This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Floral Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Lick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Now, let's have the truth, Whitey. Why did you get that suit of clothes? Uh, the fellow that got croaked, he took them off and gave them to me himself. Uh-huh, and I suppose he gave you his shirt and socks and necktie, too? Sure, sure. He said I'd need him to go with his suit. And he stopped the car so I could put him on. Was that when you tried to kill him? No, Chief. That's when he tried to kill me. Oh, Nick, this isn't getting us anywhere. You're wrong, Patsy. Now I know who really killed Mr. Ratwell. Now, the case of the unexpected corpse. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning as Nick and Patsy enter the office of Sheriff Tabor in the little town of Plain City, Texas. Hiya, Sheriff. Hello, Sheriff Tabor. Well, I'll be dog. Nick Carter and Patsy <laughs> Bowen. What are you two doing out this way? Why, we're on our way back home from California, Sheriff. And since we had to come through Texas anyway, I reminded Nick of that invitation you gave us three years ago. Remember? Sure, I remember. <laughs> and you got here just at the right time. We had a murder last night. Oh, now, wait, Sheriff. This is purely a social visit. A murder? Here in Plain City? Oh, about ten miles east of here. A big oil man from Dallas named uh, Leonard Atwell. He was shot and killed by some hitchhiker. Now, look, Sheriff. Well, I... how do you know it was a hitchhiker, Sheriff? Well, because we know Atwell started out from Dallas alone. Uh-huh. And when he we found the body, it was behind the wheel of his car with powder burns and a bullet hole in the right side of his head. Well, that sounds more like suicide. No, no, it couldn't have been that. The gun was gone, so was Atwell's money, his watch, and a big gold signet ring that he always wore. You found any clues yet? No, can't tell yet. I had everything that was in the car brought up here to my office and spread them out on those big tables over there. Come on, I'll show you. All right. I, uh, I put the tools uh, from the car in this table here, see? Mm-hmm. Now, I wonder uh, what I used this piece of rubber tubing for. Yeah, search me. Now, over here... These were the clothes he was aware of, I see? see. Hey, what's this little piece of adhesive tape? Well, that was on his right hand. There was a little scratch there. Oh. Now, look at this piece of tape. Hmm? See that flaw in the weave where it was torn off the roll? Mm, yeah. A thing like that might be a clue. Sure. Now, uh, on this table here, I got his suitcases and the stuff that was in them. Clothes, mostly. Hmm, this looks interesting. Last will and testament of Leonard Frank Atwell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he left everything to his wife in Detroit. Mm-hmm. Thought he was from Dallas. Well, he was, but he deserted his wife in Detroit 18 years ago. Uh, there's a letter there in that envelope marked to be opened in case of my death, asking her to forgive him and all that stuff. Looks like he must have been carrying that around a long time. Yeah, I guess so. I uh, suppose a man like that carried a lot of insurance. Mm, $150,000 worth. Oh, golly. Took out the policy only a couple of months ago. Right here in Plain City, by the way. $150,000, huh? Mm-hmm. Who gets it? Well, the wife, I guess. She's the sole heir. And the policy's made out to his estate. Hey, Sheriff, I don't see any first aid kit here. No, there wasn't one in the car. Just that stuff you see here. Well, then where'd he get that strip of adhesive tape? It's perfectly clean. He couldn't have had it on more than a few minutes. Well, maybe when he cut his hand, he stopped at a filling station or a lunchroom, and they fixed it up for him. Say, Patsy, now that sure sounds reasonable. Yeah, maybe if you can find that filling station or lunchroom, you can get a description of the man who was riding with that well just before he was killed. Say, that's a great idea. I'll do that. Couldn't have driven more than a few miles without getting the tape soiled, and if he should be... Uh, uh, I'm sorry to butt in, Sheriff. That's okay, Buck. Folks, this is Buck Henderson, my uh, deputy. That's Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? Hello, Buck. Uh, this telegram just come, and I thought it might be important. Oh, thank you, Buck. Oh, uh, say, Buck. Yes, yeah, Sheriff? I want you to hop in your car and start out on the highway toward Dallas. Stop at every filling station and lunchroom along the way and find out if Atwell stopped there last night. Good gravy, Sheriff. Dallas is 290 miles. Never mind. You just do what I... Well, I'll be dogged. Something wrong? Why, this telegram is from the chief of police in Dallas. You see, I wired him to send someone out to Atwell's home address and tell the folks there what had happened. 
Well? Well, the chief says they ain't no such address. It's a vacant lot. We uh, came out here to see you, Colonel Gardner, because you knew Mr. Atwell better than anyone in the country. Well, yes. In the course of our business dealings, we became very close friends. Mm -hmm. His death has been a terrible shock to me. You have any idea why he should have given a false address? No, but I'm sure it wasn't done with any intent to deceive. I've never known a more honorable gentleman than Leonard Atwell. Oh? Then you didn't know he deserted his wife? His wife? Atwell told me he was a bachelor. Well, you'll get a chance to meet the bachelor's wife this afternoon. She's coming here? Yep. When I uh, notified her of his death, she wired back that she was taking the next plane. Colonel Gardner, would you mind telling us the nature of your business dealings with Mr. Atwell? Not at all. He bought some oil leases from me. $130,000 worth. Well, you didn't sign those leases over to him without getting the money, did you? Uh, as a matter of fact, it did. What? He gave me a certified check for 40000 at the time, and he was on his way here last night to pay the balance and pick up his note. You mean the hitchhiker who killed him got away with $90,000? Oh, no, Miss Bowen. It uh, wouldn't have been in cash, of course. Oh. This sure ought to be a warning to you, Colonel, not to go picking up folks on the road. I'm afraid I'm too old to change my ways now, Sheriff. You make a habit of doing that, Colonel? Why, every tramp in the, in the country... Knows that this ranch is good for a meal and a night's lodging. Why, last winter, an old hobo got sick and died here. And the colonel even paid for his funeral. Let well, up. Sheriff, there's little enough that we can do for those less fortunate than ourselves. Oh, uh, excuse me, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, he's here. Just a minute. For you, Sheriff. Oh, thanks, Colonel. Let's be from the courthouse. Hello? Yes, this is Sheriff Tabor. You did? When? Yeah? Uh-huh. Fine. Fine. I'll come right back to town. Oh, Nick, we got him. A murderer? Yep. Caught him trying to peddle Atwell's ring and watch. Is it somebody from around here? No, it's some old bum, just like I thought. I'm sorry to rush off, Colonel, but we got a killer to take care of. <laughs> Got me wrong, Chief. Honest, I never croaked nobody. Then where'd you get his watch and ring? I told you, I found And that suit he was wearing, I suppose you found that too, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Chief. It was all rolled up in a bundle, like at the side of the road. Now, look, you, whatever your name is. It's Morgan, Chief. Whitey Morgan. Okay, Morgan. Now, why don't you open up and tell us what you did with the gun? I never had no gun. I'm a bum, sure, but I never hurt nobody in all my life. You hitched a ride with a gray-haired guy in a big sedan last night. Night, didn't you? No. No, I never you did. You pulled the gun and you made him drive off on a side road. I've never seen the guy. Honestly. And after you killed him, you took his watch and ring. Then you opened up his suitcases and got yourself a new suit of clothes. No, 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 I swear that... I didn't. No. Uh, hey, look, Chief, you wouldn't send me to the pen for something I didn't do, would you? It ain't the pen you're headed for, brother. It's the electric chair. <laughs> But Nick, he's bound to be the guy. How else would he get Atwell's watch and ring? And those clothes, they were Atwell's too. Okay, Sheriff, but why didn't he have any money in his pockets? You said Atwell always carried a lot of cash. Yes, but you didn't think he really did find that stuff, do you, Nick? No. If ever I saw a man trying to lie out of a bad situation, it was Morgan. But, well, that's pretty slim evidence in which to convict him of murder. Hey, Sheriff. Yes? Oh, Sheriff, I found it. The place where Atwell got the adhesive tape? Well, I don't know about that, but he stopped at a filling station about 30 miles up the line and had the oil changed in his car while he was eating dinner. Good work, Buck. Yeah, and there was somebody with him, too, sort of an old gent with white hair. Whitey Morgan. I knew it. I got the kid from the filling station out in the office. You want to talk to him? Well, I can't right now. Not, not right now, Buck. Miss Atwell's due in about five minutes, and I've got to go down and, and uh, meet her. Uh, come on, Nick. <laughs> The uh, undertaking parlors are at the back of the store here, Miss Atwood. Oh. I, uh, I want you to identify the body, just for the record, Jim. I can't believe it after all these years. Poor Leonard. Judging by the letter he left, he must have still thought a great deal of you, Mrs. Atwell. Yes, I don't suppose he ever married again or he'd have left the money to his second wife. Yeah, quite a pile, too. 150000 on the insurance alone. I can't imagine Leonard getting rich. Why, 20 years ago, he couldn't even hold a job. 
Uh, right through this door, ma'am. All right. The blue casket over there. And to think, everybody used to call him lazy and shiftless. I guess now they'll... <gasps> What's the matter, Mrs. Atwell? Why, th- that's not... Not your husband? Or... Oh, yes, of, co- of course that's Leonard, but... Uh... But what? Well, naturally, he's changed a lot in 18 years. But that's definitely Leonard Atwell. Sure it is, Nick. I know him myself. Everybody in town did. All right, then. Since we've identified the victim, suppose we go back to the jail and see what the kid from the filling station can tell us. You're sure you'd know this man if you saw him again, Whitaker? Oh, sure, sure. Him and Mr. Atwell stood around waiting while I finished changing the oil, and I got a right good look at him. Now, uh, Whitaker? Yeah? When my deputy brings the suspect in here, I don't want you to say anything till I ask you. Oh, no, 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 sir. By the way, did you notice a strip of adhesive tape on Mr. Atwell's right hand? And he's... Uh, well, I... I don't think he had none, or I, I'd have noticed it when he when he paid me for the oil. Here they are. Oh, oh Chief. Chief, you're going to let me go now? That's why you had me brung in here, ain't it? So as you can turn me loose, huh? Well, that all depends, Whitey. Do you still say that you didn't hit your ride last night with a gray-haired man in a big sedan? Oh, Chief, so help me. I never seen the guy in the car, neither. How about that, Whitaker? No, no, he he's a liar, Sheriff. That's the fella that was with Mr. Atwell when they stopped at the filling station. I'll swear it on a stack of Bibles a foot high. <laughs> With the filling station attendant's identification, the case against Whitey Morgan seems complete. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now, back to the case of the unexpected corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. After a sleepless night in the county jail, Whitey Morgan has sent word that he's ready to tell the truth. And the sheriff has asked Nick to accompany him to Whitey's cell. Now, let's have the confession, Whitey. You admit you were lying about where you got that suit of clothes. Yeah, Chief. I didn't find him. This fellow has got croaked. He gave him to me. You what? He did, so help me. Right after he picked me up on the highway, he said it was an old suit that was getting too tight for him. And that he... suit was brand new. I don't care. That's what he told me. I suppose the shirt and socks and the necktie, they were too tight for him, too, huh? Right? Well, he yeah. said I'd need them to go with the suit. Then later, when it got good and dark, he stopped the car so as I could get out and put him on. And that's when you killed him? No. No, honest, Chief. That's when he tried to kill me. Now, wait a minute. He did. I put on the clothes he gave me, and then when I was getting back in the car, he slugged me with a wrench. I seen it coming too late to duck, and that's all I know till I come to in a ditch someplace else. Someplace else? Yeah. He must have hauled me there in the car and dumped me out for dead. Yeah, so he got you all dressed up so you'd die happy, huh? Even gave you his watch and ring. I don't know nothing about the watch and ring. When I come to, I was wearing them. Oh, Whitey. Whitey, when you were in the car with Atwell, did you notice a piece of adhesive tape on his right hand? Uh, no. There was nothing on his hand. You're sure? Yeah. What difference does it make, Nick? You're not going to swallow this crazy story, are you? Why didn't you tell us this at first, Whitey? Well, when the chief here said the guy had been croaked, I I got scared. I didn't think he'd believe me. You bet I wouldn't. And take it from me, brother. Neither will the jury. Hi, Sheriff. Hi, Nick. Hello, Patsy. Hi. Well, where have you two been all afternoon? Oh, lots of places. The post office, the photographers, the garage where you put Atwell's car. What'd you go there for? Wanted to check the speedometer. It registers 9,485 miles. And that boy changed the oil in the car at 9,427, according to the sticker inside the door. So what? Well, from that filling station to where the body was found is a distance of 24 miles. From that spot to the garage here is 10 miles. That's 34 altogether. Yeah. But the car had been driven 58 miles. See what I mean, Sheriff? Atwell must have driven 24 miles out of his way for that piece of adhesive tape. For the love of Pete, Nick, I think that you're touched on that subject of that tape. We uh, found something else, too, Sheriff. Yeah? A spot of blood on the floor in the rear of Atwell's car. I'm going to have it analyzed to see if it could possibly have come from that cut on Whitey's head. Oh, Nick, don't tell me that you take any stock in that wild story of his. 
Why, any five-year-old kid could make up a better lie than that. And uh, so could Whitey, unless it happens to be true. But he's got to be lying. Why would Atwell give all that stuff to a tramp, then hit him over the head and throw him out of the car? Look, let me ask you a couple of questions, Sheriff. You said the suitcases were both neatly packed and locked. Why would Whitey repack them after killing Atwell and stealing the clothes? Why, I... Uh... And what happened to the money Atwell always carried? Okay, okay, I give up. But do you know the answers? No, not all of them. But I can guess at a few. For instance, Atwell took out a lot of insurance only two months ago, payable to his estate. Yeah. Now, suppose Atwell planned to stage a fake accident with a car. And suppose he planned on having Whitey's body found behind the wheel, wearing his clothes, his watch, and his ring. Yes, but he couldn't get away with it. Everybody in town knew Atwell. Yeah, Whitey and Atwell were both about the same size and age. They both had gray hair. And if the body were badly burned... Burned? Remember that piece of rubber tubing? It had been just the thing for siphoning gasoline out of the tank to be sure that the fire burned everything it was supposed to. Why, every insurance company knows that trick, Sheriff. It's been done a hundred times. Yes, but Atwell didn't do that. There wasn't any accident. The car wasn't burned. All right, maybe something went wrong at the last minute, and the plan was changed. I know. Remember how surprised Mrs. Atwell looked when she saw the body? Yes, I know, but she explained that. Yes, and she has some more explaining to do. I've been in touch with the Detroit police. And the surprise she got yesterday is nothing to the one I have in store for her today. Mrs. Atwell, do you recognize this picture? Well, where did you get that? The uh, Detroit police found it in the bedroom of your apartment and transmitted it here to Nick by wire photo. Isn't that a picture of your husband? Well, yes, but... Well, it was taken more than 20 years ago, and he... Let me see it, Nick. Yeah, yeah, that's Atwell, all right. But I wouldn't have known it unless I was looking for the resemblance. Now, look at this picture. What is it? An ear? Right, Sheriff. The left ear of Leonard Atwell enlarged 50 times from that snapshot. You see, Mrs. Atwell, ears are as individual as fingerprints. They never change from birth to death, except in size. Say, I didn't know that. And this ear, Leonard Atwell's ear, is an entirely different shape from that of the man you identified yesterday as your husband. <gasps> All right, I, I, I lied about it. I knew that wasn't Leonard. But, well, I... but, Nick, it is Atwell. I know him myself. You mean you knew the man who posed as Leonard Atwell? I don't understand. Why should anyone do that? There's one obvious reason, Mrs. Atwell. That $150,000 insurance money. Hey, I get it, Nick. He was going to fake the accident like you said and split the money with her. But then she killed him in order to keep it all to herself. Y- you're accusing me of... Of murder, you bet I am. No, 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 Sheriff. According to the Detroit police, Mrs. Atwell was attending a bridge party the night of the murder. I checked that angle. Well, she could have hired somebody to do it for her, couldn't she? Perhaps, but I don't think so. There was big money behind this impersonation. Nick, I think I have an idea. Didn't the colonel say that he signed those oil leases over to Atwell absolutely? Yes, in return for a check and a promissory note for the balance. Then maybe that was the real reason behind it. And the insurance was only part of the scheme to carry out the idea that he was a rich man. If you think he was cheating the colonel... You're barking up the wrong tree, Patsy. Nobody gets ahead of that old bird. Yeah, but the dead man did get absolute title to $130,000 worth of oil leases. And all he actually paid out was 40000 Well, even if the colonel never gets another cent, he's doing all right. What do you mean? Why, those leases ain't worth anything. He couldn't have peddled them to anybody around here for more than five or 10000 So that's it. Come on, Patsy. Huh? Hey, where are you going? To look for a roll of adhesive tape. <laughs> First aid kit, Mr. Carter. Oh, it's an awfully big one, isn't it? Go on a ranch, you never know what may happen, Miss Bowen. May I look through the kit, Colonel Gardner? Certainly, Mr. Carter. But I'd like to know why you're so interested. I'm interested because the man who was murdered two nights ago had a fresh grip of adhesive tape on his right hand. And I'm wondering whether it came from here. But Atwell never got to my ranch. I told you he was on his way. I know that's what you said, Colonel. But there was an extra 24 miles in a speedometer. In other words, he must have made a side trip of 12 miles and back. And this ranch is exactly 12 miles off the main highway. Are you calling me a liar, sir? Worse than that, Colonel. I'm calling you a murderer. Ridiculous. Leonard Atwell was my friend. The man who called himself Leonard Atwell was your stooge. You paid his expenses for four months while he built up the illusion of being a wealthy oil promoter. You're out of your mind. Why should I do such a thing? So that he could take out a big life insurance policy payable to his estate. 
and then make a will, starting with the usual clause about paying all just debts. Meaning that promissory note you hold, Colonel. There's a neat way to collect $90,000 for your worthless oil leases. <laughs> You're imagining things. Maybe so. The way I see it, the plan went like this. Atwell picked up somebody who roughly resembled him, dressed him in his clothes, then knocked him out. This man was Whitey Morgan, who was to be found dead in Atwell's car and would be taken for Atwell because his body would be too burned for positive identification. Then you and Atwell would share the money you would collect from Atwell's estate because of that note for 90000 you held. But when Atwell, with Morgan's unconscious body in his car, came here to get your help in faking the accident, you decided that a substitute wasn't as effective as the real thing, so you killed Atwell. This is ridiculous. Then you emptied Atwell's pockets to make it look like a robbery. Then you took the unconscious Morgan miles away and dumped him by the side of the highway knowing he'd be the logical suspect in Atwell's murder. And you didn't burn the car because it was no longer necessary, with a real Atwell dead in it. How do you expect to prove any such wild story? Atwell had no adhesive tape on his hand when he picked up Morgan. He did have it when he was found dead. If that tape came from your first aid kit, it'll prove he was here after he had set Morgan up for the fake killing. A very interesting theory, Carter, but not proof. You'll hand me the roll of adhesive tape from your kit. I think it'll give me the proof I need. Very well. All right. What? Get your hands up, both of you. Nick, he had a gun in the kit. Yes. I put it there when I went out of the room to get this kit, Carter. I thought there was something odd about your wanting to inspect my first aid supplies. Why? Because you remember the last time you used that kit was just before the murder? <laughs> a very shrewd guess, Mr. Carter. So you did kill that man, just as Nick said. With this very gun, my dear. It's too bad that you have to be so clever, Mr. Carter. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean that you two are the only people who suspect I killed that stupid fool. So I'm going to kill both of you. Right now. With his hands in the air, Nick hasn't a chance of reaching his own gun before Colonel Gardner's finger closes on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Unexpected Corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the living room of Colonel Gardner's ranch house, Nick and Patsy stand with their hands in the air, staring at the revolver in the colonel's hands as he says, You two are the only ones who suspect I killed that stupid fool. So I'm going to kill both of you. Right now. You're wrong, Colonel. The sheriff knows all about this. I told him not half an hour ago. <laughs> I'm too good a poker player to fall for a bluff like that, Carter. This is no bluff, Colonel. Oh, drop that gun. Table, you. Yes, Colonel, I've been standing outside that window. That was a mighty interesting confession. And thanks for telling us that this is the gun you killed your partner with. Why, Nick, you were right about this adhesive tape. It does match that strip on the dead man's hand. You can tell by that same flaw in the weave. So, even if we didn't have the gun, that would prove he was here just before he was murdered. You're pretty smart, Nick. No mistake. By the way, Colonel... Will you tell us why Atwell, or whatever his name was, had that adhesive tape on his hand? He scratched it while he was getting his suitcase out of the luggage compartment. Didn't amount to anything, but it was bleeding some. Well, Colonel, you ought to be right proud. You'll go down in history as the first man who ever hung himself with a piece of adhesive tape. <laughs> Well, Patsy, I hope we can get home without any more distractions. Uh-huh. Nick, do you suppose they'll ever find out what happened to the real Leonard Atwell? Why, Patsy, that came out in the colonel's confession. Huh? Remember the sheriff telling us about that old bum that died on the colonel's ranch last winter? What? He was Leonard Atwell? Nobody else. When the colonel went through his effects, he found that letter to his wife asking her to forgive him for deserting her 18 years ago. Uh-huh. That's where the colonel got the idea for cashing in on those worthless oil leases. Oh, then it's no wonder the false Atwell resembled the picture of the real one. The colonel knew the type of person he needed for the impersonation. And he found him in Hollywood. A broken-down movie extra with a shady reputation. Uh-huh. You know, Nick, I bet he never knew to the last minute that he was cast as a corpse in the colonel's little drama. Well, that corpse was an unexpected shock to almost everyone. Mrs. Atwell expected it to be her husband. The imposter expected it to be Whitey. And only the colonel knew who the unexpected corpse really was. And, um, he wasn't telling. <laughs> And now, Nick, how about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Well, Mike, if you were a young man with all the money you wanted, and if you had everything in the world to live for, 
Can you think of any reason why you would want to die? I can't think of a reason for wanting to die under any circumstances. Well, a young man named Miles Kincaid had a different attitude. Yes, he was found drowned in a lake, and yet he wasn't drowned in a lake. And before the case was over, Nick uncovered the reason for not just one, but for three mysterious deaths. Well, it sounds as though we're in for a lot of excitement as well as mystery. What do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Flowery Farewell. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silver. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Why do you suppose he doesn't answer the door, Nick? I don't know, Patsy. Maybe if we look through this window, we can see. Why, Nick, what's the matter? What are you staring at? Look over there on the floor by the sofa, Patsy. Huh? Why, there's a man lying there. He's been shot in the forehead. Confound it. He's the one man in the world who could have told us why a young man who had everything to live for should want to take his own life. And now, the case of the flowery farewell. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As our story opens, we find Nick seated at his desk in his office, intently studying the front page of the evening paper. Patsy stands behind him, reading over his shoulder. Nick, it says he was only 35 years old. Yes, Patsy, he was one of the richest industrialists in the world. Hmm. And he ends up by throwing himself in a lake. Oh, it just doesn't make sense, Nick. Why would a man like that take his own life? Well, the suicide note he left in his car tells why. It's reprinted here in the paper. Oh, is it? I didn't see it. Yeah, right down here at the bottom of the column. Hmm? It is not the number of years a man has lived that enables him to say his life was justified... It is the richness and fullness of his experience. I say farewell to my own life with deep regret, and yet I am convinced that it is better for a man to die in his prime quickly and painlessly than to let old age destroy him by slow stages. Well. Pretty flowery farewell, isn't it? Oh, I'll say. Imagine anyone sitting down and... Oh, I'll get it. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Mr. Carter, my name is Mrs. Holt. Mrs. Douglas Holt. Yes, Mrs. Holt. I wonder whether you can come to my home this evening... My husband and I would like to speak to you about the death of our very good friend, Miles Kincaid. Oh, yes, the man who committed suicide. The man who died, Mr. Carter. Whether or not he committed suicide is what we'd like you to find out. Well, so far, Mrs. Holt, I'm afraid you haven't given me any really solid grounds for your suspicions that Kincaid didn't kill himself. But Mr. Carter, Miles had everything in the world to live for. He was rich, famous, and happy. Well, according to his note, he wanted his life to end at the peak of his success. Yes, but what about his call to me yesterday? He said he had plane reservations and was leaving for Florida very soon. My wife checked on that, Mr. Carter. It's true. Yes, if he were going to commit suicide today... Why would he make arrangements for a trip at a future date? Let me ask you this. You're implying that Kincaid was murdered. But do you know of anyone who'd have any reason to kill him? Well, no, I don't. How about you, Mr. Holt? No, I I can't think of anyone. And yet you both knew him well, didn't you? Oh, yes. In fact, well, Miles and I had quite a crush on each other a good many years ago. That was before he introduced me to Douglas. He and I were partners at that time. We had a little organization that we called Inventors Incorporated. We broke up after a while, but we never lost touch with each other. And in all these years, he made no serious enemies? Well, of course he might have, without our knowing it. It still doesn't add up to murder, does it, Nick? No, not to me. Then you won't investigate this matter for us, Mr. Carter? Oh, I didn't say that, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I wish you would, Mr. Carter. I just know something's wrong somewhere. 
I've got a... Well, an intuition about it. Very well, Mrs. Holt. I have a lot of faith in a woman's intuition. If there has been a murder, I promise you I'll find it out before the night is over. Did you talk to Sergeant Matheson on the phone, Nick? Yes, and you should have heard the horse laugh he gave me when I suggested that Miles Kincaid might have been murdered. Oh, that must mean the handwriting experts are sure about the suicide note. They are. Matty says there's absolutely no question about it. It wasn't a forgery. <sighs> well, that pretty well settles it then, doesn't it? Mm, perhaps. But at least it won't hurt to take a look at Kincaid's home. Mm-mm. We're almost there, Nick. It's the house at the end of this street. All right. <laughs> Matty wasn't even going to hold an autopsy. Did you ask him to? I did, and he finally agreed to it. Good. All right, hop out. Uh-huh. Uh, whom do you expect to see here, Nick? Kincaid's valet. A man named Harry Otis. Oh. Holt says he was probably the last man to see Kincaid alive. Yeah, but do you think you... What, what was that, Nick? Somebody moaning. Someone in pain. It came from those bushes by the side of the porch. Yeah, come on. There he is, Nick, lying in the bushes. All right, give me a hand, Patsy. Yeah. Pull him out. Yeah. Watch out for that threat. Okay. There. That does it. My head. Yeah, what happened to you? Who, who are you? Nick Carter, private investigator. Who are you? Harry Otis. I'm... I was Mr. Kincaid's valet, sir. Well, what happened to you? Someone rang the doorbell a few minutes ago. I... I opened the door, but there was no one there, so I stepped out in the porch... That's, that's all I remember. He must have been slugged from behind, Nick. Yeah, come on. Where are we going? Whoever slugged him may have wanted to get into the house. Could still be there. Okay, Nick. If Miles Kincaid committed suicide, Nick, what's this all about? Your guess is as good as mine, Patsy. Hmm. The front door is open. Don't make any noise. Uh-uh. No one in the living room. What, have you gone upstairs? Wait a oh. Listen. Nick, it's someone moving around. Right. Behind that closed door over there. Let's drop in on him. Unexpectedly. Right. Oh, confound it. Is the door locked? Yes. Yes. Oh. Guess we'll have to announce ourselves after all. Open up. Open this door. Oh. Oh, Climbing through the door. Oh. Not hurt, are you? No, but it was awful close, Nick. Oh, it's all quiet in there now. Afraid he's giving us the slip. That gunfire was probably intended to cover his getaway. What are we going to do? Only one thing to do. Shoot the lock off. Stand back. Yeah. There. Oh, Nick, he must have gone out that open window. Yeah, no use going after him in the dark. Oh, shucks. Oh, will you look at this room? It must have been Kincaid's study. Well, it's a mess now. A friend tore it apart. Every drawer, every what file. What have you been after? I don't know. But there is one thing I do know. What's that, Nick? As of now, I'm definitely interested in how Miles Kincaid really died. Why, certainly, Mr. Carter. As Miles Kincaid's lawyer, I'm happy to help you clear up any questions you have regarding his death. Well, first, Mr. Randolph, who stood to benefit by his death? Well, all of his wealth is to be divided among various foundations and charitable institutions. What? You left no private bequest whatsoever? Only a comparatively small one to Melvin Dudley. Melvin Dudley? That's the publisher, isn't it? Yes, yes. Miles had arranged with Dudley to publish his memoirs, and he left a few thousand dollars to cover the cost. Then Kincaid was writing his memoirs at the time of his death. He practically finished them, though that fact wasn't commonly known. I see. But what about all his property holdings? He must have had an enormous estate. Not anymore. He'd sold everything in the past year, converted it all into cash. There's just one piece of land that he held on to. Oh, where's that? Over in the poorer section of town, on Montrose Avenue. That's to be sold at auction now that he's dead. But I don't understand, Randolph. Why on earth would he have disposed of all his possessions at the age of 35? Hmm. You'd almost think he knew he was going to die. He did, Miss Bowen. What? What? He and his personal physician and I were the only ones who were in on his secret. What secret? Mr. Carter, in six weeks, Miles Kincaid would have been dead of heart trouble. Why are we going back to the office, Nick? I want to call Mary and check on the autopsy. Oh. Nick... You promised Holt that before the night is over, you'd at least know whether or not Kincaid was murdered. 
Do you think you will? I don't know. All they found out so far is that he had a better reason than we thought for doing away with himself. Yeah, but that still doesn't explain the mysterious visitor at his house tonight. And also, it... Oh, that's our phone, Nick. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got the key. Good. Hurry, Nick, before they hang up. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Uh, Nick, this is Matty. Oh, yeah, Matty, I was just going to call you. What'd you find out? Kincaid was drowned, all right. His lungs are full of water. What? Well, that settles that. No, it doesn't, Nick. What do you mean? His lungs are full of water right enough, but the water was full of chlorine. Chlorine? Yeah. But there's no chlorine in lake water. You're right, Nick. But there's plenty of it in the city water system. And Miles Kincaid was drowned before he was thrown into the lake. Right. And that means murder. Well, Nick knows at last that the wealthy young industrialist did not die by his own hand. But why Miles Kincaid left a suicide note, or why anyone would want to kill a man who was doomed to die from heart trouble within six weeks, are questions that are still unanswered. We'll continue this baffling adventure in just a moment. And now, back to The Case of the Flowery Farewell, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As we pick up our story, a half an hour has passed. Nick and Patsy have joined Matty at the Kincaid home and, guided by Kincaid's valet, Harry Otis, have just entered the murdered man's bedroom. I see the bed's been made, Otis. Did you do that today? Uh, No, sir. No one's been in here all day. Well, in that case, Kincaid didn't sleep here last night, Nick. Apparently not, Matty. But his dressing gown's on the bed and there's one of his ties on the floor behind that chair. Yeah. Was Kincaid fully dressed when your men found him, Matty? Well, sure. He had on a brown business suit, a... Blue shirt and a green tie. A green tie? Yeah. Oh, no, no. You must be mistaken, Sergeant. Now, don't tell me. He had on a blue shirt and a green tie. But, Sergeant, Mr. Kincaid would never have worn a combination like that. He was very particular about his clothes. Now, listen, Otis. Hey, Mary, uh, Mary, wait a minute, wait a minute. This all adds up. Huh? Otis, take a look around. Does this room seem just about the same to you as always? Why, no, sir, it doesn't. The bed's been pushed back farther than usual, and the chairs are all against the wall. Hey, I'm beginning to catch on, Nick. Otis, where were you when your employer retired last night? I had the evening off, sir. I drew his bath water for him, then I went out. Uh When I got back, I assumed he was asleep. You drew his bath, huh? Yes, sir. Well, Mary, at least we know how he died. But you think he was killed here, Nick? I do. He was probably getting undressed when the murderer found him. And they they had a fight? Yeah. That's why the furniture is out of place. Yeah. That would also account for the bruises on King Cade's face. We figured they was from being hit against the rocks in the lake. Yeah. Well, he was probably knocked unconscious in this room. Then the murderer took him into the bathroom and held his head underwater until he was dead. Oh, how horrible. Then he dressed him again. Must have been in such a hurry he didn't see the tie King Cade had taken off. So he grabbed one out of the closet without even noticing the color. And then he carried him out shoved him in his own car, and drove to the lake. But what about the suicide note? I've got a little theory about that, too. What sort of theory? I'd rather not say until I've had a chance to confirm it. But how are you going to do that, Nick? By dropping in on a publisher named Melvin Dudley and asking him a few questions. (sighs) I guess there's no one home. Yeah, there must be, Patsy. I saw a light at the side of the house. Well, let's go around the side porch and take a look in the room where the light is. Uh-huh. Okay, Nick. No, you're just wasting time. No. Uh, here, Nick. We can look in through this French window. Well, look at all those papers scattered all over the floor. Hey, looks like a cyclone's been through here. Hey, Matty. What? Look over there beside the sofa. Beside what? Sofa. Holy smoke. Nick, there's a man lying there. Smash the glass with your revolver. We've got to get in there. I'll say we have. All right, stand back. Can you reach the latch? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Holy smoke. Look at this guy, Nick. Yeah. Shot through the head. That's Melvin Dudley, Nick. I've seen his picture in the paper. Well, you'll see it again tomorrow, Patsy, all over the front page. Hey, Matty. Yeah, Nick. This paper's on the floor. Huh? Ever seen any just like them? What? Yeah. Yeah, sure. They're the same kind of paper, the same handwriting as the suicide note. That's what I figured. And look, here's a typewritten letter among them. Huh? To Melvin Dudley from Miles Kincaid. What's it say, Nick? I'm enclosing the manuscript of my memoirs. Everything is here except the foreword, which I'm working on now. 
Well, there's the answer to your suicide note, Maddie. What do you mean? It was written by Miles Kincaid, but it wasn't intended as a suicide note. Then huh? what was it, Nick? A page from the foreword to his memoirs. The murderer stole it last night from Kincaid's house and planted it in Kincaid's car as a suicide note. Oh, no wonder it sounded so flowery. We're up against the smart operator, Nick. Plenty smart, Maddie. But he's made one big mistake. Huh? When he killed Melvin Dudley, he should have taken those memoirs with him. <laughs> I've spent a very dull night reading Kincaid's memoirs. Oh, yeah? Find anything interesting in them? Yeah, but the most interesting part isn't there. Is that... I don't get you. Manny, unless I'm all wrong, these memoirs should hold the key to Kincaid's murder. How do you mean? Well, apparently, when Kincaid learned he was going to die, he decided to leave behind him a document that would expose somebody. Uh Uh-huh. Somebody he hated. And you think this somebody got wind of it and knocked Kincaid off so as to get hold of the document? I do. But he didn't get hold of it because Kincaid had already sent it to Dudley. Uh Uh-huh. The murderer realized that after he went back and searched Kincaid's study. So he went to Dudley's house to get it and ended by killing Dudley. Right. But look, Nick, why didn't the murderer take the memoirs while he was there? He did. He what? At least he took that part of them which incriminated him. There's one whole section missing from the manuscript. Oh. Got any idea what was in that section? Yes, Mary, I have. Good boy. When Douglas Holt and his wife put me on this case... Holt told me that he and Kincaid were once partners in an outfit called Inventors Incorporated. Inventors Incorporated? Yeah. But there's no mention of any such organization anywhere in the memoirs. Hey, Nick. Then maybe the... I'm back, oh. Nick. Oh, hello, Sergeant. Oh, hi, Patsy. Yeah, what did you find at the newspaper morgue, Patsy? You got any dope on Kincaid's background? Plenty, Nick. And about that company called Inventors Incorporated. Yeah? There's something funny about that. Funny? In what way? Why, there was a third partner. Third partner? Uh Uh-huh. Who was he? A man named Peter Jarrett. Peter Jarrett? Mm Mm-hmm. No mention of him in the memoirs either. Hey, Nick, are you thinking this Jarrett guy might be our man? I don't know about that, Matty. But I am thinking that it's strange that Holt and his wife didn't tell me about this Peter Jarrett. I wonder why. I should have mentioned Peter Jarrett to you, Mr. Carter, but frankly, I was sticking to an agreement that Miles Kincaid and I made long ago. What sort of agreement, Mr. Holt? To cover up for Jarrett in spite of the raw deal he gave us. Oh, uh, he gave you a raw deal? He certainly did. Hmm. Jarrett wrecked Inventors Incorporated by walking out on us one day, taking with him what little capital we had. And you never saw him again? No, never. But I'm confident he's still alive. Nick, Peter Jarrett must be our man. Well, he certainly had a motive for killing Kincaid. Kincaid was planning to expose him in the memoirs he was writing. You say Miles was writing his memoirs, Mr. Carter? Yes, he was. They were practically complete when he died. Well, then it all adds up, doesn't it? Only a man like Jared who wanted to get hold of those memoirs before they were published would have had a motive for killing a man who was going to die anyway. Yeah, but the question is, how can we get our hands on Jared? Well, I can tell you where his wife lives. She ought to know where he's hiding out, if anybody does. Oh, good. We'll go see her. I have an idea that when we find Peter Jarrett, we'll have this case sewed up. Yeah? What do you want? Are you Mrs. Jarrett? What's it to you? I'm Nick Carter, private investigator. A dick, huh? You get out of here. Not this moment, Mrs. Jarrett. I said, get out. Mrs. Jarrett, don't do that. Put that gun away, please. You come one step closer and I'll start shooting. So help me. I don't think you're going to shoot anyone you with that gun. I'll you. take it. Why, you... And the next time you want to fire a gun, Mrs. Jarrett, remember to lift the safety catch. Nice going, Nick. <sighs> Pretty darn smart, ain't you? Now, perhaps you better talk to us. I ain't talking to no cops. Why not? Because I'm sick of you guys. You've been hounding me for ten years. Ever since Pete disappeared. You wouldn't know where your husband is, would you? Are you crazy? I wouldn't be living like this if I knew. Him with all that dough. When did you see him last? I ain't seen him since the day he went to work and didn't come home. And where was your husband working the day he disappeared? He was working over at that house on Montrose Avenue. Montrose Avenue? What? Why, that's the one piece of property that Miles Kincaid held on to after he sold everything else. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mrs. Jarrett. I'm very grateful to you. What? I didn't do nothing for you. Oh, yes, you did. 
You just gave me the last piece of a very complicated jigsaw puzzle. Oh, Nick, what a horrible, musty old place. It should be musty. After all, nobody's been down in the cellar for over ten years. Not since Miles Kincaid and Douglas Holt closed up the business they called Inventors Incorporated. But what do you expect to find here, Nick? The key to three murders, I hope. Three? But only two men were killed. Patsy, if my hunch is right... Wait a minute. What do you see, Nick? Look where my flashlight's pointing. Notice anything about that slab of concrete over there? Uh, why, yes. It's a different color from the rest of the cellar floor. Right. Because it was laid at a different time. Let's see. It's about three feet wide and six feet long, isn't it? Nick, you think that's a grave? I do. I think a man has been buried under that slab of concrete for ten long years. Patsy stares at the circle of light from Nick's flashlight. Who was buried in the musty cellar on Montrose Avenue and what bearing his death has on the murders of Miles Kincaid and Melvin Dudley? We'll find out in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Flowery Farewell. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Almost an hour has passed since Nick and Patsy discovered what Nick believes to be a grave in the cellar of the abandoned house on Montrose Avenue. They left the cellar for a time, but have now returned to it and are waiting impatiently. Not a sign of him yet, Nick. He'll be here, all right. Can't afford not to come. I still don't understand why you're so sure he's the murderer. You will before long. Yeah, but... Ah, hold it. Here he comes. Mm-hmm. You down there, Carter? Yes, we're here. Come on down. What's this all about, anyway? Familiar territory to you, isn't it? It's been a long time since I was here. This is where Miles Kincaid and I had our laboratory. You, Miles Kincaid, and Peter Jarrett. Don't forget Jarrett, Mr. Holt. That's right. Well, by the way, have you got a line on his whereabouts yet? I've done better than that. I've found it. What? Well, where is he? Right where you and Miles Kincaid buried him ten years ago. What are you talking about, Carter? I'm talking about murder. You and Kincaid killed Jarrett and buried him down here. That's ridiculous. Probably did it so that you could steal an invention of his. And you spread the word that he'd run off with your fun. You must be out of your mind. No, but I imagine you were nearly out of your mind when Melvin Dudley happened to mention to you that Kincaid was writing his memoirs. (laughs) Why should that worry me? Because you guessed that he was planning to expose your part in the murder. Something he couldn't have done during his lifetime without incriminating himself. What? When the police dig up Jarrett's body... They'll never dig it up, because you won't be alive to tell them about it. Don't reach for your gun, Carter. I've got you both covered. Holt, you made a bad mistake when you admitted that your new Kincaid was a dying man. That was the tip-off on you, especially since you neglected to tell me that fact when you hired me. Well, I slipped up once, but I won't slip this time. I'll take you first, Carter. No, Holt. I'll take you first. What the... Drop your gun, Holt. I can fight behind you. I'll kill you. You... My hand! <laughs> oh, nice shooting, Nick. You cut that gun right out of his hand. And you made a nice dramatic entrance, Matty. <laughs> well, uh, you set the stage for it, Nick, when you put me behind that packing box. Oh, I thought you'd never come out of there, Sergeant. Yeah, well, I'd have been out sooner, Patsy. Only my pants got caught in the nail. Yeah. Oh, Sergeant. <laughs> yeah, and my new suit, too. <laughs> okay, Holt, let's get moving. No use hanging around this damp cellar. When we got a nice dry cell waiting for you down at headquarters. <laughs> Then Jared's body was buried in the cellar, Nick. Yes, Patsy. And the case is closed. Uh Uh-uh. Not quite, Hmm? Nick Carter. Not until you've told me how Holt found out that Kincaid was dying of heart trouble. Well, according to the statement Holt gave Maddie down at headquarters, Kincaid told him. He did? Mm Mm-hmm. When Holt went to inquire about the memoirs, Kincaid gloated that he'd be dead in six weeks and that everybody would know that Holt was a murderer. But why on earth did Kincaid want to expose Holt? Patsy, don't you remember what Mrs. Holt told us? Hmm? That she used to go with Kincaid? Well, Kincaid never forgave Holt for taking her away from him. Well, I get it. He couldn't get even with Holt until after he himself was dead. That's right. Yeah, but I can't understand why Holt brought you in on this case. He didn't. His wife did. What? You mean it was her idea to hire you? Sure. She knew nothing about the murder of Peter Jarrett, and she had no idea that Holt had killed Kincaid. She just didn't believe that Kincaid had killed himself. Mm-hmm. And when she wanted to call you, her husband had to agree with her so she wouldn't get suspicious of him. That's it. Oh, brother. When you walked into that house and took the case, it must have been life 
darkest moment for Douglas Holt. The darkest so far, Patsy. But the state is planning an even darker moment for him in the very near future. Can you tell us something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Next week, Mike, we're going to meet a man who was honest and upright for five years in order to build up to a fraud worth half a million dollars. Only his plan broke down because he put his fraud in an envelope. A fraud in an envelope? Well, that sounds exciting. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the King's Apology. <laughs> Friends, this is Nick Carter again. And I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Cudahy Packing Company to salute the 49th Annual Convention of the National Association of Retail Grocers, which begins today in Atlantic City. The independent retail grocer is your good neighbor, bringing you fine foods from all parts of the nation and of the world. So let's all doff our hats to this very important businessman, the independent retail grocer. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Lou Schofield and Ken Pettis. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, When minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick Carter, have you lost your mind? No, Patsy. I said you're going to go crazy. Me? Go crazy? Yes. And Maddie and I are going to chase you. But why are you going to chase me? Because you've got the king's apology. And you're going to run with it until you run into a killer. And now, the case of the King's Apology. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In his library, filled with rare books, letters, stamps, and coins, wealthy collector Robert Bixby sits behind a desk and stares coldly at a small, oily man named Thomas Gall. Oh. Gall, displaying an open leather portfolio filled with papers, talks excitedly. I'm deeply obliged to you for asking me to call on you, Mr. Bixby. It's an honor to see your famous collection, I assure you. Not at all, Mr. Gall. At the same time, I have always regretted the fact that I am the one dealer in this city who has not yet had the good fortune to assist you in your collecting. Indeed, well, I... Uh... That is why I took the liberty of bringing a few of my more precious items for your esteemed consideration. Uh, several interesting autograph letters dating from the 18th century. Mr. Gall. Especially this note in the handwriting of King George III, King of England during the American Revolution. Uh, it is an apology to a friend for failure to keep an appointment. Uh, His Majesty's arms on the envelope. I especially... Mr. Gall. Yes, Mr. Bixby? I did not ask you here to display your stock. Uh, no, Mr. Bixby? I want you to answer a question. A question? Yesterday, while driving past your shop, I saw something that demands full explanation. What did you see, sir? I saw you in close conference with a well-known forger, John Pryor. You saw me? I did. With Pryor, the literary forger. Oh, I think you're mistaken, Mr. Bishop. Let me warn you, girl. I'm chairman of the Collectors Association. Oh, I know you can blast my reputation with one word, Mr. Bixby. I know you can put me out of business. And because... I shall do so. Unless you can explain your association with Pryor. I am not associated with him, Mr. Bixby. You're mistaken. You must believe me, sir. That's all you have to say? That's all I can say. Very well. 
I'm sorry, Gal. I shall take action at once. You've made up your mind, sir? In view of the fact that no explanation is forthcoming, you're going to ruin me? It's not a question of personal animosity. There are the collectors to be protected. My duty as chairman. You're ruining me. I'm afraid you're ruining yourself. I happen to know you're lying, Gal. I've got too much at stake to let you do that, Mr. Bixby. For five years, I built up my reputation just waiting for this chance to make a killing. So I'm afraid the killing is going to start with you. Oh, oh, in the name of... Oh, Don't oh, misunderstand, oh, Mr. Bixby. Oh, it's not a question of oh, personal animosity. Oh, I've got to protect myself. Oh, <sighs> Goodbye, Mr. Bixby. I hope you enjoy your new career. Collecting fire and brimstone. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh. Hello. Hello. What's the matter, Hello. Patsy? Scubby proposing in a new and different way? Oh, I don't know who it is, Nick. Hello. Oh. Hello. It sounds like someone groaning on the phone. Hmm? Here, let me have it. Yeah. Hello, this is Nick Carter speaking. Nick, Nick Carter. Yes, this is Nick Carter speaking. Who is this? Nick, Nick Carter. Is something wrong? I. Can't you speak openly? Or are you sick? Come, quick. Who is this? Hello, hello. What is it? Someone asked me to come quick. No name, no address. Hmm. Hello? Hello? And no answer. Hang up. He'll call again. No, no. I'll hold on to this line and keep it open. You get on the other phone and call the phone company. Have this open wire trace. Right. And when you get the address, call Maddie. This is an invitation to trouble. We might as well be legal about accepting it. to say is, Nick, if you interrupted my sandwich to bring me here on a false alarm... What do you do, Sergeant? I... I don't know. For years, Nick's been breaking into my meals. I still haven't figured out what to do about it. There's no false alarm, Mary. Hmm. Nobody's answering the door, Nick. You sure it's the right house? Sure it is. Robert Bixby, 1035 Russell Place. Uh Uh-huh. I'd still like to know what this is all about. So would I. All right, if I use a skeleton key... Uh, look, are you sure he groaned on the phone? On my word of honor, Sergeant. All right, all right. Let's go in and have a look. Good. Well, you got that door open quick enough. You know, Nick, sometimes I'm glad you're on the right side of the law. Except when Nick interrupts your meal. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if this is a false alarm... It isn't, Betty. Uh, but... I know it now. Huh? What? Look. On the left, in the library. What? Oh. Holy smoke. This is Robert Bixby, all right. And he's dead. Oh. And we're smack in the middle of a murder case. He was strangled. Look at the finger marks on his throat. Golly. See the way his head tilts, Matty? Yeah. His neck's broken. He died instantly. What? But he telephoned us, Nick. No, he didn't, Patsy. Not with a broken neck. What? Someone else called us. Someone who was here during or immediately after the murder. Oh. Uh, Give me the aluminum powder kit for my kid, will you? I want to dust the phone for fingerprints. Right, Nick. No matter, you better look around. See if anything looks displaced or missing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Will do. Here's the powder, Nick. Thanks. Hmm. Not a sign of a print, Nick. No. Whoever telephoned me and grown made sure to wipe all prints off the phone. Well, the place doesn't look as though it's been searched, Nick. Nothing's been touched. That's funny. Several thousand dollars worth of rare books and literary material in this room, and nothing was taken? Huh? Yeah. Then it wasn't murder for robbery. No. Confounded. Why was old Bixby killed, and who called me, and why? Hey, hey wait a minute, Nick. Hmm? Here's something under Bixby's feet. It looks like a letter or something. Let's have a look at it. Where do I get it out of the envelope? Oh, it looks pretty old. Yeah, it's probably part of Bixby's collection. Uh-huh. 
date is 1780. 1780? Yes. Oh, let me see. Seems to be some kind of an apology. Nick, it's signed George R. R. That means Rex, Latin for king. Then this was signed by King George? Yeah, King George III, judging by the date. Hmm. That must be the royal coat of arms on the envelope. Do you really mean that letter is from a king? It's a royal apology, Sergeant. Isn't that exciting? Not only exciting, Patsy, but it also gives us an angle on this case. Huh? What's that? The letter's a forgery. It is? Well, how do you know? Never mind that right now, Patsy. Just take my word for it. Okay, Nick. But a man like Bixby would never have a forgery like this in his collection. Evidently, his death was in some way connected with this king's apology. And I have an idea. Uh, what's that, Nick? Suppose you go ahead with a departmental routine, Matty. Sure, Nick. Patsy but I and I are going to check our files for a forger who can do this kind of work. And if we find the man who forged this letter, we may find the man who murdered Bixby. Tom. Tom. What, Rita? Stop that pacing. You're giving me a headache. I can't help it. That Bixby. I could strangle him all over again. The pompous ass. Sitting there as though he were my judge. But he's dead, isn't he? Yes, and I could kill him again. And I could kill him each day forever. He'd ruin the work of five years. Yes, that's what he wanted. One word from Bixby and we would have been finished. But we're not. For five years I've been honest. For five years I built up a reputation for this moment. <laughs> they trust me now, those fools who buy letters and autographs. They believe in me. And in six months, we'll unload every fortune. We'll make a fortune. That's what I've been waiting for. You've been a good wife, Rita. You played along with me during those years when we had to be honest. And don't think it didn't hurt. Ah, but now comes the payoff. We'll make 200000 maybe three. And we can't be stopped now that Bixby is dead. We can rise to it. I'll take it. Yes? Go. Yes? This is Pryor. Yes? I want you to come over to my place for a talk. Why? I got bad news for you, Gorm. Talk straight, Pryor. When uh, Bixby got you up to his place... How did you find out about that? I was there, Gorm. You were what? Bixby had me hidden in the next room. He was going to confront us, Gorm. He had it all set up. Then, then you... That's right. I know all about it. I think you better come over to my place for a talk right away. But, but I... It'll cost you money if you want me to forge you an alibi for murder. Well, now, let's see, Nick. We've been to see Joe Dyer, Eddie Barker, Sam Browning, and Billy Webster. Yeah, not a reaction, not of any of them. Uh-uh. Leaving John Pryor, Henry Forster, and Steve Skrenner as the possible forges of the King's apology. Well, let's hope we have some luck with at least one of them. Yeah. Uh, who are we visiting now? The next man on the list. John Pryor. Uh-huh. Well, what's your attack going to be with him? Same as the others. Surprise. Sudden shock. Uh-huh. He's got a ground floor apartment in the rear. Now, that must be the door down there. Down the hall. Right. Oh, the way you not gives me the shakes, Nick. So stern and official. Which is precisely why I do it. Gives us a psychological edge. Yes? You John Pryor? Yes? I'm Nick Carter. Working on a murder case. I want to talk to you. I brought my secretary along to take notes. Now, now, wait a minute, Mr. Carter. Quit stalling, Pryor. You're in a bad jam, and you know it. I don't know anything of the kind. I... Take a look at this letter. What? Don't dummy up, Friar. This is a forged manuscript, a King's Apology, dated 1780, and it's your work. Oh, uh, no, Mr. Carter. Right, you went to the murder of Robert Bixby so tight you won't get out of it with a crowbar. You're nuts. That isn't my work. No? Any objections if I take your fingerprints? Fingerprints? You heard me. Prints were left on this letter, on the inside flap of the envelope. I want to compare them with yours. Sure, I've got no objections, Mr. Carter. Uh, just let me go into the kitchen and get the grease off my hands, huh? Okay. I'll get the equipment ready while you're gone. Now, I'll give you all the prints you want as soon as I get my hands clean. Go. 
I hear it. You've been haggling long enough. Now make up your mind fast. Do I cover for you? But he said he had your fingerprints. He's laughing. I didn't leave any prints in that letter. And you think I'm a baby? But, but... One hundred grand. That's my price. Make up your mind. No. What? I said no, Pryor. I can't trust you. But with Nick Carter so close to my tail. I just, I'm sorry, Pryor, but I... Uh, no hard feelings. We're waiting, Pryor. Make it snappy. Come on out, Pryor. You got any idea of disguising those pricks? Love it. He's been stabbed. He's dead. Nick and Patsy stare at the body of John Pryor, stretched out on the kitchen floor, a kitchen knife through his ribs. We'll see what they do in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the King's Apology, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Nick and Patsy stand over the dead body of John Pryor, sprawled on the kitchen floor of his apartment. Quickly, Nick's eyes take in the few clues before them. Come on, Patsy. we got to work fast. All right, Nick. We're going out through that kitchen window, too. Uh -huh. Only a short drop to the back alley. I'll go first. Yeah. All right. Come on. I'll catch you. All right. Oh. Now, down the alley. Nick, do you know... Whoever killed Pryor isn't more than 20 seconds ahead of us. We may have a chance of catching up with him. But who is it? I don't know. He's been hiding in the kitchen while we were there. Yeah. Briar probably went back to cook up an alibi and was killed to keep his mouth shut. Oh, Nick, this is a dead end. Well, I'll be it. That means we've got to go back to the other way. No, no, that's a dead end, too. What? I noticed it when I came through the window. Yeah, but... Wait. Huh? Here's a cellar door. And look at the handle. What? It's got blood on it. Yeah. He must have gone in here. It's awfully dark in here, Nick. I think I hear someone. Probably the killer. Let's go now. Quick. Did you hear that? Yeah. Seems to be a storage room in here. Came from inside that. He must be hiding in there. We'll have to go in after him. Yeah. Now stay with me. Be careful. It's almost pitch dark. Nick, can't you use your flashlight? No. He's got a gun. He can use the light for a target. Come on. Oh, oh dear. Someone closed the door behind us. Killer. He was waiting in back of it. Oh, God. Oh, Mount it. This drawer is fastened on the outside with an iron bar. What? Somewhere locked in? Yes. Instead of trapping the killer, he trapped us. And... Why... Why are you sniffing? Got bad news for you. He's opened a gas pipe somewhere in this room. Oh, Nick. We don't work fast. We're a couple of dead ducks. Yes, Rita. Did you get everything arranged with Pryor? Yes, Rita. With Pryor and with Nick Carter. Nick Carter? I took care of that gentleman after I took care of Pryor. What are you talking about? I trapped Nick Carter. Just about now, he should be dead. At least he can hold his breath for half an hour. Did Pryor help you? I told you I took care of Pryor, too. What do you mean? I closed his mouth for good. Tom. He's dead, Rita. You, you killed him? Yes. No. No. He isn't dead. He, he can't be dead. Rita. <laughs> no. I see. You're in love with him, aren't you? Aren't you? <laughs> what an idiot I've been. You had this all worked out with pride, didn't you? Tom, I... You'll I take every nickel I made in this deal to go off with pride, eh? That was the idea. You'd help him blackmail me for the rest of my life. And you'd be laughing at me, the two of you. Don't. Don't. <laughs> no, Rita. Don't worry. I won't kill you. Maybe it's just as well this happened. Now I've got what I want. I've got plenty of money waiting for me. And I got you forever. Come in. 
Hey, Nick, we haven't gotten anywhere in the apartment with this, but I... For the love of heaven, what happened to you two? Hello, Sergeant. Hi, Matty. Come help Patsy and me smear ointment on our faces. I repeat, what happened to you? We met the killer. Did you get him? No. He nearly got up. He did? Look, I'd better sit down. Yes, do. You see, Maddie, we were trapped in a cellar storage room. With an open gas pipe. With an open gas pipe? Yeah, an open gas pipe. The killer rent the fixture off and left the gas pouring into the room. But what did you do? Well, Nick found the pipe and lighted the gas. That's how our faces got burned. Oh. Yes. That stuff flamed out like a volcano. Luckily, there wasn't enough gas in the room to cause a real explosion. Well, I'll be darned. Then we pounded on the door and yelled until the janitor came and let us out. Uh, of course, by that time, the killer was gone. Forever, I guess. Oh, no. We're not licked yet, Patsy. Oh, that a boy, Nick. Okay, but have you got any idea? I have. We're going to catch this killer with a king's apology. You mean the forgery? Yeah. Well, what do we do? While I've been nursing my blisters, I've been doing some thinking, Patsy. Uh-huh. Pryor wasn't working on this forgery alone. Oh, you don't think so? No, I don't. Now, look, look, have a heart. I'm not caught up on this case yet. Who's Pryor? I'll brief you later, Maddie. Let me work this out with Patsy first. We haven't much time. Okay, go ahead. Now, Pryor was a forger, but he couldn't sell his forgeries himself. Uh-huh. He needed a front man, a dealer, to do that. Uh, so there's a strong chance he was killed by the dealer who was working with him. Could be. Go on. That's where our trick starts. Yeah, but what's the trick? Well... First, you go crazy. Go crazy? Yes. And Maddie and I chase you. What? We, what? But why do you chase me? Because you've got the king's apology. But I... And you're going to run with it until you run into the killer. Patsy takes the forged letter and listens carefully to her instructions, her face brightening as Nick unfolds the mechanism of the trap. We'll learn what it is in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the King's Apology, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. For an hour, Valentine Street, where most of the city's autograph dealers have their shops, has been watching a curious spectacle. A girl has walked into one shop after another, displayed a letter, screamed at the astonished proprietor, and then run out. She is followed cautiously by two men who make profound apologies for her. Finally, she enters the shop of Thomas Gall. Yes, madam. May I be of service to you? Uh, do you sell autographs? Yes, madam. I have a very fine stock for your consideration. Uh-huh. Do uh, you buy them, too? Well, madam, if it is a... Ve What's that, may I ask? It's a rare old letter. A king's apology. King George III of England. He... Where did you get that letter, madam? Oh, I, um... I found it. Where did you get the letter? Well, um, maybe it isn't legal, but I found it and finders keepers. I was outside a house on Russell Place this morning. Russell Place? Uh-huh, number 1035 Russell Place. A man came running out and he dropped this letter. He... <gasps> what is it? What? You're the man. I know you're the man. You're the man who came running out. Lisa, come quick. You're the man who ran out of the house and Bixby was murdered. You dropped this letter. I know it. Oh, 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 I oh I want to be You want to be arrested? Yes, Lisa. Get your hands off me. You're a killer. Oh, oh, I thought we were so There we are not. Not until we get through oh, this maniac. No, I'll get. Help me get her into the bank of the store. Come, oh, get her. Oh, you want to burn for murder? You're an accessory. No, I'm not. Oh, no. no. In this with me. This girl has got to be shut up for good. Come I'm on. Wait, it's too late, Carl. What? what? Tom. You left the transom over your door open. We heard everything. It's the Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad. You heard the confession, Mary? Every blessed word, Nick. I... You mind releasing I, the young lady? She's my assistant, Miss Patsy Bowen. Your assistant? That's right. She pulled his knife on every dealer in the street. Oh, what they must all think I'm crazy. Oh, no, Patsy. We explained as we followed you. Mr. Gold's confession will do the rest. But you were locked in the cellar. You, you couldn't be here. You... No, Gold, I'm not an optical illusion. I'm just the man with the bad news. Sergeant Matheson wants you for murder. Murder? Yes, murder. Yeah. I'm afraid you're invited to keep a date with the state's executioner. 
with no apologies accepted. Nick, there are a couple of things about this case I haven't figured out yet. Go ahead, Betsy. Well, first, who killed Bixby? Gall did. Okay. Then who called you from Bixby's house? Pryor. What? Why did he do that? Gall said in his confession that Pryor was in love with Rita and wanted her for himself. Uh Uh-huh. She was apparently willing to help him double-cross Gall and then turn Gall over to the police for murder. Oh, so when Pryor phoned you, he was uh, setting up the case. That's right. Mm Mm-hmm. Wanted the police to close in on Gall quickly. That would increase the pressure and make the blackmail easy. Then, after he had all Gall's money, he could turn him in and go off with Rita. Well, I see. Now, one last thing. What? Since when have you been an autograph expert? Oh, I'm not. Well, then how did you know the King's apology was a forgery the minute you looked at it? Oh, that simple. You were playing a hunch. No, I knew. Huh? It happens to be one of the odd bits of information I picked up here and there. Well, how did you know? Well, the letter was dated 1780, and the envelope bore the Royal Arms of England. Uh Uh-huh. The address on the envelope was in the same writing as the letter. Mm -hmm. Besides, the envelope matched the paper and looked just as old. Yeah, but that makes it sound genuine. Maybe so, but it proves it was a forgery. You see, Patsy, while the letter was dated 1780, envelopes were unknown before about 1830. Oh. Friar made a mistake. Well, how about that? And all the while I thought you were guessing. Nick. I bow to the master. Quite all right, Patsy. Your apology is accepted. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch thunder. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined, as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Oh, my name. It is wonderful. You're choking me. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Nick. <laughs> yeah, that's better. You look behind you. You can see all the way down to... Nick. What? That's George. All huh? alone in that car behind us. Great Scott, and he's hanging half out of the car. What's the matter with that guy? Nick, he's leading way off. Look out, Betsy. Where, where are you going? I've got to get back there before we go around the next turn. It's too late, Nick. You'll be killed. Ah! He's gone. He's thrown right out of the car. Now, the case of the Midway Murders. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's a warm summer evening at the Idle Hour Amusement Park, and business is even better than usual. Thank you. 
That's what we call the show, folks, the Beauty and the Beast. And it's starting right away. You see this lovely, delicate little lady, alone and single-handed, subdue the ferocious man-killing gorilla from the jungles of far off Borneo. It's starting right away, so get your tickets now. Bongo, the most ferocious gorilla in captivity, and Lily Latour, the little lady who alone and Nick Carter speaking. Nick, uh, this is George Haley. Hey, where in the world are you, George? I thought you were coming down to my place for dinner. Uh, I'm in a phone booth at the Idle Hour Amusement Park, and I've got to talk fast. Uh, Nick, uh, can you get out here right away? Why, yes, but what's up? Uh, I'm no detective, Nick. I've got to have help. I've been following this guy ever since I recognized him on the bus on the way to your house. But I have to... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, George. Who are you following? Joe Lester. At least that was his name when he was in Bayside Penitentiary 12 years ago. I think he's working here at the park now. He's not a customer, that's for sure. Hold on, George. You're going too fast. What's this all about? I want you to find out if he's the man I think he is and what he's doing now. It's terribly important to me, Nick. Okay, I'll get there as fast as I can. How'll I find you at the park? Uh, wait for me by the whirlwind. The what? The roller coaster. I may be late, Nick, but I'll be there. I'll be there for sure. <laughs> George out front. Oh, Nick, it's so nice and dark in the tunnel. Well, it's too dark for my mother. Oh. I like to see things. The tunnel only lasts a minute. See? We're out of it already. Well, here we go up the first incline. I'm glad we're not going to have those teenagers yelling in our ears again this <laughs> yes. I guess we have a car to ourselves this time. Well, I wish George would hurry up and get here. You know, I wonder who this Joe Lester is that he's following, Nick. Well, George mentioned Bayside Penitentiary. It used to be a guard there, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Didn't he get into some kind of trouble? Yeah, he was accused of helping some of the convicts escape. George Haley? Oh, why, that's ridiculous. I know it is, but the evidence was against him, and all the escaping convicts were killed, so they couldn't testify in his favor. Oh, watch out, Nick. Here's the big dip. Hey, let you let go of my neck. You're choking me. Oh, I love it. And look behind us. You can see all the way down to... Nick. What is it? It's George. In the car behind us. What? You're right, Patsy. He's half out of the car. He must have faded off. Nick, Nick, where are you going? I've got to get back to him before we go around that sharp chair. It's too late, Nick. You'll be killed. Oh! Oh, he's... He's gone, Nick. Down right out of the car. The valley platform. Yeah, I saw it too. It's a wonder he didn't hit somebody and kill him. That thing is a hundred foot high. Keep back, everybody, please. Let me through. Let me through here. Is there anything we can do, Nick? No, Patsy. He must have been killed instantly. It looks like every bone in his body broke. Golly. What happened here? Woody, what's the matter? Better ask Slim. The whirlwind is his concession. The guy put out of the car, Mr. Browden. He's going around a high turn. Good grief. Are you the manager of this park? I'm the owner, John Browden. Are you the police? I'm a private investigator. My name's Nick Carter. The dead man was a friend of mine. Tell well, nothing like this has ever happened before, Mr. Carter. Your friend must have been standing up in the no, car. No, he wasn't standing up. Can I talk to you and... Can I talk to the concession manager in your office? Why, certainly, of course. And you two, didn't you say you saw what happened? Yeah, I run the Beauty and Beast show right next to the whirlwind. Well, uh, Miss Latour here, we was out on the ballet platform... And you two the... come along to the office, please. All right. The park police can take care of things here until someone arrives from homicide. Homicide? Yes, Mr. Browden. I've called Sergeant Matheson. This was no accident. It was murder. Folks, this is Sergeant Matheson of Homicide. Mr. Browden, the owner of the park, Matty. Oh, uh, Mr. Browden. How do you do, Sergeant? Slim Watson, who operates the roller coaster. Hi. Miss Lillian Hello. Latour, an animal trainer in the show next door. Miss Latour. Pleased to make your acquaintance. And Woody Reeves, who operates the show in which Miss Latour appears. Howdy. Uh, hello, Reeves. Uh, first of all, Matty, I'll tell you what I know. Patsy yeah, and yeah. I were in the same string of cars as the dead man when he was thrown off the roller coaster. Yeah. George ha Haley, a friend of my father's. Were you together when it happened, Nick? No, we were trying to find George. He was following a man who came out to the park on a bus about 8 o'clock. Someone George had known when he was a guard at Bayside State Penitentiary. 
How do you know that? Well, George phoned to ask Nick for help in finding out about the man. Uh, All George knew was that he was probably a park employee. You see, Patsy and I were supposed to meet him in front of the roller coaster, so we killed time by taking a few rides. Uh Uh-huh. And then I looked back and saw George in the car behind us. The man must have been standing up, Sergeant. I tell you, we saw him, Mr. Browden, and he wasn't standing up. Okay, Nick, but uh, what makes you think it was murder? Well, Matty, the body was badly smashed up. And? But not the back of the head. And I found blood there. Well, naturally, after such a fall as that... It was dried blood, Mr. Browden, from a blow that had been struck some time before he fell out of the roller coaster. Now, wait a minute, Nick. Uh, The guy might have had some accident you didn't know about. No, Matty, that was the blow that killed him. Otherwise, it would have raised a lump the size of a hen's egg. And there was no swelling at all. What are you talking about? A medical fact, Mr. Browden. Swelling does not take place after death. Right. And he must have been riding around in that thing dead ever since he was slugged. Oh, no, he wasn't, Sarge. I collect tickets before every ride. And I'm sure I certainly wouldn't miss seeing our dead guy. Then how in, how in Sam Hill did he get in there? I have an idea, Sergeant. Yeah? At the beginning of the ride, there's a dark tunnel. If the murderer had been hiding in there with the body... Now, uh, that's impossible. Huh? Oh, there's only three inches clearance on each side of that tunnel. One man couldn't possibly hide there, let alone two of them. Yeah. Well, then somebody must have dumped him in there from someplace else uh, along the roof. Well, there he ain't that track lit up bright as day. <laughs> he sure need plenty of knives. Besides, Matty, from the time the car leaves the top of the first incline, it's going at breakneck speed. Uh, well, let's forget about how he got in the car for a minute and try to find the guy he was after. I'll bet he caught this Joe Lester. Joe Lester. Uh, you recognize the name, huh, Mr. Browden? Why, uh, No. Uh, no, there's never been any park employee named uh, 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 Joe Lester. Uh, I'll swear to that. Joe Lester. I've heard that name before. Now, look, Sarge, can you get through with Lil and me as quick as possible? That gorilla of mine has been over there for almost an hour without any water in his cage, and he just... You better stay here, Woody. Somebody else can take care of Bongo. Mr. Brown, you know there ain't nobody but Woody and me can get near him. Anybody else try to walk into that cage Joe and Bongo Lester, tear Joe him apart? Lester. Huh? Uh, but look, uh, Nick, how about it? Uh, you need these folks any longer? I just want to ask them one question. We found a ticket stub from your show in Haley's pocket, Woody. So he must have followed Lester in there. Did you happen to notice anybody come in just before Haley? I didn't even notice him. Miss Latour? I... No. No, I didn't see the guy either. Joe Lester. By golly, I've got it. You know him, Matty? I don't know him, but I remember who he is. And if you think Joe Lester murdered Haley, you're out of luck, Nick. What? What do you mean? Joe Lester's been dead for 12 years. Dead? Sure, drowned while he was trying to break out of Bayside Penitentiary. His body was swept out to sea. Bongo, move back away from that cage door, you big ape. Can't you see I'm bringing you some water? Woody, let him wait a minute. Yeah. Gotta talk to you. Shut up, Bongo. Uh, what's the matter, Lou? You killed him, didn't you, Woody? Me? Ah, you're nuts. Don't lie to me, Woody. You know I'm too crazy about you to ever tell, but but I gotta know the truth. Uh, whatever put a crazy idea like that in your head? Because you're the guy he's after. You're Joe Lester. <laughs> Baby, you're way off base. Joe Lester was drowned. They never found the body. And Joe Lester was in Bayside Pen 12 years ago. And you've done a stretch at Bayside 12 years ago. You told me so. Oh, whatever. It's so did a couple of thousand other guys. Oh, Woody, don't lie to me. I said I hadn't seen the guy before, but I did. I seen him talking to you during my act. Ah, oh, baby, you need glasses. That was Browden I was talking to. I tell you, I've seen it. It was right after Browden left you and come back here. And your face when you saw that guy. <laughs> it was like you was looking at a ghost. Ah, uh, you dreaming thing. No. No, I'm not. You're the guy he was after when you killed him. You're Joe Lester. Now, look. Didn't you hear him say that Haley followed Lester out here on a bus about 8 o'clock? What? Well, yeah, Woody, that, that's right. And I began right here doing a show every 20 minutes since noon, ain't I? Just like you have. Oh, that's right. It ain't you after all. Oh, honey, I was so scared. Yeah, I, I... Shut up, Bongo. Yeah. Hiya, Mr. Brown. Yeah, Woody, can I use your car for an hour or so? Oh, sure, Mr. Brown. Yeah, here's the keys. I drove into the city for dinner, and something went wrong with my gas line. Had to come back on the bus. Yeah. You come out on the bus tonight, Mr. Browden? Yeah. Hey, Lil, you better get ready for the show. About 8 o'clock, wasn't it, Mr. Browden? Lil, what if it was? And you was talking to Woody just before. Before what? What are you getting at, Lil? I... Nothing. Excuse me. 
Uh, she's kind of upset, Browden. You know, uh, seeing a guy fall and everything. Are you sure that's all it was? What else? Ah, keep your shirt on, Bongo. I'm coming. Yeah, go ahead and take care of the gorilla, Woody. I think I have something to take care of, too. Was Joe Lester that Haley was following? Well, Matty, you say yourself there was no real proof that Lester died in that prison break. The body was never recovered. Well, you know, Sergeant, Haley was accused of helping that engineer escape. And he must have thought that by finding Lester, he could prove his innocence. Yeah, but Lester saw Haley first and killed him to keep from being turned in. Yeah. Yeah, it figures. Yeah, but how in the world did Haley's body ever get into that roller coaster? Maybe we'll find out when we catch the killer. Well, I wired Bayside 10 for Joe Lester's description and fingerprint classifications. Good. I should be here in a couple of hours. Yeah, and once we get our hands on Lester... Mr. Carter! Nick, it's that girl from the sideshow, the gorilla trainer. She looks excited. I wonder yeah. what's up. I don't know. Carter. Mr. Carter. Yes? What is it? I I know who he is. Joe Lester? Yeah. Uh, a few minutes ago, he... Hey, hey, Nick, oh. catch her. She's fainting. I've got her. Give me a hand, buddy, will you? Wait, Great Scott. What's the matter? Look at my hand. Hey, that's blood. You're right. She's just been shot. And she's dead. As Nick gently lowers the body of Lillian Latour to the ground, a curious, excited crowd begins to gather around the murdered girl. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the Midway Murders. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the office of John Browden, the park manager, Nick and Matty have been investigating the death of Lillian Latour. Confound it, Matty. Thanks to the noise of the rides in the shooting gallery nearby, we haven't found anyone who even heard the shot. Uh, I, I still can't believe it really happened. Lil and me, we was going to be married. All right, take it easy, Woody. We'll get this Joe Lester, don't worry. And when we Why do... Why do you always come back to Joe Lester? You said yourself the man was dead. No, Mr. Browden. Sergeant Matheson said he was reported dead. But I have a hunch we'll find him very much alive. You said it, Nick. Miss Latour knew who he was. That's why he killed her. But but she couldn't have known. She'd have said something to me if she did. Why, me and Mr. Browden was talking to her not five minutes before... before it happened. Well, that's very interesting. Because Miss Latour's last words were that she had just learned who Joe Lester was. Well, it, then she must have found it out after she left us. Because there was no mention of him while we were talking, was there, Woody? Was there, Woody? Oh, oh no, no, Mr. Browden. She never even mentioned his name. I'm busy now, Woody. Now, that's what I want to talk to you about. You ain't going to be so busy from now on. What do you mean? From now on, I'll be doing half the work. Because you're going to give me a half interest in this whole park. Now, look, Woody. You've been bleeding me for three years. But this is too much. I'm letting you off easy, pal. What do you think the cops would say if I told them that George Haley... Come up to me just after you left this afternoon and ask me if you wasn't Joe Lester. That's a lie. It's the truth. Lil got wise, so you had to kill her, too. I didn't. It's a lie. I put on a nice act for the cops, didn't I? The poor, broken-hearted boyfriend. <laughs> That's me. And now you're going to pay for that act with half of this pot. I won't do it. You've bled me for the last time. I thought you might pull something like that. I'll just turn this over to the cops, too. Now, Woody, listen. You're not interested. All I want to know is, do I get half of the park? Or do I tell the cops that you're Joe Lester? Okay. You win, Woody. I'll have the papers drawn up tomorrow morning. Hey, uh, 
Carter. You got the whole roller coaster to yourself. Thanks, Lim. Now, I want you to run this car as slowly as possible through the tunnel. And when I yell, stop it. Okay. Okay, but I still don't get the idea. There ain't room for anybody to hide in that tunnel. That's the same I want to see for myself, so let's get started, huh? Okay, here you go. Chief, what's the idea? You think Slim's lying? I don't know, Patsy. But since Haley's body couldn't have been put on the roller coaster from outside, I can't see what else it could have been done but in the tunnel. Well, here it is. A slower, Slim. Right. You have a flashlight, Patsy? Uh-huh. Here. But I'll bet while we're fooling around here, Sergeant Madison has already caught Joe Lester. Could be. The description and fingerprint classifications got here from the Bayside pen. And Maddie said he was going to round up every park employee to see whether any of them resembled the description in any way. Then why in the Oh, hold it, Slim. Okay. See, Nick? It's just as Slim said. This tunnel is much too narrow for anyone to hide in. Especially if he were carrying a dead body. Patsy. Uh-huh. The walls of this tunnel are bored. Well... Look at the two boards right beside us, where I'm holding the flashlight. But, why they look as if they've been taken out and put back again. And they're going to be taken out a second time. Give me the crowbar. Yeah. Here. Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, what's that? Sounds like the gorilla. Oh. What is concession is next door to the coaster, you know. Yeah. There. Well, you didn't accomplish much by taking those boards off. Look what's on the other side. Iron bars. Yeah. That does sort of upset my theory. What? Nick, we must be right up against the gorilla's cage. Let me put these boards down. Nick, it is the gorilla. There he is on the other side of the cage. Don't worry, Patsy. He's changed, see? Must be an exercise cage. Too big for anything else. Well, Haley's body couldn't have come through there. The bars are too close together. Mm Mm-hmm. Unless... Ah, look, Patsy, this bar is loose. Oh, Nick, 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 don't take that ball out. The gorilla. He's changed 20 feet away from us, Patsy. Bar's off. I'm going in the case, Patsy. Maybe you better stay out here. That's exactly what I think. But I'm going with you just the same. All right, come on, then. Hello, Woody. Just the person I wanted to see. Hey, how did you two get in there? Come inside the cage and I'll show you. Oh, I, I, I wish he wouldn't do Move that. Move away from that door, I told you. That's better. Now, stay there. Now, what's the idea, Carter? I found out how you got George Haley's body into that roller coaster car. How what? Uh, no, you're wrong, Carter. I didn't kill him. Oh, yes, you did, Woody. When he came into your show, you lured him backstage and killed him with a blow on the head. Then when the roller coaster went through the dark tunnel, you turned out the lights in here and dumped the body into one of the cars to the same opening we just came through. Well, maybe that's the way it happened, but but it wasn't me that done it. It was Browden. He's Joe Lester. Browden? How do you know? Him and me was at Bayside Penn at the same time. Browden got away in that break and everybody thought he'd been killed. He came here, got his hands on some money, and started the spark. Go on. Well, Haley spotted him today. He asked me about him. And Browden brought him back here to talk it over. That must have been when he done it. How about Miss Latour? Lil seen Haley come in. She thought it was me he was after. And when I proved that I couldn't have been Lester, she knew Browden was. And when he learned that she knew, he had to kill her, too. Ah, Bongo, shut up. Woody, if you're a liar, I won't do you any good. Joe Lester's description and fingerprints were sent here from Bayside Penitentiary. Okay, so let him take me and Browden down to headquarters. Them fingerprints will prove he's the guy. One thing more, Woody. Why haven't you said this before? Even after you thought Browden killed your girlfriend, you kept quiet. I didn't know that he'd done it, did I? And besides, keeping quiet has paid off pretty good for me. You mean you've been blackmailing Browden? Yeah, I've been shaking him down for plenty. But I sure ain't going to go to the chair for him. No, you're not. You're going to the chair for your own crimes, not his. Huh? You've just supplied the one thing that was lacking, Woody. A motive. You killed Haley and Miss Latour because if either of them had exposed Browden, it would have put an end to your little blackmail racket. Ah, that's crazy. You can't prove nothing like that. I think I can. Miss Latour said that no one could go near Bongo but you and her. Well, what's that got to do with it? The killer had to bring Haley's body through this cage. But Bongo was chained up. Where he could reach the door and anybody who came through it. You had to drive him away yourself a minute ago to get in here. It's a sense that Miss Latour didn't kill Haley and the murder herself. So that leaves only you. Okay, smart guy. So you think Bongo would have torn anybody apart that came here near except me and Lil, huh? Well, I'm going to show you that you're right. Oh, he's up there the gorilla. Get behind me, Patsy. Yeah, Bongo. Oh. 
Even as Nick frantically pulls the trigger, he knows that revolver bullets can never stop the 500-pound gorilla charging furiously toward him and Patsy. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Midway Murders. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the gorilla's cage at the Idle Hour Amusement Park, Nick and Patsy realize that revolver bullets may slow up the attacking monster, but never stop him. Get through that hole in the cage where the bar's missing. Hurry! Gotta get fast. The gorilla's too big to squeeze through that hole. Nick, Woody's getting out of the cage door. Stay where you are, Woody. I still have a couple of bullets left. You take another step, I'm going to shoot. I'll get the park police. Right. And tell him we've got Mr. Woody Reeves where he'll be for some time to come. Behind bar. Sergeant. Yeah? I'm really glad it's over. Ever since I escaped from the penitentiary, I've been living in fear. Paying blackmail. Yeah, it must have been pretty rugged, Browden. Or maybe I'd better call you Lester, huh? After I finish my sentence, I can really be free. You've been a pretty good citizen these past 12 years, Browden. I think the pardon board may take that into consideration. Especially since it was your first offense. Well, whether they do or not, I'm glad I can clear George Haley of having had anything to do with the break. Believe me, he didn't know a thing about it. I never thought he did. But Mr. Carter... Why did you believe I was innocent of killing George after you found out that I was Joe Lester? Why, when I first mentioned that George was on Lester's trail, surprise and shock was written all over your face. But that's what I mean. I must have looked guilty. You did. And I figured you either were Lester or knew something about him. But if you'd killed Haley for that reason, you wouldn't have been surprised. Yeah. You know, there's also one thing that's bothering me, Nick. What, Patsy? How could Woody have been so sure Haley's body would be thrown out of the roller coaster so that his death would look like an accident? Woody didn't plan it that way. Huh? His only idea was to get rid of the body. Oh, by the way, Mr. Browden, you'll be glad to hear that the vet says your gorilla isn't seriously wounded. That's good. Now, I only fired at his legs, hoping to stop him. I didn't want to kill him. Yeah, but there won't be any more Beauty and the Beast show without Miss Latour to appear in the cage with him. Oh, I don't know. Maybe Patsy would like the job. What? Well, you've already made one appearance in this cage. Uh, uh, I've made two appearances, Nick. My first and my last. Believe me. Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this same time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons and directed by Charles Skank. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. <laughs> this is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. <laughs> Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Patsy, I'm going to make a date for you. Well, now, a date with whom, Nick? The young boy you met this morning. Oh, but Why? I want you to find out why he wouldn't take a tip for delivering a letter to the wrong house. That's why. And now, the case of the professional beggar. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. 
At 9.15 this morning, Patsy Bowen rushes down the street toward the old brownstone mansion on the corner of 5th and 4th. She clutches her hat and purse and starts up the front steps, blindly colliding with a young boy who has just come running from the opposite direction. Oh, sorry. Sorry, lady. Are you going in this house? Yes, I work here. Here, lady. Take this, will you? But I... This letter. Here, take it. But what in the world? Will you take this letter, please? It's for this house. Sure, but what's your hurry? I, I, I gotta be going. Hey, wait a minute. I'll give you a tip. I'm not waiting for anything. Oh, for the love of... Hey, this isn't for us. This letter's for the house next door. Sonny! Hey! Hey! Oh, well. <laughs> At least it gives me an excuse for being late. Oh, good morning, Patsy. Sorry I'm late, Nick. I'd have been almost on time if I hadn't had a collision when I was coming in. A collision? Yeah, I ran smack into a boy on the steps. He was trying to deliver this letter, but it's not for us. Well, who is it for? It belongs next door. It's addressed to Walter Van Dyke. Golly, that boy was scared. He just shoved the letter into my hand and tore off as if the wolves were after him. Well, wolves are going to be after us if we don't settle down to work. Hmm. Suppose you take that letter next door and then get busy with your typewriter, huh? You know, Nick, he was such a nice-looking boy. I'd really like to know what frightened him. Comparison of profile photographs of the missing man and the person who claims to be him reveals the claimant as an imposter. Mm-hmm. Note especially the upper helix to the right ear. I am and... Nick. Oh, I am Patrick. Oh, oh. Sergeant, am I glad to see you. Nick's getting to be the worst slave driver. Glad to see you, Matty, but we're awfully busy. Well, that's okay. You folks go ahead and work. I, I just like to sit here a while. What? Well, what's the matter, Sergeant? Oh, I just came from a stinker of a case, Patsy, and it's depressed me. You go ahead with your dictation, Nick. Why, Matty, I've never seen you down in the mouth before. Or is this an act? What? Why, Nick, what a thing to say. Well, maybe, but I know, Matty. He's used tricks to get me interested in cases before. No, uh, not this time, Nick. Look, Nick, we can't let an old friend down. We've got to cheer him up. No, no, honestly, Patsy, I, I'd rather not talk. Sergeant Matheson, now you tell Papa Nick your troubles. <laughs> Go ahead, Matty. I'll listen. Well, you knew Billy Davis, the assistant DA? Actually, nice boy. Oh, one of the best. He was murdered this morning. Oh, what? No. Yeah, at 9 o'clock this morning. How? He was walking down Holland Street. A black sedan drove by and he got 13 machine gun slugs through him. Oh, gee, that's terrible. Any idea who killed him? No, it was revenge most likely, but a dozen rats hated Davis. Could be anyone. Any witnesses? Oh, a few people saw the killing from the windows, yeah, but not one of them can give us any description of anybody. Mm, what a break. There was only one other witness who could possibly identify the killer. Who was that, you know? No, we can't locate him, Nick. All we know is that it was a boy, a messenger boy. He saw the murder and scooted off in a panic. A, a messenger boy? Yeah, Patsy. He was carrying a letter. A letter? Was it in a blue envelope? Yeah. The envelope was blue. Then that's it, Nick. Now look, for the love of heaven, Nick, if you've got anything, spill it. Matty, you say the murder was at 9 o'clock? Yeah. On Holland Street. Right. Fast running would take a boy from Holland Street to this house in just about 15 minutes. Yes. And that's why he was so frightened, Nick. Hey, wait a minute. What is all this? Come on, Matty. I'll help you find who killed Davis. Good. And we'll start with a visit to Mr. Van Dyke next door. <laughs> Mr. Van Dyke. As you undoubtedly know, I'm your neighbor, Nick Carter. Of course, Mr. Carter. So nice to see you. This is my secretary, Miss Bowen. Mr. Van Dyke. And this is Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad. How are you? Well, this is quite an honor, Mr. Carter. I wondered how long I was going to live next door to a, a celebrity without getting acquainted Mr. But... Van Dyke, I, I want to ask a favor of you. Yes. Did you receive a letter this morning in a blue envelope? Yes, Mr. Carter. Your secretary delivered it to me. Well, you tell me who sent it, please. Why, I don't know. It was from a stranger. You don't know? No, uh, but it's an extremely touching letter, but I don't know the man who sent it. Well, we're trying to locate the boy who delivered it. I'm afraid I don't know him either. Well, may we see the letter? Why, yeah, yes, certainly. I have it right here. There you are. Thank uh, you. Dear Mr. Van Dyke, it's a bitter blow to my pride to be forced to make this appeal to you. I do so only because I'm connected with your family through your second cousin, Emily Gray, because I'm sadly in need of food and clothing. 
Oh, and as I stop it in the bowling alley. Sad case, isn't it? Yeah, very sad. Signed, Major Hector Dowd. Any address, Nick? Yeah, 44 Poultry Square. Hey, that's a tough neighborhood. Yes, it's quite sad, quite sad. Well, thank you, Mr. Van Dyke. You've helped a lot. I don't quite know what I've done for you, Mr. Carter, but you're more than welcome, I'm sure. Thank you. Come on, Maddie. we got work to do. Right with you. So long, Mr. Van Dyke. Bye. Goodbye. Uh, do drop in again, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Well, Maddie, there's our lead. Major Hector Dowd, 44 Poultry Square. Yep, it's a lead, all right. Suppose you get a dragnet going to pick up every crook who might possibly hate Billy Davis enough to kill him. I'll do that. In the meantime, I'll hustle down to Major Dowd and see whether I can locate the boy who delivered this letter. Right, Nick. There's a 20 to 1 chance he's your key witness. Ready, Rodney? Yes, sir. There, Mr. Hollingsworth. Colin. It is a bitter blow to my pride to be forced to make this appeal to you. Uh, Full stop. Capital. I do so only because I am connected with your family through... uh... Uh, Now, one moment, Rodney. Uh, Yes, sir. A glance in who's who to refresh my memory. H. H. Uh, Hollingsworth. Oh, yes. Uh, We will continue, Rodney. Yes. Connected with your family through your great aunt, comma, Sarah Crane, comma, Sarah. and because I... I am sadly in need of... Idiot, watch your pen, you blotted the page. Ah! Oh, please, Major. You lazy, careless, impudent... Oh. Oh. You're, you're hurting me, Major. Nothing at all, David. Write a few letters and then deliver them. You wretched boy. Do you expect me to write them myself? You know your handwriting is much more genteel than please, mine. Major. Ha! Ah. <laughs> Sorry I made the plot, Major. I'm kind of nervous. After what I saw this morning, it scared me. I... What did you see, a blithering I... ass? I saw Mr. Slade. Slade? The hoodlum who pretends to lord it over this neighborhood? A man called Gat Slade? Yes, sir. I... I saw him kill somebody. What? You what? When I was taking your letter to Mr. Van Dyke, I saw Slade drive up the street in the car and kill a man. Who is the man he killed? I I don't know. But you're sure you saw this slave kill him? Yes, Major, I'm positive. Ah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Mm, Yes. Rodney, my dear, dear boy. You know that I have only your best interest at heart, don't you? Well, I... Yes. Now, you must listen to me carefully. Yes, Major. You're in great danger, dear boy. We must protect you. Major, Now, leave everything to me, Rodney. Yours not to reason why. Yours but to do and... uh, Obey orders. Yes, ma'am. You must scuttle down to the basement of this house at once. The basement? Yes, go at once and remain in hiding there until I come for but you. Major, I don't... No arguments, my boy. Obey your commander. Now go. All right, Major. <laughs> now. Slade speaking. Aha, Mr. Slade. This is a neighbor of yours, Major Dowd. The Major, huh? I kind of thought I'd be hearing from you. I've just received a startling piece of information. The boy told you, huh? Yes, Rodney told me all. That's too bad. Too bad for you, sir. Yes. I think if you're wise, you'll come to my quarters at once. We have business to discuss. Your safety and my pocket. All right, Major, let's get the steel going. I do business wide open, understand? You know all about me, I know all about you and your phony letter racket. Ha! A kid saw me this morning. He did, sir. Where is he? In a safe place. Oh, he got him hidden, huh? Naturally, I must look out for my, for his welfare. Okay. So how much you want for him? Well, uh, come on, how much for the boy? You I ain't worried about. You're old enough to scare. You'll keep your mouth shut. Yes, yes, that's all right. But who can scare sense into a kid's head? I gotta close his mouth myself. <gasps> Mr. Slade, you... How much you want for the boy? You're asking me to deliver Rodney over to you, my own flesh and blood. Don't give me that, Major. You got the kid out of an orphan asylum. He's no kin to you. Oh, but even so, Slade... How much? I couldn't possibly... Now, look, if... 
Hey, hey, maybe that's the kid now. I'll wait in the bedroom. When you figure out your price, send them in to me. I am. Uh, just one moment. Major Dowd? Why, uh... My uh, name is Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Mind if I come in? Why, no, not at all. Thank you. Dowd, I need your help. My help, Mr. Carter? Yes. I want to know who delivers your letters. I don't think I understand, sir. Huh? Look, Dowd. I know you're a professional beggar and that your specialty is letters supposedly sent by a poor but worthy gentleman, usually written to rich but not overly intelligent suckers. How dare you, sir? You send those letters by messenger to avoid arrest for illegal use of the mails. Your messenger is a young boy who... Oh, I see. He lives here with you. That's preposterous, sir. I live alone. Oh? Do you make model airplanes, Major? Do you wear a junior-sized windbreaker, sneakers, and a baseball cap? Well, I... I... Major Dowd, I want that boy. Mr. Carter, I don't... He's the sole and vital witness in a murder case. We need his evidence. More important than that, I think, his life's in danger. I don't know what you mean, sir. This is what I mean. This boy saw the man who killed Billy Davis. It's very likely the killer saw him. And any rat who would cut down an assistant DA with a machine gun wouldn't hesitate to murder a boy. Mr. Carter, you must... Where is he? I can't tell you. You mean you won't? Well, I don't know. You're lying, Dowd. Mr. Carter, you're you... are scared and you're lying. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. Eh? It's just possible that someone got here before I did. I think I'll find... Mr. Out. Carter! Come out of there, you. Oh, I see I was mistaken. The way your eyes kept watching this bedroom door, I thought there might be someone in here. Oh, I see. The only thing worrying you was this money on the bed, huh? <coughs> money? You usually leave a thousand dollars lying around like this? Why, well, yeah, I... Now, let's get back to business, Dowd. Where's the boy? Mr. Carter, I'll trouble you to hand that money over to me and get out of here. I know nothing about this boy you speak of. Nothing, sir. And I know you're lying. Your touching story of his danger is most pathetic. I'm afraid I'm in no position to prevent the death of a boy I know nothing about. Nick turns and leaves the apartment. Major Dowd watches him with quick, cunning eyes. One thousand dollars firmly grasped in his hand. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Professional Beggar. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Outside the tenement in which Major Dowd lives, Nick sprints across the street to a candy store, dashes into a telephone booth, and hastily dials a number, his eyes watching the tenement house entrance through the window. Nick Carter? Hello. Hello, Nick Carter's office. Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, any luck? Not yet. Now, look, Patsy, I want you to come down to Poultry Square right away. Of course, Nick. What's up? Major Dowd's got that boy hidden somewhere down here. I've got to stick to this place until I locate him. And since you're the only one who's seen the boy, I'll need you to identify him for me. Major's still inside. How about the boy? No boy of any description has been through that door since I've been here. You sure the boy lives with him? Positive. Now, we better work fast, Patsy. Yeah. Dowd's been warned. Think he's trying to use the boy for his own advantage. Well, like blackmail, for instance? Exactly. So he's got to be located at once. Do you have a plan? Yeah. I'm going to phone Major Dowd and get him out of the house. Then you and I go in and look for the boy. Well... If he's in there, we'll take him with us. If he isn't, well, we'll wait for him. All right. There's a phone in the candy store here. I'll call him from there. You keep an eye on the door. Yeah. This is Major Dowd speaking. Uh, Major Dowd, this is Walter Van Dyke. Walter Van... Oh, yes. Honored that you should call, sir. I was impressed by your letter, Major. I should hate to think that a relation of Cousin Emily was in need. Well, that's very kind of you, sir. Can you come to my house immediately? 
I have a check for you. Why, Mr. Van Dyke, this is too kind, too kind, sir. I should be delighted to renew my acquaintance with dear Emily's favorite cousin. But it would be difficult for me to come immediately. I have some business at hand. Well, it's a rather large check, Major, and I'm leaving town within the hour. I want to make sure you have no trouble cashing it. Why, this is most generous, sir, most generous. Yes, my business can wait an hour or so. I shall call on you immediately. <laughs> No sign of the Major yet, Nick. Give him time. Give him time, Patsy. It's only a few minutes since I called. Okay, but I wonder what's keeping him. Offhand, I'd say he was putting on his best clothes for the big touch. Nick, look, that big car's going to park right in front of the door. Yeah, it's cutting off our line of sight. Oh, we'll have to move. Nick, look who's getting out. Scott, it's Walter Van Dyke. And he's going into the house. Going to see Dowd, confound it. Oh, he'll blow your plan higher than a kite. Yes, I'm afraid you're right, Patsy. Well, all we can do now is sit tight and see what happens. <laughs> ah, let me see. Spat, Buddha, stick, all in order. This confounded boy might have polished me boots better, but they'll do. Ah. Well, I should have a flower for my buttonhole. Hey, Joe, now who could that be? Surely not Carter. I'm positive I'd put him off the stage. Coming! Coming! Uh, Major Hector Dowd. I am Major Dowd, sir, but I'm afraid you have the advantage of me. I received your letter this morning. I'm Walter Van Dyke. <laughs> Walter that was Van. the most touching letter you sent me. It bothered me all day. Oh, I decided to come down to see you. But, Mr. Van Dyke, there was no need to make the trip. When I spoke to you on the phone less than a quarter of an hour ago, I'd say... You spoke to me on the phone? (laughs) You called me, didn't you? I never called you, Major Dowd. You never... Well, no. I say, I'm afraid I've been duped. Will you excuse me, Mr. Van Dyke? But, Major Dowd... Some other time, sir, I beg you, some other time... I've just had some shocking information. I must leave at once, Mr. Van Dyke. At once. It's Mr. Van Dyke's coming out of the house. And Dowd's right behind him. Oh, he's on to your trick. Oh, naturally. But, but the Major's not getting into the car with Van Dyke. Uh, he looks worried. And he's moving fast. That could mean trouble for the boy. Oh. What are we going to do? I think I'd better follow the Major. Well, what about me? You go up to the Major's apartment, second floor rear. See whether you can find the boy. I'll do my best, Nick. Either you'll find him or Major Dowd will lead me to him. Mm. We've got to be quick about it, Patsy. In another hour, the boy may be dead. delivering more letters. I better go. <laughs> Quite a surprise, huh? Oh, yes. I'm looking for the major and I find you. You're Patsy Bowen, huh? Why, Don't I... move, sister. Well, you're gas late. I know you. I've you... been hanging around a back alley waiting for the kid to show up. Then I decided to come upstairs. Do you mean the, the boy who... Saw me knock off Davis. Yeah. Oh. You know, one trouble with a killing is you're never finished. First, I got to take care of the kid. Now, you. But I... Your Carter's girl, see? That means you're trouble to me. But, Mr. Slade... Did the major squeal of Carter? Why, I... I I think you... Sister, I think you better take a walk with me. But I... Yeah, there's a nice, quiet basement in this building. You and me will go down and have a talk. Between us, we'll figure out how I'm going to get rid of the major, the boy, and you. His heavy hand fastened on Patsy's arm like a vice. Gas Slade leads the girl down toward the cellar where, unknown to him, Romney is hiding. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Professional Beggar. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Five minutes after Major Dowd leaves his apartment... He arrives in front of a tenement door across Poultry Square and knocks energetically. Mr. Slade, Mr. Slade, try and open up. 
This is Major Dowd. There's been an unexpected crisis, sir. A well-known detective has just entered the scene. If we're to complete our business, it must be done at once. Major Dowd. Who's that? The well-known detective who has just entered the scene. The Carter. Where's the boy, Dowd? I told you. You were I calling did. to Slade. That wouldn't be gas blade, would it? Why, I... He left that thousand dollars for you, didn't he? You were going to sell him the witness. Sir, I protest these unwarranted accusations. Where's the boy? I don't know what you're referring to. I think you're going to know very soon, Major. Let's go back to your apartment and see whether we can refresh your memory. Nice and cozy, Miss Bowen. <laughs> we marched down into the basement, and who do we run smack into but little Rodney? Now look, Mister Slade. So we got my problem all solved, huh? You you haven't got the major. No. That old gimster will keep. He's too scared to do any talking. Well, he won't stay scared long. I'll get him before he gets his nerve back. After I've taken care of you. But can't okay, we? Okay, let's get it over with. Oh, please, Mister Slade. Please don't kill us, Mister Slade. Now turn around. Look, Mister Slade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. If I ever get you ten, it's the major looking for Rodney. Yeah, this is my lucky day. Now I get all three of you. Come right in, Major. Slade! I found your little friend Rodney, Major. Now the we can Carter, get... Slade, here! The Carter! Oh, that's me! Stop stealing oh. gas. You just caught a slug in your hand. Oh, Major, you... did find me. Yes, Betsy, thanks to your cleverness. Nick, this is Rodney. Oh, are you, Mr. Carter? Well, hello, Rodney. You certainly gave us a lot of trouble today. I'm, I'm sorry. Sir. All we wanted to do was tip you for delivering the wrong letter to the right address. It was a lucky break for you, but a bad one for our friend Slade, as he'll soon find out. <laughs> Nick, it turned out to be a nice day after all. Uh -huh. <laughs> Your blue's all gone now, Sergeant. I uh, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. We got gas slate on a murder rap. We got down on a charge of fraud, and we also got the kid away from him. <laughs> yes, Matty. He'll go into the downtown boys' club, and he'll be all right there. Yeah, he sure will. Hey, but look, Nick, you said Dad refused to tell you where he had Rodney hidden. That's right. All right, then how in blazes did you trail Patsy right to the basement? Why, he followed the trail I left for him. Yeah. The trail of what? Trail of lipstick, Matty. Now, wait a minute. What are you giving me? It's a fact, I... Sergeant. When Gaslade said he was going to take me down to the cellar with him, I got my lipstick out of my bag. Yeah? And whenever I could, I made a mark on the wall with it. Well, now, uh, how come Slade let you do that? Oh, oh he didn't. What? I refused to go along with him willingly, so he had to drag me. Uh -huh. And I kept struggling and swinging my arms around. And making a mark on the wall or the banister with each swing, eh, Betsy? That's it, Nick. But, Nick, uh, how did you know it was Patsy's lipstick? And how did you know it was a trail you were supposed to follow? Well, Matty, I'll tell you. The first mark was in the apartment living room just inside the door. Mm -hmm. And I knew I hadn't seen it when I was there a short time before. So? It seemed logical to think it meant something. So, I followed it. And it did. <laughs> Patsy, I sure am proud of you. That's what I call fast thinking. <laughs> oh, why? Right. Thank you, Sergeant. <laughs> yes, Matty, I just followed the line of red lipstick and caught up with a killer. And while Slade follows a line that leads to the electric chair, he can remember that red stands for danger. <laughs> Nick, what sort of adventure does new post-war old Dutch cleanser have for us next week? Well, Mike, it started when a man was murdered back in the year 1815. And it ended when his great-great-granddaughter was killed in the same room with every door and window locked on the inside. Of course, we had plenty of clues, but they all seemed to prove that the murderer was an Indian chief. Oh, an Indian chief, huh? Uh-huh, but it made things a little difficult, Mike, because the chief had been dead a hundred and fifty years. Uh... Look, I'll wait and listen. <laughs> but what do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Red Arrow. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. 
Today's script was written by Alfred Vester. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcast. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined. As new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. She said she locked all the doors and windows, but don't you think we ought to check them, just in case? You're right, Patsy. I'm going to check them right now. Good. Of course, I don't really believe this Indian legend. Oh, oh. Hey, somebody screamed. Do you Come suppose... on, Patsy, hurry. Yeah. Oh, Lock, confound it. Well... <gasps> oh, Nick, look. Yes. We're too late. She... She's dead. Yes, Patsy. With a red arrow in her heart. Now, The Case of the Red Arrow. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As Miss Harriet Hartwell removes the hairpin from her iron gray hair before going to bed, it's a stern, determined face that looks back at her from the mirror. The face of a woman not easily frightened, even by a sound heard often during the past few weeks in the historic old Hartwell mansion. Oh, for heaven's sake, not again. Where's that gun? Abby! Abby, what is it? Oh, I saw it again, Harriet. I was letting the dog out, and there it was. Oh, sit down, sit down. I tell you, I saw him with the feathers in his hair and the bow and arrow. Oh, you saw nothing of the kind. Now, stop that noise. You too, Hannibal. You hear me, sir? What's the matter, Aunt Harriet? Is it the ghost again? Oh, yes. Abby says she saw him again. I did. Here, Gerald, take the gun and look around. Okay, I'm sorry. I heard the screaming. He's come again, ain't he? Never mind, Lisa. Go back to bed. I told you not to plow up that grave. He'll keep coming back until one Go night. Go back to bed, Lisa. Unless you want me to look for a new housekeeper in the morning. I'm going. But remember... I warned you. <laughs> now, Abby, you stop that blubbering right now. There's no one in the back of the house, Aunt Harriet. Of course not. There never is. Oh, Harriet, Harriet, please. Let's get out before it's too late. What? Let a dead Indian run me out of my own house? I should say not. Perhaps you only imagined it. I did not. I tell you, I saw him. Oh, Harriet, listen to me. You can't fight a ghost. Oh, can't I, huh? Well, I'm going to make this particular ghost wish he'd never been born. Of course, you know, Miss Hartwell, chasing ghosts isn't exactly my line. Yeah, and it maybe would be interesting for a change. Well, maybe you have something there, Patsy. Tell me about the ghost anyway, Miss Hartwell. Well, the old Hartwell place is about 50 miles up the river. I see. And when my great-great-grandfather, General Absalom Hartwell, built it back in 1815, the Indians around that section were pretty riled about it. Why? Well, because they had a burial ground on the property and they considered it sacred soil. I see. Now, among the graves was that of Red Arrow, one of their greatest chiefs. Uh-huh. And the Indians warned that his spirit would come back to avenge the insult. And did it? Well, something did. Because one morning, the general was found dead in his bedroom with a red arrow in his heart. Golly. And I suppose the ghost has been appearing ever since? Well, no. Not until I moved in three months ago. Oh? You see, for the past 30 years, no one has lived in the house but Lisa Mabry, the caretaker. Yeah. Now she's my housekeeper. Yeah, but I wonder why the big chief is on the warpath again after all these years. Well, according to Lisa, when I put in my rose garden, I accidentally had his grave plowed up. Did you ever see the ghost yourself, Miss Hartwell? Well, yes, one time. 
But when I threw a brass inkwell at him, he ran into my bedroom and disappeared. Well, what happened then? Well, I went right in after him, but there was nobody there, and all the doors and windows were locked. But both hmm. your housekeeper, Miss Abby, have seen it several times. Is that right? Yes, we've all seen it, uh, except Gerald. Gerald, that's uh, the nephew who was visiting you last night. Yes, hmm. he usually comes out for weekends. That's Gerald right. is the only close relative I have, and... He knows he'll get my money someday, so he tries to keep on the good side of me. Well, Miss Abby's a relative, too, isn't she? Oh, she's a second cousin twice removed, oh. but both she and Gerald know I'm not leaving her much. Miss Hartwell, what do you think a private investigator can do against a ghost? Ghost, my foot. Someone's deliberately trying to frighten me, and I want to know who it is and why they're doing it. Well, I'll tell you what. Patsy and I'll drive up there tonight stay a few days. Good. But please... Don't tell the others who I am. Mm, whatever you say, Mr. Carter. From now on, it's uh, Professor Carter, Miss Hartwell. I'm a scholar who's interested in psychic manifestations, okay? Uh, very well, uh, Professor Carter. Oh, gee, this is going to be interesting. Yes, Betsy, but not only for us. With a little luck, I think we can make it plenty interesting for Mr. Ghost. <laughs> Definitely an aura about this house, conducive to psychic phenomena. Wouldn't you say so, Miss Bowen? Absolutely, Professor. Well, uh, it's 11 o'clock. I think I'll turn in. Yes, it's time we all went to bed. Oh, uh, did you take the dog out, Abby? Oh, yes. Hannibal and I had a lovely walk in the garden. Did Lisa show you your room, Miss Bowen? Uh, yes, thank you. At the head of the stairs. Oh, uh, your room is on the ground floor, Professor Carter. I thought you'd prefer that. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you. Did I tell you that the ghost has never been seen upstairs? Why, no. How very interesting. Mm. Yes, that's why nobody but Aunt Harriet will sleep down here. Well, not all. Oh, wait a minute, Gerald. Hmm? I'm going up, too. I don't like to walk through the hall alone. Not after last night. Oh, Mr. Nesbitt. Yes, sir. You say that every time the ghost has appeared, you made an immediate search and found all the doors and windows locked on the inside. Yes, every time. I happened to be here on each case. Oh, imagine what would have happened if we'd been alone. That's what I was thinking. Oh. Well, good night. Good night. And, uh, good luck with your ghost case. Uh, good night, Professor. Uh, good night, Miss Bowen. Good, good night, night, Miss Abby. Miss well, well, I think I'll retire, too. Is there anything you need, Mr. Car uh, Professor Carter? No, thank you, Miss Hartwell. Patsy and I'll sit here for a while and watch for our friend, the Redskin. Well, I just hope you catch him. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Well, Professor, what do you think? Oh, it's hard to tell, Professor. But the fact that the ghost always appears on this floor, and everybody but Miss Harriet sleeps upstairs is a help. Yes, in this room you can keep an eye on the front stairway. And there aren't any back stairs. That's what I mean. They're all panned in. Even Miss Harriet herself. Hmm? There's only one door to her room, and I can see that from here. Oh, what do you think of her, Nick? Miss Harriet? Oh, she's a great old girl. <laughs> I'd hate to be that ghost when she catches it. <laughs> That's the way I feel. Well, oh, Lisa, I uh, didn't see you come in. No, you and the professor were talking. Will you be wanting anything else before I go up to bed? No, thank you, Lisa. Did you lock up? Yes, sir. I tested every door and window. Not that it will do any good against him. You've lived here a long time, haven't you? Thirty years. Most of it all alone in this house, just like it was my own. And there was not never no trouble with him till she moved in. You mean Miss Harriet? I do. Moving the furniture around. Things that ain't been changed in a hundred years. Plowing up the burial ground. Bossing everybody like as if she was a queen. Well, if you feel that way, why don't you quit? Me leave this house? No, sorry. I got more right here than she has. And I'll be here after she is gone. What makes you think Miss Harriet will go, Lisa? She'll go. Chief Red Arrow will take care of that. You mean the way he took care of old General Hartwell? That ain't for me to say. I'm going up now. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, he's a pleasant person to have around. Yeah. Wonder how far she'd go to get Miss Harriet out of here. That's what I was thinking. You know, Patsy, this place must be worth a lot of money. Yeah. A collection of Indian relics alone are the finest I ever saw. And did you see those things upstairs? Helmets, suits of armor, crossbows, antique guns. Oh, you mean the European collection? Uh-huh. Yeah, Miss Harriet said they belonged to her grandfather. 
Oh, set up a museum, Peter. I've uh, been thinking something, Nick, not to change the subject. What? Lisa said she locked all the doors and windows. Oh, don't but... worry. I'm going to check them myself. <laughs> Miss Harriet, come on, Harriet. Yeah. Miss Harriet, Miss Harriet, what's the matter? Oh, Nick, she doesn't answer. Did you scream, Miss Bowen? No, it was your Aunt Harriet. Well, maybe she fainted. Miss Harriet isn't the fainting type. Oh, wasn't that Harriet Professor Carter? Yes, it was, Miss Abby. Oh. I found that the door's locked. Stand back, Betsy. I'll have yeah. to break it in. Don't you dare. I won't let you. You haven't anything to say about it, Lisa. No, no. Get her away from there. Stop that. Get her off my back, Miss Bowen. Stop that. Yes, Patsy. With a red arrow to her heart. A red arrow, symbol of the long-dead Indian chief, protrudes from the chest of the woman who dug up his grave. A woman who was alone in a room with every door and window shut. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Red Arrow. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Only a moment has passed since Nick broke into the locked bedroom to find Miss Harriet lying on the floor with a red arrow in her heart. There's only one door to this room, and the killer didn't come in or leave that way. I've been watching that. How about the windows, Nick? This one's locked on the inside. So this one, Nick. And the killer must still be in the room. What's this door? That's a closet. But if he's hiding there, he's... No, nothing here but a few dresses. I tell you, it was Chief Red Arrow. He don't need no doors, no windows. He walks through the walls. If you want to believe that, Lisa, go ahead. But I don't take any stock in ghosts. Not yet, anyway. Really, Professor Carter, that's an odd remark for a man who says he's interested in psychic phenomena. I'm a private investigator, Nesbitt. <gasps> a, a detective? That's right, Miss Abby. Nothing must be touched until the police arrive. Will you phone them, Patsy? Of course, Nick. Oh, I knew something awful would happen. I warned her. I begged her to leave this house. Well, you should have known those were the wrong tactics to use on Aunt Harriet, Miss Abby. Oh. She hadn't ought to have come here in the first place, changing things around, plowing up graves. No ghost did this, Lisa. And no human being could have gone out and locked the windows after him on the inside. So it's someone who's in this house right now. Why, you don't mean one of us. That's exactly what I mean, Nesbitt. And I'm making it my business to find out which one of you it is. Do you expect to find a secret panel in the wall, Miss Carter? Could be, Sheriff. They all sound pretty solid. Oh, but, Nick, secret panels. You don't find those things in real life. Well, not nowadays, Miss Bowen, but this house is 133 years old. The sheriff's right, Patsy. But there doesn't seem to be any panel in these walls. You know, Miss Carter, maybe what we ought to look for first is uh, motive. Yeah. Well, first there's Lisa. She certainly resented Miss Harriet's being here. They all had motives, Patsy. Except Miss Abby. Even she might have hated Miss Harriet. Hmm? Couldn't have been too easy living here as a poor relation. No, but she could always leave if she wanted to. Yeah, how about money? Miss Harriet was rich, and if Miss Abby thought she'd be the heir... No, Sheriff. Miss Abby knew that practically all the money goes to the nephew, Gerald Nesbitt. Nesbitt, huh? Yes. Uh-huh. And Gerald Nesbitt is the only person in the house who never saw the ghost, even though he says he just happened to be here every time it showed up. That does look suspicious. Yeah. But just now, I'm interested in this arrow... Yeah, yeah, it looks, uh, looks like a homemade job. No stone arrowhead tied into a new shaft. Taped on, Sheriff. And very neatly, too. I've seen that sort of tape before, Nick. Pressmakers use it. You can get it at any dime store. I know, Patsy, but it's the way the tape is wound down that interests me. What? Huh? Hmm? A very distinctive design. Yes? Oh, Mr. Carter. Yes, Miss Abby. I, uh, left my glasses in here. Oh, there they are, Miss Abby. On the table. Oh, thank you. Mr. Carter, you don't really think that one of us... I'm afraid I do, Miss Abby. Oh, but we were all upstairs. Mr. Carter was trying to find a secret passageway in the walls, but uh, didn't get nowhere. Oh, I'm sure there couldn't be anything like that. <gasps> Miss Abby, what's the matter? Oh, oh there he is again. <laughs> oh. oh. Good grief, Carter. She's fainted. 
Here, Miss Abby. Mm. Drink this. Oh, thank you. I... Did I think? You said you saw something. Oh, oh yes. See Red Arrow's ghost? Where? At the window? No, no, no. In the closet. The closet, huh? Yes. Yes, the dresses moved as if someone were hiding there. And then... Then I saw a hand. No, oh, you just imagined it. There ain't nobody in here. No, no, no. I saw it. Maybe this is what we're looking for, Sheriff. Sure. What do you mean, Nick? The walls in the room were solid, but... Hey, that sounds hollow. There's some clothes hooks on the back of the closet wall. Maybe if we pull one of them. Well, not this one either. Ah! By golly, run! A hidden stairway going upstairs. So that's how the killer got in and out. Let's see where it goes up to. Oh, yeah. These stairs are narrow, aren't they? Say, what's that, uh, what's that laying there on the step? A blanket. And an Indian headdress with feathers. The ghost costume. Right, Patsy, let's go on up. Yeah. No wonder we didn't see anybody using the front stairs. There's another door at the top. Yeah. So where's the leader? Apparently we're in another closet. Here, let me push these clothes out of the way and we'll go into the room. Look, these are men's clothes. So what's the well, well, where did you people come from? Well, you ought to know, sonny boy. What do you mean? Well, you come wait up here. Wait, wait. Nesbitt, you were the first one to come upstairs just before the murder. Did you come directly to this room? Yes. Why? Did anybody else come through here? No, of course not. So, that does it, young fella. You're under arrest for the murder of your aunt. Come back out here this morning, Nick. I want to take a look at the outside of the house, Sheriff. Yes. Now, these are the windows to Miss Harriet's room. Yes, who was? Letha's room is on the other side of the house, the back. Miss Abby's windows are directly above here. And that's Nesbitt's room, above and to the right. Well, what difference does it make? We know he did it, and we got him safe in the county jail. Yeah, it won't hurt him to stay there for a day or two. It'll throw the real killer off the Darn it, Nick. Nesbitt's the killer. Those hidden stairs were the only way into Miss Harry's room. Yeah, that's right. And nobody but Nesbitt could have used them at that time. He admitted it. Right again. So the arrow must have been shot from outside the house. Through those locked windows? Not necessarily. Here. Look at this tree, Sheriff. Yeah, yeah. It's right in front of Miss Harriet's window. Not six feet away from them. Well, if you think one of the women climbed down that tree from upstairs, you're crazy. That isn't what I'm driving at. Here. Take a look at these marks on the inside of the place where it forked. About five feet from the ground. Yeah. That's funny. The tree forks three ways. And something's been pressed into the bark inside each fork. Yeah. Something's been wedged firmly between those three forks. And recently. Yeah. Well, you can tell that those marks are new. Chad, did you ever see a crossbow? <laughs> crossbow? What's that? A medieval weapon with a stock like a shotgun and a bow mounted crosswise on the front end. Oh, sure, yeah. More powerful than an ordinary bow. And it can be aimed more accurately. Well, yeah, there's one in the collection upstairs. After it's cocked, you pull the trigger to shoot the air. That's the weapon I mean. Oh, then you think that the crossbow was wedged in the fork of this tree pointing into Miss Harriet's tree? I wouldn't be surprised. Could easily be pulled loose from the tree fork. And hauled into an upstairs window with a strong cord. Uh, and a cord around the trigger could pull the trigger by remote control. Well, maybe so, but still couldn't shoot through a closed and locked window without breaking it. You can't get away from that, Nick. Maybe not, Sheriff, but I'm doing my best. What are you two fooling around out here for? Suppose I ask you the same question, Lisa. Isn't it time you were getting dinner? I'm doing the washing. Miss Abby always tends to the cooking on wash day. I see. That girl you brung with you is helping her, if you're interested. Yes, uh, looking for something, Lisa? I'm looking for my clothes prop, that's what. Somebody moved it. Now, wait a minute. Up clothes prop. Clothes prop. That's a pole about seven feet long, isn't it? Well, yeah. It's used to prop up the clothesline and hold the clothes off the ground. Here it is. Now, how in the name of common sense did it get around here in the tall grass? Yeah, let me see that. If 
I catch the one that threw it out here? Never mind, Lisa. I'll catch that person for you. Come on, Sheriff. I've got the answer now. Another big knife, Miss Abby. I'll help you shred that cabbage. Oh, I'm almost through, Miss Bowen. But if you'd like to take a look at the sink, I better get a long spoon to start with. There's one in the drawer of the cabinet over there. Thanks. This one that's been mended? Yes. The handle came loose and I put some tape around it. <laughs> I'm very good at fixing things. What? Well, that's the same kind of tape that was used to make the arrow that... What did you say? Well, the way this tape is wound around the spoon handle, that complicated way, that's the same as what was on that arrow. I uh, uh, wish you hadn't noticed that, Miss Bowen. Was you? You, Miss Abby. Yes, Miss Bowen. But, it was I. But you had no reason to kill her. No reason. How would you like to be a poor relation? Always taking orders, watching her by the best of everything, and having to get along with nothing yourself. I made up my mind that I was going to have nice things, too. Well, you killed her for the money? But surely you know that practically everything goes to Gerald. <laughs> Not if he's convicted of killing her, it doesn't. What? Well, the law doesn't let a murderer profit by his crime. And I'm the only other relative Harriet had. I'll get it all. Maybe you would have, but now... Well, you won't tell on me, Miss Bowen. Well, you won't ever tell. Miss Abby, put down that knife. Mm -hmm. but, no, Miss mm -hmm. Abby, please, Trapped in a corner of the old-fashioned kitchen, Patsy has no chance to get past Miss Abby as the old lady advances with a heavy knife in her hand. We'll see what happens in just a moment. And now, the conclusion of The Case of the Red Arrow. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the kitchen of the historic Hartwell Mansion, Patsy is alone with a murderess. A murderess with a heavy knife in her hand who advances slowly as she says, You won't tell on me, Miss Bowen. What? You won't ever tell. Abby, put down that knife. Yeah. No, Miss Abby, please. No! Abby, if you don't mind. No, 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 I'll kill you, too. I'll kill you. All right, Miss no, Abby. No, no, Be a good girl. Go Might hurt yourself, Miss Carter. Pull away, like that. All right, I've got the knife, Sheriff. Hold on to Miss Abby. Hey, you're a world. Nick, she did it. She killed Miss Harriet. I know, Patsy. I know. Uh, the Sheriff and I were just coming in to rest her. And she wanted Gerald to be blamed. That's why the ghost never appeared unless he was here. Oh, no, it was you who played it around, dressed up like an old chief red arrow, was it, Miss Abby? Very well, I'll admit it. Yes. Uh, got the idea when Lisa warned Harriet. If the chief ghost would come back for revenge. And when I discovered that secret stairway, I knew just how it could be done. Yes. <laughs> that stairway to Gerald's room made it appear that he was the only person who could have shot Miss Harriet from inside the house. When actually, you shot her from outside the window. But, oh, Nick, how could you do that? A crossbow, Patsy. What? Wedged in the fork of a tree outside the window. Fired by pulling a string tried to the trigger. Then quickly pulled up into Miss Abby's own room with a cord tied around the stock. But I don't see how, how, how in the world... The arrow was aimed at the center of Miss Harriet's window. When Miss Harriet opened the window for the night, the light inside the room threw her shadow on the tree trunk outside. Oh. And that's when Miss Abby pulled the string. What a setup. Hey, what if we hadn't found that secret stairway, though? Then there wouldn't have been no evidence against Joe. You almost didn't find it, you idiot. What? Even after I put the blanket and headdress on the stairs for you to discover. So I had to pretend I saw something there. So you look closer. Well, Miss Abby, I got a nice cell waiting for you down in my jail. Oh. Awful <laughs> sorry there ain't no secret panel for you to monkey with. But I guess you'll make out somehow. <laughs> Nick, 
Pete, I still don't see how Miss Abby managed to close that window after shooting Miss Harriet with that arrow. It was easy, Patsy. What? She merely leaned out of her own window and pushed it shut with a clothes prop. A clothes prop? Yeah, she took it upstairs early in the evening. And when she was finished with it, she threw it out into the yard. But Nick, Miss Harriet's window was locked. Yeah, but you remember when we broke into the room just after Miss Harriet was killed? It was Miss Abby who rushed to the window to see whether it was locked. What? You mean she locked it then? She did. Well, I'll be darned. And right in front of us. Oh, it was a clever scheme, all right. Oh, but why were you so sure that Gerald hadn't come down that hidden stairway and murdered his aunt? Because I knew Miss Abby was lying when she pretended to see someone in the closet. How did you know? Because if anyone had come into the closet from the hidden stairway, the secret door would have creaked so loudly that we couldn't have missed hearing it. Oh, gee. She must have planned that murder for months in advance. Oh, I'm sure she did. But she lost her head when she tried to kill you. Oh. If she couldn't cover that up, it would have been a bad mistake. Well, I'll say. Not only for her, but for me. Thanks for not letting her make it, Nick. You're quite welcome, Betsy. I'd hate to have to break in a new assistant. What? Why, you... Victoria! <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Indeed I can, Mike. Next week we're going to meet a brand new version of an old horse and buggy racket. It was so streamlined that it murdered three people. And the only clue to the solution was the fact that a lot of people suddenly started wearing new glasses. Well, that certainly sounds interesting. What do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Failing Eyes. Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, and is copyright by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined. As new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter... Master Detective. You haven't noticed anything at all unusual, Sheriff? Well, nothing I can think of, Mr. Carter. Not even some little thing that's out of the ordinary? <laughs> well, the only thing I've seen different is that a lot of folks who never wore glasses are wearing them now. Hey, wait a minute, sir. Sure. You say lots of folks have suddenly taken to wearing glasses? That's right, Mr. Carter. Sheriff, that's the answer I was looking for. New glasses. Come on. Come on where? To catch a murderer. And there's no time to lose. And now, the case of the failing eyes. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This early summer morning, a fleet new car drives into the yard of a small farm in western Pennsylvania. A man and a woman get out briskly, carrying notebooks and sheets of official-looking documents. They approach the tall old farmer who is watching them curiously and explain their business crisply. Good morning, sir. Morning. I hope we're not intruding. Uh, permit us to introduce ourselves. My name's Blake, and this is Miss Ransom. Good morning. Morning, ma'am. We're research experts for the Federal Foundation, Mr. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Fred Thomas. Oh, Mr. Thomas. You've heard of the Federal Foundation, of course. Oh, can't say I have. Well, the Federal Foundation is engaged in a nationwide survey of public health. Mr. Lake and I are one of 1,500 teams of research scientists covering the entire country. Mm. You don't say. So, if you've got half an hour to spare, we'll get our information as quickly as possible and move on. Ready, Alan? Yes, all set. All right. Physical condition of farm? Excellent. Drainage? Good. That's a chemical disposal plant back there, Mr. Thomas. Yeah. I thought so. Splendid. Electricity? Oh, yes, yes, I see the wiring. Bottle gas for cooking? Excellent. 
Best conditions for maintenance of health. Got it, Alice? Right. Now, your own condition, Mr. Thomas. Age? Seventy. Any recent operations or illnesses? Nope. Physical condition? <laughs> the best, I should say. I can tell. One moment. What is it? Mind if I take a close look at your eyes, Mr. Thomas? My eyes? Hmm. Yes, I see. You're having difficulty reading lately, huh, Mr. Thomas? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Print is blurred, your eyes seem dim, tendency to squint, headache sometimes, huh? Uh, yes. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Alice. Yes? Put down condition of eyes, bad. First stages of cataract. First stages of what? Cataract. Uh, yes. You mean Mr. Thomas is going blind? Yes, I'm sorry. It's cataract, unmistakable symptoms. <laughs> Well, it's no laughing matter, Mr. Thomas. If you value your eyesight, you... Know, you... son, you almost had me fooled for a minute. It's the same old racket, but with new trimmings. Mr. Thomas, what I do you mean? you cheap little crook. You think you were handing out this line to a rube? I was a detective for 30 years before I retired to this little place. Detective? Jerry, let's get out of here. No, you right. don't. Let's see your racket's ended right now. We ain't got an eye doctor in a hundred miles, but we got a fine little jail down in town. Let go, you hear? Let go. The old cataract racket, eh? <laughs> well, it's finished, Mr. I Thomas. told you. Oh, Jerry, no, no, don't. What's the letter say, Patsy? It says, My dear Mr. Carter, in accordance with your wishes, I am keeping you in touch with news about your old friend, Fred Thomas. I'm very sorry to tell you that Fred is dead. Dead? Go on, Patsy. He committed suicide on his farm sometime yesterday. Suicide? A note was found in which Fred stated that he had been depressed for some time owing to failure of his health and that he had decided to give up the struggle. Why, oh, that's impossible. I can't tell you how sorry I am to give you this news. Yours very sincerely, Walter Bleaker, attorney. I can't believe it, Patsy. <sighs> Fred Thomas was pretty close to 70, Nick. Fred could be 170. He'd never commit suicide. Well, some people, when their health fails, Patsy, they... Fred Thomas worked with my father. He was my father's friend and mine. Fred never gave up a fight. Never. Well, what do you think happened, Nick? I'm not going to do anything until we've got facts to go on. Do you want me to write to the lawyer, Bleaker? No, get your bag packed. We're driving out to Westville at once. <laughs> Mr. I'd like to talk to you. My name is Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Hello. The detective fellow, eh? What do you want to talk about? Fred Thomas. Nothing to talk about. Case is closed. Well, Sheriff, I'm not exactly satisfied with the facts as they stand. You're not, eh? No, I'm not. Well, ain't that too bad. Look, Mr. Nick Carter, we've got a small police department here. Not exactly fancy like your big city outfits, but we know our way around. I'm sure you do. So if you've got any idea of making a big show down here... Excuse and... me, Sheriff. I don't like to interrupt, but you don't understand. I've come down here to cooperate and help. If there are any headlines, you can have them. Ha! Ah. Look, Sheriff, Patsy and I just checked in at the Westville Hotel. Would you mind calling the desk clerk? Why should I do that? To prove that I'm sincere. Call him and ask him to read you the names of the people who just checked in. If that doesn't satisfy you, we'll get out of town. Well, I think you're crazy. But uh, just to get rid of you, I'll do it. Nellie, get me Sam Woods at the hotel. Yeah. <clears throat> Sam? Uh, this is Joe Parsh. I understand a man and a woman just checked in. What's their names? Mr. Nelson Crane and Miss Paula Brown. Shoe salesman? Well, well, well. Thanks, Sam. Well, Sheriff? I, uh, I guess maybe I made a mistake, Mr. Carter. I, uh, I apologize to you and Miss Bowen. Forget it, Sheriff. All I want to do is to find out what happened to my old Fred. Fred Thomas. Well, come on, come on. We'll, we'll go out to Fred's farm right now. And by heaven, if you earn any headlines, I'll split them with you. <laughs> Mr. 
This is where he was found, Mr. Carter, the day before yesterday. This the parlor, huh? Right. Old Mrs. Jameson found his body. She used to clean up for him every few days. Oh, then Fred lived alone? All alone, Miss Vaughan. Oh. oh, here's the note we found on the table. Fred was slumped in the chair right in front of me. Hmm. My health is going fast. I'm 70 years old. Doesn't seem worth fighting anymore. Sheriff, this doesn't smell right. No? This note is printed. Why wasn't it written? Well, that bothered me, too. But then I remembered. Fred's eyes had been going back on him. Maybe. And how about the suicide? Did he shoot himself? Yeah. Through the heart. You checked the gun for prints? Yeah. The gun's down at the courthouse. But I've got photos with me. Here, I'll show them to you. Hmm. It was a thirty-eight automatic. The bullet checked with the gun, all right. We dusted it for prints inside and out. Found Fred's prints all over. Sharp and clear as a crystal. Every one of them. You see him? I think the sheriff's right, Nick. Fred must have committed suicide. No, Patsy. Hmm? Now, these photographs prove I'm right. The fingerprints on that gun were placed there after Fred was killed. But... They were what? It's a simple matter, Sheriff. You know that. All the killer had to do was take the dead man's hand, wrap it around well, the gun, and... Well, of course, Nick, but what makes you so sure that's what happened? Because the prints are too clear and sharp, Patsy. Especially when Fred's supposed to have held the gun when he shot himself. Too clear? Yes, the recall of the gun in his dying hand would have smudged the prints. They couldn't possibly be sharp. By heaven, you're right. I've been a fool. The question now is, who killed Fred Thomas and why? That's right. Let's go back to your office, Sheriff, and start thinking. <laughs> Sheriff, you say Fred had no enemies at all in Westville? Not one. He was a fine man, and everyone liked him. And you also say he had nothing worth stealing. No, nothing was stolen. Uh-huh. And it gets down to this. Fred must have come across something new, something bad here in Westville. Whatever that was, he was killed as a result. We've got to find what it was. Well, you name it, Mr. Carter, and we'll find it. So, Sheriff, you're the man to call the turn now. I am. How? Well, have you noticed anything new or different or unusual about Westville recently? Suspicious strangers passing through, new businesses, anything? Well, I can't think of nothing. <clears throat> At least nothing suspicious. Not even some little thing that's out of the ordinary? <laughs> well, the only thing I've noticed recently is that lots of folks who never wore glasses are wearing them now. Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Wait. You say lots of folks have suddenly taken to wearing glasses who never wore them before? That's right. Well, even old Jem Small's got a pair. Why do you mention Jem Small particularly? Well, because he'd be the last fella I'd expect to see wearing glasses. Why, he... Wait a minute. I wonder where Jem got them specs he's wearing. Well, he probably bought them at the Oculus, same as anyone else. Uh, that's just the point, Miss Bourne. There ain't no Oculus in Westville. Well, if there's no... When one... anyone wants glasses, they drive the 16 miles over to Garytown. Well, Jim's been laid up for the last two months with a lame back. Well, he couldn't get to Gary Town. Maybe he bought them by mail. Not Jim Small. He'd want to see what he's buying first. Sheriff, I think you've given me the answer I was looking for. New glasses. I don't get you. Let's go ask Jim Small about it. There's just one chance in a hundred that this is the something new that killed Fred Thomas. <laughs> Physical condition of farm, excellent. Best conditions for maintenance of health. Got it, Alice? Right. Now, about your own condition, Mr. Olson. Age? Oh, I was 65. Mm hmm. Recent operations or illnesses? Well, 10 years ago, I get the appendix taken out. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing serious in that. <laughs> now, your physical condition. I'm the best, I should say. I should. One moment. What is it, Jerry? Do you mind if I take a close look at your eyes, Mr. Olson? My eyes? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I see. You're having difficulty reading lately, huh? Prints blurred, your eyes seem dim, tendency to squint, headache sometimes, huh? Yeah, yeah, that is right. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry, Mr. Olson, I've got bad news for you. Bad news? Take this, Alice. Mm-hmm. Condition of eyes, dangerous. First stages of cataract. What? Cataract. Yes. You, you mean I go blind? I'm sorry, but it looks as if oh, you... No, no, not blind. I, I cannot go blind. Better I kill myself. Oh, I... it's not as bad as all <laughs> that, Mr. Olson. Mister, you and that lady, you scientific people from the Federal Phone... From... The Federal Foundation. You know science. You know about eyes. Maybe, 
Maybe you tell me how affects him up, please. Well, there is a cure, Mr. Olsen. Oh, you yeah, tell me. The Federal Foundation Elixir, Alice, get a bottle. Right, Gary. Now, this treatment, when taken with the special foundation glasses, retards the progress of cataracts. Oh, yeah, that is good. Uh, unfortunately, it's a difficult formula to prepare, Mr. Olsen. It's rather expensive. How much? Uh, one hundred dollars. One hundred dollars? If the price is too much for you, Mr. Oh, no, Olsen. No, no. No price too much to pay for eyes. I pay. You wait here. I got money from home. Uh, get a pair of the foundation glasses, too, Alice. Good morning. Wind, southwest 24 miles an hour. Barometer, 29.91 and falling. Burn right it. Right, the horn again. I tell her next time she leaves that storm. I... Q brings you a special warning. Huh? Sheriff Parsh. In association with Nick Carter, warns all citizens to be on the lookout for two crooks now working the cataract racket in this county. That's all right. A man and a woman claiming to be representatives of the Federal Foundation are working through the farms and selling bogus cures for imaginary cases of cataracts. Imaginary. Any information as to their whereabouts should be phoned directly to this station. A reward of one thousand dollars will be paid. By Jiminy, I get them and I get the reward too. Hello, Mrs. Short. I want to call radio station right away. Yeah, I hear announcement. I think I've been reward. You get radio station quick, please. I think Crooks is here on my farm now. Oh, yeah, many. They try to take one hundred dollars from me. Now I take one thousand dollars from them. I tell Nick Carter all about <laughs> this. Good work, Jerry. Yeah, he's out cold. Hang out that receiver, quick. Okay. We're in a jam, but there's one ray of sunshine. At least this big mouth didn't get through to Nick Carter. The two crooks stand over Olsen's body, and Nick is 70 miles away. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Failing Eyes. Today's adventure with Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. Heavy thunderclouds are slowly covering the sky as Nick's long black convertible scorches down the roads, eating up the miles to Olsen's farm. How much further, Sheriff? Uh, just a few more minutes, Miss Bourne. Uh, you know, Nick, I keep thinking about that phone call to the radio station. People kind of make fun of the way local phone operators in the country gossip and listen in to local conversations. Yeah. But if that Mrs. Choke, you know, the local operator, hadn't been in the habit of listening in on what people were saying, she wouldn't have been able to relay Mr. Olsen's message to us. Well, I'm still worried about Olsen. Well, Why, what do you think happened to him? I'm afraid the crooks overheard his call and shut him up. Uh, ease up, Mr. Carter. Here's Olsen's place. <sighs> Golly. Thank heaven that's over. Seventy miles in seventy-three minutes. That's traveling. Oh, it sure is. Come on. This is uh, Ed Larry here, local police officer. Hi, Ed. Hi, Joe. Well, then we got here, didn't you? Yeah, uh, this is Nick Carter and Miss Patsy Bourne. Ed Larry. How do you do? How's also Mr. Laro? We don't let rightly know, Mr. Carter. Now, what do you mean? Seems like he ain't around nowhere, Mr. Carter. Seems like he's disappeared. <laughs> Checked the house, the barn, the shed, and the chicken coops, all the buildings on the farm. And he ain't in any of them, Mr. Carter. But he must be here somewhere. I'll tell you what, Mr. Lara. Suppose you have your men check the rest of the farm. Search all the ditches, gullies, the brook back of the orchard, and so on. Okay, we'll do that. Let's go, man. If Olsen was murdered, and there's a strong chance he was, the killer may have buried his body. So be on the lookout for fresh turned earth. We'll keep our eyes open, Mr. Carter. All right, Sheriff. Will you come out to the driveway that turns off the road? Why, what's on your mind? Tire treads. Oh? Rained last night, just enough to make all the tire marks made today plainly visible. So, look uh, here. Uh, quite a mess of tracks in this drive. Oh, Mr. Carter, you think you can make anything out of them? Yeah, maybe. Let's see. This diamond pattern tread belongs to Red Laro's car. This India balloon is from Olsen's truck. Well, how do you know that, Nick? I checked him while the sheriff and his men were looking for Olsen. Well, oh, so that's why you didn't go with them. Yeah. 
And these are the marks of my tires. These triangular treads are from the other officer's car. Also the ones of the straight-boarded band. Yes, those are from Tom Adams' car. And that accounts for all our cars. Right. Now look here, Sheriff. Here's one tire track unaccounted for. Hmm. It's a half-moon pattern. Funny looking, too. And an easy pattern to identify. Sheriff, let's have another look at those pictures you took at the time of Fred Thomas's murder. Yeah, I got them right here, Nick. You want them all? Yeah, I remember one in particular, a close-up of the drive. Yeah, yeah, here it is. What? It's a picture from tire marks. How'd you happen to take that one, Sheriff? Well, I'll tell you. I've been uh, reading a book on detection, and uh, it said to never overlook a thing. Uh Uh-huh. So when I saw these marks and knew that it wasn't Fred's car, I took the picture just in case something might come up later. And it has, Sheriff. Look closely at this shot. Nick, that's the same tread. Yeah. My heaven, that same half-moon pattern. And since that tread appears in both places where we know the cataract crooks have been, it's ten to one of it's the tread of their car. I'll buy that. <clears throat> now what do we do? Well, this is mostly a backcountry district. Practically all the roads are dirt. Maybe we can follow this tire, Mark, and catch up with those crooks. Maybe. If the rain holds off. Yeah. Got to work faster when I beat the rain. Let's see. The tire marks here from the right are overlapped by those going out to the left. That means the ones to the left are more recent. Mm-hmm. And then the killers drove out and turned south on the road. Right. So let's get in my car and follow the tracks. You really think we've got a chance, Nick? Yes, Patsy, if they stick to the dirt roads. And if the rain holds off. Straight ahead, Mr. Carter. Straight ahead. I can still make out the half-moon pattern. They've certainly been weaving in and out of the back road. Probably Ed Larry should take credit for that. How so? Uh, he set up roadblocks in a ten-mile circle right after I spoke to him on the phone. Good man. That means our friends are running in circles trying to find a place to break Bless through. Bless me, bless. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Betsy. Oh, doggone it. Huh? What's the matter, Sheriff? The rain's starting. Oh, show what has. If we don't overtake them before the next fork or crossroad, I'm afraid they'll get away. Unless the roadblock stop them. Mr. Carter, look up there ahead. Why, there's smoke. Yeah, black smoke. What does that remind you of, Sheriff? Why, uh, burning oil or gasoline. Hey, them crooks couldn't have cracked up running away, could they? We'll see in a moment. Hold on. Right. Well, it's a car, all right. Down in the culvert. Come on. Uh-huh. Oh, good grief. Look at it. Pretty well burned off. Must have crashed at least an hour ago. Yeah. Watch your step, Patsy. I'm all right. Hey, look. Two bodies inside. Badly burned. Oh, it looks like a man and a woman. Oh. Two doors to dance. Searchlight on roof. Fog lights over bumper. Last two numbers on license plate. Five, nine. That all checks with what Jen Small told us, Nick. Yeah, it's a killer's car without any question. The whole front end smashed in. Yeah, looks like death caught him before we did. <laughs> Give me a hand with this door, will you, Sheriff? I right, force it open. Oh, a man and a woman. That's about all we can say now. Have to check further for identification. It looks like there remains of books and bottles here in the back seat. And what's left of a lot of spectacles, too. Well, I guess nobody will ever drive in this car again. We don't know that anybody will want to drive it. Them two crooks don't need a car no more. Not that they're both dead. I wonder whether they are. What? Nick, what on earth do you mean? Patsy, I've got a job for you. This case isn't finished yet. What? Are you crazy, Mr. Carter? Don't guess finish a case? Depends on who's dead, Sheriff. Now listen, both of you. Here's what I want to do. Somewhere, not very far. Golly, it's getting so dark, I'm getting all mixed up. Nick said to cover all these back roads, but I don't know where I've been and where I haven't. These dawn roads twist and turn like a... Like a labyrinth. Gee, I wish Nick were here. I'd like to ask him whether... Hey! Hey! Oh, Golly. Get off the road. You want to get knocked down? But let's go to the door. Move out, sister. What? what in the world? It's a gun, sister. Get out of the car. You... I've been waiting two hours for an easy mark to come along, and you're it. The car belongs to me now, lady. You won't be needing it anymore. Patsy stares at the wild-eyed man who fingers his revolver nervously and motions her out of Nick's car. We'll see what she does in just a moment. Now, 
now for the conclusion of The Case of the Failing Eyes. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. On a lonely country road, Patsy crouches behind the wheel of Nick's convertible. The armed man who has stopped the car shifts his gun to his left hand, reaches through the open door, and grabs Patsy. Come on, you heard me. Get out. No. I'd just as soon let you have it but now, sir. You're a only... cataract man, aren't you? How do you know? From the description. That I... chairs it, lady. If you ever had a chance, it's gone but, now. Come but, on. Oh, he can't help you now. Come on, let's get off the road. I don't want them to find you right away. Just a couple of hours in your car is all I need. Nick, where are you? Don't be a fool, sister. Yelling won't help none. Yeah, oh. it's far enough. Oh. I'm not going to waste time, oh. sister. This is it. Go, Patrick, go. Put that. Oh, Nick, Nick, oh, Nick. Go looking for that gun, friend. It's probably buried in poison oil. Huh? You hurt your Patsy? No, 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 no. It's just my heart. It won't start again. Well, I'm sorry. I got all tangled up trying to get out of the luggage mm. compartment. Well, my friend, the racket's finished, and you're... You uh-uh. dirty... No names, please. After all, I could call you a three-time killer, swindler, thief, and all-around crook, but I won't. I'll just call you a jailbird. <laughs> Better now, Patsy? Oh, I guess so, but golly, I was scared stiff, Nick. What? Even though we planned everything in advance? Oh, I know, but Nick, how did Jerry Lake get away with that cataract racket? How did he manage to scare people into falling for it? Well, he only picked on the older folks, people who were suffering from the natural short-sightedness of old age. All he did was describe the symptoms of failing eyesight. And they thought he was describing the symptoms of cataract. That's about it. <laughs> what a dirty racket. Yeah. Oh, uh, another thing, Nick. Yeah? You say it was Olsen's body that was burned in Jerry Lake's car. That's right. You see, Jerry murdered the girl he worked with and left her body and Olsen's body in the car when he burned it. Yeah? He figured by making us think he was the one who was who died in the phony wreck that he could get clear. Well, you said you knew it was a phony accident because the car was still in low gear. Well, I certainly did. If the wreck had been on the level and had gone off the road while they were driving along, the car would have been in high gear. <laughs> I didn't notice what gear it was in. I just saw the dead bodies, and that was that. Well, that's what most people think. They look, but they don't see. Just like Jerry Lake. What about Jerry? He couldn't see that when he put Fred's fingerprints on the gun, he was really putting the finger on himself. As a result, he's going to get well acquainted with the electric chair, which is as it should be. Well, Nick, what about the adventure that new post-war old Dutch cleanser will bring us next week? It's a story about women's fashions, Mike. Women's fashions? Well, they've always been a mystery to me. Don't tell me... Well, that... in this case, they're more than a mystery. They're a cause for plenty of violence. You see, the fashions were being stolen, and Mary Danville said she knew who was stealing them. And when we went to see her, she walked out of her apartment without saying a word. And a moment later, we found her murdered in her bedroom in that same apartment. Hey, wait. This is confusing enough without going any further. What do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Quiet Roommate. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined. As new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, are you 
going to break into this apartment? I don't have to, Patsy. Sally gave me her key. Oh, gee, you think of everything, don't you? I try to. Okay, come on in. Uh-huh. Well, now, this is certainly a pleasant living room. Nothing sinister here. Uh-huh. Looks as though there are two bedrooms, too. wonder whether this one is married. Let's see what... Oh! Great Scott! Nick! This girl's been shot through the temple. Oh, Nick, I wonder if she... Somebody just came in the front door. It's all right, Miss Carlyle. It's... And now, the case of the quiet roommate. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's late in the afternoon, and Nick and Patsy are in the lavish office of John Fenrus, president of a Fenrus department store. I'm glad you brought Miss Bone to the store with you, Mr. Carter. She'll understand this business. You said you were being annoyed by a blackmailer, Mr. Fenris. Precisely. The girl who worked here until last Saturday night is trying to shake me down for a lot of money. You were involved with her? Of course not. Nothing of the sort. Then what's the trouble? Our fashion designs are being stolen. Oh, you mean that the clothes sold in the Fenris store are exclusive? A great many of them are, Miss Bone. Two years ago, I hired Jerry Bartlett, one of the best dress designers in the business. To create designs exclusively for the Fenris store. Well, I knew Fenris models couldn't be bought anywhere else in town. Yeah, but that's but... the point. They can be now. Oh? The cut-rate stores have our exclusive styles at marked down prices before we even put them on sale here. Mm, that can't be very profitable. Profitable? We've lost a fortune. And this girl says she knows how our fashions are being pirated and who's responsible for it. And she won't tell you who it is? Tell me. She has the gall to ask $2,500 for the information. Then you want me to find out who's stealing your design? No. I want you to force Mary Danville to give me that information. Without paying for it, you mean? I have a right to know. And it's her duty to tell me without blackmailing me. I want you to scare her. Scaring girls is out of my line, Mr. Fenris. You want me to investigate your problem? Oh, to... so you want to run up a lot of investigating fees, do you? Well, I won't fall for it. I'm not asking you to fall for anything. I'm responsible to the board of directors for every dollar I spend. It isn't my money. It's your store, isn't it? Well, it was my father's store. Now it belongs to a great many people. And they expect me to show a profit. I can't throw money away on detectives. Well, it's probably just as well, Mr. Fenlis. I don't think I'd enjoy working for you anyway. Mr. Carter, if my secretary were here, I'd have, I'd have her show you out. Oh, we can find our way out. Come on, Betsy. With pleasure. Mr. Fenwick. Miss Carlyle, do you think my office is a public waiting room? Miss Drake isn't at her desk, and I have to see you. Just the same. What you do to Mary Danville is none of my business. But when you start ransacking my apartment, just because... Control yourself, Miss Carlyle. I've done no such thing. Then if you didn't do it, you hired someone to. Your accusations are in particularly bad taste in front of outsiders, Miss Carlyle. Oh, don't worry about us, Mr. Fenwick. This young lady's outburst hasn't changed my opinion of you a bit. I think I'd like to talk to Miss Carlyle privately, though. I forbid it. Oh, you do? I certainly do. This man's a detective, Miss Carlyle. Fine. Mr. Detective, if you'll come down to the Fenrus exclusive shop, I'd like very much to talk to you privately. Well, I didn't imagine you'd have a private office like this, Miss Carlyle. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I'm in charge of the Fenrus exclusive shop. But with a job like that, I should think you'd be afraid to antagonize Mr. Fenrus. Wouldn't you hate to be fired? He won't fire me, Miss Bowen. What makes you so sure? Because Mr. Fenrus is the only person in the world who would have any reason for ransacking the apartment that Mary and I share. He wants the information Mary has. Hmm. Do you have it too, Miss Carlyle? No. But if I did, I'd do exactly what she's doing. I'd make him pay for it. Uh, was the lock on your apartment door broken? No, it wasn't. But somebody had been there because Mary's wardrobe trunk had been turned inside out and my room had been all torn up, too. Was anything stolen? Nothing of mine, and Mary says Fenris didn't find what he was after. I see. Miss Carlisle, you said Mary Danville hasn't told you what she knows about the fashion theft. Are you and your roommate on friendly terms? Yes, of course. I got the store to hire her, and I also saw to it that she was pushed ahead. But she still doesn't trust you enough to tell you. That is not the point. She said I'd be better off not knowing that what she discovered was dynamite. Look, Miss Carlyle, I don't want to alarm you, but can you get a room for yourself and Mary Danville at a hotel for a few nights? Why, uh, well, I suppose so. Then I'd do it if I were you. And I wouldn't let anybody know where I was staying. But everything's happened while I've been here at the store. 
Nobody would dare to try anything while Mary and I were at home. I'm not too sure of that. Is Mary at your apartment now? I think so. Why? I want to talk to her, and I'd also like to examine your apartment. Do you want me to take you there now? No, I want you to line up a hotel room. Besides, Patsy and I may do better talking to Mary alone. If you think... I don't think anything yet, Miss Carlyle, except that you may not find it healthy to stay in your apartment. All right, Mr. Carter, I'll do whatever you say. I can hear somebody in there, Nick. Maybe she's afraid to open the door. Miss Danville. Sally Carlisle sent us. I'm Nick Carter, a private investigator. Look, Miss Danville, I know you're in there because I heard you moving around. Hmm. I guess she isn't going to let us in, Nick. I'm going to camp right here on your doorstep till you open this door, Miss Danville. I'm here to help you if I can. What? Well, now, you're being sensible. I don't know you. What? Miss Bone and I would like you to tell us what you can about your apartment being searched for you recently. Sally Carlisle told us about it, Miss Danville. Nick and I are here to investigate. So if you'll let us in? Uh, I'm in a hurry right now. I, I have a date. Couldn't you come back some other time? I'm afraid this can't wait, Miss Danville. But I can't talk... There's one thing I want particularly to know. Was anything stolen from your wardrobe trunk? No. Miss Carlyle thinks Mr. Fenrus did the searching. So what? Well, do you have any idea? Uh, look, Mr. What's-Your-Name, I told you I'm in a hurry. I'm late for my date now. Is and... your date with a gentleman friend? Well, yes, my date's with a man. Then we'll just talk to you here outside your door till he arrives. But I'm to meet him downstairs in the lobby. Oh? Your callers meet you in the lobby, do they? Look, I don't know you. Maybe you're a detective and maybe you're not. But until Sally's here to say you're okay, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm ready to leave, and I'm going right now. You're making a mistake, Miss Danville. Maybe, maybe not. But don't try to follow me down to the lobby. If you do, I'll... I'll call the police. Very well. We won't even go down in the same elevator with you. Go right ahead. That's what I intend to do. Nick, yeah, aren't you going to follow her? No. I'm going to wait here and see what she does. Well, what do you expect her to do? I'd see if you were Miss Danville. Would you leave two strangers standing in front of your door after a conversation like the one we've just had? Well, that all depends. Depends nothing. You'd meet your boyfriend in the lobby and then get right back up here to see what's going on. Well, if you ask me, I don't think she has a date. You don't? No. And if she did, it wasn't with a man. Well, why do you say that? Well, she didn't powder her nose and it was shiny. And her lipstick wasn't on straight. No, Nate. I have a feeling she just wanted to get away from this apartment as fast as she could. Yeah, maybe you're right. Mm. Come on, let's get inside and see what was bothering her. What? Oh, Nick, you aren't going to break into that apartment, are you? Don't have to. Sally Carlisle gave me her key. Oh, gee, you think of everything, don't you? Sure, I do. All right, come on. Right. Well, it's certainly a pleasant living room. Nothing sinister here. Mm-hmm. Looks as though there were two bedrooms. I wonder which one is Mary Danville. Well, not this one. Uh, at least I wouldn't think so. Why not? Because the picture's on the vanity. And you'd hardly have your own picture in your room. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> so Mary Danville's room must be the other one. Of course. Well, let's see what's there. Great Scott! Yes. No wonder Mary wanted to get away. This girl on the floor. She's been shot through the temple. Nick, do you suppose... Quiet. Uh... Somebody just came in the front door. Let's listen. Maybe we can hear something. Okay. Who's there? Who is it? You wait here, Sally. No, Gary, don't. Let's get out of here and call the police. Nonsense. Whoever you are, come on out or I'll shoot. It's all right, Miss Carlyle. It's... Oh, Gary, you fool. That's the detective. Oh, Mr. Carter, are you hurt? Not a bit, Miss Carlyle, but tell your trigger-happy friend to quit pointing that revolver at me. Oh, I'm sorry, old fellow, but I, I was nervous. After what's been happening here, well, I... It's good most people can't hit anything with a revolver. This is Gary Bartlett, our fashion designer, Nick Carter, and his secretary, Miss Bowen. Uh, how do you do? I'm awfully sorry I frightened you, but I, I was... I thought I told you not to come back here, Miss Carlyle. I know, but I got to thinking about Mary Danville, and... Well, if it was dangerous for me to be here, it was dangerous for her, too. So I came up to get her. Well, she just left a few minutes ago. Oh, I see. Oh, well, in that case, Jerry, I suppose we might as well leave, too. Right. Just a minute, Miss Carlyle. Did you see your roommate in the lobby just now? In the lobby? No. Well, there's somebody else in this apartment. In one of the bedrooms. You mean you've caught our mysterious visitor? Oh, that's wonderful. But who is... Suppose you take a look. That's a good idea. <gasps> oh, no. No. Recognize her, Miss Carlyle? Of course we recognize her. But that's Mary Danville. What? 
You mean this murdered girl is your roommate? Oh, yes. Well, but why would anyone... Mr. Carter, you've got to catch her murderer. You've got to. I think I did catch her murderer, Miss Carlyle. But I let her get away. <clears throat> Mary Danzo was apparently murdered by the girl who made a cool, daring getaway. But the fugitive's picture is on Sally Carlisle's vanity, so we should know who she was in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Quiet Roommate. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. The scene is Sally Carlisle's bedroom, and Nick stares grimly at the photograph he's removed from Sally's dressing table. This is a picture of the girl who left your apartment just as we arrived. Who is she, Miss Carlyle? Why, well, that's Dorothy Drake. Is she a particularly good friend of yours? Well, she gave me the picture, and she stops in to see me once in a while, that's all. She's friend with her secretary, so everybody in the store tries to get in solid with her. Oh, I see. Oh, well, I think she can give him a boost with Fenris. She really have that much influence with him? Well, if I think I'll have trouble getting Fenris to okay one of my fashion designs, I try to sell Dorothy on it first. If it's okay with her, you'll take it. Oh, then she gets to see your designs before they're approved? Well, sure she does. Uh-huh. Who else sees them? Well, Fenris, of course, and Sally. Huh? Oh, yes, I see them, too. Do you think this Dorothy Drake would commit murder to help Fenris? You said she was here in this apartment when you got here, didn't you? Yes, she was. Well, I don't see why you let her get away. Well, she told us she was Mary Danville. We had no reason to doubt her. But she doesn't look the least bit like Mary. Don't forget, Miss Carlyle, I never saw Mary Danville before. And we didn't find Mary's body until after Dorothy Drake had left. She must have killed Mary. All you have to do is find her. You know where she lives? Well, sure, there's no secret about that. It's over on Prince Street. But she won't be there. Mary must have known that she was the fashion thief. Oh, just a minute, Miss Carlyle. We can't assume that she's guilty of Mary's murder or of the fashion theft either. You and Mr. Bartlett and Mr. Fenris all had access to the fashion designs. But if she isn't guilty, why did she run away? We don't know that she has run away. If she's smart, we'll find her at home. Let's see if she is smart. All right, all right, come in. You don't seem surprised to see us, Miss Drake. I knew you'd be here after me. Well, are you coming in? Thanks. We are. I suppose you found Mary's body? We did. And I suppose you expect me to say I didn't kill her? Naturally. And I suppose you won't believe me when I do. Well, you lied to us at Sally Carlisle's apartment. Of course I lied. I was frightened. I just found Mary's body. You mean she was dead when you went into her apartment? Yes, she was. And how did you get in? I... I, I had a key. Where'd you get it? That's none of your business. Solving murders is my business, Miss Drake, and unless you give me some straight answers, I'm going to escort you down to headquarters. I wouldn't try that if I were you. Why not? I'll sue you for false arrest, and I'll collect. You seem pretty sure of yourself. You'll find out how sure I am if you try to make trouble for me. You think Mr. Fenris will back you up, huh? I wouldn't count on that if I were you. No? Look, if you're going to take that attitude, Miss Drake, I'll have to show you I'm not bluffing. Come on. Come on where? To headquarters. Where do you think? Now, look, you can't I do... certainly can. And if you won't come willingly with me, I'll have Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad here within ten minutes. You just try it and see what'll happen. Very well. Where's the telephone, Miss Drake? It's in the hall, Nate. Fine. Call Maddie, will Right. You? No! Don't you dip! Walter! Mr. Carter. Well? If I were you, I wouldn't make any phone calls until I knew what I was doing. Hi, Mr. Fenrod. I won't have my secretary, myself, or the store mixed up in a murder scandal, Carter. And if you do it, I'll run you right out of business. What are you doing here, Fenris? He came because I called him as soon as I got away from Mary Danville's apartment. Okay, now that we're back to that, Miss Drake, I still want to know why you went there. She was following orders, Carter. Your orders? Naturally. I was entitled to the information the Danville girl said she had, and I was going to get it. Even if you had to steal it. Her attempt to extort money from me was outside the law. You have to fight fire with fire. So you gave Miss Drake the key to Miss Danville's apartment. I did. Why did you get it? We have a key shop in the basement of our store. I borrowed Sally Carlyle's key from her locker long enough to have a duplicate made. Did you borrow it with Sally's permission? I told you. You have to fight... I know. You have to fight fire with fire. Okay, so you had Miss Drake sneak into Miss Danville's apartment. What was she supposed to steal? Mary Danville claimed she had a package of correspondence that proved the identity of the fashion thief. I wanted it. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You say you sent your secretary to get the letters Mary Danville had? I did. 
that before she'd had any chance to let you know whether she got them or not, you called me and asked me to get them. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I had no intention of hiring you. From what I'd heard about you, I was quite sure you wouldn't take the job. Suppose I'd said I would. I'd have found some excuse for not hiring you. Then why did you call me? That's really very simple, Carter. If Miss Drake had been successful in getting those letters, Mary Danville would have immediately accused me of having her apartment burglarized. But I would have been in a position to deny it. How? I could have proved that I was trying to hire a detective to get the letters for me at the very time somebody else was actually getting them. Very clever, Penrith. And now you put your secretary right on the spot. He has not. I was... You were in the apartment with Mary Danville's body when we found you, Miss Drake, and you admit why you were there. But that doesn't mean... By the I... way, did you get the letters? No. When I saw Mary's body, I didn't even stop to look for them. I think perhaps you did. What? I think perhaps you found them and didn't want Mr. Fenris to know you found them. You're accusing Miss Drake of being the fashion thief, and that's preposterous. Mary Danville's murder is preposterous too, Fenris. But it happened. Just the same. Did anybody else except Miss Drake check out at the store just before the murder? Yes. Sally Carlyle took an extra hour at lunchtime because she said she was nervous about her apartment and wanted to go home to check things. How about Jerry Bartlett? Say, I remember now. What? He came in while you were out, Mr. Fenris, and said he wanted an hour off to attend to some personal business. And I told him it would be all right. So nobody's eliminated. Well... Looks as though our first job is to find those letters. But where are you going to look for them? I don't know, Mr. Fenris, but I'm going to start looking just the same. And when I get any information, you can be sure I'll let you know. Miss Bowen, what's the idea of summoning all of us here to Carter's office in this high-handed manner? He has some information for you. He isn't even here. He said he'd be delayed a bit, Mr. Fenris. Delayed? Doesn't he know my time's valuable? Should we go back to the store, Mr. Fenris? You can go back if you like, but I'm staying right here. Oh, you are, are you? We'll see about that. I'm staying, too. Mr. Carter must have had an important reason for asking us to come here. The only thing that's important to me is to find out who's been stealing our fashion design. You mean murder doesn't bother you? Mary Danville was outside the law, Miss Bowen. She deserved what she got. Did Carter say how soon he'd be here? I'm sorry. He didn't. Just the same, we'll wait until he gets here. All of us. This is an outrage. We've been here nearly two hours. And I refuse to submit to such treatment any longer. Where is Carter, anyway? I'm sure I don't know, Mr. Fenris. All he said over the phone the last time he called... Was... I know. He said to tell us to wait. Well, I'm not going to wait any longer. I'll bet you are. Your curiosity wouldn't let you do anything else. What the devil's he up to, anyway? Oh, Miss Board wouldn't tell, even if she knew, Jerry. Always not to reason why. Always just to wait. And... Hi, everybody. Well, it's about time, Carter. Do you realize you've kept us waiting here? Yes, Mr. Fenris, I've kept you waiting about two hours. Well, your explanation better be good. I'm a busy man. My explanation's very good. I intended to keep you people waiting here when I called you. Why, of all the colossal nerve... I had to get you here so I could search your homes without being disturbed. You mean you... I mean I've made a thorough search, Miss Drake, with the full approval of the police department. I'll... I'll have you thrown into jail. I'll have you... Calm down, calm down, Mr. Fenris. You said the proper way to fight fire was with fire, remember? I confound you. You were interested in results, Fenris. Well, I've got results right here in this package. What's in it? The letters that cost Mary Danville her life, all ready to be turned over to the police. Have you read them? I haven't even examined them. I thought I'd prefer to do that with everyone present. Well, why wait any longer, then? I don't intend to wait. No, I'll take care of this. Nobody's going to frame me. Nick, he's got a gun. So I see. Has anyone accused you of anything, Mr. Bartlett? No, and nobody's going to. Well, as long as you have that gun in your hand, I suppose you're right. You just keep away from me if you don't want this gun to go off. Now, let's see these letters. Why, they're, they aren't the letters at all. Carter's trying to trick us. Quite right, Mr. Fenris. They're fake. I didn't even look for the letters. What? But, what? You didn't look for them? No, I didn't. Mr. Fenris, how did you know these letters are fake? Why? You said you'd never seen the letters, and yet you know at once these aren't genuine. How about that? Carter, are you accusing me of something? Yes. I'm accusing you of Mary Danville's murder. That's utterly ridiculous. You don't think I'd steal my own fashions, do you? They aren't your fashions. That's just the point, Fenris. They aren't your fashions. Now, see here. You're president of the store because of your name, because your father founded the business. The money you made stealing those fashions and selling them was probably more than your salary. So 
Fenris murdered Mary, then deliberately sent me to her apartment so that if anything went wrong, I'd be the suspect. Miss Drake, don't be a fool. I'm not anymore. I'm getting smart. The rest of us had to check out before we could leave the store, but you didn't. And I'm the only one who knows you weren't around the store at the time of the murder. Nick, that's right. She said Mr. Fenris was out. So she told Jerry Bartlett it would be all right for him to leave. Look, Carter, it may be news to you, but there aren't any letters. There aren't? No. Mary and I worked out that scheme because I thought Fenris suspected me. What scheme? Well, you see, it was like this. I, I paid Mary to quit her job and make Fenris that proposition. My professional reputation was at stake, and I thought I could get the fashion feet to show his hand that way. If you knew there weren't any letters, why did you pull that gun? Well, I, I got excited, I guess. I knew there weren't any letters, and then when you showed up with a whole bundle of them, I, I figured I was being framed with fake letters. I wasn't going to stand for that. Oh, you've all lost your senses. Believing that fantastic story about hiring Mary Danville. Look at him with his gun in his hand. Jerry, look out! Oh, oh, oh I Not quick enough, Barbara. Find this Don't try to get your gun back, not unless you want a slug in the heart. And that goes for all of you. <laughs> Mr. Fenrus, covering the group with the revolver he grabbed from Bartlett, edges his way toward the door of Nick Carter's office. We'll see what happens in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Quiet Roommate, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Mr. Fenrus, revolver in one hand, reaches for the door of Nick's office with the other. So you thought Mary Danville knew you'd been selling those fashion designs, huh, Fenris? And that's why you killed her. Yes. I thought she was all set to blackmail me for the rest of my life. It's Bartlett's fault that I killed her. Oh, I, you you can't hang the blame on me, Fenris. And you can't leave this office either. Try to stop me. See what happens to you. I have a trick lock on the door to prevent just that thing. But, Nick... I snapped the secret catch when I came into the room. You will never be able to find it, Fenris. Thanks for telling me, Carter. In that case, I'll let you find it for me. Oh, no, no dice. You don't have any choice... Get over here and open this door or I'll blow your head off. Well, I mean it. Okay. I guess you got me. Get it open. And be quick about it. All right, all right. Take it easy, Fenris. I can't be quick about it. First you twist the door handle slightly to the left like this. And a full turn to the right like this. Don't try any funny business, Carter. I'm right behind you. And I'm ready to pull the trigger if I have to. I'm sure you are. Now you turn the door knob to the left again. And open it. No, wait. Right, give me the gun, Fenner. Give it to me before I break your arm. Trick me. You slam the door into me. And I'm going to slam my left fist right into your face if you don't drop that gun. You. All right. I've got it, Carter. All right, good. Hold on to it this time. I didn't want to kill Mary Danville. I thought I had to do it. I'm sorry I can't sympathize with you. You tricked me, Carter. How did you know? I didn't know, Fenner. Didn't have any idea of who was guilty. But you remember what I said about guilty people running away? But... That's why I arranged this meeting, to give the murderer a chance to try to run away. And it worked. But if there weren't any letters, Nick, if Mary Danville didn't have any letters... There were letters, Patsy. They're, they're... But she didn't have them. Oh. The letters were from Fenris to the people who bought the fashion designs from him. Yes. They wouldn't buy unless I gave them something to put them in the clear in case the store ever brought any suits against them. I thought she got hold of those letters in some way. But you acted as though you thought I was double-crossing you. Oh, you had me half crazy. I had to accuse someone, didn't I? And you're still trying to justify yourself, aren't you? The story should have been mine. I only got a small part of what I deserved. Well, starting right now, Fenris, you're going to get more than a small part of what you deserve. You're going to get the works. <laughs> Let's hear something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week. Mike, it started when Patsy and I went on a visit to another city and were greeted by a welcoming committee. A welcoming committee with machine guns, no less. See, I went there to look for a gangster, but I spent most of my time looking for Patsy. Um, you see, Mike, I found the gangster first, and uh, I was sorry I ever did, believe me. Yeah, Patsy pretended to be a gun mall. She played the part entirely too well for her own safety. That sounds as though we're in for an exciting half hour, Nick. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the Great Impersonation. Mm -hmm. 
Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by George B. Anderson. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. With millions of additional children entering our schools during the next few years, the nation faces serious educational handicaps. Inferior education for our boys and girls may damage our prosperity, our traditions of freedom, our security. That's why we urge every adult to work with local civic groups and school boards to help improve educational conditions. Show by your interest and friendliness that you appreciate the importance of your children's teachers. They mold our nation's future. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined, as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, look out! Quick, Nancy, down on the floor! Come back here. Come out back, Nick, you dirty lousy... Nick, they the curb oh. deliberately. I saw them. Crazy fools. They could have killed us. You're not kidding, driver. Look at those windows. Hey, those ain't... Oh, yes, they are. They're bullet holes. And now, the case of the great impersonation. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. When Jack Blaney was police reporter on the Morning Blade, he and Nick saw a lot of each other. But they lost touch when Jack moved to Center City as city editor of the Daily Crusader there. And then, late one night, Nick received a long-distance call. Hey, where are you calling from, Jack? Center City? Yes, I'm still at the newspaper office. Everybody else went home hours ago, but I'll be here until morning, except that I'll probably have to run out for cigarettes in a little while. Big story coming up? Oh, plenty big. I'm going through the morgue, checking every crime story here for the past ten years. Now, what's the big idea? Nick, there's a gang in this town that the local cops haven't been able to touch. They don't even know who's at the head of it, but I know. Anybody I ever heard of? I don't want to mention names over the phone, but they're mixed up in everything. Gambling, stolen cars, black market, building materials, and now counterfeiting. Well, look, Jack, you better get in touch with the Treasury Department then. Counterfeiting's their job. No, no, I want to get the evidence myself first. This is really big stuff, Nick. And if I swing it, it'll give me a national reputation as a newspaper man. But, Jack, if you know so much about their operations and plans and you know who's at the head of the outfit, you're... I haven't any proof, Nick. I just happened to overhear a scrap of conversation between a couple of drunken mobsters in one of our local gin mills. They mentioned their boss's name, and then I heard something about Arlie Grinner, and then... Arlie Grinner? Yeah. He's going to supply the counterfeit money, and the mob here will distribute it. Look, Jack, take my advice, will you? Call the Treasury Department. I'll make a bargain with you, Nick. If you'll come out here for a few days and help me get proof to back up what I know, I will call them before I take any action. Now, wait a minute. Oh, it means a lot to me, Nick. Breaking this story will put me ahead ten years in the newspaper game. I'll have offers from... Okay, okay. Patsy and I'll catch the next train. Oh, swell. Well, now I'll get back to work. So long, Nick. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Right. Shut off the recorder, Benny. That's all there is. They hung up. That sneaking rat, Blaney. Hiring a private eye from the big town. Oh, when the boss hears this record, he'll blow his top. Well, the boss must have figured something was up or he wouldn't have had us tap Blaney's phone wire. Hey, I hope he thinks of some way to keep this Carter guy from coming here. I heard Don't about him. Don't worry and... about Carter. When his train pulls in tomorrow, we'll be ready for him. But tonight, we're going to take care of Mr. Blaney. Come on, Patsy. Here's a cab. Say, Nick, Center City's quite a place, isn't it? Oh, sure. Almost 100,000 population. Golly. Hey, get in, Patsy. Yeah. What's up, brother? The morning crusader officer. Check. Hey, there's another cab around. I'm in a hurry to get to the Hotel Bradford. Be all right with you if I... Oh, well, that's all right. We don't mind sharing oh, the ride. Uh, never mind. I think uh, I see another cab coming now. Thanks. 
If she can see a cab coming, she has better eyes than I have. I think she changed her mind when she saw us, Patsy. What's the matter? Do we have leprosy or something? You know who that was? No, who? Ollie Grenner's girl. Ollie? Her name's Connie Mills. Oh, well. Yeah. No wonder she didn't want to ride with us if she recognized you. She probably did. I've run into her several times around New York. I wonder what was in that bag she was carrying. Hey, buddy. You know any people in New York? Yes, quite a few. Why? Any theatrical producers? Oh, yes, a couple. Uh, how about give me a letter of introduction, huh? Well, I don't know. I'm talent, see? Undiscovered talent. One of them stars of tomorrow. Yeah? Listen. Am I mortified? Am I burned up? I'm standing on the street corner with Don Priago by my side. In person, when up comes this discourteous individual, he steps up on my toes, puts a penny in my mouth, and tries to weigh himself. Cha-cha-cha-cha. I got a million of them. I got... That was Jimmy Durante, see? Oh, uh, yes, yes, we see. Uh, how about this? Now, you listen to me, young Dr. Killjoy. I'm an old man. Maybe I'm not the surgeon I used to be. But at the same time... Hey, watch out for the truck! Get that hackle up along! Yeah, shut up. And I was Lyle Barrymore. Driving the truck, you mean? No, nah, that's the impersonation I was doing. <laughs> I can impersonate anybody. Maybe you like to hear Edward G. Robinson. No, not while we're in this heavy traffic. I can drive this hack with my eyes closed. Oh, don't argue with him, Nick. He'll try to prove it to you. From now on, I'm running this mob, see? Yeah, me, little squeezer. You're taking orders from me, see? Yeah. If I have to put a hole in somebody's head. Look out! Quick, Matthew, down to the floor. Come back here. Come on, back oh, you can't dirty... push it to the curb deliberately. I saw them. Oh, the crazy fools, they could have killed us. You're not kidding, driver. Look at those windows. Hey, those ain't... Yes, they are. Bullet holes from a machine gun. This is the office, Nick. See on the door, Jack Blaney, city editor. The girl said to walk right in, but did you notice how oddly she said it? Yes, as if she were frightened or something. Well... Maybe Jack can explain. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Well, How are you, Mr. Connor, Miss Bond? I'm Chief Ramsey of the Center City Police Department. The police? When the receptionist but... phoned to say that you were here to see Mr. Blaney, I recognized your name, so I asked her to send you in without saying anything. Anything about what, Chief? About the fact that Blaney was murdered at 3 o'clock this morning. What? Murdered? Well, that was only a couple of hours after he phoned me. How did it happen? A couple of hoodlums waited in front of this building with a machine gun. Oh. Your local boys seem to like machine guns, Chief. They used one to welcome Miss Bowen and me just a few minutes ago. Huh? They did? Well, what in the Sam Hill... I demand action. I demand it. My city editor's been shot down on the street like a dog. Like a dog, mind you. Uh, Mr. Hanford, uh, these are some friends of Blaney's from out of town, Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. Uh, Mr. Hanford is the publisher of the Daily Crusader. Hello. Howdy, Dad. See you. Sorry to have to meet under such tragic circumstances... But I'm throwing every resource of this paper behind the hunt for these mad dogs. Every resource. Any idea why Blaney was murdered, Mr. Hanford? Well, of course I have. Of course I have. The Crusader's a newspaper with a mission. A mission. That mission is to stamp out crime in Center City. And you think Jack was killed simply because he was your city editor? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. We have a well-organized criminal element. Well-organized. Not they're afraid of the Daily Crusader. Afraid of us. They know we'll get them someday. Uh, the Daily Crusader and the police department work pretty close, Mr. Carter. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hanford here was directly responsible for making me chief of police. Oh, you bet I was. I have influence in this town. Influence. I wanted a police chief who was honest. <laughs> Even if he isn't smart. Uh, now, Mr. Hanford... But that's the truth, Ramsey. Everybody knows it. Everybody. But by the eternal, if you don't clean this town up now, clean it up, I say. Well, I I'm trying, Mr. Hanford. You know that. And if Mr. Carter will help out... As far as Jack Blaney's murder is concerned, you bet I'll help out. And I think I know just where to start. I'm sorry, sir. There's no Connie Mills registered at this hotel. Uh, but, Nick, she certainly said the Bradford Hotel. Well, maybe she's using another name, Patsy. Oh, yeah. Uh, look, clerk, the young lady I mean probably came in about an hour ago. She has red hair. Hannah red hair. Was wearing a green dress, a green and white hat, and... Oh, I remember her. But she checked in under the name of Turner. Uh, wait till I look at the card. Oh, using an alias, huh? Uh, here it is. Miss Jean Turner, New York City. That's probably the one. Uh, you'll find her in room 1018. Thanks. Come on, Chief. <coughs> Yeah? 
Hello, Connie. What's the idea? What is this, a pinch? Is it, Mr. Carter? No, Connie. We'd just like to look around and ask you a few questions. Well, uh... Just a minute. Let me get you locked that what? door. He won't get it locked. There. Now, look, Connie. Watch her. Watch her. She's trying to get a gun out of that suitcase. No, no. It's a package of something. Keep it behind her in that window, Chief. I'll head her up on this one. Oh. <coughs> Go! Let go! Come on, Connie. Please. Let's see what you're so anxious to throw out the window. If I ever run, I'd teach you to throw those away. There. Here, Patsy. See what's inside this package. All right, Nick. Hold still, hold still, Connie. Be a good girl. Well, good gravy. It's money. Why, there must be a couple of hundred thousand dollars here. Now, that every dollar of it's counterfeit. Connie here is associated with a counterfeiter named Ali Grinner, Chief. Huh? Treasury men have been trying to prove something on him for months. And Grinner had a deal along with the head of the gang here in Center City. Jack Laney told Nick about it not two hours before he was killed. Why, I figured this gang leader found out that Jack knew about him, and that's why Jack was killed. Come on, sister. Who are you bringing this stuff to? I don't know. You don't know? How could you deliver it if you didn't know who it was going to? I don't say another word till I see my lawyer. Okay, Connie. Lock her up, Chief. And keep her arrest quiet as long as you can. Now, see! Shut up, sister! Mr. Carter, I'd appreciate it if you'd come along to headquarters with us and bring that phony money. Sure, glad to, Chief. Patsy, you better stay here. And if there's a phone call, pretend you're Connie and stall until I get back. Right. Now, don't let anyone in but me. I'll be back in 30 minutes. Almost 30 minutes since Nick left. Better be here any minute now. Nothing's happened. Oh, there he is. Coming, Nick! Oh. Gene Turner, ain't it? Why, uh, uh, why, yes, yes, I'm Gene Turner. We're from the boss. Well, well who, who do you mean? Never mind who we mean. You got the stuff? The, the stuff? Oh, oh, you The you... funny money, baby, the yeah. funny money. Oh. Ready to pay off in real dough. Yeah, 50 grand. Show us, Slim. Uh, uh... Yeah. Does that convince you that you're talking to the right guys? Well, I, I... You see, boys, there's been a little hitch. Have you got the stuff or ain't you? Well, uh, well, not right now. But if you'll come back in half an hour... What kind of a runaround is this? You knew we'd be here for it at 9 o'clock tonight. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But, uh, look, come back in half an hour and I'll explain. Well, explain sooner than that, baby. Well, Get but, your hat. But my hat? Yeah, you're going to explain to the boss in person. <laughs> Afraid to resist and hoping she can continue to carry out the bluff, Patsy has no choice but to leave the hotel with the two gangsters. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Great Impersonation. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. After sending a telegram to the nearest office of the Treasury Department, informing them of the counterfeit money found in Connie Mills' luggage, Nick returns to the Hotel Bradford, expecting to find Patsy waiting in Connie's room. Finding the room empty, he goes to the hotel desk. Miss Bowen? Yes, Miss Bowen. Oh, the young lady who came in with you. Yes, yes, have you seen her? Why, she just this minute left with two men. With two men? Well, they must have been coming down the elevator as you went up, Mr. Carter. What do they look like? Well, they were rather hard-looking, flashily... Which way they go? Or through the street door. Perhaps you can still catch them. It hasn't been more than a minute since they left. Howdy! Right you looking for a cab? Yeah. The girl who was with me when you picked us up at the station. You see, I just come out of the hotel with two men. Sure, they got into a black sedan. That's it. Up at the corner, waiting for the red light. Oh, there they go. The night's changed. Catch up with them. No, let them get away. Hey, you really going to introduce me to some of them theatrical producers? Catch that car. I'll introduce you to every producer in New York. I know you made a deal. Hey, you know what? I forgot to do for you before. Cary Grant, listen. Never mind the impersonations now. Catch that car. What are I doing them if I catch them? Horse them over to the curb. Hey, look, I'll get in trouble with the car. Do what I tell you, will you? This is a matter of life or death. Okay. Okay, chum. Now? Yeah, shove them over. Then stop and front of them so they can't get away. Right. Here it comes. <laughs> What's the meaning of this, young man? You alone in this car? Certainly I am, but don't think I'm helpless. I'll scream for the police. Look here, driver. I thought you said Patsy and those two men were in this car. Gee, pal, I thought it was this one. All these big black sedans look alike. I'm sorry. Tell me about it later. Sorry, madam. It was all a mistake. Driver, take me to police headquarters right away. And see if you can impersonate a cab driver in a hurry. (laughs) 
Keep moving, sister. Well, Boss is going to be mighty interested in why you ain't got that dough. And whatever your reason is, it had better be good. But I, I told right, you save that... Save it for the boss. Now, right to the store. Okay. Hey, boss, I brought him. I told you and Benny never come here to my home. I told you that... Mr. Hanford. What's she doing here? This is the girl Ollie Graham sent with her stuff, boss. But she ain't got it. And she acted so funny about it, we thought you'd... You're fools. Fools, both of you. So you're the boss, the great reformer, the man who fights crime. Shut up. Why... Shut up. Is something wrong, boss? This isn't the girl Grena sent. She's Nick Carter's assistant. His assistant, you hear me? But we went to room 1018 at the Bradford like you told us, and she said her name was Jack I don't care. I don't care what she said. So you're the gang leader Jack Blaney found out about. And it was you who killed him, you dirty... A necessity, my dear. A regrettable necessity. Now I'm afraid we must take the same measures with you. What? The same measures. We got to bump the dame off, too? Oh, no. Hey, look, no. Boss, this ain't so good if she's Nick Carter. You do as I tell you. Exactly as I tell you. Perhaps we can make it appear an accident. Oh, no, please. Please, please kind no. of an accident. I don't know yet. I'll have to think it over. I have to think it over. Take her out to the old Deshu place. Wait for a call from me. When I make up my mind. Okay, boss. Come on, yes. baby. We're going right. Let me go. I'll, I'll scream. I'll raise the whole neighborhood. Oh, you won't. I, I, uh... Too bad I had to slug your sister. Now you won't get no chance to scream ever. Got Patsy. How do you know? The desk clerk said she left the hotel with two hard-looking characters. She wouldn't have stirred out of that room until I got back unless she'd been forced to. Maybe we'd better go see Mr. Hanford. Who's chief of police in this town? You or Hanford? Why, uh, I am, but him and me always work together, and I kind of depend on him. time, let's depend on the police force. I want to talk to the men who know the districts where this gang might have a hideout. Oh, sure, Mr. Carter. Anything you say. Alan Bates, send Myerson and Dunphy in here on the double. Sorry if I seem impatient, Chief, but... Anything happens to Patsy? I know how you feel, but I still think we ought to talk to Mr. Hanford. I was just reading the editorial he wrote in tonight's paper all about the Blaney killing. Yes, yes. I'm sure it's a fine editorial. Oh, you bet. A real tearjerker, too. About how Blaney was working late, and when he stepped out to get a pack of cigarettes, he... What? Guy... Huh? Let me see that editorial. Oh, sure, here. Yeah. Yes, Chief, you're right. I think we should go see Mr. Hanford. Good. I'll get a squad. Don't go. I have a taxi waiting outside. Come on. <laughs> See, what's the meaning of breaking? Look here, Hanford, I'm going to give you just two minutes to tell me where your thugs have taken this bone. And if you don't tell me, I'll wring your scrawny old neck. Well, no, no, no. Look, Mr. Carter, I know you're excited. Excited? But... I've gone way past that, Chief. The gang leader you weren't able to find is a man who's been your unofficial advisor, Mr. Cyrus Hanford. Get out of your mind. Out of your mind. You listened in on Blaney's phone call to me last night, Hanford. You heard him tell me he knew who was behind the gang. So you had him killed before I could get him. That's a lie. I didn't even know he made such a call. Take a look at this editorial you wrote in tonight's Daily Crusader. It says that Blaney was leaving the building to get a pack of cigarettes when he was murdered. There wasn't anybody else in the building he could have told that to. So how did you know his reason for going out at that time? Well, I was only guessing. Only guessing. Mighty good guessing, Mr. Hanford, because Jack told me over the phone that he was going out for cigarettes soon. What about it? Listening in on that phone conversation was the only way you could have known about those cigarettes. And when you wrote the editorial, you unconsciously proved your own guilt. Hey, I never even thought of Mr. Hanford. But it is kind of funny that every time we'd plan a raid on one of the mob's gambling houses, they seem to know about it ahead of time. You think you can go into court with any such ridiculous trumped up evidence? They'll laugh in your face. Laugh in your face. Your two minutes are up, Hanford. You gonna tell me where Patsy is? Or... Why did you let him lay a hand on me? He said he was gonna break your neck, and I hope he dies. Where is you? I don't know. Where? I don't know. He killed me. That's swell by me. Don't hit me, Carter. Don't, don't. don't. I'll talk fast, then. I'll tell you. She, she, she hasn't been hurt at all. Not hurt at all. Let me use the phone. I'll, I'll have her here in a few minutes. Okay, go ahead. And to think that old buzzard's is making a sap out of me all the time. My mother, it's the your number. Hey, hello, hello, son. This is the boss. This is the boss. You, you know what I said about the girl, about uh, you and Benny putting the girl uh, out of the way. Yeah. Well, uh, do it now. Do it fast. Kill her. Kill her. As Hanford shrieks the order for Patsy's death, Nick and Chief Ramsey grab frantically for the phone, but too late. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Great Impersonation. 
today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Pretending he is phoning his thugs to bring Patsy back unharmed, Cyrus Hanford gives orders for her to be killed. Kill her! Kill her! Why, you dummy! And save her now if you can. No, murder, no, devil! Well, right. maybe you can prove I gave the orders to kill Blaney, Connor. Maybe you can. Yeah. But they can only hang me once. And I'll have the satisfaction, Roy, I've paid you for your meddling. Oh, gosh, Mr. Carter, if we only knew where they are, I could call out the radio cars. Take a to a farm, 50 miles out of town. By the time your radio cars get there, it'll be too late. Go ahead and call out your men, Chief. I'll be right back. Where are you going? I want to see a taxi about a man. <laughs> Do me, you so good to fight, sister. You keep twisting around like that, and it might take two or three slugs to do the job. Just one bullet right between the eyes. No, no. That's the phone, Slim. Well, so what? Well, nobody would be calling out here but the boss, would they? No. Okay, I'll get it. Hang on to it, Benny. You bet. Did you kill me, Mr. Finder? You're on your dumb. Hush. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, Slim. Uh, this is the boss. Uh, this is the boss again. Yeah, boss. Is the girl still all right? Is she? Is she all right? We're just getting to that little matter now, boss. Well, everything's changed. It's all changed. Carter's found out about us. He's found out. Now we've got to get out. We've got to get out fast. Okay, but what about the dame? Bring her with you. We're taking her along as a hostage. Carter won't dare try to stop us if we have her in the car. He won't dare. Yeah, that's a smart idea, boss. I'll wait for you at the corner of Ninth and Livermore in a green and white taxi. Green and white. Bring the girl, pick me up there in 20 minutes. There's the green and white cab, Benny. Pull over and stop. Okay. As long as you're making a getaway, why not let me go? All right, you. Oh. Is that you? Is that you, Slim? Yeah, boss. And we got the girl with us. You'll have to get out and help me. Have to help me, both of you. Uh, come on, Benny. Something's wrong with the boss. What do you mean, wrong? Is he hurt? Well, I don't know, but... Don't know. Hey, boss. What? He ain't in his cab. Keep your hands where I can see them. Hey! You and Benny both. Who the cops? Yeah. And if either of you'd like to make a run for it, we'll show you that cops can use machine guns, too. <laughs> Drive a little faster, Chris. We don't want to miss our train. Uh, I'll get you that, pal. Nick, Hanson had an almost perfect setup, didn't he? Just about, Betsy. Of course, no one ever suspected the city's most fanatical of human. Well, not only that, Hanford actually helped land the campaigns against himself so that he knew every move the police would make before they made it. Yeah, but there were some arrests and some gambling houses were closed. Ah, but never any of Hanford's. He used the police to wipe out his competitors only. Ah, uh, well, I guess he knew what he was talking about when he said Chief Ramsey wasn't very smart. Well, it was ideal for Hanford's purpose. Yeah. Everyone knew the Chief was strictly honest, and yet it was easy for Hanford to make a fool of him. Tell me, Nick, how did you ever induce Hanford to put through that second phone call? The one that made Slim and Benny bring me to the place where you and the officers were waiting. Oh, <laughs> that. I couldn't make him do that, Betsy. But he did it. Oh, no, he didn't. He... That was Chris, our impersonating cab driver here. He was? Yes, yeah, that was me, in the flesh. But, but if it was Chris, how did you know what number to call? I listened very carefully to Hanford's dialing when he made his phone call. Oh, and you counted the clicks so you knew what the number was. Right, so while the chief called out his men, I dashed down and got Chris, who was waiting in his cab at the entrance to the building. I told him what number to call, and he made the call, in Hanford's voice. Well, I'll be darned. And don't, don't forget them producers, pal. <laughs> I uh, don't, Chris. They'll listen to you if I have to tie them down. That's a promise. Yeah, see, thanks. I'll do the same for you sometime. Uh, the same for you. Oh, Nick, that really sounds a lot like Hanford. Over the phone, it was close enough. It was the only thing I could think of that would be fast enough. And believe me, Chris gave a star performance. Yeah, it was a cinch. Everybody in Santa City knows that funny way old man Hanford talks. I told you I could impersonate anybody. Chris, you're wonderful. Hey, I got another one I want you to hear. Margaret O'Brien. Margaret O... Oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> Nick. 
Dick, what about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser has for us next week? Well, Mike, it's a story of a girl who looked as if she'd never get a husband. And then when she did get one, she shot him. But Nick felt sorry for her, so he tried to send someone else up for the murder. You mean to say that Nick framed an innocent person for murder? Well, it's a long story, Mike. I'm afraid it'll have to wait till next Sunday. All right, but what do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Homely Bride. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. With millions of additional children entering our schools during the next few years, the nation faces serious educational handicaps. Inferior education for our boys and girls may damage our prosperity, our traditions of freedom, our security. That's why we urge every adult to work with local civic groups and school boards to help improve educational conditions. Show by your interest and friendliness that you appreciate the importance of your children's teachers. They mold our nation's future. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleansers. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I want you to take a look at this picture of Barclay's body. No, please. All Nick wants to know is whether Mr. Barclay was lying in that same position when you left the cabin. Stop talking about it. I said I killed him. What more do you want? I want a lot more. I want to get you out of this jail. And the best way to do it is by putting someone else in here instead. And now, the case of the homely bride. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Agnes Perry is not a pretty girl, and she's so painfully timid that the gossips predicted she'd never get a husband, even with her father's millions. But you never can tell. It's early evening in the Perry home as Tony Barkley, handsome and self-assured, sits facing Agnes's father and her best friend, Linda Forsythe. Mr. Perry, I dropped in to tell you that Agnes won't be home for dinner tonight. You see... We're eloping. Oh, Tony, not really. Oh, I'm so happy for you both. Well, I, uh... An elopement isn't necessary, my boy. If Agnes loves you... Loves uh... me? Huh. She's mad about me. Oh, Tony, you clown. Oh, give me a handkerchief, somebody. Oh, here you are, Linda. Thanks. And don't say I'm crying, either. It's just that my glasses are getting misty. Agnes and I plan to meet in a little town upstate and be married tonight. In fact, she's waiting there for me now. Well, I, I don't understand. Isn't it a bit unusual to inform the bride's father before an elopement? Yes, but in this case it makes no difference. You couldn't stop us if you wanted to. But I don't want to, my boy. Of course, I don't know you very well, but uh, just before you came here from the West Coast, we had a letter from my old friend, Judge Hamilton. I know. A letter telling you that I was a fine young man. Plenty of money, good family. How did you know that? I wrote the letter myself. What? And since Judge Hamilton has been abroad, naturally, you haven't been able to check up on me. You wrote that letter? Yes. Forgery is one of my many accomplishments. You should ask the police about me. I'm quite a notorious character, really. You're joking. Not at all. I have a very interesting record. Swindling, fraud, picking pockets, armed robbery... Of course, those were when I was younger, and my methods were more crude than they are now. Barclay. Incidentally, my real name is Tony Blaze. What's the point of all this? Well, I was thinking. It's going to be a wonderful story for the newspapers. Millionaire's daughter weds criminal. I'm beginning to understand. You think I'll pay you not to marry my daughter, is that it? Precisely. The only way to stop the wedding now, Mr. Perry, is by writing me a check for $100,000. $100,000? 100, Why, you're out of your mind. Mr. Perry, 
You know what would happen to a sensitive girl like Agnes if she married this man. You can afford the money. For Agnes' sake, pay him and... I'll give you 10000 and not one cent more. Oh, no. Marrying Agnes will be much more profitable than that. <gasps> Tony, you're not serious. Oh, but I am, my dear. I've just decided in a few months, Mr. Perry will be willing to pay twice 100000 for a nice, quiet divorce. If I make Agnes unhappy enough. And believe me, I can. And will. Linda, call the police. Stay where you are, Miss Forsythe. That revolver doesn't frighten me. If either of you charming people tries to stop me, I'll show you I'm not bluffing. If you dare to marry her... Suppose you tell me all about it when I return from my honeymoon, Miss Forsythe. an hour since he left, Mr. Carter. I tried everywhere to find you. I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, but Miss Bone and I were both out of the office. You've got to stop them, no matter what it costs. Well, it isn't money that's important now, Mr. Perry. It's time. Well, they can't get married tonight, Nick. Even if they could get a license, there's a three-day waiting period in this state. If he doesn't have a license already, Patsy. Yeah. And if they plan to get married in this state... Oh, if there were only some way to warn every minister and justice of the peace in this part of the country and to tell them... Wait a minute. Huh? There is a way. Well, how, Nick? By radio. Why, yes. The station manager of WQXQ is a friend of mine. And if he'll let us run an announcement every now and then... No, no, no. We can't put the story on the air, Carter. Think of the scandal. Well, Mr. Perry, the important thing is to keep your daughter from marrying this man, isn't it? Well, I... Yes, of course. All right. Go ahead with the radio announcements, Carter. Agnes, take the Anthony to be my lawful wedded husband. To love, honor, and cherish so long as we both may live. And by the virtue of the power vested in me, I now pronounce you. Well, this is our cabin, Agnes. Not much of a honeymoon cottage, is it? Oh, I don't mind, darling. <laughs> Nothing matters except that we're married. Oh, Tony, I'm so happy. I... Here, here, stop there. There, that's the girl. Oh, um, I'd better go put the car out of sight. I don't want anybody to spot it. All right, darling. And while you're gone, I'll unpack your suitcase for you. Wait for my suitcase. Well, Tony, I was only going to... Oh, I, I, I know, darling, but I'm rather fussy about my things. Uh, look, there's a radio in this cabin. See if you can get some music, huh? I don't want my bride feeling unhappy. believed to be in the vicinity of the state line. We ask all ministers and justices of the peace who may hear this broadcast not to marry any couple answering the description we have just given you, and to communicate with the station immediately. The man has boasted that the marriage is merely an attempt to extort money from the girl's father, and that he has a long criminal record. Mm. Your cooperation may no, prevent a tragedy. It. We now resume our midnight music app. Why did he act that way about the suitcase? As if he had something in it that he didn't want me to see. I've got to know. I've got to. A revolver. Oh. Agnes. Tony. What I told you not to open that suitcase. Tony. Why are you carrying this? Why, I... I, I always carry a gun, baby. For protection, that's all. Don't lie to me. It was on the radio that you're a criminal, that you only married me because of my father's money. All right, so I did. Why else would anyone marry a stupid little thump like you? Tony! Oh, no, 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 I don't believe it. You said... I said I loved you, huh? And you were sap enough to believe me. But it's cash I'm in love with, darling. Papa's cash. Oh, Tony, you... Oh, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> Good. Good, I want it that way. You're going to hate me a lot more unless Papa pays up. I won't stay here a minute longer. I'm going home. Well, no, you're not. Take your hands off me. Tell me. Why, you little... Slap me, will you? No dame can get away with that. Keep away from me, Tony. I can play rough, too. Don't you touch me. I'll... 
I'll kill you if you do. <laughs> God kid me. You haven't got nerve enough to use that gun. I will. I swear I will. I'm going to give you a little lesson in wifely you. You. You little fool, you. <laughs> Mr. Perry, well, where have you been? Do you realize it's 8 o'clock in the morning? I, I've been walking the streets for hours. When we didn't hear anything by midnight, I knew it wasn't any use. Well, it's a good thing somebody stayed here at the radio station. Nick's on the phone now. You mean they've been found? I think so. Listen. I see well, thank you, Mr. Megley. Yes, I'm sorry, too, but it was good of you to call. Goodbye. Who was it, Carter? A justice of the peace from upstate. What? I heard the announcement on the morning newscast. A justice of the peace? You mean they're married? Yes. Oh. He said he performed the ceremony at 10.30 last night. I, I see. Well, I suppose there's nothing to do now but go home and wait. Oh, I'll get it, Patrick. Uh-huh. You better go tell the announcer not to broadcast any more of those notices. All right, Nick. Nick Carter speaking. This is Linda Forsythe, Mr. Carter. Is Agnes' father there? Oh, yes, just a moment. For you, Mr. Perry, Miss Forsythe. Oh, I asked Linda to stay at my house last night. I wonder if Agnes has called her. Uh, hello, Linda. Mr. Perry, I have wonderful news. Agnes is back. She's there at the house now? Yes, she must have come home during the night sometime. Is that man with her? No. Uh, one of the maids found Agnes asleep in her own room a few minutes ago. But but she's locked herself in and won't talk to me. I and think... Hold on, we'll be home in ten minutes. Oh, leave me alone. Leave me alone. I won't tell you anything about it. But, Miss Perry, I know you and Tony Blaze were married. <laughs> I didn't naturally, your father wants to know why you came home alone. Nick, why don't you give her a chance to get control of herself before you start firing questions at her? Maybe you're right, Patsy. Perhaps you'd feel better if you had some breakfast, Agnes. I don't want anything. I beg pardon, Mr. Perry. Yes, Gordon? There's a gentleman who insists upon seeing Miss Agnes. My daughter isn't seeing anyone. Tell him to go away. It wouldn't do any good if he did tell me, Mr. Well, Perry. Sergeant Madison. Hello, Patsy. Hi, Nick. Hi, Matty. What are you doing here? Official business, Nick. What do you mean, official business? I didn't send for the police. The police? No, 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 I didn't do anything. Of course not, dear. He isn't here to see you. Uh, that's where you're wrong, Mr. Perry. I'm here to arrest your daughter on suspicion of murder. Agnes Perry's despair is equaled by the shock and grief in the eyes of her father as Matty makes the arrest. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the Homely Bride. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's a couple of hours later, and at police headquarters, Agnes Perry is giving her version of what happened in the tourist cabin the night before. When Tony admitted that, that he only married me in order to get money out of father, I said I was going home. He grabbed me and... And I... you had a fight. That's when you fell against the chair near the bed and broke your watch, wasn't it? No, no, there wasn't any fight. I noticed the crystal is missing from your watch. And we found thin pieces of curved glass near that upset chair. I don't know anything about that. I okay, don't... okay, go ahead. What time was all this? Well, about 12.30, I think. Yeah? Then what happened? Well, I broke away from him, ran outside to my car, and drove home. And during the time it took you to get in the car, start the motor, and put it in gear, why didn't he catch up with you? Well, he, he, he didn't try. He only chased me as far as the door. He chased you to the door, yet you still found time to stop and pick up your coat? No, I didn't. I just ran. I didn't stop for anything. Okay, okay. Now I'll tell you what really happened. You fought with Tony Blaze about 3 o'clock. No! Not 12.30, because the medical examiner says he was shot sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. It was 12.30, I tell you. Huh? I mean, that's when I left the cabin. Oh, and when you broke away, you didn't run out the door. You picked up that gun of his and shot him. No, no, I didn't. After that, you didn't need to hurry, so you got your coat and purse, walked out to the car and came it's home. It's a lie. I didn't shoot him. All right, then why are your fingerprints all over the gun and only your fingerprints? I told you, I found it in his suitcase. I picked it up. Yeah. Excuse me, excuse me, Matty. Yeah, Nick? I suppose you've had ballistics check the revolver to be sure it's the one that killed Tony Blaze. Well, naturally. All three bullets came out of the same gun, 
We dug two out of the wall, the one that missed him completely and the one that grazed his head. There was a third bullet in his heart. And, I see. Oh, why are you so sure it happened at exactly 3.15? Because, Nick, something aroused the woman who runs the camp. She realized later it must have been the shooting, of course. She looked out her window and saw Miss Perry here leaving. Wearing a coat? Yeah, a white coat you could see a mile off. That's how the woman knew who it was. Miss Perry was wearing that same coat when she checked into the place. She's lying. I left my coat at the cabin when I ran out. It's not there now, Miss Perry. But I can't... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's forget the coat a minute, Maddie. Huh? About the time element. Couldn't the woman be mistaken? No, not a chance, Nick. In the first place, she looked at her clock. In the second place, she wasn't even home until after 2.30. Oh. You see, Nick, none of the other cabins were rented last night, so the woman went into town to a party. I see. Now, look, Miss Perry, everybody knows Tony Blaze was a king-size heel. So maybe if you would admit the truth... I won't admit anything. Would... You're trying to trap me. Okay, okay, then. I'll have to hold you for the grand jury. And I hope you've got a better story then than you have now. <laughs> I can't believe it. Agnes accused of murder, policeman here in my home, searching for evidence. Please don't worry, Mr. Perry. No jury will ever convict Agnes under the circumstances. Maybe they won't, Miss Forsythe, if she'd admit the circumstances. And if she sticks to the story she told at headquarters, she may be charged with first-degree murder. Well, you're probably right, Carter. Even I can see that Agnes is lying. But why but... should she lie about such unimportant things? The time and whether or not she was wearing a coat. But she's hysterical, that's all. You don't know Agnes as I do, Mr. Carter. She's always been terribly shy, frightened of everybody. How long have you known her, Miss Forsythe? Well, only about six months, really. But but we've been like sisters. Oh, Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? I asked Gordon of the butler, you know. Oh, yes, yes, I know. Well, I asked him to come down here and tell you what he just told Sergeant Matheson. Tell him, Gordon. Well, sir, it's... Just that I heard Miss Agnes come home last night. And why didn't you tell somebody, Gordon? You knew how frantic we all were. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, but I didn't know it was Miss Agnes at the time. I, I thought it was you, sir. Why should you think that? Could that have been Miss Forsythe here or one of the servants? Oh, no, sir. The only persons with a latch key are Miss Agnes, Mr. Perry, and myself, sir. Anyone else would have to ring the door, but... The time would be just about right. That's what I was thinking. Well, Nick, Nick, I found it. What matter? The white coat Miss Perry said she didn't wear home. She tried to burn it in the furnace, but there's still plenty left for identification. And look at those blood stains. Is that Agnes's coat, Mr. Perry? Yes, I... I'm afraid it is. And it's the last piece of evidence needed to smash that story of hers to smithereens. Oh, what's the use? Yes, 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 I shot him. No, I hope you're satisfied. Please, Miss Perry, don't look on a bit. And Miss Patsy and I came here to the jail hoping we could help you. That's the truth, Miss Perry. Why don't you tell Nick just what happened? <laughs> well, he was going to hit me. I warned him to stay away, but he kept coming with that awful look on his face. I was almost out of my mind with fear. I, I didn't even realize what I was doing. Oh, now, now, look, you mustn't get excited. You see, Nick, it was self-defense. Yeah, but the next thing is to prove it. Oh, well, can you with everybody lying about me? Nobody's lying about you, Miss They're Pat. all lying. That woman at the camp, the police, even Gordon. They lied about the code, about the time it happened, even about my breaking my watch. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you still insist that the shooting took place at 12.30 and that you came back home without your coat? Of course I do, because it's the truth. And you didn't fall against that chair and break your watch, Chris? I didn't fall against anything. Hmm. Look, Miss Perry, 
How many times did you fire that revolver? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, wait. I have a picture here that the police photographer took of the body. I don't want to see it. You've got to. This is important. All right. Now, tell me. Was this the way he was lying when you left the cabin? No. No, he was more on his side and not next to the bed. He, he was over by the easy chair. He must have lived long enough to crawl a few feet. No, Patsy, uh, that last bullet killed him instantly. Oh, please stop talking about it! I said I killed him. What more do you want? I want a lot more, Miss Perry. I want to get you out of this cell. <laughs> and the best way to do it is by putting someone else here instead. <clears throat> Sergeant Matheson, this is Patsy. Nick just got back to the office, and he wants to know whether you have any report on those fingerprints yet. And the broken glass, too, Patsy. Oh, yes, the glass fragments, too, Sergeant. Okay, I'll hold on. You've gone for the report now, Nick. Good. Why this sudden interest in fingerprints? You know the only prints on the revolver that killed Tony Blaze was Agnes's. I know, but these are different. I got one of them from a teacup, and the other off the lock button on the Perry's front door. Off the what? A little button on the lock that you press when you want to leave the door off the latch. But what the... Oh, yes, Sergeant. They were. And how about the glass? I see. Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. What did he say? Those fingerprints were both made by the same person. But it wasn't Agnes Perry. That's what I hoped for. And how about the pieces of glass? Well, it seems that Agnes is telling the truth about her watch, at least. Those fragments weren't from a watch crystal after all. They were optical glass. That makes things more interesting. Gotta get your hat, Patsy. We're going to travel. No <laughs> idea it was so mountainous. Do you really think you can do anything to help Agnes, Mr. Carter? I do. As a matter of fact, I intend to prove that Agnes Perry didn't kill her husband. But, but she confessed. I know she did, but I found a fingerprint on the latch button of the front door that's going to convict the real murderer. I don't understand. Uh, here's the turn, Miss Forsyth. Oh. I almost missed that. Yeah. And you turned right, Miss Forsyth. I told you to make a left turn. Oh, oh, how stupid of me. I'll turn around. No, no, never mind. The tourist camp is on this road. But how did you know? What? Why, well, I didn't. <laughs> what is so miserable over the cliff? It's all right. I just swerved to avoid that dog. I didn't see it until it was almost under our wheels. Oh, you, you almost gave me heart failure. Must be a hundred feet down to the river. Miss Forsythe probably didn't notice the dog because she doesn't see so well without her glasses, Patsy. My glasses? How did you know that I... You usually wear them while driving, don't you? Well, of course I do, but... But they're broken, aren't they, Miss Forsythe? You broke them last night in the tourist cabin where you killed Tony Blaze. That's utterly ridiculous. You say you've never been over this road before? I haven't. Yet because you were excited, you took the right-hand turn, even though I purposely told you to turn left. But that doesn't mean anything. I'd say it means you made this same trip before. Last night, when you slipped the latch on the front door of the Perry home so that you could get back in unobserved. I did no such thing. Oh, yes, you did. Your fingerprint was on the push button of the automatic lock. The same print you left on the teacup this afternoon. Suppose I did touch that push button. You still can't prove I was ever in that cabin. I think we can. By having an oculus compare the pieces of broken glass found in the cabin with a prescription for your eyeglasses. All right, smart boy. So I did kill him. But I won't go to the chair for it. I'd rather die this way. If you're going over the cliff! Linda Forsythe twists the wheel of the speeding car toward the edge of the cliff with its hundred-foot drop, intending to kill not only herself, but Nick and Patsy as well. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of... The Case of the Homely Bride. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Rather than take a chance on the electric chair, Linda Forsythe turns the wheel of her fast-moving car toward the side of the mountain road, where there's a sheer hundred-foot drop. Nick, we're going over the cliff! Let go of the wheel! Yes, they don't try to kill. Oh. oh, 
Oh, thank heaven. We hit a tree instead of going over. Yeah. I managed to twist the wheel enough to avoid that. Yeah, but, but even hitting a tree at that speed, I mean, why aren't we smashed up more? I managed to get my foot on the brake and jammed it down hard. But why did you have to go snooping around? They'd have acquitted Agnes, but... But it made me a different story for you. Why did you kill Tony Blaze anyway? He double-crossed me. I was the one he was going to marry, not Agnes. He said it would only be a bluff to get money out of her father. Then you were in on the whole scheme. Well, of course I was. Tony would never have been able to meet Agnes if I hadn't made friends with her and introduced him. And then you stayed right with her so that you could encourage the courtship, huh? I did it because I loved him. And he said he loved me. We were going to take the money and get married. And then he... And then he decided it'd be more profitable in the long run to marry Agnes and collect afterwards. Yes. I knew where they'd gone, so I came up here to have it out with him. And then he got nasty. He hit me. So it was you who fell over the chair and broke your glasses. Yes. I must have gone crazy. I grabbed up the gun. But Agnes said she shot him. She did. What? One bullet went wild and another grazed his head and made him unconscious. He would just come out of it a little while before I got there. And you got the idea of putting the blame on her, huh? Yes. I was sure her fingerprints were still on the gun. Tony was still groggy. He didn't notice what I was doing. So I picked it up with my handkerchief. And finished the job. Then you put on Agnes's white coat before leaving the cabin so that if anyone saw you, they'd think it was she. That's right. Oh, Mr. Carter, what do you think they'll do to me? I don't know, Miss Forsythe. But since you're so fond of wearing Agnes Perry's clothes, we'll see how that prison uniform of hers will fit you. <laughs> Well, Nick, what about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser will bring us next week? It's a story, Mike, about a politician who found an oriental dancer in his bathtub, dead. And Nick didn't like the costume the corpse was wearing because it exposed an uneven suntan. But what suntan got to do with murder? It had plenty to do with this one, Mike, along with a jealous wife and a sideshow barker and an old-fashioned political rally. Well, now, that sounds like quite an adventure. What do you call it, Nick? I call it The Case of the Candidate's Corpse. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser Although it is only 10 o'clock in the morning Nick Carter has a prospective client in his office A client whose pompous dignity is a bit startling So, I am the Honorable Wilton Nigel Oh yes, yes, you're a politician, aren't you, Mr. Nigel? I, Mr. Carter, am a public servant Statesman would be an apter term than politician. Uh, uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Nigel? Oh, thank you. Mr. Carter, I want you to protect me. Protect you? From what? I'm scheduled to be the speaker of the day at a stupendous political rally this afternoon in Springville. Uh, that's about 20 miles from here. Oh, I read about that. It's going to be an all-day celebration. There'll be a carnival and barbecue and fireworks. Yes, indeed. And my address is to be the feature event of the day. Uh, about 50,000 uh, constituents are expected to hear me. And uh, you want me to protect you from them? Certainly not. Mr. Carter, there's a plot afoot. The uh, Honorable Leonard Squire, my opponent, is tied up with a gangster element. And they'll stop at nothing to discredit me. What do they threaten to do? Oh, they wouldn't dare threaten me. My information comes from a... Uh, a roundabout source. Information regarding what, Mr. Nigel? You're telling me practically nothing. All I know is that something's uh, up. And that's not any more definite. You'll have to trust my judgment that you're needed, Mr. Carter. And I'll pay you $5,000 to keep me from being discredited at this rally. No, thank you, Mr. Nigel. If you'd give me the whole story, maybe I could help you put under the... Then you refuse to take my case? That's entirely up to you. I regret your decision. I thought I could count on you to help me. If you change your mind, my office still open. Good day. Honestly, of all the pompous old fuddy duddies. He's pompous now, Patsy, but it's obvious he expects to be deflated. The man's really frightened about something. I wonder what... Well, you don't think anybody tried to hurt him physically, do you? I don't know. But I can't think of a better spot for a skullduggery than one of those old-fashioned political rallies. Well... Crowds, crowds, excitement, noise. You know, Patsy, just out of curiosity... We're going to Springville. Nick, is this a political rally or a country fair? Well, it's supposed to be.
to be a political rally. Oh, look. They even have a sideshow. Yes, with an oriental dancer who certainly should draw the crowd. Even if the Honorable Mr. Nigel doesn't. Oh, gee. He must be some politician if he has to resort to shows like this to get folks to listen to him. Yeah. Hey, come on. Right, Let's listen gentlemen, to this bar. He's just starting his close. spiel. Gather up close, the gentlemen. On the inside of this tent, you will see Rosita, that dainty little oriental dancer doing a famous landslide dance. It's a sensation, gentlemen. It's daring. It's delightful. Okay, Rosita, go on inside. All right, gentlemen, step right up to the ticket booth. Have your money ready. All right, I'll take two, please. Come on, take one, please. Go on, Rosita, hurry up, though. No, I ain't going in, Harry. Not till I get the money you owe me. I ain't cut it. You've got more dough in your pocket today than you ever had in your life before. Now, look. Oh, I'm Jesus. tired of being a sap. I'm leaving, Harry. What? Why, I would have slept, you silly. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to the hotel to see a guy with real money. <laughs> you're bluffing. Yeah? Ask the Honorable Wilton Nigel if I'm bluffing, you cheap chiseler. But you can't do this to me. What am I going to do? There's a couple of costumes in my dressing room, wise guy. Do the dance yourself. <laughs> That's it. Did you hear what that dancing girl said about Wilton and Nigel? I heard it, but I still don't believe it. You know, I think I'll go and have a talk with Mr. Nigel myself. But I thought you weren't going to take his case. Oh, I might have known you couldn't resist. Uh-huh. In other words, you don't want to come to the hotel with me? And listen to old windbag Nigel, I should say not. I'll amuse myself here where there's something interesting going on. Okay. Where will I find you when I'm through talking to him? I'll be somewhere near here. Oh, um, if you need Rosita there, give her my regard. Come on, come on, open up. Yes? Is this Mr. Wilton, Nigel Sweet? It is, and who may I ask are you? I'm Nick Carter. I'd like to talk to Mr. Nigel. So do I, but he isn't here. You know where he is? If I knew, I'd be there, too. Oh? And who, if I may ask, are you? I'm Mrs. Wilton, Nigel. Oh, you just wait till I get my hands on that man. Is something wrong, Mrs. Nigel? Wrong? There certainly is. You see, he and I went to a political breakfast and... Yes, I know. When I was here earlier, the desk clerk told me he was at that breakfast. So I went there to see him, but was told that he'd already left. He certainly did. When we were about half through, I left the table to make a phone call. And then when I got back, he had disappeared. You know where he went? No, and nobody at the breakfast seemed to know either. So I waited for him. But when he didn't come back, I finally returned here alone. So, uh... You have no idea where your husband might be now, then? No, but two different bellboys told me that a woman came up here this morning. A young woman in a scanty oriental costume, even had a veil over her face. A woman who had... How long have you been here? Only a few minutes. Why? And how long ago did your husband leave the breakfast? About an hour ago, more or less. Oh, there he is now. Oh, hello, Stella, dear. It's Sergeant Matheson. This is... Hey, Hi. Nick Hi. Carter. Marty. Hey, what are you doing here? Mr. Nigel told the chief you turned him down. I did, but... Hey, aren't you outside your bailiwick, Matty? <laughs> well, it's my day off, and Mr. Nigel's a personal friend of the chief, and Dr. so I... Dr. Matheson volunteered to be my uh, guest at this great political rally, Mr. Carter. Uh, uh, yeah, wait yeah. a minute, Mr. Nigel. Uh, hmm? What's that water coming from under your bathroom door? Water from under your bathroom looks like you need a plumber, Mr. Nigel. You better see what's the matter. Great Scott, it looks like the Johnstown flood. Oh, good heavens, you forgot to turn off the water after you shaved this morning, Wilson. I'll turn it off right now. Still, that water's coming from the tub, but I didn't think of it this morning. Are you sure neither of you saw a girl in this hotel suite this morning? I'm sure I didn't, but I'm not at all sure what Wilson saw. Oh, now, Stella. Hey, 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 what's, what's all this about a girl? There's one here, all right, in the bottom of the tub, weighted down with a suitcase. Oh, 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 oh. a girl in my bathtub? Mary. Yeah. You know anybody in the local police force? Sure, do. What? You better give him a ring. Tell him what's happened. Okay, I will. Uh, look, Nick, uh, what do you figure killed her? That'll be up to the coroner, but whatever it was, it's obviously murder. Murder? Sir Nigel, will you come here, please? Well, well, all right. Ever see this girl before? Well, never. Most decidedly not. Mrs. Nigel. Oh, dear. I can't. <laughs> Oh, what a disgraceful costume. Uh, looks like she was a dancer from that outfit she's got on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll go see the local police chief, Nick. Oh, but if, if there's any publicity about this, it, it can ruin my whole campaign. Oh, yeah? Well, you've got more in the campaign to worry about now. This is murder. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, Mr. Carter, who on earth could have done a thing like this? I don't know, Mr. Nigel. 
Both you and your wife have the opportunity to kill this woman. But that's preposterous. You think I'd have anything to do with a woman like that? Well, she's from the carnival, isn't she, Mr. Carter? She is. And I happen to know she left the carnival grounds close to two hours ago. Where are you, then? Why, at the political breakfast, and I haven't been back here since. And you, Mrs. Nigel, where were you? I, uh, why, I was, uh, uh oh, oh. Oh, God, the catch, she fainted. I've got her. Oh, good. Here, put her on the Davenport. Oh, I'll give you a hand. Oh, easy now. Now, there. She'll be all right in a minute. You better get her some water. Oh, what about course, of course, Mr. Carter. Mr. Nigel, would you have any idea why your wife fainted? Why, no. This is the shock of finding a dead body in our bathtub. It wouldn't have been because she didn't want to tell me where she was, would it? Oh, ridiculous. She was at the breakfast with me. She there all the time? Why, uh, uh, you may as well tell me, Nigel. I can easily find out from those who were there. Uh, yes. Well, no, Mr. Carter. Partway through the meal, she excused herself to make a phone call. How long was she gone? Well, as a matter of fact, when I left to meet Sergeant Matheson, she still hadn't come back. I see. Well, Mr. Nigel, as soon as we're sure your wife's all right, you and I are going to see whether we can find out why that girl's body is in your bathtub. You're going to this, this carnival sideshow? I am, Nigel. But Carter, I can't be seen in a place like this palace of oriental wonders. Don't worry. We aren't going in. Thank heaven. The man who runs the show can give us the information I want. Oh, uh, pardon me, mister. Huh? Did you have a girl named Rosita working for you earlier today? Did I? Why, I still got a chance. Rosita, the snappiest little oriental dancer this side of Panama. There'll be a new show in just a few minutes, boys. Listen, mister. I had Harry Hall, boys. Outstanding producer, high-class educational and refined entertainment. And you're sure Rosita's still here? Why, sure, I'm sure. You'll see the little lady in all the glory in just a minute, boys. Give the music the needle, Louis. All right, lucky, 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 lucky. Men, I'm about to show you the most beautiful bit of feminine poker tune you've ever seen. Rosita, the famous Oriental dancer. Come on out, Rosita. <laughs> Why, Mr. Carter, isn't that Where's your gun? It's Patsy. <laughs> Patsy Bowen may be able to pass as Rosita, the oriental dancer, to the satisfaction of the public, but not to the satisfaction of Vic Carter. We'll find out the reason for Patsy's masquerade in just a moment. To the case of the candidate's corpse, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the dancer's dressing room, Matty, who has rejoined Nick, is eyeing high-hat Harry Hall, owner of the Palace of Oriental Wonders, with plenty of suspicion. Nick is still indignant at having found Patsy in a carnival dance act. Don't be stuffy, Nick. I was trying to help you. But, Patsy, I don't see how that... Look, after his dance had left, Mr. Hall was going to close up a show and leave town. And I thought you wouldn't want to let him get away, that's all. And you did right, Patsy. Thanks. Now, uh, Hall, suppose you start talking. Why did Rosita leave your show? Uh, she was just a dame with ideas, I guess. Yeah, you didn't owe her any money. Who, me? Oh, the help money? She said you did. And she also said you had more money today for the first time since he'd known you. Where'd you get it? Oh, listen, smart guy. No, you listen. The local police have asked me to work with them. You mean that thing will stick the cops on me? Why, I'll slug that thing. Oh, no, you won't. Harry, she's dead. Come again? I said she's dead. Her body's in the morgue right now. I don't believe it. You will. You'll even get a chance to look at it. Meanwhile, I'm going to take a look through Rosita's stuff. You won't find anything, Sergeant. No, why not, Patsy? Well, that's another reason I took Rosita's place. I wanted to see whether there were any letters or anything that involved her with Mr. Nigel. Well, good for you, Patsy. What did you find? Nothing. Just extra costumes, makeup, the, the things you expect to find. Oh, speaking of costumes, Patsy... You better get into your street clothes. That Oriental costume. Oh, what's you. the matter? Don't you think I look cute in this outfit? I uh, sure do, baby. As a matter of fact, Patsy, it doesn't look well on you at all. Well, I like that. Why not? Because the suntan pattern on your back doesn't match the lines of the costume. Uh, oh. The Oriental costume is cut very differently from your bathing suit around the shoulders. Say, I guess you're right. I noticed the same thing on another girl just a short time ago. Uh, look, Hall, uh, what's this Rosita's home address? Well, you got me there, Sarge. Oh, come now, Hall. She worked for you. Didn't she have any references? Uh, 
On a show like this, you don't ask for references. You take whoever you can get. Matty? Yeah, Nick. I think we'll give Hall a chance to spend some time with Mr. and Mrs. Nigel. What do you mean? I mean he's going back to the hotel and stay with them while you and I go to the city. Oh, for the love of Pete, Nick. Nick. There are labels in the girls' costumes, and the costumer may have a record of the sales. Of course. A good idea, Patsy. Uh, We can start our search there. Yeah, but look, what if Hall here tries to take a powder while we're gone? Have one of the local policemen keep an eye on him, Matty, and see that he doesn't get away. Patsy. Yes, Nick? For the last time, will you get out of that costume and into some decent <laughs> clothes? You've got work to do. Oh. Well, a lot of good it'll do us to make this trip, Nick. Well, we already got Rosita's address from the costume, didn't we? Yeah, we already know her address, the morgue. Yeah. The costumes were sold to a dance team called the Casal Sisters. Yeah, yeah, and we'll find the address that will be a theatrical boarding house where they won't even remember Rosita. Oh, yeah? This is the place right here. Huh? And it doesn't look like any cheap theatrical boarding house to me. No. Hey, you're right. This is a pretty fair-looking apartment building at that day. Now, let's see, let's see. Hey, we're in luck. Oh, Yeah. Here's the nameplate, see? Oh. Roxanne Cassell, apartment 1C. Yeah. Okay, press the buzzer. <clears throat> More luck, Matty. Somebody's home. Uh, good. You looking for me? You, Roxanne Cassell? Sure. What of it? Got something on you to hey, Just a minute. Your voice. Hey, you're Rosita Cassell. You're wrong there, mister. I'm Roxanne. What's up? Was Rosita your sister... No, we just worked together as a dance team. Then we had a fight and split up. Yeah. Last I heard, she was dancing in the cheap little Carney show. Well, what's she done now? She's been murdered. Murdered? Sure. What? Was it a man who killed her? What? Why do you ask that? Well, she was running around with a guy before she left town. A big shot. He got sore at her and she was afraid of him. Scared half to death. You know the man's name? Oh, it's a kind of funny name. Something like, uh... Milton or Wilton? Uh, was it Wilton Nigel? That's it. I always wondered what a guy with a name like that would look like. Well, you're going to find out, Miss Cassell. And fast. <laughs> Patsy, I thought I told you nobody was to leave this hotel room. Where are Mrs. Nigel and Mr. Hall? They were the local police, Nick. How come? Well, they wanted Hall to identify the body, and they wanted to question Mrs. Nigel about leaving that political breakfast before it was over. Sergeant Matheson, are the police questioning Stella because they think that she... Look, Mr. Nigel, this is a murder case. They'll be questioning you, too, when they hear what this young lady here has to say. Well, well, I don't know her. Do I, miss? No, but you knew Rosita, all right. And knowing you didn't do her no good, either. That's preposterous. They brought you all the way out from the city just to accuse me of murder? Nobody's accused you of murder, Nigel. All I know is what Rosita said about a guy named Nigel. Oh, please, please. If Stella should come back and hear... Stella, dear, you... Why, what's happened to your hat? What's happened to my hat, indeed? What's happened to me? This is Nigel. Where's Hall? Where is he? When we got out of the car in front of the police station, that man literally threw me against the police and got away. Got away? The crazy fool. I only hope the police don't find him. What? Oh, now, see here, Matty, if they you... catch up with him, they may shoot to kill. And you couldn't blame him either, except that he isn't guilty. He isn't? No. And Miss Roxanne Casal is going to help me prove it. Huh? Me? I don't get it. You will. We're going to open his Palace of Oriental Wonders show with you taking the part of Rosita. Well, no, I'd be afraid. You needn't be. Matty and I'll be there. And I have a hunch Hall will show up, too. His curiosity won't let him stay away. But is he the murderer and thinks I'm trying to trap him? Why, he... You'll be protected. Patsy, is the costume you wore still in the tent dressing room? It should be. Let's go, then. Well, Mr. Carter, you want Stella and me to come, too? No, no, it's not necessary. Now, look, Nick, a guy like Hall won't fall for that stunt. He's been around too much. Maybe not, Matty, but it's worth a trial. Now, look, he ain't going to be thinking about the carnival. He'll be trying to get out of town fast. In his car? No, the police will be watching that. My hunch is he'll head for the freight yards. And that's where I'm going right now. in 
this ten, Wilton. Stella, dear, we have to stay here. Mr. Carter said so. And I suppose we have to watch that woman do a dance. I'm afraid you do, Mrs. Nigel. She should be about ready. Patsy's helping her get into the costume now. I don't see why anybody would need help to get into a skimpy thing like that. Oh, Mr. Carter, look. Coming down the aisle. Sergeant Matheson and... And Mr. Hall! Oh, wait till I get my hands on that man. Come on, Hall. Come on. Bring him back alive. That's me. (laughs) Okay, Nick. Now, who was right? Look, huh? what's the idea? I ain't done nothing. No? no? Hall, who paid you to bring your show to Nigel's political rally? Nobody. The police are going to search you, Hall. If they find any substantial sum of money, you'll be in the spot. What do you mean? I heard your dancing girl say you hadn't been able to pay her, but that you had some money today for the first time in weeks. Okay, so what if I was paid to bring the show here? I wasn't told to do nothing crooked, just bring in the show and play here at the rally. Why? Look, I don't ask questions. If somebody wants to give me a grand with no strings tied to it... My opponent was responsible for that. He wanted to make my political rally look cheap and discredit me. Mr. Sal's already there. Fine, I'll signal you when to start. What goes on here? We're going to have a private performance, Hall. All All right, sit down, everybody. Go ahead, Patsy. What about the music? Look, Hall, now that you're here, suppose you play the organ. Just the way you did for Rosita. Well, why should I? This thing... Get busy, Hall. Do as Nick says... Oh, okay. Hold the curtains, Patsy. Right. Oh, good heavens. Of all the disgraceful... Quiet, oh. please, Mrs. Nigel. Wait a minute, Mr. Paul. Stay in the center of the stage. Don't try to talk to Hall. I said don't... What did she say to you, Hall? I just told him to play a little faster, that's all. Are you sure you didn't tell him how you murdered the woman we found in the bathtub? What? Me murder Rosita? Yes, you. You're crazy. I wasn't even here. I was in the city. Oh, no, you weren't. You were right here in town. What? Your name may be Roxanne, but you've been working for a hall under the name of Rosita. But it was the real Rosita who was murdered. You don't know what you're talking about. How about it, Hall? Is this the girl who worked for you or not? Uh... No, no, this ain't the one. I think she is. And now look, Nick, if Harry says she ain't the one, how are you going to prove different? Nobody else ever saw that dancer without her veil but him. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Carter. Prove I was the one who was working for Hall. All right, I will. Your costume's a dead giveaway. What? A... Huh? The suntan pattern on your back, it fits the cut of your costume perfectly. Uh, come again? Standing out in the sun every afternoon doing the ballyhoo on your show hall, Roxanne got a tan that fits the lines of the costume she wore. The same costume she's wearing now. But the girl in the bathtub wasn't tanned that way. The pattern of her suntan didn't fit the costume. The dead girl never worked for you, Hall. Okay, you're right, Carter. No use trying to bluff any longer. No, you fool! I told you while I was dancing I'd split with you if you'd stick with me. I was giving you a chance to... You'd have something. given him the same treatment you gave Rosita the first chance you got. I've got a treatment for all of you if you try to stop me. A lead treatment. Under this veil that's draped over my right hand, I'm holding the gun aimed at Miss Bowen's back. Should I let her have it, Nick? Not if you want Miss Bowen to live. She's going to leave with me. And if any of you try to follow her, she gets shot. So if you want me bad enough to have her killed, come right ahead. Patsy slowly puts her hands up as the dancing girl reveals a new use for a veil. Nick hesitates as the two climb down off the platform. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Candidate's Corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. With her veil-covered revolver pressed firmly against Patsy's back, the dancing girl moves toward the rear of the tent. Keep away from me if you want a live secretary, Mr. Carter. You heard her, so help it's me. It's all I'll... up to you. If you don't follow me, she'll be all right. Toss me your car keys, Harry. Ah, uh, now look. Be quick about it. Okay. Now, lift up the side wall of the tent, Miss Bowen. Lift up the what? The tent canvas. Lift it up so we can get under the tent. Oh, okay. There. <sighs> Higher, you dope. I can't. That's as high as it goes. Oh, all right, hold it. Steady while I get under it. Don't you... Hey, help me! I've got her, Nick! You've got me, have you, by your little son? Oh. Matty, Matty, hold the canvas up off so I can get a hook. Wait, Nick! Watch out, Patsy, don't let her... Get away! Oh, I'm hurting, Mr. Carter, if I should kill somebody! Oh, 
All right, Patsy, you can relax. I've got a gun. Yeah, and I've got her. That's what you think. Why, I'm... Oh, no, you won't. Now shut up and behave yourself. Oh, yeah. You all right, Patsy? I guess so. A couple of sore spots, but that's all. Knocking her over with your foot when she bent down to get under the tent wall was half thinking, Patsy. Remind me to tell you later what a smart girl you are. Why, thank you. She's not so hot. If I hadn't been off balance, I'd never... All right, all right, Roxanne. Why did you kill Rosita? Rosita had it coming to her. Why? She had me working in this Connie job under her name. Well, she was working a blackmail racket and wanted an alibi if anything went wrong. And she could claim she was out of town with whole show. Yeah. Was Rosita planning to blackmail Mr. Nigel? No. The gang that's trying to keep him from getting elected hired her to come up and sneak in his hotel room while he was out. Uh-huh. She's going to put out a big act about how she was his girlfriend and all that stuff. And when she was through with her act, Nigel would have had to withdraw from the race or face a nasty scandal. That's it, Mr. Carter. And if anything went wrong, Rosita would have taken your place in the show. Why, sure. She could have proved she was doing a dance act at the time she was supposed to have been putting on a act with Nigel. Oh, I get it. Pretty clever. Clever? <laughs> Disgraceful, you mean? But how did you happen to go to the hotel, Roxanne? I saw a chance to make myself a nice hunk of money. So I decided to sell what I knew to Nigel. Only when you got to the hotel, you found Rosita was already there. Yeah. Yeah. And they guess I was there to double cross her when we got into a fight. I knew I had to get rid of her, so I hit her over the head with a bookend. And you put her in the bathtub and turned on the water. Yeah. Then I went back to town to see if I could find where she kept her money. But you got there too soon. You mean you got there in time to save me from being the victim of a dirty political plot? It almost looks as if I'm a man of destiny. Save the speech for tonight, Wilkins. Uh, yes, my dear. One thing, Mr. Nigel. When you came to my office, why wouldn't you tell me where you got the tip that somebody was plotting to ruin your career? Well, uh, it was an, an anonymous phone call from a, a girl. It was from me, in case I decided to sell out to you. Then why didn't you tell me that, Mr. Nigel? And have Stella know a beautiful young girl had been talking to me on the phone? Oh, dear me. I'd rather go through anything than have that happen. Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Chasing Dirt presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. If you got Miss Bowen to come here to make trouble, Clara... I didn't, Larry, I swear it. Oh, maybe that's the mysterious woman who called me. I'll get it. Why, Mr. Carter? My name. Don't tell us you got a phone call, too. Certainly did. A call to come over here in a hurry to prevent a murder. Murder? But I'm the one who's been threatened, and I certainly didn't call you. Well, somebody did. Listen, that's the kitchen door. Somebody... And now, the case of the substitute slayer. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's mid-morning as an overly dressed woman in her middle thirties sits stiffly in Nick Carter's office. I suppose you've heard of me, Mr. Carter. I'm Clara Corbin. Oh, uh, Miss Corbin's a writer, Nick. She writes soap operas for the radio. You know, serials. Thrilling real-life drama. The solutions to the problems that confront every woman. Oh, I see. But uh, doesn't it get a little tiresome, Miss Corbin? Oh, heavens No. Well, what can I do for you? Mr. Carter, the plot of one of my shows is actually happening in real life. Really? Here, read this note. Clara Corbin, if you don't stop writing about Larry and me, I'll kill you. You got this note through the mail? Yes, and here's another one. Clara Corbin, take me out of your script if you want to keep on writing. Sounds like the work of a crank, if you ask me. Mr. Carter, I don't suppose you've ever heard my radio serial, My Sister's Husband. Why, no, I haven't. Well... I don't dare let this out publicly. But my serial, my sister's husband, is based on the real lives of real people. Even so, I don't see how... You will. My younger sister's married to Larry Harris, a reasonably successful man. They're a typical middle-class couple. Oh, then the reference in one of those notes to Larry... It refers to Larry Harris, of course. Uh-huh. But where do I come in? Well, everything that happens to Sue and Larry goes into the show. If they have a misunderstanding, the characters in the show have a misunderstanding. But actually, Sue and Larry lead rather prosaic lives, and the serial needs conflict and excitement, so I have to make up some of the plot myself. I see. Go on. 
Right now, the show is getting its excitement from a triangle. There's another woman. But this triangle in your serial isn't based on actual facts, is it? Well, I didn't think so when I began writing the present series of episodes, Mr. Carter. But I'm not so sure anymore. Then you think the other woman in a real-life triangle is sending you the threatening notes? I don't know what else to think. Well, Miss Corbin, is there really any mix-up in your sister's marriage? Why, if I'd even suspected any such thing, I wouldn't have dreamed of using it in my show. Of course not. But if there is another woman, and she's responsible for the threatening notes I've been getting... Oh, I'm afraid, Mr. Carter. She hates me, and she intends to kill me. Well, uh, couldn't you stop writing this particular plot? Oh, no. The plot's been approved by the sponsor, and the scripts are in for three weeks in advance. I can't do a thing about it. But I don't want to be murdered, Mr. Carter. You've got to help me. No, 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 Miss Corbin. Those notes may be the work of a practical joker or a crank. Hardly seems probable that you'd hit on a true story by accident. Oh, I'm not so sure it was an accident. Larry is... Well, well, I don't trust him. He's been fickle before. Oh, Mr. Carter, please. Will you take my case? But I don't know that there is any case, Miss Corbin. I don't even know if there actually is another woman. But there must be. Well, that shouldn't be too difficult to find out. Yes, yes, but how? Well, the simplest way is to ask your brother-in-law, Larry Harris. You, you mean you'd go to see him? Why not? He may even thank me for tipping him off that there may be trouble brewing. Oh, no, he'd be furious with me. He'd say I was meddling again. Now, don't worry, Miss Corbin. I'll do my best to protect you when I talk to you. Oh, but Mr. Carter... Besides, if I were in your place, I'd rather have a brother-in-law sore at me than have a threat of murder hanging over my head. Now, Carter, what the devil is all this about? Mr. Harris, it's about some notes that contain threats of murder. Threats of murder? Yes. Do you have any idea who might send a note like this to Clara Corbin? Oh, let's see. Clara Corbin, leave Larry, Larry and me out of your cereal or I'll kill you. Is this another one of Clara's little tricks? I don't think so, Mr. Harris. Why would she hire me if it were? You don't know Clara very well. I take it you don't like your sister-in-law. That's a real understatement. How would you like it if your whole private life was paraded in public? No better than you do, Mr. Harris, but I don't like murder either. Murder? This isn't murder. This is, well, it's... Uh... Yes, what is it? Why, why, it's a joke of some kind. Murder's not a good subject for jokes. It is with Clara Corbin, and it couldn't happen to a nicer person. Look, Mr. Harris, I'm going to be frank with you. If there is another woman in your life besides your wife, these letters may get you into a lot of trouble. That wouldn't worry Clara. But it should worry you. Now, I'm not interested in your personal affairs, but... Is there another woman? Certainly not. I threatened to sue Clara for libel once, and if she keeps this up, I'll do it. But if you aren't involved with another woman, then her story hardly applies to you, does it? That doesn't make any difference. Whether it applies to me or not, it, it can still hurt me plenty. But how? Outsiders don't know that the story is based on your life. But, Mr. Carter, I think I've given you quite enough of my time. You might as well go back to your office and charge this interview up to wasted time. All right, Mr. Harris, I'll go back to my office. But I won't admit I've wasted any time. Not yet. So her sister's husband wouldn't tell you a thing, huh, Nick? Oh, I wouldn't say that, Patsy. Hmm? He thinks he didn't tell me anything, but he did give me some helpful information. For instance? Well, for one thing, he's nursing a violent hatred for Clara Corbin. Oh, I could have guessed that. For another thing, there is another woman in his life. What? Then he admitted it? No, he denied it, but when I suggested that he didn't have any cause for libel if it weren't true, he got sore at me. Practically told me to get out of his office. Okay, but do you think he tried to get Miss Corbin to change her plot by sending her those notes? No, Patsy. He seemed genuinely surprised when I showed him one of those notes. Hmm. Well, I keep going back to the idea that maybe Clara Corbin sent those notes to herself. But why? Well, she hears that her brother-in-law is stepping out on Sister Sue. She wants to stop it, so she puts that kind of a plot into her radio serial. Figuring it would scare Larry Harris into behaving himself? Exactly. Only it didn't, so she went a step further. And you think those murder notes are fakes, Why, huh? sure. No, no, I, I think you're wrong, Patsy. What? It's quite possible that this mysterious other woman does exist. And I want to find out who she is. Well, say, say, Nick, we're overlooking one person who may know who this other woman is. Sue Harris, his wife. Well, that's possible, Nick, but... perhaps she didn't want to risk breaking up her home by making a scene. So, instead of accusing her husband, she may have talked Clara into writing this stuff. But, Patsy, she wouldn't admit that. Oh, Nick, I have a hunch I could get us to talk. At least, why don't you let me try? 
Okay, go ahead. Good. But don't be disappointed if your hunch turns out to be a flop. Hello, I'm... Oh, are you the woman who called herself Miss Bowen and claimed to be working for a detective? Oh, yes, yes, I'm Patsy Bowen. And if you're Miss Harris... My husband was furious when I told him I'd agree to talk to you. He said it was a trick. A trick? Well, I don't see how. Larry says the newspapers have been after him about the plot in my sister's husband. Trying to get him to involve himself and me in a scandal. And if some newspaper sent you... Oh, Mr. Find... Harris, I assure you I'm not from any newspaper. Well, if you are, you can tell your editor that the triangle plot in my sister's radio show is completely without foundation as far as Larry and I are concerned. Please, Mrs. Harris, I'm not from a newspaper. Believe me. You, your sister knows about my appointment with you. You can call her if you don't believe me. I'll just take you up on that, young lady. Come in. <sighs> Thanks. And if she doesn't back you up, I'm going to call the police. Larry told me not to let you get away with anything. And I'm... Oh, somebody else is at the door. Wait a minute. Of course, Mrs. Harris. Why, Clara. Hi, Sue. I just dropped in to see whether I could do anything that might help Miss Bowen. Well, then, you know this woman, Clara? Why, of course. You see? You mean you actually hired a detective to pry into our private lives? Oh, now, darling, that's hardly the way I've to... stood all I can, Clara. You've tried to make a mess of my married life right from the start. But, oh, I... dear, I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, yes, you do. And you've gone too far this time. Now get out of this house and never come back. I never want to see you again. So, dear, you're upset. You bet I'm upset. Sue, so I went to a detective because I don't want to be murdered. Murdered? That's right. Oh, why, I think you're both crazy. I suppose you think it's crazy that Larry... Stop it. I won't have you say anything about Larry. No? Then I suppose he isn't in love with somebody else. He was never in love with you, Clara. That's certain. Uh, Mrs. Harris. I told you time and time again that I was glad we found out in time that Larry and I were... You were so jealous of me that it drove you crazy when Larry married me. And you've never given up trying. Sue, you don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. You started that radio program just for spite, to try to break up our home. But I'm trying to save it. Please, no. I haven't asked you for any help, Clara. Get out. Sue. Sue, somebody came in the side door without knocking. Who? I... Well, Larry, what... It brings you home in the middle of the afternoon. Some woman called me, said I should get home right away, that it was a matter of life and death. She scared me half out of my wits. Well, it must have been this woman here who called you. Well, Mrs. Harris, I don't know a thing about it. Well, then, whoever you are, what are you doing here? Well, I... If Clara brought you here to make trouble... I haven't, Larry, I swear. That it. doesn't impress me much, Clara. Well, I suppose... It... Maybe that's the woman who called you. Well, I'll go see who it is right away. Why, Nick, Mr. Carter, what... What's going on here, anyway? Well, don't tell us you got a phone call, too. Certainly did. Some woman said I'd have to hurry if I wanted to prevent a murder. Murder? But I'm the one who's been threatened, and I certainly didn't call you. Well, somebody called me. Shh, listen. Somebody just opened the kitchen door. Somebody must have come in without knocking. But who would... Ah! Oh! Good. One, uh, one in the kitchen. Hurry. Oh, great Scott. What? Connie Barton. Yes. It... Is she dead? I'll tell you in a minute. Mrs. Harris, who's Connie Barton? Why, she's... She's Larry's secretary. Larry, how in the world did she... I don't know anything about it, Sue. Oh, Mr. Carter, is she... Yes, she's dead. Oh, dear. What's more, I'm afraid the murderers had time to get away. See anybody? No. Murderer must have figured we'd be stopped a few seconds when we saw the body. Oh, but... The murder... How did you know it was... From the scratch on her face, I'd say she died from a hypo-injection of some quick-acting poison. And I don't want anybody to leave this room. Oh, really, now? The police will want to find the hypodermic needle. And I don't intend to give anyone here a chance to get rid of it. But none of us could have killed her. We were all in the living room. Mrs. Harris, did you know this... Connie Barton. Why, yes. Not well, oh, but Oh, of course, who knew her? Connie Barton was my private secretary. That's one way of putting it. Now, see here. Clara, if you think There's that you can... no use trying to bluff me. Clara, I've stood all I'm going to. You want the truth, don't you, Mr. Carter? I do. Well, Connie Barton was the other woman in my radio show. The kitchen door of the Harris house opened. There was a scream, and then the door was closed. The number one question now in Nick Carter's mind is... Who killed Connie Barton? In just a moment, we'll see what happens next. Now, 
back to The Case of the Substitute Slayer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's now some time later. The scene is Larry Harris's private office, and Nick Carter has just come in. Larry, none too enthusiastic, says... What do you want now, Carter? I want to discuss your secretary's murder, Mr. Harris. Well, there's not much I can tell you, is there? That all depends. The police found the hypodermic needle in the yard. Thanks to you, none of us had a chance to get out of the house after the murder was committed. I know. But whoever the murderer was, it isn't healthy to have him or her running around loose. Murder's the kind of an idea that grows in a person. Just the same, Connie must have been killed because of something entirely outside the office. Then why was your home picked as the place for it to happen? Well, that's easy, because there'd been gossip about Connie and me. Was there any foundation for that gossip, Mr. Harris? I've told you there wasn't. Thanks to that telephone tip, I was lucky enough to be in the clear. Mm Mm-hmm. Any idea who called you? No. Mr. Harris, was Connie Barton the other woman in your life? No! There was nothing between Connie and me. You think it was Connie who threatened your sister-in-law's life? I've been wondering. Was she angry about the plot and my sister's husband? How could she help but be? I suppose she discussed it with you. Yes. Well, she was in a spot. She didn't dare bring any legal action against Clara because that would dignify the whole mess. She wanted to quit her job on account of it. I wouldn't let her. Nick and Mr. Carter, we... Betsy, what brings you and Miss Corbin here? I told you... I know, Nick, but I had to close up the office. Miss Corbin came to see you, and you weren't there, so we rushed up to Mary Manning's apartment. Hey, just a minute. I... Hmm? That's a new name. Who's Mary Manning? She's the radio actress who was playing the part of the other woman in my serial. When I listened this afternoon, there was a new girl in the part, and I wondered what had happened. So I called the producer, and he said that Mary Manning didn't show up for rehearsal, and he hadn't been able to get her on the phone. And... So Miss Corbin and I took a cab to her apartment, and, well, she's gone. She'd packed up and cleared out. It looks as though she's run away. Miss Corbin, can I listen to a record of this Mary Manning's voice? Why, I suppose the studio has recordings, but why? I want to see whether I recognize the voice. Whether she was the woman who sent me to the scene of the murder. I can understand it, Mr. Carter. You insist you recognize Mary Manning's voice from the record at the studio... And Larry said the same thing before we left him, but... There's not the slightest doubt of it, Miss Corbin. Why was Mary Manning playing the particular role you gave her? I? You think I cast the shows? Why, I had nothing to do with it. The producer... Uh, I talked to the producer, Nick, and Mr. Weller. He backs Miss Corbin up on that. All right, then. What do you know about Mary Manning? Why, nothing. I've seen her around the studios, that's all. Did you find out anything about her, Patsy, when you talked to the radio producer? Practically nothing. I don't suppose Mr. Weller knew whether Miss Manning knew Larry or Sue Harris. No, no, I asked just to be sure, but he didn't. I still think there must have been some reason why she was picked to play the role of the other woman in that serial. Only because the producer evidently thought that she was capable of doing a good job, and she was. Hmm. Miss Corbin, I think I'll go have a little talk with the producer of your show. Oh, Mr. Carter, my living depends on getting along with radio producers, and I won't have you making any more trouble. I'm not trying to make trouble for you, Miss Corbin, but at the moment I'm trying to run down a murderer, and I'd like to do it before anybody else gets killed. You and Patsy wait here for me. Right, Nick. Well, of all the... I won't have it. He's not going to jeopardize my show. Now, look, Miss Corbin. Let me get at that phone. Oh, Miss Corbin, if you're going to call the producer... It's none of your business whom I call. Well, just the same. Miss Bowen, I told you that... Hello? What? Uh, give me Mr. Weller's office right away. Yes, and please hurry. I've got an idea, Miss Corbin. Oh, uh, hello, Sarah. Yes, yes, this is Miss Corbin. Now, Lord. a detective's on his way to the studio to talk to Mr. Weller. Well, he'll ask all kinds of questions and tell him anything you want to, but don't let him see Mr. Weller. Now, look here. If you do, Sarah, it will cost you your job. Well, Goodbye. Miss Corbin, you killed Connie Barton. I killed... Don't you even dare say such a thing. But you did, and you're also afraid to let Nick find out how Mary Manning got into the cast of your show. That's a lie. Oh, no, it's not. She was working with you. And I'm going to phone the producer of your show right now. You're not going to keep Nick from talking to him. You you, you put down that phone. I will not. You put it down. Oh, so you want to fight, do you? Well, ouch! Why, you... Drop that phone. Drop it, you... All right, I'll drop it right on your head. (gasps) Oh, Okay, Miss Corbin. I hated to knock you out, but you had it coming. Now maybe I can make my phone call without any interruptions. Hello, 
Hello, Mrs. Harris. Why, Mr. Carter, what brings you back here? Have you found out anything about the murder? I am not sure. Is your husband at home? No, he isn't. Well, maybe it's better he isn't here now. I want to talk to you about Connie Barton. Very well. I'll start out by telling you I'm glad she's dead. Oh? Every word that Clara put in the radio serial of hers was true. You're sure yes, of that? Yes, and everybody knew it. Connie Barton deserved to die. I see. Well, Mrs. Harris, it so happened that she died in your kitchen. And in view of what you've just said, you had a stronger motive for killing her than anybody else. But I couldn't have killed her. I was right here with the rest of you. When the kitchen door opened, we heard that scream. Mary Manning wasn't here in this room, Mrs. Harris. Mary Manning? Don't tell me you don't know who Mary Manning is. But I don't. I've never heard the name. Who is she? Well, you know, I believe you're telling the truth. Well, of course I am. Who is she? She's the person who's going to catch the killer. What? Larry. Carter. What the devil are you doing here? Asking your wife a few questions, Harris. What brings you home at this time of the day? Why, I, I have to go out of town for a few days on business. It's a hurry-up trip. You think it's wise for you to leave before this murder is solved? That murder doesn't concern me. Come in at the door, Larry. Okay, I'll get it. Larry. Oh, hey, hey, you think what's happened to you? Miss Bowen tried to kill me so that I couldn't leave this man's office. Miss Corbin, you're... But I pretended to be unconscious until I saw my chance to get away from her. Then I got a cab. You didn't get away from her, Miss Corbin. She's getting out of another cab at the curb right now. But why should she try to keep Clara in your office, Carter? Great Scott. Does she think Clara is the killer? Oh, oh, Nick. Nick, she tried to get away after I discovered she was the killer. Hold on, Patsy. Hold on. Are you sure Miss Corbin's the killer? That girl's mad. Miss Corbin, I want to know one thing. How did you happen to arrive here just before the murder? Why, I, I got a telephone call from the woman who'd been giving me all the information I'd been using about, about Larry and Connie Barton. Go on. She said there was going to be a showdown here. You, you mean Mary Manning called you too? No, no, it wasn't Mary Manning. I know her voice, but... I know. It was Connie Barton who called you, wasn't it? Connie Barton? I, I think so, yes. Yes, I'm sure it was Connie. It was Connie Barton who gave you all the information you used in your radio serial. But I... She was the one person who stood to profit from the breakup of the Harris home. She wanted you to divorce your wife and marry her, didn't she, Harris? Why, well, that's hard to believe, but if what Clara says is true... You know very well it's true. But this Mary Manning, why should she have killed Connie? Why... We won't know what part Manny Manning played in this till we find her. I'll get it. No, no, I've been expecting a call. Here, give me the phone. Okay, but... Hello? Nick Carter speaking. Oh, yes, Maddie. What? Mary Manning? She has wonderful. Has she talked yet, Maddie? She has, huh? Fine. I don't blame her for asking to be placed in protective custody. No, no, I won't need any help, Maddie. Thanks. Goodbye. You'll need a lot of help, Carter. Nick, he's got a gun. I'm afraid I'll have to use it too, Miss Bowen. I don't intend to be arrested. Larry Harris holds the revolver to Nick Carter's head as he removes Nick's gun from its holster. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Substitute Slayer, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As Larry Harris takes Nick Carter's gun, he says, No, Carter, I don't intend to wind up behind bars. And you're not going to tell anybody your ideas about what happened either. Look, Harris, if you love your wife, you won't run away. It's my money he loves. That's he never loved right, me. That's right, darling. You never let me forget it. Okay, Carter. Larry, don't. For my sake, you mustn't kill anyone else. You mustn't. Sue, get away from me. Don't put your arms around me. Can't you see Come me? on, Harris, drop those guns. I, I, you I told you to drop those you. guns. If you don't, I'll break your neck. Carter, I'll... Okay, if that's the way you want it. There. Now, if you want some more... Look out, Nick. Don't reach for that other gun, Harris. I've got you covered. And it would be a pleasure to shoot. Okay. Okay, you win. But you'll never be able to prove a thing against me. You don't even know what really happened. I know enough. I know for one thing that your secretary was trying to force you to divorce your wife and marry her. The whole mess was her fault. You mean that Connie Barton sent me those threatening notes? Yes. She wanted to stir things up. That still doesn't prove I killed Connie. The proof you killed her, Harris, is the positive identification of the druggist who sold you the poison she was killed with. That's a lie. I got it from a doctor, and even he doesn't know that I... Oh. So you stole it from a doctor, huh? 
Thanks, Harris. All right. Yes, I stole it from a doctor. You win again. I suppose you also told the actress, Mary Manning, that you wanted her as a witness in a scheme to sue Clara Corbin. No. I told her Clara was framing a little scene at my house as a publicity gag for the show. Did she come here to the house with you and your secretary? Yes. But I had her call you first. Then the three of us, Connie, Mary Manning, and I, all drove out here together. Didn't Connie Barton suspect anything? Sure. But I told her we wanted an outside witness. But when did you kill Connie? While Miss Bowen was ringing the doorbell... I told Connie she was to hide in the kitchen until everybody was here. Then I sneaked her in to show her where to hide, and, well, it was quiet and simple. I don't suppose she ever knew what happened to her. No. Then I tiptoed out and told Mary Manning she wasn't to come into the kitchen to listen until after everybody had arrived. It was a cute trick. You thought we'd catch her when we discovered the body and screamed, and that she'd take the rap for Connie's murder. Yes. If you didn't catch her, I was in the clear. And if you did... Nothing she could have said would have helped her much. I would have insisted I didn't know her. It was just my bad luck she got to the police before I found her. Suppose you planned to kill her, too. Of course, I had to. Now that she's told the police all she knows... But she hasn't, Mr. Harris. What? Well, that that phone call... That call was for your wife. And the magazine salesman who called her must think I'm crazy. Why, you... I had to know who'd be afraid to have Mary Manning found. So I fall for a trick like that. I even fall for it when my wife throws her arms around me so that you can grab the guns. Uh, But, Mrs. Harris, did you do that deliberately so that Nick could stop your husband? I, um... Don't answer that question, Mrs. Harris. I'd rather not know. But thanks, just the same. Nick, before we leave, what about next week's adventure? Well, Mike, it came as close to being the perfect crime as any I've seen. You see, Mike, the only person who could prove there'd been a murder was the corpse. But surely Nick found some kind of a clue. Only one. A peroxide cutie with naturally blonde hair. But if she was a peroxide blonde, she couldn't be a natural blonde, too. She was, though, Mike. Huh? And it was a good thing. Because trying to explain that fact was the only way to solve the murder. Well, what do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it the case of the unwanted wife. Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by George B. Anderson. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Well, Nick, did you get that description of the Travis girl? Yes, Patsy, a flashy type in her late 20s. Medium height, slender, snub nose, thin lips, perfect teeth. Nick, then you were right. They are the same person. You've found the answer. Now, now, wait till you hear the rest. The Travis girl is a natural blonde. A natural? But but the nurse is a bleach blonde. Those curls are positively brassy. Yes, and that means that the whole case is blown up in our faces. <laughs> Now, The Case of the Unwanted Wife, today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Nick and Patsy are returning to the office after an uptown luncheon engagement when a traffic light halts Nick's car in front of the city's most exclusive hotel, the Van Arnhem. 
That's the Van Arnum where Mac McGowan works now, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, Mac's been house detective there ever since he retired from the force. Well, what in the world? Nick, look, she's coming this way. Hmm? Who, Patsy? That woman in the blue coat. She just ran out of the hotel as if someone were chasing her. Say, somebody is chasing her. You're right. It's a man and, and a nurse, isn't it? Yeah, it looks that way. But they're coming right toward us. Oh, please. Oh, please drive on and hurry. Now, wait a minute. What's the idea? Don't let them take me back. Hurry, the Lock the doors back there, quick. Yes, yes. Hey, Patsy, what in the name of heaven are well, you doing? Well, you're not going to let them get her until you find out what's going on, are you? Hey, Laura, Laura, open that door. I won't. I'll die before I'll let you take me back. No, driver, unlock that car door. Now, just a minute. What's this all about? That lady's my wife. She's ill. She's out of her mind. That's a lie. Come on, open the door. Don't you do it, Nick. You keep out of this, you nosy little cluck. Look, you... driver, you open that door, or I'll knock a couple of your teeth out. I think I'd like to see you try that. Mr. Barton, call the police. Yes, do. I'll tell them how you and my husband are trying to put me in an asylum so that you can get my money. Shut your mouth, Laura. You don't know what you're hey, saying. Hey, 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 what's going on here? Oh, Mr. Barton. Oh, Hello, Mac. Well, well, hello, Patsy. And Nick. Mr. McGowan, these people are trying to kidnap my patient. You mean Nick and Patsy are... Hey, look, Mac, we're holding up traffic. I better pull over to the curb. Don't let them start that car, McGowan. Now, 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 take it easy, Mr. Barton. I know these folks, and they're all right. Uh, Go ahead, Nick. Oh, you've got to believe me. I'm no more insane than you are. My husband and that woman are holding me prisoner. Now, don't get excited, Mr. Barton. Oh, get in touch with John Ramsey in San Francisco. He's my lawyer. He'll tell you. All right, McGowan, get my wife out of that car. I'd better get her out, Nick. The poor lady's a little, uh, you that's know... That's not true. I'm perfectly sane. I am. If my you... patient isn't taken back and put to bed immediately, I refuse to answer for the consequences. No. Take my word for it, Nick. Everything's on the level. Oh, okay, Mac, if you say so. Oh, Unlock the door, Pat. Oh, no, no, please. Don't let them get me again. Oh, Mrs. Barton, there's nothing else I can do. You're letting with them. You're against me, too. Go oh, ahead, Laura, you're... we'll go back. No, I won't go back. I won't. Oh, yes, you will. Oh. Take her other arm, Mary. No, please. Somebody help. I felt just as sorry for the poor woman as you did. Then why didn't you do something? Well, what could I do? There was nothing suspicious. Nothing suspicious? Did you ever in your life see a real nurse wearing as much makeup as that peroxide Goldilocks? Was spread on an inch thick. So what? There's no law against that. And it doesn't prove she's not a real nurse. Just the same, I'd like to get my hands in those blondine curls of hers. Calling me a nosy little clock, will she? (laughs) I don't blame you for being sore, Patsy, but still that's no reason to say she's not a real nurse. I didn't care much for Barton, either. But did you notice that when he got excited, he called her Mary? Are things usually that chummy between a nurse and her employer? Oh, now, Pansy, that's a strictly personal matter. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet it is. I wouldn't be surprised if it was so personal that railroading the wife into an asylum would be very convenient. That may very well be, but there isn't a scrap of evidence to back it up. Well, that's what Mrs. Barton said they were doing, and I believe her. Oh, Nick, she was so helpless, so frightened. Well, in her state of mind, it's natural to imagine things. What do we know about her state of mind except what Barton and the nurse told us? We know that Max says they're telling the truth. And that's enough for me. Well, it's not enough for me. Oh, Nick. Nick, if there were only something we could do. Oh, Patsy, the chances are one in a thousand that Mrs. Barton's story is true. Yeah, but Nick, that, that one chance, won't you do something about it? Well, it's probably a waste of time, but if it'll make you happy... What? Well, Nick, what are you stopping here for in front of the telegraph office? I'm going to play that thousand to one shot. Oh, Nick, you're an angel. I'll send a wire to John Ramsey, Mrs. Barton's lawyer in San Francisco. <laughs> Nick Carter speaking. Yes? This is John Ramsey, Mrs. Barton's attorney. Oh, yes. Now, what's all this about her losing her mind? Well, that two-page telegram I sent you contained all the facts, Mr. Ramsey. But it's preposterous. I just got in touch with Mrs. Barton's physician, and he tells me there wasn't a thing wrong with her when she left here ten days ago. Well, tell me, do you happen to know if there's ever been any insanity in her family? Well, yes. Her father had some trouble of that kind, and so did a distant relative. But she's never shown the least sign of it. I see. Now, Carter, I've heard of your reputation. Could I get you to investigate this business for me? I don't like the looks of it. Now, wait a minute. You mean that perhaps her husband is trying to railroad her into an asylum? I wouldn't put it past him. 
Barton's a pretty shady character. Uh-huh. Did he have any money? No, oh, not a cent. That's why he married Mrs. Barton. She's a wealthy woman, and he knows that if she goes through with the divorce... Oh, she was planning to divorce him, huh? Yes. She told me to have the papers ready for her as soon as she returned from the East. They've been separated for months. Well, that's funny. They arrived here together. Well, they certainly didn't leave San Francisco together. She should have got rid of him long ago. Is there any particular reason outside of his being what you call a shady character? Plenty of reasons. Mostly other women. Younger women. Uh-huh. But how about it? Will you take the case? Well, I'm afraid I'll have to, Mr. Ramsey. My secretary will never forgive me if I don't. Good. Now, don't worry about money. Spend anything within reason, but make absolutely certain that this insanity thing isn't a frame-up. I'll do all I can, Mr. Ramsey, but I'll need some help from your end, and I'll need it quick. Well, just tell me what you want me to do. Get the best private detective in San Francisco. Have him send me all the facts he can dig up on the Bartons. He'll be on the job within an hour. Good. And tell him I also want a complete description of Barton's latest girlfriend, especially if she turns out to be a peroxide blonde named Mary. They checked into the hotel five days ago, Mac? Yeah, all three of them. Mrs. Barton was in a coma at the time. A coma? I'll bet she was rugged. I still say they're keeping her prisoner until they can railroad her into an asylum. Well, that may be what they're trying to do, Patsy, but it isn't easy to put a perfectly sane person in an asylum. No, I'll say it isn't. You've got to have a doctor certified that they're really mentally ill. Mac, do you know whether any doctor has visited her here at the hotel? Well, sure, a doctor, uh, Leonard, Leonard Jarvis. Why, well, Nick, mm-hmm. you know Dr. Jarvis. You recovered his wife's pearls that time, remember? Yes, yes, and Dr. Jarvis is one of the best psychiatrists in the city. It's a sense he wouldn't be mixed up in anything illegal. Well, how do they happen to pick him, Mac, or, or don't you know? Oh, sure I do. Barton phoned the desk and asked for a psychiatrist. So the desk clerk called the medical association and got Dr. Jarvis's name. Uh, that was a couple of days after they came. Oh, well, I suppose there couldn't be anything suspicious if they let someone else pick the doctor. No, I don't think they could be, Patsy. If Jarvis says Mrs. Barton is mentally ill, that settles it. Nick, let's go see Dr. Jarvis. But why? Maybe he noticed something when he examined her. Maybe he, he, he... Oh, I don't know, but let's go see him anyway. All right, all right, Patsy. If I don't, I may have to take you to see him. Mrs. Laura Barton... Now, let me see. She's staying at the Van Arnhem, Dr. Jarvis. Yes, she's about 40 years old. Dark brown hair, thick glasses, very prominent front teeth. Oh, yes, yes, of course. An extreme manic depressive, Carter. Her husband should really put an institution for her own safety. You you couldn't possibly be mistaken, could you, Doctor? My dear young lady, Mrs. Barton definitely exhibited every symptom of psychopathic melancholia. Why, even during my examination, she attempted to leap from the window. Hmm. Was she in good health physically? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Except for a rather puzzling lack of coordination. What? Well, Dr. Jarvis, what do you mean? Well, Miss Byrne, the inability to judge distance. Uh-huh. For instance, when she reached for a cigarette, her hand missed the package by several inches. Now, that condition is not ordinarily a symptom of her particular disorder. Tell me, Dr. Jarvis, could the symptoms you observed have been caused by a drug? Oh, absolutely not. Now, I'll stake my professional reputation on that. But her personal physician in San Francisco said Mrs. Parton was perfectly all right before this trip east. Well, psychiatry is a specialized field, Miss Bowen. A general practitioner might easily overlook certain warning signals. Yeah, but the condition could have arisen without warning, couldn't it? Oh, I hardly think that's possible. But suppose it did. Then perhaps it could go away just as suddenly. Well, I suppose there might be exceptions. Dr. Jarvis. Yes? Just on the off chance that there might have been some change since you saw her, could I persuade you to go back to the hotel with me and make another examination? Well, it seems useless, Carter. There's seldom any change. I realize that, but uh, I promised to investigate every possibility in this case. And I'd consider it a personal favor if you take another look at it. Please, Dr. Jarvis. Well, when you put it that way, I won't refuse. Good. I haven't forgotten your fine work in recovering Ethel's pearls. Then you will go over there with us? Yes, I'll go with you. But I don't expect to find any reason why I should change my opinion. Yeah, 
Yes? Oh, what are you doing here? We came with Dr. Jarvis, Mr. Barton. I wanted to see your wife again, Mr. Barton, to verify my earlier diagnosis. I hope you don't object. Well, I... There's no reason why you should object, is there? Of course not. Come in, please. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Your wife's room is over here. Uh, Now, just a moment, Doctor. The nurse is giving Mrs. Barton a massage. If you'll be seated, I'll ask you to get the patient ready. Oh, very well. Have you seen the nurse yet, Dr. Jarvis? No, no, I haven't seen Miss Emerson. No, what? No, 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 go away. But Laura, dear, Dr. Jarvis is... You see, a persecution complex. Laura, they only want to talk to you. No, 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 I won't see them. Laura, come back here. Don't... 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 I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Come on. You're responsible for this, Carter. If it hadn't been for your meddling... Responsible for what? Where's Mrs. Barton? She... It wasn't my fault. I tried to hold her back, but Where's Mrs. Barton? There. Oh, Nick, look at the window. She got away from us. She jumped out. Horrified, Nick and Patsy gaze at the broken window through which Mrs. Barton fell 21 stories to her death. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Unwanted Wife. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It is ten minutes later. Miss Emerson, the nurse, has gone to notify the police. Nick and Patsy are examining the window through which Mrs. Barton fell 21 stories to her death. And Dr. Jarvis is speaking to the dead woman's husband. I warned you that something like this might occur, Mr. Barton. Your wife should have been put in a hospital. I know. I know, Doctor. But she was so frightened of strangers. Yes, yes. I heard her begging you to send me away. Oh, not you. It was... Carter and that girl. In her poor, deluded mind, Laura pictured them as enemies. But when she got in their car, they acted as if they were going to help her. Then they had to admit their mistake. Laura thought it was deliberate. She was getting better until that happened. Well, I'm sure Mr. Carter didn't do anything. Oh, what difference does it make now? She's dead and we can't bring her back. Well, her money's still here, Mr. Barton, so don't feel too bad. Why, Miss Bowen? How dare you say a thing like that? Perhaps because Patsy feels as I do, Mr. Barton. That your wife's death coming at this particular time looks very suspicious. I don't know what you're talking about. She was going to divorce you, wasn't she? No. We straightened everything out on the train coming east. We were completely reconciled. That's your story. Your wife said you kidnapped her and were trying to railroad her into an asylum in order to get her money. Oh, delusions, Mr. Carter. Just the delusions of a sick mind. That may be, Barton. But if Laura Barton had lived five minutes longer, she might have proved her statement was the truth. Are you accusing me of... Of murder, Mr. Barton? Yes, I think maybe I shall. There are laws about slander in this country, Carter. I'm going to drag you into court and make you prove that statement. And that's just where I intend to prove it, Barton. In court. Nick, I hope you've got plenty of proof to back up what you said to Barton. He's really boiling. I haven't any proof, Mac. What? Nothing I can take into court. Oh, then why in the world... You can learn a lot from the way a man reacts to an accusation, Patsy. Okay, what did you learn from Barton? Well, Mac, if you'd seen his face, you'd know. He's guilty. I'll bet my last dollar on it. Well, maybe you already have. He can sue you for everything you've got. But you must have had something to go on, Nick. I have. It's not much, but it's enough to convince me. Oh, what is it? On the window frame through which Mrs. Barton fell, I found scratches. Deep scratches toward the outside, as if Mrs. Barton had been desperately trying to hold herself back. But, Nick, you... I also found this piece of broken fingernail wedged in a crack in the window frame at one of the scratches. Well, then, then you think they pushed her out of the window? I'm sure of it. Oh, but what if it turns out to be Barton's fingernail or, or the nurse's? Oh, I took a look at Barton's hands and also at the nurse's. Her nails are perfect. So are his. Not a broken one among them. Well, maybe they did push her out, Nick, but... You'll need a lot more than a fingernail to prove it. Yes, and besides, Dr. Jarvis will swear in court that she'd already tried to jump out of the window when he was there earlier. Yes, I know. <laughs> Son, I, I'm afraid you're licked. Don't be too sure, Mac. What I do next depends on what we hear from San Francisco. Nick, 
week was that airmail special delivery from San Francisco? Yes, yes, Betsy. There's a report I've been waiting for. Well, Not does much it... help. Unless you're interested in knowing that Mrs. Barton graduated from Stanford in 1927, married Barton three years ago, belongs to the better clubs and so Oh, on. what's this newspaper clipping? The one with her picture? Oh, something about her activities in the Anti-Tobacco League. Oh, I see. Well, isn't there anything about Barton's latest girlfriend, the one who caused his wife to decide on a divorce? Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Seems the girl's name is Mary Travis. Mary? Well, that's what Barton called the nurse. I know. And Mary Travis left San Francisco the same day Barton and his wife did. But, Nick, that's just what we were hoping to hear. Is there a picture of the Travis girl? No, but the investigator says she's a very flashy type. In her late 20s, medium height, slender, snub nose, thin lips, perfect teeth, a natural blonde. Oh, natural blonde, my eye. If that girl's hair wasn't dyed, I don't know dyed hair when I see it. Well, that's just the point, Patsy. The description fits Miss Emerson perfectly, except for her hair, which has very obviously been dyed. Even I can see that. And take it from me, it was no touch-up job either. Which proves that Mary Emerson, the nurse, is not Barton's San Francisco girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right, Nick. Mary Emerson's hair was brown before she dyed it. What did you say? I said I could still see traces of brown at the roots of her hair. Must have died of blonde in a hurry. Brown? Huh? That's the answer, Patsy. It's got to be. Well, Dick, what are you talking about? Oh, what a fool I've been. Mrs. Barton was a member of the Anti-Tobacco League, and I didn't even... You didn't what? Give me that newspaper clipping, Patsy, yeah. and get your hat. Uh-huh. We're going to see Dr. Jarvis again. I've already told you that Mrs. Barton was a manic depressive. She exhibited every symptom. I know, Doctor, but is it usual for every symptom to be present? Well, not always, but hers was an extreme case. Almost as if she had learned those symptoms from a book and pretended to be out of her mind. Isn't that right? Well, yes, but... What? You're not saying that Mrs. Barton wanted me to think her insane? Here. Take a look at this newspaper clipping. Just a picture. I'm going to hold my hand over the printing under it. Why, that's... Oh, no, no, I'm wrong. For a moment, I thought it was Mrs. Barton. It is Mrs. Barton. No, it isn't, Carter. This woman has the same outstanding features. You mean the prominent front teeth, the thick glasses, and dark hair? Yes, but it's definitely not Mrs. Barton. All right. Now read what it says under the picture. Mrs. Laura Barton, prominent San Francisco club woman who lost... But, Carter, that is not the woman I examined. I'll swear to it. Dr. Jarvis? That statement is going to convict a murderer. Nick, don't you think we should have brought the police with us? Max has gone for them, Patsy, but I didn't want to wait. Hello, Miss Travis. Is Mr. Barton here? No, he isn't, and he wouldn't see you. What'd you call me? Mind if we come inside and wait? What do you mean, pushing your way in here? And my name's Emerson. Maybe she's forgotten who she really is, Nick. She's been using so many names lately. Mary Travis. Mary Emerson. Laura Barton. Are you crazy? You met Mrs. Barton. You scared her into jumping out of that window. Oh, no. We frightened you and Mr. Barton into pushing her up before the doctor could see that it was you and not Mrs. Barton he examined and pronounced insane. That would have spoiled everything, wouldn't it, Miss Travis? You talk like a fool. The doctor saw me here. Not very clearly. You kept out of his sight as much as possible. Mrs. Barton and I were as different as night and day. And that's what you counted on. When Dr. Jarvis came here the first time, you wiped off all that makeup, wore Mrs. Barton's thick glasses, probably even had protruding false teeth made to fit over your own. You're a liar. You're a dirty, snooping liar. You also dyed your own blonde hair brown to match hers, and then dyed it blonde again after the doctor left. A very poor job, too, Miss Travis. What's the matter? Were you afraid to have it done by a professional beauty operator? Get out of here. Get out or I'll call the cops. That's a fine bluff, Miss Travis, but Nick has already called the police. They'll be here any minute. No wonder Dr. Jarvis didn't recognize you the way you look now. And after the fall, Mrs. Barton's body was too badly mutilated for him to notice it was not the woman he examined. You planned on that all along, didn't you? You can't prove that. You can't prove a word of it. When the doctor testifies that you and Barton tricked him into certifying Mrs. Barton as suicidally insane, I think a jury will consider that proof enough. You may be well, right, Carter. Roger, do you hear what they said? They're on to everything. Barton, you and this woman are under arrest for the murder of your wife. Nick, We're under arrest. <laughs> 
You forget I'm the one who's holding the gun, Mr. Carter. Roger, they sent for the cops. we got to get out of here. We're going, Mary. But first, we'll make sure our friends here don't follow us. Well, then tie them up or something, but hurry. There's not enough time for that. Turn around, Miss Bowen. You too, Carter. All right, pardon. What next? Put your hands against the wall where I can watch them. Roger. You're not going What's to... the difference? If we're caught, it means the chair anyway. Well, you're going to, to shoot us in the back? Correct, Miss Bowen. And you first. Mr. Barton... Right I... now. As fire jets from the muzzle of Roger Barton's revolver, Patsy screams and falls. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Unwanted Wife, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In Suite 2104 of the Van Arnhem Hotel, Nick and Patsy stand with their faces to the wall as Roger Barton, a revolver in his hand, says, You first, Miss Bowen. Mr. Barton, now. Ah! Roger, what happened to the light? I put them out, Miss Travis. Ah! You missed me, Barton. Shooting at a voice in the dark is tricky business. No, my aunt. So I didn't miss. Now, the flash of your gun served as a target. Patsy. Uh, I'm all right, except for some bruises. What happened? When I pushed the light button, I had to shove you out of the way before Barton could fire. There wasn't time to be gentle. Well, I, I guess I fell over a telephone table or something. I wish you'd broken your neck. Thanks, Goldilocks. Got the lights, Nick? Yeah. Better pick up Barton's revolver. Okay, Nick. Nick, are you a Patsy all right? Couldn't be better, Mac. Come on in. The police with you? They're coming up in the elevator now, and the paddy wagon's right outside the front door. Just what we want. All right, come along, folks. Your carriage is waiting. Nick, tell me, what did the fact that Mrs. Barton belonged to the anti-tobacco leave have to do with solving the case? Well, Patsy, don't you remember that Dr. Jarvis said that the woman he examined reached for a cigarette? Well, why, yes. He said something about her hand missing the package by several inches. Yeah. Well, Mrs. Barton would never have reached for a cigarette, Patsy. Well, of course not. Not if she belonged to the anti-tobacco league. That's right. So it had to be Mary. Mm Mm-hmm. And she missed the package of cigarettes when she reached for them because she was wearing Mrs. Barton's thick glasses. Glasses that she could hardly see through. But why did it have to be Mary? They could have hired somebody to impersonate Mrs. Barton who really looked like her. Sure, but letting some outsider in on their plot would have been too risky. And besides, what possible reason could there be to suspect that a natural platinum blonde would suddenly turn into a peroxide blonde with much darker hair, except that Except she... that for some reason she dyed her hair dark and then bleached it again. And very inexpertly, too. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Mrs. Barton. Maybe all the trouble did affect her mind toward the end. Well... Remember how she screamed that she didn't want to see us when we came to help her? Yeah. Mary Travis explained that in her confession. Yeah. Mrs. Barton didn't know it was us. Barton told her that the men had come to take her to an asylum. What? So that was it? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, Nick, the old dime novels had a phrase that described Mary Travis perfectly. They did? Well, what is it? She was a double-dye deceiver. (laughs) I'd say she was. What about next week's adventure, Nick? Well, it's a story of Johnny Wade, Mike, a boy I had a lot of faith in, even though he'd been in prison. Johnny was one of our best friends, Mike, so when he was released from the state penitentiary, Nick and I were right there to meet him. See, he was only a youngster, and I wanted to help him get a fresh start. Yeah, but um, Johnny was too ambitious. But that's a good thing in a boy, isn't it? Not in this case, Mike. You see, Johnny's only ambition was to kill. (laughs) What do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Double Frame. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Cash Packing Company and is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, 
Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined... as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction... Nick Carter, master detective. Johnny, I know how you feel. No, you don't, Mr. Carter. Nobody knows how I feel. A couple of guys named Ford and Bisbee are going to find out. And soon. Now, wait a minute. They framed me. They stole three years out of my life. They killed my mom. Now I'm going to do something about it. Johnny, Johnny Nick's your friend. Listen to me. I don't want any friends that work with the cops. Because I got a job to do that the cops ain't going to like. And now, The Case of the Double Frame. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Today, Johnny Wade is being released from state penitentiary. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, Nick is waiting outside the prison gate. His secretary and assistant Patsy Bowen and Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad are in the car with him. Yeah, what's Johnny going to think when he sees a cop with you, Nick? Well, I'll simply tell him the truth, Matty, that you and I are old friends and that you came along to get some fresh country air. <laughs> Johnny won't be suspicious of any friend of Nick, Sergeant. Uh, Why, when Johnny was a member of the Downtown Boys Club, he simply worshipped Nick. He used to call him his big brother. Yeah, you see, Johnny never had any family except his mother, and she's dead now, so well, naturally I wanted to meet him when he got out. You sure must have a lot of faith in him, Nick. I have, Matty. Even after he stole 20,000 bucks? Now, look, Matty, I don't believe he did. If I'd only known about it sooner, I might have been able to prove that Johnny was innocent. But we were out west on a case at the time of his trial. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was only recently when we learned he was being released today that we knew he'd been in prison. I made a few inquiries, but the evidence was all against him. And his employers, Ford and Bisbee, flatly refused to give me any help. Nick, mm. look, isn't that Johnny coming through the gate now? Why, it looks like him, It but... is. Oh, Nick, Nick, how he's changed. He's so thin. <clears throat> now, wait a minute. I'll be right back. Right. Yeah. Hey, Johnny! Johnny! Johnny Wade! Yeah? It's me, Johnny. Nick Carter. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. What are you doing here? Why, I thought you'd like to have me meet you when you got out. We're old friends, aren't we? We used to be. Well, we still are, Johnny. Come on. Patsy's in the car. She's anxious to meet you. And say, I've got a job lined up for you. No, thanks. But listen, son. No soap, Mr. Carter. You was always swell to me, and I appreciate it, but I don't want any friends. Not anymore. Don't be foolish, John. Okay, so I'm foolish. Maybe three years in stir makes you that way. But it needn't, Johnny. Now, look, I want you to forget all Forget that. it? Forget that Ford and Bisbee framed me? Forget that for the rest of my life people are going to say I'm a crook and a jailbird? I know it won't be easy. Maybe I ought to forget my mom, too. Maybe I ought to pretend that it wasn't grieving over me that killed her. Believe me, I understand how you feel, John. No, but... you don't. Nobody knows how I feel. There's a couple of guys that's going to find out. A couple of guys named Ford and Bisbee. Now, wait a minute. When they framed me, they stole three years out of my life. They killed my mom. Now I'm going to do something about it. Johnny, I'm speaking as your friend. You used to say I was the best friend you ever had. And I'm not forgetting it. But I got a job to do, and friends will only get in my way. Especially friends that work with the cops. So long, Mr. Carter. Johnny, wait a minute. You can tell Mr. Ford and Mr. Bisbee I'll be seeing them. Johnny's in a dangerous mood, Mr. Bisbee, and I think both you and Mr. Ford should be prepared for trouble. If you're such a friend of his, Carter, why did you come here to warn us? Because he's had trouble enough. I don't want him making any more for himself. I see. And it's not out of any regard for our safety. I'm thinking of that too, Mr. Ford. I don't blame Johnny for being sore if he's innocent of stealing that money. Innocent? He's a dirty crook, Miss Bowen, and he didn't get half what he deserved. That's what I thought at the time, Bisbee, but I'm beginning to wonder. You're out of your mind, Ford. If he didn't get the money, who did? 
Did you get it? Did I? I beg your pardon, Mr. Ford, but I have the report. Uh, just a minute, Miner. Yes, sir. I put that money in the briefcase myself. Uh, you saw me, didn't you, Miner? Oh, yes, sir. As I testified in court, I brought the cash from the bank and handed it over to you, and I was there when you put it in the briefcase, fastened the case, and gave it to Johnny. And the young thief admitted that the briefcase never left his hands till he gave it to you at the airport, Ford. Well, the money certainly wasn't there then. Oh, all right, then. He took it. Nobody else could have. I don't care. Johnny wasn't the kind of a boy to steal. I see, Miss Bowen. You think either Mr. Ford or I stole our own money. That isn't what she said, Mr. Bisbee, but it still seems odd that neither of you gentlemen would give me any cooperation in trying to find out who did steal it. Right. Rubbish. We knew who got it. By the time you came around, he'd been tried and convicted. We were both pretty angry, Mr. Carter. This was a new business then, and 20000 was a serious loss. It was disastrous as far as I was concerned. You had money in the bank for it, but I was broke. Well, if you didn't put all your money on the horses or a roulette wheel... You don't have to give me another lecture for it. Then don't complain because you're always broke. Now, just a minute, gentlemen. You're getting away from the subject. Oh, you're quite right, Mr. Carter. And while both Mr. Bisbee and I appreciate your warning us about Johnny... I don't think there's any cause for alarm. But he blames you two for his mother's death, and there's no telling what he's likely to do. He'll most likely get that money from wherever he's got it hidden and leave this part of the country. It sounds logical to me. I don't think he'll want to attract any attention to himself by coming here. Gentlemen, I hope you're right. If he tries anything with me, I'll break his thieving neck. <laughs> What can I do for you, Letty? You Daddy Greer? What if I am, huh? My name's Johnny Wade. Link Garson told me to look you up when I got out. Link Garson, eh? Well, well, well. Link said that if I come to you, you'd take care of me. So? Well, I guess any friend of Link's is all right. So, uh, what do you want from Daddy Greer? Just one thing. A gun. <laughs> Johnny, boy, it's good to see you. Hello, Mr. Miner. Still doing the bookkeeping around here? Yes. Oh, Johnny, you got thin. It must have been pretty bad up there, wasn't it? Skip it. Well, uh, Johnny, if there's anything I can do... No, thanks. Are Ford and Bisbee in their offices? Yes. Oh, but you don't want to go in there. Oh, don't you... I? Johnny! Johnny, listen to me! What's the idea of... Oh, you. Yeah, it's me. It's the guy you and that crooked partner of yours railroaded into the pen. Now, hold on, Johnny. Keep your hands on the desk, Mr. Ford. Put away that gun, you crazy fool. Maybe you didn't know my mom was dead, Mr. Ford. Or maybe you wouldn't care. She died thinking I was a crook and a thief. Oh, don't do anything you'll be sorry for, Johnny. I couldn't do anything to you I'd be sorry for. Or to Bisbee either. Now, wait. No, wait. I waited long enough. And now... Oh, watch out, Bisbee. He's got a gun. Drop it or I'll break your eye. I... I've got it, Bisbee. That door hadn't knocked me off balance when you opened the it. The door isn't the only thing that's going to knock you off balance, you... Oh. Oh. Get up. Get up, you dirty... Well, that's enough, Bisbee. Can't you see he's out cold? Is anything wrong here? Oh. I ought to call the police and have him locked up. Oh, no. No, please, Mr. Bisbee. I I I'm sure he didn't know what he was doing. No, so you're a friend of his, too, are you, Miner? Well... Not exactly. Well, sir. get him into the outer office, and when he comes to, tell him if he shows up here again, I'll send him back to jail where he belongs. Nick Carter speaking. This is What's the matter, Ford? Did Johnny show up? Yes, yes, he did. He came to the office early this afternoon, threatened me with a revolver. From him. Well, I'm glad to hear nobody was hurt. What did you do? Have him arrested? No, no. Bisbee was going to, but he changed his mind. And I'm glad he did. So am I. Sending him back to jail might be the worst thing in the world for him right now. You saw how bad he looks. I know. He was talking pretty wildly, too. Evidently, he's been brooding over his mother's death. That's what I mean, Mr. Ford. If I can get hold of Johnny, I'm sure I can straighten him out. Maybe it's because I take a personal interest in him, but I still don't believe he stole your money. That's why I called you, Carter. I'm not so sure he did either. What? You've changed your mind? Well, if he had the money hidden away, why would he come up here threatening me and take a chance in going back to jail? It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. 
A guilty man would go get the money and leave town as quietly as possible. Hmm? That's what I think. But if he didn't take the money, I'd like to know who did. Are you asking me to make an investigation? Mm, yes. If you don't think it's too late to find out anything after three years. As a matter of fact, I've been doing some looking around on my own hook, Mr. Ford. And I turned up one very interesting fact. Mm, what's that? May not mean anything, but in August of 1945, your partner, J.T. Bisbee, bought $28,000 worth of stock at an East Texas oil company. He couldn't have. In 1945, Bisbee didn't have a dime. So he said, but he paid $28,000 for oil stock just the same. August 1945? That was less than two months after that 20000 disappeared. I, I wonder... Of course, there's an $8,000 difference between the amount that was stolen and the amount Bisbee invested in oil stock, but it Bisbee still... Bisbee looked... was in charge of the office that year, Carter. I was on the road all the time. Well? Everybody will be leaving the office in a few minutes. But I think I'll stay down here and look over the books for 1945. Maybe I can discover where that extra 8000 came from. Do you know enough about bookkeeping to recognize something wrong if you found it? I think so. And if anything does look suspicious, I'll have Miner come down and check with me on it. Good idea. Let me know how you come out. I'll do that. I'll give you a ring first thing in the morning. Fine and cold weather, Charlie, but on a night like this, I'd rather be back pounding a beat of... Uh, two to one, it's some dame whose kid hasn't got back from the movies yet. 45th Precinct, Sergeant Lafferty speaking. This is... <coughs> Adam Ford, Jansen Belling. Oh, yes, Mr. Ford, what's the matter? I... I've been shot at. I think I'm dying. Hold it, uh... Charlie, get an ambulance over to the Jansen building on the double. Guy's been shot. Right, Sarge. You still there, Mr. Ford? Yes, I... Uh, just hold on. We got an ambulance on the way. Do you know who shot you? It was... <coughs> it was John Wayne. You're sure of that, Mr. Ford? Yes, I saw him. Johnny Wayne. Johnny... Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Snap it up, Charlie. I think he's croaked already, but I got the name of the guy that did it. <coughs> As the police ambulance speeds toward the Jensen building, the alarm goes out to pick up Johnny Wade for murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the Double Frame. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It is an hour later. The photographers and fingerprint men have left, but Nick, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson have remained at the office of Ford and Bisbee. The body of Adam Ford still lies beside the desk, his dead hand clutching the telephone with which his last call was made to police headquarters. Uh, wish we could get hold of Bisbee, but his housekeeper says he's been out all evening. Have you found any trace of Johnny yet? No, Patsy, but every cop in town is on the lookout for him. I see. We found out he's registered at a little hotel called the Meckley. Uh-huh. I got a couple of the boys stationed there, too. Oh, not that he'll be crazy enough to come back. Matty, I have a hunch Johnny didn't do this. Oh, Nick, use your head. Now, I know you like the boy, and I'm sorry, but we've got Ford's dying statement that Johnny Wade shot him. Yes, I know, but I think the killer himself made that call to police headquarters after Ford was dead. Oh, for Pete's sake, And then Nick. put the phone in Ford's hand to make the story look good. Well, if that's the best idea you can dream of. I'm not dreaming. Look at that phone. It's in Ford's hand backwards. What? Why, yes. The mouthpiece and the earphone are reversed. Ford's thumb is next to the mouthpiece. Well, I can see that. But what? No one would hold a phone that way, Matty. You'd have to twist your arm half out of its socket to speak into it. Hey, you're right, Nick. Now, how it... What, uh... That isn't the phone in Ford's hand, Sergeant. It's huh? the other one on the desk. He had two of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> uh, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, you have, huh? Good. We'll be down to talk to him pretty soon. Did they find Johnny? No, Bisbee. He's down at headquarters. Oh. Uh, look, uh, how about Johnny Wade? You... What? Well, why didn't you tell me before that? Fourteen minutes after ten, huh? All right, Hanson, I'll see you in a few minutes. Uh, that's funny. What is, Matty? Nick Hanson says Ford called Johnny's hotel tonight. Left a message that Johnny should come here to the office right away, no matter what time he got in. What was that, about 14 minutes after 10? That was the time on the message to the hotel, Patsy. They always mark it down when a guest isn't in. 
Hey, Matty. Yeah? Thought you said Ford died at eight minutes after ten. Well, that's the time he phoned headquarters. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Yes. Ford was dead before the call was made to headquarters. And that call was made six minutes before the call to Johnny. Then both of those calls were fakes. But, but why should anybody call Johnny? I can think of one very good reason, Patsy. The murderer is trying to make sure that Johnny isn't able to defend himself on the charge of killing Ford. Nick, it was a trap. That's exactly what I think. And if Johnny had got that message and started for here, he probably wouldn't be alive now. Oh, Nick, you don't suppose the killer could have found him on the street? No, it's not likely, Patsy. The police will pick him up when he returns to the hotel, if they don't locate him sooner. You know, I'm beginning to think you're right about the lad being framed, Nick. But who's doing it? We may find the answer in this open ledger on Ford's desk. Now, how can you tell anything from that? With ink spilled all over it. Yeah, everything on the page has been blotted out. That's just the point. Looks to me as though the ink had been spilled purposely and then spread around. Oh, Nick, that's mm. the ledger for August 1945. That's an old one. Yes. Ford told me this afternoon he was going to look over the books for 1945 to see whether there was any evidence that something crooked was going on then. Well, well if somebody tried to destroy what was on those pages, he didn't get away with it. The lab boys can bring out what's under that ink blot as clear as it ever was. No, I don't want to wait for that, Matty. Suppose we talk to the bookkeeper tonight. Uh, Miner? Yeah. If anybody would know what was in this ledger, he would. Uh-huh. Well, I sent a man over to his boarding house after him. You know, he was a witness to that brawl this afternoon. Good. He ought to be here any minute. I... Oh. <clears throat> Sergeant Matheson speaking. Huh? He did? Well, he never got here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'd better stay there and wait for him. Right. What was that, Matty? Miner isn't at his boarding house, Nick. He left for here quite a while ago. What? Yeah. It seems someone who said he was Adam Ford called and asked him to come to the office right away. What? Why, that's exactly the message that was left at the hotel for Johnny. Yeah. Only Miner got his message and started out. And he isn't here yet. But, but why should anyone... Well, maybe he did know something about that ledger, Nick. Maybe he knew too much. Perhaps you're right, Matty. Let's go down to headquarters and see whether Mr. Bisbee thinks so, too. I don't know anything about any phone calls. I didn't even know Adam was dead until the police officer told me. Where have you been all evening, Mr. Bisbee? That's my business. Yeah? It's police business now, mister. Well, I... If you must know, I was at the Blue Eagle. The gambling house? Yes. Can you prove that? Why, someone will remember me, but uh -huh. I... Uh-huh. Well, you better just hope that somebody does. Mr. Bisbee, your partner was examining the ledger for August 1945 at the time he was murdered. Well? That was the month you invested $28,000 in oil stocks, wasn't it? All right, it was. So what? Thought you were broke in 1945. Well, I... I... Where'd you get that $28,000? I... I won it in the poker game. Oh, you play for high stakes, don't you, Mr. Bisbee? Suppose I do? What of it? Can you prove that's where you got the money? After three years, don't be ridiculous. Hmm. Matty. Yeah? While you check Mr. Bisbee's alibi for tonight, I think Patsy and I'd better go over to Johnny Wade's hotel. Yeah? What for, Nick? I'm worried about it, Matty. And maybe the desk clerk or somebody there may be able to tell us where he went tonight. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but Mr. Wade checked out. He left no forwarding address. Checked out? When? Not more than five minutes ago. You mean he was here in the hotel and the police the didn't... police? Oh, you mean those cops across the lobby are waiting for Mr. Wade? Didn't what? you know? I know, sir. I just came on duty. Oh, I know that. But how did he get out of here without their seeing him? Oh, Mr. Wade wasn't here. He phoned and said we could release the room. He paid in advance. So, Nick, another phone call. If the police are looking for him, they may be able to catch him at the office of Ford and Bisbee in the Jansen building. Why do you say that? Well, there was a message from a Mr. Ford that he should go there immediately, no matter how late it was. And... You gave him that message? Of course I did, and, and he said he'd stop there on his way out of town. Oh, oh! thank goodness he's all right, Nick. When he gets to the office, the police will be waiting. That's what I think. We'd better see whether we can catch him before he gets there. Why? Because it may be that whoever phoned him doesn't want him to reach the office. <laughs> Huh? Oh, 
Oh, Mr. Minor, what are you doing Mr. here? Ford went home, Johnny, but he asked me to wait here and drive you to his house. Come on, get in. What's he want to see me about? Well, I think he's found out that you didn't take that money after all. He has? That's the impression I got. Now, hurry up, get in. Well, you bet I will. Hey, is this on the level? You're not kidding me? Take my word for it, Johnny. Before long, your troubles will be all over. here, Mr. Miner. You said we were going to Mr. Ford's house. He's at his country place, Johnny. We're sure out at the end of nowhere. It don't look like there's three cars a year come over this road. It is lonely, isn't it? Well, here we are, Johnny. What do you mean, here we are? Where's the house? There isn't any house, Johnny. Only an old stone quarry about half full of water. But it's very, very deep, Johnny. I don't get it. You will. Get out. Hey, what's the idea of the gun? Get out, Johnny. You're going to join Mr. Ford. Right here. As Johnny Wade gets out of the car, there is no sign of mercy on the face of his supposed friend, the bookkeeper. Only a grim determination to kill. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Double Frame, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Beside a lonely country road, the headlights of a parked car shine upon the figure of an elderly man with a revolver in his hand and a young man standing helplessly at the edge of an abandoned rock quarry half filled with water. You're the one that took that 20 grand three years ago. You're the one that framed me. It was so easy, Johnny. After Bisbee put the money in the briefcase, he turned his back to get some papers off the desk, and I took the money out again. That's all. You put that ticket from Montreal in my pocket, too. Of course I did. It made the police think you were planning to run away. It was a very efficient plan, John. Yeah, you're a smart guy, you are. So you bring me out here. Make me carry all this scrap iron over from your car. They make excellent weights, Johnny. Excellent. Now, I want you to take that roll of wire and fasten the scrap iron securely around your ankle. Huh? Go on. Take a piece of that scrap iron. Okay, I'll take it. And give it right back to you. Why, you young... Oh! Keep away, Johnny. I don't want to kill you. Just yet. Okay, okay. What do you want to bump me off for? You framed me. You got away with it. You have to disappear, Johnny. You see, you murdered Mr. Ford tonight. I did What? I needed that money three years ago to cover a shortage in my accounts. And tonight the old fool started looking over the books. He found you'd faked him, huh? Unfortunately for him, yes. He phoned me to come down to the office to accuse me. But I wasn't going to the penitentiary as you did. So you knocked him off? Oh, no, John. The police have Mr. Ford's dying statement that you killed him. I know. Because I made that dying statement myself over the phone. Well, you're double-crossing... That's enough, Johnny. Get busy with that scrap iron. With this bullet in my arm? You're crazy. You're right. I'll have to attend to that detail myself. Later. Goodbye, Johnny. Now, look, Mr. Miner. It won't hurt much, Johnny. I'm just going to... What the... That's just a warning, Miner. Drop okay. that gun or I'll shoot to kill. Mr. Carter... Where the devil did you come from? Uh, Patsy, take Miner's gun. Right, Nick. Look... Carter, I, I can explain. Johnny confessed to killing Mr. Ford. He was going to kill me. Save your breath, Miner. For you, the highway back to town is going to be a one-way road to the electric chair. How's your arm, Johnny? Oh, it'll be all right. It's just a flesh wound. Oh, gee, you're lucky, Johnny. We were on our way to Ford's office when Nick saw you getting into Miner's car. And you followed us all the way out from town? Yeah. If we had to drive without lights and stay quite a distance behind, our Miner would have noticed us. I still don't know why he wanted to bump me off. After the way he framed me, I never could have proved I... I didn't kill Mr. Ford. Well, he couldn't take any chances on you having an alibi. Nick, Nick, how did Bisbee get that 28000 Did he really win it in a poker game? There's no reason to doubt it now, Patsy. 
Oh, Johnny, here's something Bisbee asked me to give you. Oh? Uh-huh. Probably a nice little apology for sending you to the penitentiary for something you didn't do. I just don't like that man. Well, what is it, Mr. Carter? Here. Gee, it's a check. For a thousand dollars. Oh. Mm-hmm. He thought it might make up for at least part of what you've been through. Oh, Johnny, that's wonderful. Now you can make a real start in life. Yeah. Yeah, gee, a thousand bucks. I wish Mom could be here to see this. And he has a job for you, too. A much better job than you had before. Gosh, Mr. Carter. That just goes to show you how wrong a fellow can be sometimes. Mr. Bisbee ain't a bad guy at all when you get to know what he's really like. You know, Johnny, that's generally true. Very few people are really bad when you get to know them. I'm glad you found that out while you're still young. It'll make your life a whole lot easier sometimes. Well, Nick, can you tell us something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Yes, Mike. Next week, we're going to meet a young man who didn't commit murder because the victim wasn't running backwards. And the only way Nick could prove it was by tracing $5 worth of toy money to the real killer. Well, between running backwards and toy money, there ought to be plenty of excitement. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the Bull and Bear. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Matty, I want you to get hold of a delivery truck and two suits of overalls. Okay, Nick. Anything else? Yeah. Get enough grease to turn us into a couple of overworked truckmen. Uh, and then what? Then we've got half an hour to make the wrong delivery to the right party and prevent a murder. Now, the case of the bull and bear. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Jeff Howe and Dodie Murray think they're a lucky couple. Just when they thought they'd never get the money to get married, old Sidney Poor, who owns a candy store in their rundown neighborhood, is breaking them into a racket that's going to make them rich. He keeps telling them, Now, uh, you understand. You walk into the department store. Dodie's got two $100 bills in her purse. Yeah, one's real money, and the other's counterfeit. Yeah, yeah, we got that. Yes. You buy something, a watch maybe, something in the jewelry line. Uh-huh. Dodie takes out the real $100 bill to pay for it. Yeah. Then that the what? clerk will have to have the bill checked by the floor manager. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. Uh, all stores do that. It's a rule. And you make a big fuss, both of you. Like, like you're being insulted because they don't trust you. You get that? Yeah. Uh-huh. But when the floor manager says the bill is okay, and for the clerk to go ahead and make the sale... You grab the bill back, and you walk out like you're real mad. Well, what do we do after that? You wait about a half hour, and then you go back. Make out like you're ashamed of yourself for losing your temper. Apologize. Say you'll buy the watch after all. Uh-huh. And this time, you pay for it with the counterfeit hundred. I get it. The clerk thinks it's the same bill the manager okay. That's right. He won't check it again. He'd be glad to make the sale. So you walk out with the watch or whatever you bought, and you bring it back here. And bring back the change, too. Sure, it's a cinch. Well, anything else now, Mr. Poor? This, this is the kind of a test. If it works out okay, I'll take you on regular. 
I like to give nice young folks a helping hand. Well, I... Uh, I don't know. They're all very nice, madam. May I suggest... Uh, how much is that bracelet? Uh, the one with the red beads, the ruby? Yeah, $290. Oh. Oh, well, uh, how about that one there? $98. That's the one for you, honey. Oh, okay, I... I'll take it. Very good, madam. May I have your charge number? Oh, um, I'll, I'll pay cash. I just happen to have a hundred dollars with me. Uh, here, thank you. I, uh... Well, what are you gawking at the bill for? We're not accustomed Mr. to having our honesty. Oh, Mr. Roberts, do we count a please and hurry? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the manager, I think he's a detective. Stay right where you are. Go on, Dodie, run. Quick, I'm going. Oh, Mr. Roberts, stop that man. Look at Anybody trying to stop me, get the bullet in the head. All right, fellow, I'll take that gun. Why, you Come on, don't. let me have it. Let go of me. For life. Anybody hurt, Patsy? Yes, Nick. The door detective was shot. You hurt bad? Yes. Yes, he was. He's dead. All right, Nick. Now, see if I got this straight. Go ahead, Benny. Jeff Howe and a girl come into the store and try to buy a bracelet... With a counterfeit $100 bill. Right. The clerk spots the phony and calls Roberts, the store detective. Right. Jeff Howe makes a break and Roberts chases him. The girl disappears and Howe kills Roberts. Wrong. What do you mean, wrong? I mean, Howe didn't kill the detective. But he was doing the shooting. Well, we know that, but he was shooting over his head to break up the crowd. Just the same, Patsy. He could have shot one bullet over his shoulder and drilled Roberts. Roberts was only six or seven feet behind him. Yes, Matty, but Roberts was shot in the back. In the back? Yes, and he couldn't have been running backwards when he was chasing Howe. Holy smoke. You're telling me someone else shot Roberts? I am. But I have a hunch the killer was really shooting at Howe. Oh, but look, Nick... If I'm right, Matty, the shot that killed Roberts came from the door of the fire stairs. Come on, I'll show you. But what makes you think the shot came from there? I examined the wound. And I figured out the approximate angle the shot was fired from. Huh. Did anyone notice the shot from this direction? Not so far as I know. There was too much excitement in shooting. Huh. Incidentally, how did you and Nick happen to be here in the store? Why, uh, I was trying to buy a birthday present for a boy named Lucas. Yeah. And Nick was very annoyed because I wouldn't tell him anything about Lucas. I was trying to make him jealous. <laughs> and... Oh, save it, Patsy. <laughs> here we are, Matty. Oh, yeah. Now... The killer could have stood about here, just inside the emergency exit door. The yeah. sound of the shot could have been swallowed up by the stairwell. The killer could have... Huh? Yes, by George, he did. What? Did what? Nick? Look there in the corner, right next to that piece of paper. What? what is it? It's an ejected cartridge from a forty-five automatic. Well, how about that? And there, that's not a piece of paper. It's a bill. Money. It's a... Oh, Chuck, no, it isn't either. Yeah, let's see it. It's make-believe money, toy money from some game. Mm. But it's a pretty good imitation in a rough sort of way. Yeah, probably from the toy department. Well, Matty? So Jeff Howe didn't kill Roberts. Right. Let's go to headquarters. I want to see if Howe can tell us who did kill him. What a crazy little dope. Scared she was. She pulled out the phony bill first. Who was she, Jeff? None of your business. Oh, tough guy, huh? Yeah. Look, Jeff, I know that routine. I've heard it a hundred times. I'm tough. I can take it. I don't squeal. Yeah, you said it. They all say it. But change their minds when they find out they're suckers. You're trying to be loyal, Jeff. Only trouble is no one's going to be loyal to you. Says you. Someone put you and the girl up to this racket, Jeff. And I want to know who it was. Yeah? Yeah. I've got to notify the Secret Service. I want to give them that information. Too bad. You ain't gonna. Still loyal, huh? It's rather foolish, Jeff. Why? Because someone has tried to double-cross you already. Double-cross me? Yes, double-cross you. They didn't trust you. You and the girl were followed when you went to the store and were watched very carefully. When you got in that jam, someone tried to shut you up. With a bullet. What bullet? What are you talking about? A forty-five automatic slug. Meant for you. What? You didn't get that slug because the store detective got it. And he's dead. Is that on the level, Mr. Carter? Someone tried to plug me? I'm sure of it. Now, look, Jeff. 
Eventually, you're going to be handed over to the Secret Service. Counterfeit money's their case. They've got you cold on that count. Yeah, yeah. But murder. But murder comes first, and murder's my business. So if you want to escape a murder rap, you've got to help me. Well, what do you want to know? A lot of things. Who put you up to this racket? Who supplied the phony money and the real bill? Who would want to shut you up for keeps? It's... Sydney Poor. 1270 Grand Apple. Mm-hmm. But don't tell him I told you. Now, don't worry, I won't. But I've got a few things I want him to tell me. He left me, Mr. Poor. He ran off and left me on my own. The dirty double-crossing no, heels. No, my dear. If I hadn't had good luck, I'd have been caught. He didn't even try to help me. No, he just no, ran out of Jody, the place. everything is going to be all right. You've got to... Someone just came into the shop. Hello? Anyone uh, minding the store? Coming, sir. Coming. Just resting my feet in the back for a moment. Hard on an old man's feet keeping shop. Yes, sir. You, Mr. Poor? Sidney Poor? Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Uh, I'd like a dollar's worth of that candy. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's cold in here. Don't you have any heat? Uh, no, sir. Just the stove in the back. I haven't started it yet. Can't afford to. With the price of coal so high up. Poor is a poor man. <laughs> My favorite joke. Oops, careful with that tray. Hey, what's the matter with your hands? No, oh, old age, sir. Just old age. Makes a man shake. Uh, will that be all, sir? Yeah, that's all. Well, here you are, sir. And many thanks. Come again. Thanks. Any luck, Nick? Yeah, yeah. I brought you some candy, Betsy. Well, where's poor? Still in the yeah. store. You didn't arrest him. Nope. Why not? He isn't the man we want. But Jeff said... Poor may be the man who started Jeff in the racket, but he isn't the killer. And I have a hunch he isn't the big boss counterfeiter either. What? How do you know? Because he's an old man. His hands shake constantly. He couldn't shoot a gun with any accuracy at all. Oh, but how do you know he isn't the boss counterfeiter? Look, Betsy, if poor is operating from that store, where's his plant? You need machine, storage space, room for a bread. Maybe a plan from the cellar. There's no cellar. He heats the store with a stove in the back. Oh. No, I have a strong hunch poor is just a middleman, the agent who passes counterfeit money from the plant down to kids like Jeff. And if we want to find out who killed Roberts, we'll have to locate the plant and the man who runs it. That's right. He's the one who'd have most reason to cover Jeff or try to kill him to keep him from talking. Well, could we locate him through poor? All depends on how smart we play it and how far we can play poor. But I've got an idea. Yeah? What is it? Listen to this and tell me what you think. Crystal! Crystal! Open up! Who is it? It's me, Sidney Poor. Oh. You and your crazy ideas. How to cut you up and feed you to the lions at the zoo. Oh, no, take it easy, Crystal. Take it easy. I just killed a man. You know what they hand out for murder in this state? But, Crystal, This was I... a nice, smooth business until you started getting ideas. Let's break new people in, you said. Smart young kids, you said. Make it easy for us, you said. But, Crystal, Oh, you I... certainly made it easy, all right. Now, who is going to be the next bright boy I have to kill to make it easy? That's what I came to tell you. Jeff isn't dead. What? You didn't what? hit him. You hit the store detective. Yeah, you're kidding. I'm not kidding, Crystal. And the man who caught Jeff was around to my store just now. <laughs> snooping, I guess. Don't you recognize him? Who is he? I, I don't know. He, he's a tall fella. About 6'1". Weighs maybe uh, 190. Dark brown hair. Blue eyes that kind of look through you. About 35, I'd say. A nice looking fella. It looks like an athlete. Wait, did he have a soft hat to pull out in front? Yeah, that's him. Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Yes, you dope. I know he was in the store this morning. I saw him there. Well, I, I guess we better pull out. You can't buck Carter. I've got to. And I can. I'm smart, Sidney. And I'm already one step ahead of Carter. I don't see it, Crystal. He doesn't know I know he's looking for me. Maybe I'll let him find me. Yes. Yes, maybe I will. But, Crystal, I... You know, it's a funny thing, Sidney. The first murder's the hardest. And the rest come easy. And no matter how many times you kill... They can only send you to the chair once.
Crystal Davis, young, beautiful, and hard, stares icily at Sidney Poor as plans to outwit Nick Carter race through her head. We'll see what she decides to do in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the Bull and Bear, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. While Crystal Davis prepares for an all-out war to the finish, Nick is making plans of his own at police headquarters with Jeff Howell. Did you go after poor Mr. Carter? Yeah, Jeff, I did. But poor isn't the man I want. I want the man he's working for. And you're going to help me find him. I am? How? You're going to escape. But how? Patsy Bowen's going to help you. You and Patsy will head straight for Sidney Poor's candy store. She'll tell you our plan on the way. Yes, sir. And get this straight, Jeff. I went out on a limb to give you this chance. I had to do some hard talking to get Sergeant Matheson to agree. Yes. Yes, Mr. Carter. Now, this is your chance to come through. So don't let me down. And above all, don't let yourself down. Shut the door, babe. Okay. What are you doing here, Jeff? What happened? Who's this girl? I made a break, Mr. Poor. She helped. You got away? Yeah, yeah, but I wouldn't have if she didn't give me a hand. That's right. It's here, Penny Blake. Good kid. Hi. But, but, but why did you come here, Jeff? I mean, what You don't think you... I'm quitting the racket, do you? No, sirree. Me and Penny's going to work together and act together. She's smart. Yeah, sure. Had to pull it off before if it wasn't for Dodie. Why, that crazy kid's the dumbest cluck i ever seen. You oh, know what yeah. she... Dodie! I heard I every word you said, Jeff. Everything. So, this is your new girl, huh? Want to make something out of it? She's just right for you, Jeff. A cheap little dame for a cheap little young Why don't you and... shut up? Shut up? Me? I'll show you, you... Hey. Well, who are you staring at? You. What's the matter with me? Mr. Poor. She... She's the girl that was with Nick Carter when he caught Jeff. <coughs> And stay with that phone, Scubby. Patsy's due to check in any minute. I'm going down to headquarters to fight with Maddie. Good afternoon, Mr. Carter. I've been waiting for you. I beg your pardon. I thought this was my car. It is. Please get in. Well, thank you. I'm Crystal Davis. Charm, Miss Davis. Uh, call me Crystal, please. Delighted, Crystal. Thank you. Nick, are you a gambler? Isn't everyone, one way or another? I suppose so. My favorite game is open poker. I like to see everyone's cards. I like them to see mine. You have some good cards to show, Crystal? I think so. I killed a store detective, Nick. What? You killed a... I killed him with the same gun I've got in my purse now. <laughs> Is this a confession? No. I'm just showing my cards. You've already shown yours. Patsy Bowen. Oh? I've got her, Nick. I guess that, more or less. What's your proposition, Crystal? I want you to call off the war, Nick. Drop the case. Let me alone. But someone's got to take the rap for the murder. What's the matter with Jeff Howe? Jeff? Sure. Who cares about him? Pin it on Jeff, Nick. You can do it. Except that he'll talk. No, he won't. I'll arrange it so that you get him back, uh, dead. You will? Nick, if you'll promise me to drop the case, you get Patsy Bowen back. Otherwise? I see. Suppose I give you my word in one hour. No, Nick. Now. That's impossible. The whole homicide squad's working on this case. It'll take me an hour to pull them off. It'll take an hour to convince Maddie I was wrong about Jeff. You mean that? I do. All right, Nick. In one hour. It's a deal. I'll let the girl go in one hour. I have your word that you'll drop the case. In one hour, yes. You have my word. Nick, are you out of your mind? Why didn't you just pull Crystal in when you had her? Use your head, Maddie. She's holding Patsy a prisoner. If Crystal didn't get back to her hideout, Patsy would be killed. Ah, you're right there. Well, what do we do now? After Crystal left me, I found this key on the floor of my car. She must have dropped it. The key? Let me see it. Yeah. Uh, hotel key from the old Kettle Inn. Nick, now we got something. 
Any idea where this old kettle inn is? Yeah, yeah, it's North Barton, about 50 miles from here. I've been past it a couple of times. Well, what are we waiting for? I'll get my car. No, 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 no. hold it, Matty, hold it. Do you huh? think Crystal's fool enough to drop a hotel key accidentally in my car right where I could find it? What? Oh, then you think it's a plan? Of course I do. She hoped we do just what you started to do, dash up there to try to locate her. Yeah, I see what you mean. It's a trap. She wanted to gain time so she could clean up her business and get out of town. She wanted to let me know she was holding Patsy as a hostage. Yeah. And maybe Patsy ain't safe even with that deal you made with Crystal. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of, Maddie. No crook would ever trust anybody as much as Crystal says she trusts me, which means we've got to locate her hideout and fast. Yeah, but where is she? Well, let's use our heads. Suppose we were in the counterfeiting racket. Yeah, sure. What's but, our but... problem? First, we need a hideout. A place where we can run a printing press without drawing attention to ourselves. Yeah, a printing plant would do the trick. Yeah, but what do we do with print? What do we print? We've got to be in a position to buy paper and ink of high enough quality to use for counterfeiting money. Oh, there you got me. And our next problem, the distribution of the money. How do we send it out to men like Sidney Poor all over the country? How do we get it to the middlemen who hire the crooks who pass it? Uh-huh. Maybe. Uh, hey. What's the matter? The toy money. What? A crumbled bill of toy money Patsy picked up. It was lying next to the ejected cartridge shell in the store. But what about that? Don't you understand, Matty? It was a pretty fair imitation of real money. So real, it fooled Patsy at a distance. That satisfies the condition. Holy smoke, Nick, you got it. You have a plant that makes a game using toy money. Probably a very expensive game because the toy money looks so real. That's your excuse for buying high-quality paper and ink. Yeah, but I never saw a game that used toy money that looked that good. Now, I doubt whether many people have, Matty. And if I'm right, I don't believe the manufacturer cares if nobody buys it. Nick, that's it. That's how you distribute the counterfeit money to middlemen. You send them a dozen boxes of the game with the counterfeit money hidden under the toy money. And no one would ever notice. Right, Matty. Here, let me have that phone. Yes, sure, here. Maybe when Crystal pulled the gun out of her purse, that toy money came out, too. Maybe she manufactures this game for a cover-up. Yeah, could be, could be. Yeah. Hello? Croydon Department Store? Let me speak to the buyer in the toy department, please. What are you doing now, Nick? Now, just a minute. You find... Yeah, hello? Can you tell me whether you stock a game using toy money that looks very much like real money, except that the president's face on the bill has changed to a joker? Uh-huh. Bull and bear. I see. A Wall Street game, speculation in the toy exchange. Yeah. Now tell me, is that the only game using that kind of toy money? It is. Good. Can you tell me the manufacturer who supplies bull and bear? This is very urgent. Uh, you got something, Nick? I think so. Adult Games Company, 25 Archer Street. Thank you very much. Adult Games Company. You think that's Crystal's outfit, Nick? I hope so. What time is it? At uh, almost 5.30. All right, let's go. I've got a little over half an hour to show Crystal how I play poker. Nick and Matty rush from the room, wondering whether Nick's deduction is right. Wondering whether they'll find Patsy and Crystal Davis at the home of Bull and Bear. We'll see what happens in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Bull and Bear. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In a dimly lit plant on Archer Street, the presses that turn out toy money for bull and bear games and counterfeit money for cheating Uncle Sam make an ominous background for the five people who sit and wait. Sydney. Yes, Crystal. What time is it? Five or six. All right. Got the press, Mike. Okay, Crystal. All right, Miss Bowen. Time to get ready to leave. It goes for you and Dodie, Jeff. Now, look, Crystal, we don't like this. You don't like what? I mean, the boys, we don't like to deal with Carter. How do we know he keeps his word? Who cares if he keeps his word? He keeps his word. But I thought you trusted him. The whole deal was a stall, honey. I wanted to get us time to finish up and get out of here. I gotta hand it to you, Crystal. Now, if the last batch of phony dough is finished, we blow town. Yeah, but what about the girl? What do you think? They can only hang you once. You're... You're going to... Yes, honey. You and Jess and this dumb girlfriend of his... Three bullets. Oh, no. Oh, you can't do that. We had nothing to do with this. Mike, get the car. We'll take them over to the river. Okay. The rest of you get that money packed and get ready to... Hey, Crystal, open up. Who's that? I don't know. Come on, come on, open up. Look, nobody makes a break. I can shoot this gun fast and straight. Now stay put. Okay? Open the door, Sidney. Come on, come on, will you? Look, I got my truck here. Three dozen bales from Consolidated. Wait a minute. I didn't place any order with Consolidated. All right, I... Crystal, drop that gun. Drop it. Hey, hey, no Mr. tricks, Carter. Sidney. Watch yourself, Crystal. I'm warning you. Hey. All right, pick up that gun, Matty. Okay, I got it, Nick. Material evidence in Crystal's trial for murder. Well, look. Six o'clock, Crystal. The hour's up. 
And I'm keeping my word. I'm dropping the case right now. Only I'm afraid it's too late to do you any good. Well, it sure was a nice haul, Nick. <laughs> Secret Service is going to be mighty happy with that printing plant. To say nothing of the list of Crystal's customers. And you've solved your open and shut murder, Sergeant. Oh. Yes, Matty, with a pistol that killed a store detective and the evidence that Jeff and Dodie are prepared to give, you've got Crystal right where you want her. Headed for the death house. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're all lucky you and Patsy decided to go shopping this morning, Nick. <laughs> all except Crystal. And Patsy. Why me? Well, you never did buy that birthday present for your mysterious Lucas. Nick, I bet you are jealous, goody. Now, I can tell you, I got the present already. Yeah, but how? You didn't have time. I took one of those bull and bear games from Crystal's hideout. It'll be just right for Lucas. He's ten years old. <laughs> about the adventure that new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Mike, we're going to meet an old lady in a wheelchair who refuses to be murdered. Well, I can understand why she might not approve of the idea. Not only that, Mike, she objected so violently that she joined Nick's staff long enough to catch the killer. Say, that's a new kind of detective, an old lady in a wheelchair. And it's a story I think you'll enjoy, Mike, about a murderer who discovered too late that he was his own victim. What do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Wrong Mr. Wright. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Patsy, Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Friends, in every community chest city, nearly half the families benefit from Red Feather Aid. This year, however, these services cost more. Hence, there must be more and greater contributions. What's more, the USO is back, and community chest gifts must also cover it. We urge you, therefore, to give generously to the community chest in your city. One contribution is a gift to all the services in your community. Remember, everybody benefits, everybody gives. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. <laughs> This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Even though she's 79 years old and confined to a wheelchair, old Mrs. Peck still enjoys picnic. And since her two great-grandnephews, John and Charles, expect to inherit the Wright Pharmaceutical Company one day, they're always willing to go along. One day early last fall, Charles' wife, Janet, wheeled old Mrs. Wright to the picnic ground in a secluded corner of the estate and stopped the chair near the edge of a cliff overhanging the river. How's this, Aunt Mag? Just fine, Janet. Oh, I've always loved this view, looking down at the river. Mm. Like being on top of the world. It is beautiful. Where are the boys? They went back into the woods looking for dead branches to build a fire with wine. I wanted Charles to go back to the house for my shawl that you might know he wouldn't be around when I need him. I'll get it for you, Aunt Mag. Thank you, Janet. I'll be right back. Uh, I still wish she'd married Johnny instead of Charles. Oh, well... This is a beautiful spot up here with the sun uh, ah, ah, Johnny, take your hand away from my eyes. I know it's you. Where are you wheeling me to, Johnny? Johnny! Charles! Johnny! Take your hand off my eyes. Oh! No! Oh! <laughs> you didn't drown, Mrs. Wright. If those two fishermen hadn't seen you fall in and got to you in time... Well, they did. Are you sure you're well enough to talk, Mrs. Wright? Yes, of course I am. But Aunt Madge, you know what Dr. Myron said about your heart. No, pneumonia and left it weak may quit any time. All the more reason this thing has to be now. But Aunt Madge, I'll... Mr. Carter, 
I sent for you to tell you someone has tried to murder me. You mean someone deliberately pushed your wheelchair over the cliff? Exactly. But I mean, no one was near that part of the estate but John and Charles and me. And the boat is burned on the foot, scattered with firewood. I know it wasn't you, Janet. Well, that was a man's hand over my eyes. And Johnny wouldn't he? He loves his old aunt. Then you think it was your other nephew, Charles? I know it was, and I want you to prove it, Mr. Carter. Well, I'm afraid you're asking the impossible, Mrs. Wright. Why? Well, don't you see? This all happened three weeks ago. Even if there were any clues, they'd, they'd be gone by now. Investigate, Charles. You'll find something I'll be bound. I don't understand you, Aunt Madge. Talking about your own nephew like this, and in front of me, his wife. I'd just as soon say it to his face. Even as a boy, Charles used to sneak lie, steal money out of my purse. I could see the difference between him and John even then. You've never given Charles a chance. I put them both through the same school, didn't I? Trained them both chemists so they could take over the business together someday, didn't I? And what happened? Charles went into real estate. There's no more reason than that. You're accusing him. Oh, it made you being unfair. All right. I'll show you whether I'm unfair or not. Mr. Carter, I want you to investigate both Charles and John. Very well, Mrs. Wright. And let me know what you find out as soon as you can. I will. In the meantime, be careful. <laughs> he won't try it again. I fixed that. You fixed it? How? My lawyer was here this morning, and I changed my will. You did what? Changed my will. The way it stands now, I'm leaving everything to John. That's mad. How could you? Maybe I'll change it back later. But I want Charles to know that if anything happens to me before I do, <laughs> he won't get a red cent. <laughs> That's so soon, Carter. It's only been three days, hasn't it? Well, there wasn't a great deal to find out. How nice you look, Mrs. Wright. You must be feeling a lot better. I wouldn't be out of bed if I wasn't. <laughs> this is Aunt Madge's 80th birthday, and we're getting ready to have a little party. Oh, oh. never mind that, Janet. I want to hear what Carter found out. Well, frankly, Mrs. Wright, what I've learned doesn't prove a thing. I'll decide that. Okay. First of all, your nephew, John Wright, seems to be a pretty steady young fellow. No bad habits or associates. Lives within his income, saves regularly, and so on. I could have told you that. What about Charles? Well, Patsy can read that part of the report to you. Go ahead, Patsy. Right, Nick. Charles Wright. Credit rating, very poor. Business, heavily mortgaged. Overdue loan at the First Community Bank. Several large personal loans. I all... don't see any reason for parading Charles' business difficulties. Why, here. Janet. What else, young lady? Three days before Mrs. Wright's accident, Charles Wright attempted to consolidate his debts with a loan from the Halliday Trust Company offering as security the fact that he would soon inherit half the estate of his aunt, who was very ill and could not possibly live long. Uh, couldn't possibly live long. Well, he did his best to make sure of it. That isn't true. Charles couldn't do such a thing. It is right. It'd be very unfair to condemn anyone on such flimsy evidence. No, it only confirms what I thought before. Janet... If you want to live here with me, you're welcome. But I want Charles to back up and get out today. Well, that man's your birthday party. My mind's made up. Mrs. Wright, it's a favor to me. Go on downstairs. Have your birthday party. And don't say anything to either John or Charles until tomorrow. Sleep on it first. Well, please, Aunt Madge, try to be fair. Oh, there goes that word fair again. All right. I won't say anything until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you love it, Aunt Mad. Huh? Now, come on, open your present. Open this one first, Aunt Mad. Yes, it's from Charles and me. I can read the card, can't I? Hey, an amethyst brooch. Good looking. Uh, very pretty. Thank you, Janet. Uh, you too, Charles. Well, I'm glad you like it, Aunt Mad. Don't oh, talk with your mouth full, Charles. I should think three pieces of cake would be enough for you anyway. Well, I'm afraid my gift will look pretty sad after that, Aunt Mad. Anyway... Here it is, with all my life. You know I like it, Johnny, whatever it is. Well, a music box. It's beautiful, Johnny. Well, open the lid. Oh, how thoughtful of you. But where am I, chocolate? You what? Ah, oh, now, stop teasing. You know you always give me a box of those special Swiss chocolates on my birthday. Well, you know, I have to order them from Switzerland, and this year it just slipped my mind. Oh, I don't believe it. 
What's that you're holding behind your back? <laughs> <laughs> can't fool you, can I, Aunt Mad? Here. And many happy returns of the day. Ah, damn. <laughs> uh, my birthday just wouldn't be complete without these. Aren't they pretty? They always look as good as they taste. Here, I'll put them away for you that night. You know the doctor said no sweets for a while. Oh, Janet, give me those chocolates. But that's mm, the They doctor do look good, don't they? <laughs> well, I'm not on a diet. Charles, put that back. Those chocolates are for Aunt Mad. Well, huh? too late now. I only took one anyway. Now, you ought to be ashamed, Charles. Hmm. Doesn't taste so hot. Kind of bitter. Hand me that box, Janet, before you eat the rest of them. Well, all right. And then don't don't eat those. What, Charles? What's the matter? Chocolate. Something wrong. I feel. Charles. Within seconds of eating one of his aunt Madge's birthday chocolates, Charles Wright collapses. And even before Janet can reach her husband's side, he's dead. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. An hour has passed, and Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad is at the Wright Mansion with Nick and Patsy, trying to arrive at the facts of Charles' death. A medical examiner says there must have been enough cyanide in that piece of candy to kill half a dozen men. But it couldn't have been the chocolate, Sergeant. You stop pretending, John. This is one thing you can't blame Charles for. Well, I'm not trying to... If that wife have... had eaten that chocolate before she put Charles back in the will, you'd have inherited everything. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Then it stopped. I won't stop. You've always protected and tired of Now you know who tried to kill you last That's month. Madge, I swear I don't know anything about liar, it. Liar, liar, liar. Charles always had to take the blame for what you did. And even as he was dying, he tried to warn us. All right, all right. Now, hold everything just a minute. Uh, Mr. Wright, why do you say the chocolates couldn't have been poisoned? Because they arrived by registered mail from Switzerland only this afternoon. I didn't even have time to unwrap the package before I gave it to Aunt Madge. The wrappings could have been taken off and put back again. Of course they couldn't. That's exactly what he did. I did not. If there was poison in those chocolates, somebody else put it there. Oh, sure, sure. As a biochemist, Mr. Wright, you have access to cyanide, don't you? Well, yes, but so do lots of people. And when Charles started to eat that chocolate, you tried to stop him, didn't you? I, I don't remember. I do. He said, put it back, Charles. Those chocolates are for Aunt Mad. Uh-huh. Well, I think we've heard enough. Come on, young fellow. Come on, where? To headquarters. Where do you think? I'm booking you for murder. We have to wait here at the post office very long. No, no. Maddie said he'd phone ahead and get an okay for us to look at that receipt. Good. Oh, here's the inquiry window over here. Well, I hope the sergeant didn't forget the phone. Uh, yes, sir? My name's Nick Carter. I came to see about a receipt for a registered package from Switzerland. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I have it right here. The assistant postmaster said he'd be calling for it. Thanks. Oh. Why, Nick? John Wright didn't sign for the chocolate. Oh, the name seems to be... Yvette Fouchard. Yvette Fou... Why, that means his wife's personal maid. Uh Uh-huh. And look at the date. Yesterday. Then John was lying. He had that package a whole day before the party. It looks that way. But before we make up our minds, let's talk to Yvette. Oui, monsieur. It is yesterday afternoon. I finally... What you call in the certificate? The receipt. Oh, oui, mademoiselle. I sign him, then I place the package on the old table where Monsieur Jean is sure to see him. Not a half hour has passed until I hear the voice of Monsieur Jean greeting Madame, and I say to myself, why he is home so early, huh? And why was he? Madame, see, he had a headache. But what about the package? When I put the regular mail on the whole table about three o'clock, the chocolates are gone. Monsieur Jean had sent them. But you didn't see him do it. No, monsieur. But the package is there when he come home. It is gone after he passed through the hall. So I know he had signed it. 
Isn't it funny, Nick? The smartest men make stupid mistakes when they try to commit a crime. John left a trail of evidence a yard wide. How about you forgetting, Patsy, that if Mrs. Wright had eaten that chocolate, there probably wouldn't have been any investigation. You mean because of her weak heart? Sure. Everyone would have assumed that death was due to heart failure. Well, what now, Nick? Let's get on to headquarters and see what the laboratory boys have found out. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Nick. That box of candy was more interesting than we thought. How do you mean, Sergeant? Well, first of all, Patsy, the poison must have been put in with a hypodermic needle. The lab boys found marks like pinholes in the bottom of every chocolate. Nothing unusual about that, Matty. No, but what was unusual was the cyanide itself, Nick. In the lower layer, he used a solution so weak, it wouldn't have killed anybody but a person with a bad heart like Mrs. Wright. Well, what do you mean in the lower layer? <laughs> That's just it, Patsy. He gave the top layer a solution ten times as strong. Enough to kill anybody. Hey, that is interesting. Yeah, and that's not all. There were some impurities in that cyanide, Nick. That'll be a thing to prove where it came from once we locate the original supply. Yeah, sure. Chemical analysis should take care of that. Yeah, but the most important thing of all was a fingerprint. Whose fingerprint? I don't know yet, Patsy, but I bet it's John's. The chocolate must have got sore while we was holding it to put the poison in. Have you checked it against John's print? Yeah, the boys are doing that now, Nick. Matty, where was the chocolate with a fingerprint on it? Top or bottom layer? Uh, The bottom. And that layer hadn't been touched until we got the box down here to the lab. So he can't claim that it got there by accident after the box was open. Now, you're right about that. Could I go down to the lab and take a look at the chocolates myself? Sure you can, Nick. What for? I'd like to find out why the top layer was given a double dose. Sergeant Matheson was right, Nick. All these chocolates have the same kind of little pinholes in the bottom. No, no, not quite the same, Patsy. Look at these chocolates in the top layer. Holes are larger and not quite so regular. Well? Looks to me as though someone had put a second dose of cyanide in these and tried to insert the needle in the holes left by the first one. Well, yes, it does look that way. That's why the poison was stronger in the top layer. Why, of course. He decided that perhaps the weak solution wouldn't actually kill her, so he gave the chocolates on top another dose with a stronger solution. Perhaps. But why insert the needle in exactly the same place? Why not? Look at the pattern on the bottom of each piece of candy. The tin hole is right in the middle of that little dimple where you can hardly see it. It's the logical place to put the needle. You know, Patsy, I'm beginning to wonder whether that second dose of poison might not have been put in by somebody else. Well... You mean two different people had the same idea at almost the same time? Could be. And both of them tried to kill Mrs. Wright with the same kind of poison in the same box of chocolate? Oh, Nick, that, that's too much of a coincidence. Well, stranger things than that have happened, Patsy. Let's visit John Wright's laboratory. I want to find out if the cyanide really did come from there. <laughs> Here's the only bottle of cyanide we have, Miss Carter, but we don't use it because it's not a very good grade. Some kind of impurities in it. I don't know exactly what. Impurities? Nick, do you remember what the sergeant said? Yeah, I know what you mean, Patsy. Must be an interesting job, Mr. Jensen, laboratory assistant to a biochemist. Oh, the work's interesting enough. You don't happen to be working for a slave driver like John Wright. Oh, uh, don't you like him? Uh, John's all right, I guess. It's sure a lot pleasanter working for Charles. You mean Charles used to be a chemist here, too? Oh, yes, yes. Before he went into real estate, I was his assistant then, and Janice worked with John. Then after John broke their engagement and Janice married Charles... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is getting complicated. Janet and John were engaged. Oh, yes, yes. But he changed his mind. Everybody thinks she broke it off. I know different. John just let her say that they were feeling. Then Charles was Janet's second choice. Huh? Yes, that's right. Have you seen either of them lately? Uh, yes, yes. They were both up one day last week talking over old times. I see. Well, thanks for the information, Mr. Jensen. It helped a lot. Uh, here's the report on that cyanide comparison test, Nick. Okay, let's see it. Here you are. 
Both of them analyzed exactly the same. Then the cyanide and the chocolate came from John Wright's laboratory. Not a doubt in the world, Patsy. Now, how about the fingerprint on that chocolate? Ah, we drew a blank there. Maybe it belongs to somebody in the candy factory in Switzerland. Anyway, it's not John Wright. Uh, could it belong to someone else in the Wright household? Well, Patsy, the fingerprint boys are checking that now, but it's, that's just routine. That print had to be made by either the poisoner or somebody in Switzerland. Nobody else had a chance to touch that bottom layer of candy. I'm beginning to get an idea, Matty. Huh? Pretty fantastic, but... Oh, sure. Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, yeah, Barker. Is it the report? Yes, I think. What? Parker, you made a mistake. Oh, no, no. No, you must have. Yeah, but... Okay. Okay, Parker. Whose friend was it, Sergeant? Nick, do you know who poisoned those chocolates? I think I do. Same guy that ate one of them and died, Charles Wright. John, call it Nick Kill Wright. It was his fingerprint. Oh, but if Charles poisoned the chocolates, he must have known what he was doing when he ate one of them. Uh, yeah, Nick. Are you trying to tell me the guy committed suicide just so he could frame John for murder? No, Matty. I think Charles Wright cooperated in his own murder. Huh? And I'm afraid by doing so, he made it impossible for us to get one shred of evidence that will convict the real killer. Well, do you know who it is, Nick? I think I do. There's only one way to prove it. How? Method I hate to use, Matty. Because it may be pretty dangerous for an innocent person. <laughs> Aunt Matt, so I... What in the world are you doing with these two laundry hampers here in your room? I'm looking for something with a chocolate stain on it. Here, Janet, you look through this hamper. Chocolate stain? What do you mean? The chocolate was soft. And whoever poisoned those candies must have got some of it on his fingers. It would be the most natural thing in the world to wipe them off on something without even thinking about it. Aunt Matt, John poisoned them. You know that. All right. Then if we find chocolates on one of his handkerchiefs, that will prove it. Oh, it's just a waste of time, Aunt Man. Maybe, but... <gasps> Did you find something? Uh, no. No, I didn't find a thing. And why are you looking so funny? I'm not. I'm not looking funny at all. I... Jenna, would you run downstairs and ask Harvey to bring up some tea? You're just making an excuse to get me out of the room, aren't you, Aunt Man? I know, Janet. Why should I? Why? So you can make a telephone call to Nick Carter. Oh, what an idea. Why should I... Because want... you did find something in that clothes hamper. You're trying to hide it under your robe right now. I'm not trying to hide anything. Let's see. Let's let go of it. My damn it. Oh. One of my handkerchiefs. And there is a smear of chocolate on it. I was more careless than I thought. And it was you. You did poison that candy. Of course I did. But you knew that if I died, everything would go to John. That's why I took the candy away from you before you had a chance to eat any of it. And that's why Charles grabbed the piece first. We had it planned very carefully. You mean Charles knew about the poison? Yes. But he thought there was only a tiny bit of it. Enough to make him convincingly sick. And make you think that dear Johnny was trying to kill you. Ah, now I'm beginning to understand. You thought that I blamed Johnny for the other attempt, too. You thought I'd change my will and leave everything to Charles. Exactly, darling. But there was more poison in the chocolates than Charles thought. Because after he finished preparing them, I gave the top layer a second and stronger dose. Ah, I can't believe it. You love Charles. I hated him. Greedy fool. I only married him because I thought he'd be rich someday. And then you cut him out of your will. Why did you kill him, Janet? I, so that I'd get it all for myself. And be rid of him at the same time. With Charles dead and John convicted of his murder, who could you leave it to but me? The poor, sorrowing widow. I didn't know anybody could be so evil. Well, you know now, darling. Any more last words? Last words? Yes. You're about to die of heart failure, dear. No. You don't think I'll let you tell the police about finding that handkerchief, do you? But I was just... So if you don't mind, I'll take that no. pillow from behind your bed. Yes. No, don't please. You won't struggle, mother. Your heart won't last that long. All I need to do is 
hasn't the strength to defend herself against Janet's murderous attack. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Helpless in her wheelchair, Mrs. Wright struggles feebly against the suffocating pillow which Janet holds firmly over her face. Go on and die, you old... Shut up, Janet. Oh, where did you come from? We've been hiding in the closet, listening. Are you all right, Mrs. Wright? Yes, I, I'm quite all right, Mr. Carter. It was such an interesting confession, Janet. I'm sure the jury will enjoy it as much as we did. And you go on trial for murder. <laughs> Charles who pushed my wheelchair over that embankment, wasn't it, Mr. Carter? That's what Janet told us at headquarters. Well, that was Charles' own idea, but the poisoning scheme was Janet. I began to see through the plan when we found Charles' fingerprint on that chocolate. And obviously, Janet had to be in on the scheme, too. Why? Because when we found out that the chocolates had been poisoned a second time with a stronger solution, that made it pretty clear that somebody who knew what Charles had done was double-crossing it. And Janet was the most logical suspect. Uh, I suppose so. But we still didn't have any proof. Those things were only circumstantial evidence. Well, you had the handkerchief with the chocolate stain, Nick. <laughs> Shall we tell her, Mr. Carter? Quite as well. There wasn't any chocolate stain, Patsy. There wasn't any... But there was. I saw it. I know. Maddie and I put it there ourselves. You... So that's why you went through all that rigmarole and let Mrs. Wright risk her life. Oh, I wasn't worried, knowing you were all there in the closet. Uh, anyway, it was worth it to prove that I wasn't wrong about Johnny. <laughs> well, now you can be satisfied that you put your faith in the right, Mr. Wright. <laughs> Well, Nick, what sort of an adventure does he... In the back booth of a dingy bar in the slum district, a well-dressed young man takes a thick package of banknotes from his pocket and passes it across the cigarette scarred table to the shifty-eyed little man who sits across from him. That's every cent I have in the world, Whitey. Six thousand dollars. I said ten. Where's the other four grand? I couldn't get any more. You better get it. Remember that letter I told you about... If anything happens to me, it'll be in the hands of the D.A. within 24 hours. That'll be the end of you. But why? I'll you? meet you here tomorrow night and you... Quit. I can't come here again, Whitey. If anyone should... Okay, say... okay. I'll phone you at the office. Tell you where to bring it. But why do I... I get the other four grand tomorrow night? Or I go to the cops. And you go to the electric chair. For murder. If there were any way I could raise the money for you, I would. You know that. Oh, I know, Chris. I, I wouldn't have asked you, except I've tried everything else. You're the only real friend I've got. Sure. <laughs> now, when you need me, I can't come through. Oh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Whitey phoned me about an hour ago. I promised to have the money at the corner of First and Water Streets at 1 o'clock tonight. I've got to have it there. But why, Don? What's he got on you? You can tell me. No, Chris, I, I don't want to talk about that. But if Whitey ever tells the cops who I really am, it's the end of everything. And that little rat's got me tied hand and foot. You mean that letter to the district attorney? Yes, but... Chris. Chris, do you think you'd be lying about that letter? If I thought now, that... Now, Don, you're not getting any crazy ideas, are you? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm thinking. There's only one chance left. Yeah? Mr. Hughes gets back from Washington at 11 tonight. Nah, you'll never get him to part with $4,000. If I know our beloved employer, he'll never... But he's just... got to. It's my last hold. What if he won't? Then I'll be waiting for Whitey just the same. And it'll be a meeting he'll never forget. <laughs> Whitey, 
Huh? Oh, it's you, Sonny Boy. So dark in that doorway, couldn't see you. Okay, where's the four grand? It's right here. Oh, no, you don't. Let go of that gun. Brian, just trust me with it. Oh. Oh, hi, Nick. Hello, Patsy. Good morning, Sergeant Matheson. Uh, Mr. Hughes, this is Nick Carter and Patsy Bowen. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Hughes. Well, thank goodness you're here at last. At last? Well, Mr. Hughes, it's been exactly 17 minutes since Sergeant Matheson phoned and asked us to come down here to your office. I haven't even had my breakfast yet. What's this all about? Mr. Carter, my firm publishes children's and religious books. An notoriety, scandal, unfavorable publicity, anything like that can ruin us. Um, you see, Nick, there was a murder in the waterfront district last night. Cheap little two-bit crook named Whitey Gear was shot to death. We found this slip of paper on Whitey's body. What? Why, that looks like one of those slips of paper they have in phone booths for people to write phone numbers on. That's what it is, Patsy. Hmm. What's the connection, Matty? The phone number written on that paper is the number of the Hughes Publishing House. Oh, I see. Oh, hey, there's something else written here, too. Don Mason, 1 a.m., 1st Avenue and Water Street. Right. And Whitey was found dead at the corner of 1st and Water, shot to death about 1 a.m., according to the medical examiner. So Don Mason... Now, wait a minute. Is... Who is this Don Mason? Oh, that, Mr. Carter, is the crux of the whole thing. Don Mason is my sales manager, and he's engaged to my daughter. Oh, I see. And you think Mason kept the appointment with Whitey and murdered him, huh? Well, of course, don't you? I wouldn't know, Matty. This slip of paper with Mason's name on it certainly doesn't convince me. Well, I don't get you. From what you tell me, I doubt that Whitey was the kind of man to make a memorandum about anything. Oh, fooey. He did it this time, and that's all I care about, Nick. Maybe. Look, Matty, has anybody else handled this piece of paper except you and me? Why, no, I took it off the bottom myself. What? Then let's put it in an envelope and see that no one else does touch it. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, if you want to. Uh, but there's another thing, Nick. Yeah? Why do was a skinny little runt, but from the looks of things, he must have put up a whale of a fight before he was killed. We found a couple of gray wool threads under his fingernails, like from a gray tweed coat. And Whitey's coat was brown. Oh. Then you think those threads came from the killer's coat during the struggle? Sure, Patsy. What else? Uh-huh. And uh, Mr. Hughes here tells me Don Mason wears a gray tweed coat. And so do lots of other people, Matty. You must understand, Mr. Carter, this company simply cannot afford to have one of its executives accused of murder. Now, I want you to prove that Don had nothing to do with this, this whitey person. But what if he did have? Well, well, then we'll publicize the fact that Hughes Publishing hired the best detective it could get to see justice done, even though the culprit is one of our own executives. Uh, that may help some. Well, how about it, Carter? Before I give you an answer, Mr. Hughes, I'd like to talk this over with Don Mason. He hasn't come down to the office yet, Nick. I was just waiting for you to get here before going over to his apartment after him. A good idea, Matty, except that he may leave for the office before we get to his place. Oh, I have an idea. Don shares an apartment with my star salesman, Chris Bentley. I could phone Chris down to keep Don there until you arrive. Yeah, I suppose you do that, Mr. Hughes. And unless he's got a mighty good alibi, that young fellow's going to move to another apartment. A small one in the city jail. Don. Uh, Don, wake up. Oh, go away. Wake up, you dope. Snap out of it. Uh-huh. Oh, good morning, Chris. What's the matter? Old man Hughes just phoned that some people are coming to see you. He says to tell you to wait here until they arrive. Okay. Oh, I feel terrible. Don, where were you last night? Huh? Get with it, Don. You, you didn't get in until after I went to bed, and that was 3 o'clock. Where were you? Oh, I... What? Oh, I don't know. I can't remember. Did you get the money from old man Hughes? Money. What money? The money to pay off that blackmailer. Did you get it? Good grief. Why, yes, Whitey. Did you see him? I I can't remember whether I did or not. You mean you had another one of those blackouts? I, oh, I guess I must have. Now, let's see. I remember eating dinner here at the apartment with you. Yes, and afterwards I went out for a pack of cigarettes. But when I came back, you were gone. And so was that gun you keep in your dresser drawer. What? Oh, Chris, no. What did you do, Don? 
Why'd you take the gun? You, you, you've got to remember. Oh, I, I can't. I can't remember anyway. I went all over town looking for you, but you just disappeared. Oh, well, from the way my head feels, I'd, I'd think I must have been in some bar, but I don't drink. Wait a minute. What are you doing? Looking for your gun. Yeah, here it is in the pocket of your top coat. And down. Three bullets have been fired from it. What do you mean, three bullets? It wasn't even loaded last time I saw it. Well, it is now. John, are you sure you didn't meet that whitey fellow? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I can't remember. Hey, hey, maybe it's the police who are coming here. Maybe whitey turned me in. Now, get hold of yourself. We haven't much time. What are you doing now? I'm putting the gun on this little shelf over the door in the coat closet. Not much of a hiding place, but we'll have to do until we can get rid of it. Chris, I won't let you get mixed up in anyway. Don't be silly. Now, get this. You never even heard of this whitey person. You were here all last night. You never left the apartment, understand? Yeah, yeah. I never left the apartment. After dinner, you and I played gin rummy and listened to the radio until 3 a.m., and then we went to bed. You were here all last night. And I'll swear to it. <laughs> And you still say you didn't meet Whitey Gear at the corner of First and Water Streets last night, Mason? No, I never even heard of the guy, Sergeant. Then how come he had your name and phone number? I don't know. Can you prove where you were at one o'clock, Don? I was right here in the apartment. That's right, Mr. Carter. Don never stepped outside all last night. You'll swear to that? What? Well, sure I will. We played gin rummy until 3 a.m. Well, that sounds like a pretty good alibi, Sergeant. Yeah, if it holds up. Frankly, Don, you don't look as though you'd spent a quiet evening at home. I'd say you were suffering from a pretty bad hangover. Well, I... Mason, I... Whitey Gear was killed with a thirty-eight revolver. You own such a gun? No. You own a gray tweed coat? Yeah. Why? Where is it? Oh, it's in the closet. But... Right. Don! Uh... Oh, darling, Daddy said you were in some kind of trouble. Uh, Don isn't in any trouble, Betty. No, honey, it's, it's all right. Hey, wait a minute. Who's this? Betty Hughes, Don's fiancée. Say, you're looking fine, Betty. That's a new hairdo, isn't it? Of course not, Chris. But what did Daddy mean I by... guess it's just because I haven't seen you for so long. What are you talking about? You saw me only last night. But what was that? Chris came over to my house last night looking for Don. He said Don had disappeared and he thought... That... Well... Don, something is wrong. Oh, you are in trouble, aren't you? You bet he is, Miss Hughes. So he was with you every minute last night, was he, Chris? Well, I, uh... Now, now look, Sergeant. I'll no... talk to you later. Get your hat done. I'm taking you in for the murder of Whitey Gear. Now, Matty, are you sure you have enough of a case to justify an arrest? You bet I have, Nick. Why would he frame a phony alibi if he wasn't guilty? Oh, Chris, if I'd only known... I tried to tip you off, Betty, but I guess I was pretty clumsy about it. You ready, Don? Yeah. I got my hat. And I got this. Oh, where did you get that gun? Never mind. Just don't make me use it. Because if I do, somebody's going to get hurt. People of the fact that his action is practically a confession of guilt, Don stands near the door, holding Nick, Matty, and the others at the point of his gun. In just a moment, we'll back to the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. <coughs> Holding Nick, Maddie, and the others at the point of his gun, Don stands beside the door to the inner room of the two-room apartment he shares with Chris. Now, get into the bedroom. All of you. Let's do as he says, Maddie. No use anyone getting shot. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Carter. I want to be sure nobody's going to... Oh, don't be too sure. Hey! Keep your hand away from your gun, Sergeant. Okay, okay. You hurt, Nick? No. Just got the wind knocked out of it. Went down to me. I was quite a stunt, Don. I was a commando in the war. Now, anyone else want to try any smart tricks before I leave? You're playing this awful dumb kid. I'm playing it the only way I can. Now I'm going to lock this bedroom door. And then I'm getting out of here. And heaven help anyone who tries to follow me. <coughs> Well, you both just stood there and let him walk out, did you? A fine pair of detectives you turned out to be. They didn't just stand there. 
As soon as they heard the outside door close, Nick and Sergeant Matheson were after him. Yeah, but by the time we got the door unlocked, he was out of sight. But he left his wallet on the dresser, along with some small chains, keys, and so on. He won't get far without a cent in his pocket. Yeah, he left that gray tweed coat, too. I sent it down to the police lab. And if those threads under Whitey Gear's fingernails came from that coat, we'll know it in a couple of hours. Nick. Mm-hmm. That young scoundrel. When I think of all I did for him. What did you do for Don, Mr. Hughes? Well, I gave him a job, didn't I? He even promoted him to be sales manager when he wasn't in line for the job, simply because Betty was in love with him. Well, I guess she sees a mistake now. I doubt it. When a girl's in love... Oh, love, fiddlesticks. Before he came along, it was Chris. For him, somebody else. How long has Don worked for you? Ever since he came here from Toronto in 1942. He was just out of the Canadian Army. I thought I was being patriotic by helping a disabled veteran. Disabled? Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't anything disabled about the way he threw me clear across that room. It was, it was a head wound. That's why they discharged him from the army. He used to have periods when he'd black out completely. He couldn't remember where he'd been or what he'd done for hours at a time, even days. That hasn't happened for a year or so now. Well, according to Chris, it happened last night. That's why Chris tried to give him an alibi. He said whatever Don did, he wasn't responsible. Oh, the guy's just getting ready for a plea of temporary insanity, Nick. But he won't get away with it. Maybe he will, Mary. Unless you can prove the motive. I'll prove the motive. Don't you worry about that. Mm, it seems to me the first thing you've got to do is, is catch him. Yeah, well, I'll do that, too. Every cop in town is on the lookout for him. And five will get you ten. We have him rounded up inside of 24 hours. <laughs> John, is that you? Yes. Are you alone? Yes. Oh, darling, where are you? Never mind. Betty, I need help. And I don't dare try to get in touch with Chris. The cops are sure to be watching the apartment. If there's anything I can do. There is. I've got to have some money so I can get out of town. A couple of hundred dollars. I'll get it. I'll bring it to you. No, no, I, I won't let you take any chances. Give the money to Chris. Tell him... I'll be waiting in the freight yards at the foot of 68th Street at midnight. Hey, Nick. Nick, we've got it. Got what, Matty? The only thing that was missing in this case. The motive. Look at this letter. Who's it from, Sergeant? From Whitey Gear, that's who. Whitey. And let's see. There you are. He was afraid Don might try to knock him off, so he left this with a friend to be mailed to the district attorney in case anything happened to him. <laughs> the A got it in the mail about an hour ago. What are those newspaper clippings, Nick? I don't know yet. A dated Portland, Oregon, 1939. It's all there. Even a picture of Don Mason. <laughs> His real name is Jimmy Burke, and he's wounded for murder. Murder? Yeah, Patsy. He was mixed up with a juvenile gang in Portland that robbed a warehouse and shot the night watchman. And Don was the one who killed him? That's what this clipping says. Oh. The gun that killed the watchman was positively identified as belonging to Don. He must have escaped into Canada and joined the army there under the name of Mason, huh? You wire Portland for confirmation, Matty? Sure, sure I did. No answer yet, Nick. Hey. Hmm? Look at the handwriting on this note that was with the clipping. What about? Well, that's Whitey Gear's handwriting. At least his name is signed to it. So what? Well, it's nothing like the handwriting on that memo you found in his pocket. Why, Nick, you're right. Hey, maybe Don wrote down the time and place he wanted to meet Whitey and then gave it to him. No, no, I don't think so, Matty. I have a hunch that memo was planted. Yeah? Well, the laboratory boys tested those gray threads under Whitey's fingernails, Nick, and they're definitely from Don Mason's coat. An airtight case. Yeah, sure. You seem to have everything except the prisoner. Uh... You haven't found any trace of Don yet, have you? No, no. He won't make a move until after dark. But like you said, he's got to have money. Probably he'll try to get it from Chris. And I've got all my men around that apartment. I don't think he'll go back to the apartment, Matty. What? My hunch is he'll try to contact Betty Hughes. Hey, maybe you're right. Well, I'll just plant some of the boys around the Hughes house, too. You won't have to, Matty. I phoned Walter McGlynn. He's watching the place now. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> then we got him, no matter which way he jumped. Oh, 
I think I'll go on home, Nick. It's been a long day. Yeah, it's almost midnight. I know, but I wanted to stick around the office. Oh, hold it. Nick Carter speaking. Oh, Waldo. Huh? What? I see. Where'd she meet him? That he met Don somewhere? No, she met Chris. Uh-oh. Where? Why, that's the freight yard. Nick, what's happened? Good boy, Walter. We'll get right on it. Nick, what is it? Betty just met Chris in the cafeteria on the east side and gave him a roll of bills. The getaway money for Don. That's what Waldo figured, so he trailed Chris out of the cafeteria and heard him tell a cab driver he wanted to go to the foot of East 68th Street. So that's what you meant when you said the freight yard. Yeah. Chris just left a couple of minutes ago. We hurry, maybe we can get there first. <laughs> ahead of us. I know it was. Yeah, I got a good look at him when he passed under the light. Where'd he go to? Maybe he went around the other side of this boxcar. We have a couple of hundred boxcars in this part of the yard. You can stop right where you are, Carter. Don! Thank heaven we found you, Don. I was afraid you'd take it. Chris? Yeah, Don? Get his gun. Okay. Now, wait a minute, Chris. You're in trouble already. You help him now, that's going to make you equally guilty. Well, what can I do, Mr. Carter? Don's making me do this at the point of a gun. Aren't you, Don? Sure I am. You got it? You bet. Don, listen to me. Don't be a fool. You give yourself up, I think I can prove you're innocent. Innocent? But I, I'm not. I killed Whitey because he was blackmailing me. I must have. Do you remember killing him? Oh, no. I don't remember anything that happened last night. But I, I don't think you did kill him, Don. In fact, I'm positive you didn't. Don't listen to him, Don. It's a trick. Look, Don, there's only one person who knew where and when you were going to meet Whitey. Only one person who could have drugged you. Drugged me? Yes, drugged you. That's why you thought you had a hangover this morning. So that's it. This person drugged you, then kept your appointment with Whitey wearing your gray tweed coat. Chris, it was you. Okay, let's quit playing games. You met met Whitey. Whitey. You met Whitey and you killed him. You don't drop your gun, stupid. I'm going to use this gun I took from Carter. Oh, Jay. Now you're being sensible. But but I don't get it. You were my friend. I trust you. Sure, I was your friend. I didn't mind a bit when you got the sales manager's job I should have had. And I was tickled to death when you took my girl away from me. So that's it. Sure. With you out of the way, I'll be the new sales manager. And I'll be the boss's son-in-law, too. Someday I'll own the whole business. You're going to have to work awfully fast to do all that before you go to the chair for killing Whitey, aren't you, Chris? Who's going to send me to the chair? Not any of you three. Because when Carter and Don get through fighting it out, I'm afraid there won't be any survivors. What are you talking about? It'll be easy, Carter. I've got your gun to shoot Don with, and then I'll take his gun to finish off you and Miss Bowen. Chris, Chris, you're crazy. The cops will think Carter tried to arrest you, and you shot it out. Why, that's ridiculous. Someone will hear the shot. That freight engine is going to pass on the other side of this boxcar in a few seconds. It'll make enough noise to cover anything, even gunshots. <laughs> With a passing freight engine to cover the sound of gunfire, Chris's finger tightens on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the freight yard at the foot of 68th Street... Chris Bentley is holding Nick, Patsy, and Don Mason at the point of a gun, waiting only for the noise of an approaching engine to cover the sound of his shot before he fires. Here's the engine. So get ready. You first, Don, old pal. Sergeant Madison. Yes, you want me to punch this? I'll be done lower than this time. About time you got here, Maddie. I started as soon as I got your phone call, Nick. You're not going to take me in? Nick, he's getting away. Not so fast, chum. <laughs> there. That'll hold you for a while. Good work, Don. Holy mackerel, Don. What did you do to him? Didn't you recognize that stunt, Maddie? It's the same one he used on me. And I can tell you from experience that Chris isn't going to do any more running away. Not for a minute or two. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for what you did, Nick. But, well, I guess it wasn't much use. They'll only send me back to Oregon to stand trial for for the killing that night, killing the night watchman back in 39. Oh, no, they won't, Don. Sergeant Madison wired the Oregon police about you, and they wired back that the charge had been dropped. That's right, Don. 
But a year later, the real killer was caught. Did he confess? Oh, the love of peace. You were completely cleared. But if Chris wanted to get rid of me, why did he kill Whitey to do it? Well, for all he knew, he only had to sit tight and let Whitey turn me in. He said you were going to Mr. Hughes for the money, and he was afraid you might get it. And he couldn't turn you in himself because you wouldn't tell him what Whitey had on you. Or even what your real name was. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But even after he killed Whitey to make sure the DA got that letter, Chris tried to give me an alibi. Oh, it just doesn't make sense. Well, that was only a part of his scheme to put himself in a good light with Betty Hughes. He knew that alibi wouldn't stand up. In fact, he made sure it wouldn't stand up by going to a dozen places looking for you. He knew someone would remember that he'd said you disappeared and couldn't be found. And to think you figured the whole thing out from that piece of paper with my name on it. And the time and the place where I was supposed to meet Whitey. Oh, just a minute, Don. That's not quite true. That slip of paper looked a bit phony to me, but that was all. When Chris tried to incriminate you by putting that piece of paper in Whitey's pocket, he was actually furnishing the evidence that was going to convict him. Well, well how do you mean? He forgot a very important thing. Fingerprints. Fingerprints? Yes, Whitey's fingerprints weren't on that paper. So obviously he couldn't have written it. But Chris's fingerprints were all over it. Wow, he did forget something important, didn't he? Uh Uh-huh. But, uh, say, Nick, you didn't know about those things until an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Why were you so sure Don was innocent? I became convinced the minute he threw me across the room at his apartment. What'd that have to do with it? Well, Whitey was a scrawny little fellow. Yet Maddie said he put up quite a fight before he was killed. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. If Don could put you flat on your back in two seconds, a little guy like Whitey would have been licked before he started. Right, Patsy. Well, this is the first time in my memory that a man has made a friend of me by knocking me down. about the adventure new post-war... New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. You can't. You're all I have. Oh, Joe. Oh, please, Edna, you've got to get hold of yourself. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, you think there's any chance he'll live? Afraid not, Maddie. I doubt if he ever regains consciousness. Oh, poor Joe. Both Nick and I like him so much, Sergeant. Yeah, I know, Patsy. I guess it's better for his wife if he dies. What? Why, Sergeant, what in the world do you mean? Even if the doc saves him, it'll only be for the electric chair. <laughs> Now, the case of the clue called X. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. When Joe Gibbs used to deliver the evening gazette after school, Nick was his best customer. And when Joe grew up and got into trouble with the law, Nick helped him get a parole from the state penitentiary. Then, when Joe married Edna Marsh, he asked Nick to be his best man. And Patsy Bowen, Nick's assistant, was bridesmaid. And so today... At ten in the morning of their first anniversary, it's Nick and Patsy that Edna has come to because Joe's in trouble again. Joe never did a wrong thing in his life when he was sober, but when he's drinking, he goes crazy or something. But, Edna, you told me only last week that he hadn't touched a drop since he got his parole. As a matter of fact, the parole board forbade him even to enter a bar room. He didn't either, Mr. Carter. Not until yesterday. And what happened yesterday? Well, we... We had a fuss. Not about anything important, but... It was the first time we'd ever quarreled. Oh, now, Edna, stop it. This isn't doing any good. I know. Well, Joe got all upset and he slammed out of the house. That was about two o'clock. Uh-huh. He didn't come home until early this morning. Where had he been all that time? I didn't know, but I could see he'd been fighting. There was a cut place on his chin. His new suit was all dirty and wrinkled. He was a pretty unhappy guy. Edna, honey, I'm sorry. Oh, I'd give ten years out of my life if I hadn't gone into Barney's place yesterday. Oh, don't worry about it, Joe. I know you won't do it again. I was to blame anyway for nagging at you. Oh, you're not to blame for anything, not for anything. The cops come here. I want you to remember that. Cops? Oh, you mean because you broke your parole? Uh, yeah, sure. That, that's what I mean. 
because I broke my parole. Oh, they probably don't know anything about it. Oh, come on, darling, drink your coffee. I'll try to clean your suit up. Gee, you're swell. <laughs> Billy, just look at this cold dirt all over it. Blood. Blood. Hell, from that cut on your chin, oh. you? Yeah, sure. Sure, that's where it's from. Here, take your cigarettes and your what? Joe. What's the matter? It's a ring in your coat pocket. Uh, a ring? A diamond ring. It looks real. But I... I... Joe, where'd you get it? Well, I... well, this is our anniversary, ain't it? I always said I... Joe, I... please don't lie to me. This is a man's I'm ring. I'm not lying. I'm... I know you. You stole it, didn't you? No. Oh, you can tell me the truth, honey. It won't make any difference but to me. But Edna, I... I'll keep on loving you even if you killed somebody. Huh? Why'd you say that? Say what? Say that about... About me killing somebody. Because that's the way I feel. Oh, Joe, you've got to take this ring back. I can. It's too late. It's I not too late, Joe. Look, you can explain to me you didn't know what you were doing. Edna, please. Please leave me alone. I'm almost crazy now. But I don't can't take me. anymore. I'm getting out of here. Joe, don't. You should have known better than to marry a jail first. Joe, come back. Please. I'm... And you don't know where he went when he left the house? No, I, I don't. Well, what do you want Nick to do, Edna? Well, I thought maybe if he could find out where Joe got the ring and give it back, maybe they wouldn't have him arrested. But, Edna, you don't know that he stole it. I couldn't have got it any other way. You say he was at Barney's place yesterday? That's what he said. Well, I'll go around there now and see if I can find out anything. Oh, Mr. Carter, would you? Yes. You got a picture of Joe? Yes, I always carry one in my purse. Good. Yeah, here it is. If Joe's in trouble, I'll certainly do whatever I can to help him. Well, let be, folks. Uh, just some information, thanks. Are you Barney? Yeah. What can I do for you? Uh, here, Nick. Here's the picture. Show it to Barney. Right. Can you tell me if that fellow was in here last night? Let's see. Oh, sure. That's Joe Gibbs. Then you know him. Yeah. He works for the company that's been putting in my new sprinkler system. Sprinkler system? You know, one of them automatic things that puts out a fire before it even gets started. Oh. Turns in the alarm and everything. And Joe installed it, is that right? Yeah. Took him about ten days, so we got to know each other pretty good. Did he ever take a drink while he was working here? No. I never seen him take a drink till last night, but he sure made up for lost time then. Uh... Did he behave himself while he was here last night? Oh, sure. Uh, him and some friends sat here right in that there booth, shooting the breeze all evening. Who was the friend, you know? Oh, somebody he met in here, I guess. Guy about my size, maybe 50 years old, gray hair, pretty good clothes. Did he and Joe leave together? I wouldn't know about that. You see, I was only in here from 7 to 8 while Pete, that's my bartender, went out to eat. They were still here when I left. Then we'd better talk to Pete, hadn't we, Nick? Yeah, it might be a good idea. Well, I guess you'd find him at home. He never gets up till noon. Can you give us the address? Well, sure. I'll write it down for you. Yeah, Joe was a nice guy. Say, I hope he ain't in any trouble. I hope so, too. But I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> see. I got back to the bar about 8.30. Hey, wait a minute, Pete. Barney said it was 8. Well, that's when I was supposed to be back, but Barney asked me to stop at the drugstore and get him a bottle of that uh, dope he uses on his hair. Well, he uses enough of it. He looks like a wet seal. Yeah, he plasters it on all right. Well, it was all out of it, and I had to run all over looking for the right kind. Barney's awful particular about his hair, you know. All right, so you got back at 8.30. Joe was still there? Yeah, yeah. Him and this other guy was all alone in the place, just like when I left. There's never anybody in at that time of night. Barney's trade don't go for cocktails. Yes, I know. Kind of... Did Joe leave with this other man? Mm-hmm. Just a few minutes after I got back. By that time, they both had too many. Why, this other guy, he was at the place where... He was losing things and accusing people of taking them. What did he lose? Well, first it was his overcoat. He claimed I must have lifted it till I showed it to him hanging right on the end of the boot. Well, what else did he lose? Well, and next it was his keys. According to him, they was in his overcoat, and he went through all his pockets looking for them. Hey, wait a but minute. he wasn't. He didn't lose a diamond ring, did he? No. But it's funny you'd say that. Why, Pete? Because that's what him and Joe was talking about all evening. The guy sells diamonds, I guess, and Joe was saying he wanted one to give his wife for an anniversary present. Nick, we're on the right track. You don't know the other man's name, do you, Pete? No, but he's got an office in a well building. 
I know, because I heard him telling Joe they'd go up there and look at some rings and stuff. Nick, let's go over to the Wellburn building now. Maybe the man hasn't even missed his ring yet. I hope you're right, Patsy. It's our only chance to keep Joe out of really serious trouble. <laughs> Sergeant Matheson over there talking to that man? Yes, it is. I wonder what the devil he's here for. Well, I'll be doggone. Nick and Patsy. <laughs> Say, Patsy, you're looking great. Oh, thanks. Where'd you get that dress? I like it. Mm. This is the first time I've worn it, and Nick didn't even notice. It's swell, but uh, um, isn't it a little bit too long? That's the new look, Sergeant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> look, Sergeant, if uh, you got any more questions, let's have them, will you? You got me out of bed to come down here, and I'm losing a lot of sleep. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Rip. Nick, this is the night elevator operator. I was just asking him a few questions. Don't let us stop you. Now, look, young fella, you say Mr. Forster and this young guy came in about 9 o'clock, huh? Yes, sir. I remember because Mr. Forster had lost his key, and I had to let him in his office with my pass key. Lost I his key? See. Nick, it must lost be the same key. Key. Uh-huh. Let's hear the rest of it. Uh, that safe in Forster's office, was that uh, where he kept his diamonds? Yes, sir. He had the safe installed when he moved here three years ago. And Mr. Foster was a private dealer in diamonds, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, look, uh, give me the description of the fellow with him. Well, uh, I'd say he was about uh, 23 or 24. Yeah? He was close to six feet tall. Uh, rather poorly dressed. Nick, it was Joe. Yeah, I know his first name was Joe, but... Hey, do you two know the guy? I think so, Matty. It's probably Joe Gibbs, a friend of ours. Great, then you can help me find him. I can take you to where he lives, but... Hey, what's Joe done, Matty? You wouldn't be here if it were only a robbery. Well, it was robbery, Nick. Your friend Joe got away with everything in Forster's safe. Maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of diamonds. But, Sergeant, you're on the homicide squad. Sure, Patsy. That's why I'm here. What? Because Forster put up a fight and this Joe Gibbs beat him to death with a bookend. <laughs> Here, Matty. Right. Joe lives in that tenement above the fruit store. Okay, Nick. Not that I expect them to be sitting home waiting for us. Nick, I just can't believe that Joe would ever have done a thing like that. Oh, no? What did he get sent up for the other time? Well, he got mixed up with bad companions, and they talked him into driving the getaway car while they stuck up a nightclub. Uh. But I don't think Joe even knew what they were doing. Neither do I. That's why I helped him get his parole. We've both known Joe ever since he was a kid, Sergeant. And we both like him so much. Now, hold we, it, Patty. Hmm? Back in this doorway. You too, Matty. Yeah. Well, what's the matter, Nick? There's Joe now coming across the street. Oh. Let me talk to him first, will you? Yeah, sure, but... Uh, Wait, what? here he is. Hello, Joe. Huh? Oh, Mr. Carter, Miss Bowen. Joe, this is Sergeant Matheson. A cop? What'd you bring a cop here for? He wants to talk with you, Joe. What about? About murder. Huh? Okay. So you got me. But you ain't gonna keep me. Joe, wait. Stop. Stop or I'll fire. Joe, look out that truck! <laughs> In this desperate attempt to escape the law, Joe Gibbs is struck down by a heavy truck as he tries to cross the street. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the clue called X. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It is a few minutes later. Edna Gibbs is kneeling beside the unconscious body of her husband, Joe, where he lies in the street in front of their tenement house after being hit by a truck while attempting to escape arrest. He's dead. Mr. Carter, Joe's dead. No, Edna, he's still alive. The ambulance will be here in a few minutes, and we'll know what his chances are then. Oh, Edna, don't. Joe's going to be all right. I know he is. I don't care what he did. Oh, Joe, Joe. Hey, uh, Nick. Yes, Matty? Come over here a minute, will you? Okay. What's on your mind? You uh, think there's any chance for him? You'll have to ask the doctor about that. I doubt if he ever regains consciousness. Uh, better if he don't, I guess, for his wife's sake. If the doc can save him, it'll only be for the electric chair. <laughs> This is Forster's office, Nick, but I don't know why you wanted to come up here. I wanted to see for myself what really happened. 
Is everything just the way you found it, Maddie? Yeah, nothing's been touched except that the body's been taken to the morgue, of course. Mm, there must have been some fight here the way all these chairs and things are knocked over. Yeah, it must have been quite a battle. Didn't the elevator operator hear it? No, Nick, he said he didn't hear a thing. Did he take Joe down again later? He says not. After Joe killed Forster, he must have walked down the stairs. I see. And the medical examiner says Foster was killed within an hour of the time Joe and Foster came up to the office. Right, yeah. Uh, here's the pictures of the body. Let's see. Now, uh, this one is the whole room. Here's a couple of full-length views of the body from different angles. And uh, this one is a close-up of the face. You can see where the book and... Yeah, wait a minute, man. Hmm? What are those marks on Foster's face? Oh, those little cuts like an X? Yeah. The medical examiner said they might have been made by a ring when Foster was hit. But, but Joe wasn't wearing a ring. Well, he came up here to look at rings, didn't they, Patsy? Yeah. He might have been trying one of them on. Oh, that's possible, but... Hey. Look at that. What uh, is it, Nick? This wall safe. One of the old-fashioned kind that opens with a key. Yeah, that's where the diamonds were, but you can see it's empty now. What I'm getting at, Matty, is that the keys are still in the lock. Several of them on this one ring, including the door key. Well, what about it? Foster said he lost his keys, remember? That's right. Yeah. The elevator operator had let him in with his pass key. Oh, Nick, look, the guy was drunk. The keys were probably in his pocket all the time. Or, well, maybe he left them in the office when he went out. This door has an automatic lock. Yes, Manny, there's an explanation for everything, I know. But it seems odd that so many things have have to be explained. Oh, Nick, stop it. This case is closed. Maybe. What does this door lead? Uh, that's a closet where he keeps supplies, I suppose. Imagine you think that you... Hey, that's funny. What uh, is Nick? Stuff in this closet. It's all crowded together in a jumble on both sides. But the center is clear. And here on the floor, just inside the closet door, there's a spot of blood. Well, so what? They probably fought all over the room. Yeah. And this closet's been painted recently, too. Even the underside of this shelf. Nick, what are you twisting your neck like that for? Trying to see the bottom of the shelf. Uh-huh. There's a greasy spot on it. Well? And here's another one on the back wall directly opposite. I think I'm beginning to figure this thing out. Now, look, Nick, if you're off on some wild idea of proving Joe Gibbs is innocent just because of a couple of grease spots... That's exactly what I'm trying to do, Matty. Oh. What's the latest report from the hospital? Well, Joe's still unconscious, but the doc said he thought he was going to pull through. Be a long, hard fight, but... Can we talk to him? Well, the doc said he could give him a shot or something to bring him around long enough for a few questions, if it was really necessary. Good. I think it is necessary. Let's go. Oh, Nick, okay. gotta wait till Joe's stronger. No, Patsy, I'm sure now Joe isn't guilty, and I want to hear what happened from his own lips. Maybe that'll tell us who really did kill Foster. <laughs> Injection should take effect in a few seconds, Sergeant. Okay, Doc, thanks. Hey, Matty. Come on. Look at that cut on Joe's chin. Yeah. It's like an X. The same as we found on Forster's face. It's already beginning to heal. Why, it couldn't have been made by that truck. That only happened a couple of hours Nick. ago. Yeah. He's opening his eyes. Joe. Joe, can you hear me? It's Nick Carter. Yeah. I hear you, Mr. Carter. Joe, tell me the truth. Did you kill Henry Foster? I... Oh, what's it, you? Sure I did. Uh-huh. But, Joe, why? Not for the diamonds. You were never a thief. I... I wanted to get a ring for Edna. I always promised to want it. I guess that was it. I don't know. Okay, Joe. Better not try to talk anymore. It's funny. I don't even remember fighting with him, but... You don't remember it? No. Last thing I know, he was sitting in Barney's, talking about diamonds he had in his office. And me saying, I wish I could buy one for Ed. And then you went up to the office to look at him? I guess so. Because when I come to about five o'clock this morning, I was laying on the floor there. I knew I'd been fighting again. You mean from the condition of the room? Yeah, and my jaw was sore where he'd socked me. And I seen him laying there. Go on, Joe. That's all. I got down the stairs without anybody seeing me and went home. I didn't even know I took the ring to Edna found it in my pocket and... And... You better not talk anymore, Mr. Carter. All right, Doctor. I found out all I need to anyway. Mr. Carter, 
with you and Miss Bowen. Please, kind of look out for Edna after. after. Don't worry, Joe. You just take it easy and get well. Unless I'm mistaken, you'll be taking care of Edna yourself for a good many years to come. Hello, Barney. Hi, folks. Business seems a little dull this afternoon. Yeah, there's never anyone in this time of day. Hey, what'd you find out about Joe? I think everything's going to be all right for Joe. Hey, that's swell. You see, Nick thinks that somebody stole Mr. Forster's keys when he was here yesterday. Huh? Wouldn't have been hard to do, Barney. Forster's coat was hanging outside the booth, wasn't it? Sure, but... And someone might have overheard him telling Joe about all the diamonds he had in his office. And that someone could have decided to take the keys and go up there and get those diamonds for himself. Ah, uh, that's crazy. Nobody was here except them two. The joint was empty, just like now. You were here, weren't you, Barney? What are you getting at? Why aren't you wearing your ring, Barney? What ring? The one that left a mark on the second finger of your right hand. Uh, oh, that. Why, uh, it got too tight. Why? You have the ring here at the bar? Well, sure, it's back in my office. I'd like to see it if you don't mind. Why should I? Come on, back this way. The um, ring doesn't have a big X on it, does it, Barney? No, it's one of them signet rings. Gold with the initials B.G. Here's the office. Step in. Okay. No. Oh! Inside the look, sister. You, you hit him. Sure, a blackjack is just the thing for taking care of Snoop. Oh, Nick. Nicky, you all right? Get away from him until I get his rod. Ah, a shoulder holster, huh? So you're the one who killed Foster. <laughs> Maybe that'll learn you to keep your trap shut. Oh, well, how do you like my office? Office? Why, this is a... It's a storage room, sister. Nice thick walls and no windows. You'd stay here forever and nobody would ever know. You aren't going to keep us here. No, I ain't going to keep you here long. But first, I'm going out in the bar and put a few nickels in a jukebox and turn up, turn it up loud just to be sure nobody hears the shooting. The... That's right, baby. Because I'm coming right back to take care of you and your nosy friend for good. <laughs> As Barney leaves the storeroom, locking the door behind him, Nick lies unconscious and unarmed, helpless to protect himself or Patsy from the coming attack. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Clue Called X, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Locked in the almost soundproof storeroom of a tavern called Barney's Igloo, Patsy frantically tries to rouse Nick before Barney can return and kill them both. Oh, Nick, open your eyes. Please, Nick. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, what happened? When you turned your back, Barney hit you with a blackjack. Here, let me help you up. Oh, my head. Oh. Hey, what happened to my gun? Barney took it. He, he's coming back to kill us, Nick. We better get out of here. But we can, Nick. The door is locked and there's no window. Yeah. He said he'd be right back. And that was almost five minutes ago. Well, maybe a customer came in and he's waiting till the place is empty again. Oh, Nick, don't just stare at the ceiling. you got to think of something. That's what I'm doing, Patsy. I think I've got it. Oh, good. Here. Yeah. Help me pile some of these beer cases under that little metal rosette. The what? Up there in the middle of the ceiling. It's an automatic water sprinkler, the kind that goes into action when the temperature reaches a certain point. Oh, Nick, this is no fun. Hurry up, Patsy. If Barney gets back before we're through, we'll be... There. I think that's enough. Now, let me hold onto your shoulder while I climb on top of these cases. All right, but... Oh, careful, Nick. I'm all right. Okay. Now, if I don't have a match... Yeah, here's one. Oh, Nick, I don't know what you're doing, but... I'm getting ready to give us both a shower bath. A what? Holding this match under this sprinkler outlet should provide enough heat to... Nick, it worked! The alarm bell's ringing! That ought to attract plenty of attention. In a few minutes, this place will be swarming with fire. Oh, Nick, you're wonderful. Barney won't dare try anything now. You bet he won't. Ooh, that water's cold. I'm freezing. Sorry, Patsy, but just remember, we're making it plenty hot for Barney. Ah, 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 Thank you. Well, it's all over, Patsy. 
After the police got him to headquarters, Barney made a complete confession. He even told them where he hid the rest of Foster's diamonds. Well, I bet nobody would have ever suspected him. He hadn't left those stolen keys hanging in the lock of that wall safe. Well, he didn't expect Joe and Foster to arrive so soon after he did. When he heard him at the door, Barney had just got the safe open. And the only place he could find to hide was the supply closet. I, I, uh, Joe! He's in there. Thanks. So that's why the stuff in the closet had been shoved over to the side. Sure, Barney pushed them aside to make room for himself. In those grease spots under the closet shelf and on the back wall were from Barney's hair? That's right. Barney says when Joe opened the closet door to hang up Foster's coat, he hit him on the jaw, and Joe passed out without even seeing who hit him. So it was Joe's blood on the floor of the closet. Mm-hmm. Foster saw him do it, though, and that's why Barney killed him. Then he planted one of the rings in Joe's pocket to make Joe look guilty. Well, that reminds me. What kind of a... Uh, uh, Gesundheit? Uh, never mind. I skipped that one. Hmm, excuse me. What kind of a ring was Barney wearing that made those X-shaped cuts on both Foster's and Joe's faces? A skull and crossbones. It was the crossbones that made the X. Hmm. How very appropriate. Yeah. Well, I figured that the chances were that only someone in the bar could have stolen those keys from Foster's pocket. And only someone with greasy hair could have left those spots inside the closet. So you suspected Barney, especially considering that Pete said there wasn't anyone else in the bar at that time. And when I saw that mark on his finger where the ring had been, I was practically certain. Nick, will Joe have to go back to jail for violating his parole? No, no, I don't think so, considering all that's happened to him. And he's going to get well? He'll be as good as ever in a few weeks. And this time he's going on the water wagon for good. Ah, then I... Guess the only permanent damage was that done to my new look. Your what? My beautiful new dress. Oh. After being soaked by that sprinkler, that dress looks like a bathing suit. <laughs> it's not funny. Well, maybe not, but... Uh, Nick, uh, what's the matter? Uh, I think that sprinkler system gave me a call, too. Gesundheit. <laughs> <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New wonderful old Dutch cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismotype, invites you to stand by for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's Nick Carter adventure starring Lon Clark... The Case of the Vanishing Weapon. I, Dorothy, take thee, Wayne, to my lawful wedded husband, to love, honor, and cherish. Wayne, darling, please, let's move back from the edge. High places always frighten me, and I... Wayne, no! Don't, Wayne! Don't! Ah! I, Emily, take thee, Wayne, to my low for wedded husband, to love, honor, and... Don't keep swimming away from me, Wayne. Help me. You know I can't swim. Please, please. Now, Nick Carter and the case of the vanishing weapon, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. It's 4.20 in the afternoon of an extremely warm day. Driving back to the city, Nick and Patsy meet a car rushing toward them at top speed on the left side of the road. Get over, you idiot! Nick, it's a woman. She's going to hit us. Oh. Oh. Nick, she ran right into us. Couldn't get out of her way because of that fence. 
But at least we avoided a head-on collision. Oh. She only struck the back end of the car. Well, I wonder if she's hurt. Now, come on, let's see. Yeah. Nick, she carried off your car right smack into that tree. Must have been ill. I saw her just before we crashed. Slumped over the wheel. There she is. Oh, Nick, she was thrown to the windshield. Yeah. She's in pretty bad shape. Oh. She seems to be conscious, though. I can't die. Can you hear me? I can't. You're not going to die. You're going to be all right. You'll marry again. You'll kill his next wife, too. What did you say? For the insurance. I know it. I found out too late. If I do, he'll do it again. He'll marry again and again and again. Please, don't think about it now. She's dead. Oh. Nick, Nick, she wasn't delirious. She knew what she was saying. Do you think her husband really killed her? I don't know, Patsy. But I'm going to make it my business to find out. In just a moment, we'll return to The Case of the Vanishing Weapon, today's adventure with Nick Carter. Yours, a thrilling new cleaning discovery. Yes, to give you faster, easier cleaning than any other cleanser, we've activated Seismatide in Old Dutch Cleanser. When there's a sink to clean, a touch of Old Dutch Cleanser works dazzling magic. Just see new sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser go to work. It dissolves grease on contact. Quickly, easily, its sudsing action sweeps away dirt and stains. Snowy white Old Dutch Cleanser cleans fast, safe, sure. Leaves no gritty sediment. Rinses away completely. Doesn't clog drains. Get two cans of Old Dutch Cleanser. One for the kitchen, one for the bathroom. Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismatite. Now, back to The Case of the Vanishing Weapon, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. It is a short time later. Nick and Patsy are talking with the chief of police of Elm City, the town the dead woman lived in. Well, that's a story, chief. I've given you her exact words. Mm. Oh, I've known Kay Bolton since she was a little girl. Well, do you know her husband, too? Sure. He came here from out west someplace, I understand. They've been married long? About a year, I guess. I see. Kay was a widow with a good farm, a little money in the bank. I guess Bolton knowed a good thing when he seen it, and he just swept her right off her feet. Uh, what did her family think about it? She don't have no family except a brother, and he was away at the time. You see, he builds bridges. I see. Hey, Chief, did you notice that the windows in Mrs. Bolton's car were all shut up tight? A day like this, it must have been sweltering in there. Yeah, it would be. Well, Kay had hay fever kind of bad. I heard her say many times she'd rather roast than sneeze her head off from the pollen in the air. Yes, but that's no reason to have the heater on. The, the heater? Yeah. When I examined the wreck, I noticed that the heater was on full blast. And uh, Nick, you said she was slumped over the wheel as though she were unconscious just before the collision. Yeah. Maybe she passed out from the heat. Well, now that don't make sense, Miss Bowen. If it was that bad, seems like even Kay would stop and cool off. Hay fever, no. I'd think she would. But suppose she were unconscious from carbon monoxide fumes or something. Huh? You mean Bolton might have done something to the exhaust pipe so them fumes go inside? Maybe. But she wasn't unconscious when you got to her? No. But the shock of the wreck could have snapped her out of it. Well... Look, Chief, suppose we don't say anything about our suspicions until after we talk to her husband. Yeah. Yeah, and let him think he's put it over on us, huh? And I'll have the autopsy performed as soon as we get back to town. Yeah, but you'll need the husband's permission, won't you? And he'll never give it if he's guilty. Uh, you've got something there, Miss Bowen. Well, nevertheless, let's try it anyway. Maybe we can learn something from his reaction when we suggest that autopsy. <laughs> An autopsy nothing doing. Kay suffered enough already. Just a minute, Bolton. Kay was my sister as well as your wife. And if the chief thinks an autopsy would serve any useful purpose, I'm in favor of but it. But what useful purpose? An autopsy would show whether there was anything in her system that would make her unconscious. What Mr. difference does it make? She's dead. Autopsy won't bring her back. Did she have any insurance, Mr. Bolton? I... Yes, we had a joint policy for $20,000 payable to the survivor. Mm. And this farm, who gets that? Well, I... I don't know. We never discussed it. Well, you get it, Bolton. Huh? Kay wrote me she'd made a new will after she married you, leaving you everything. I didn't know. Well, there won't be any autopsy, and that's final. As Kay's brother, I have something to say about that. And if there's any suspicion that her death wasn't accidental... You 
Have any reason to think that, Mr. McEwen? Well, why else would you want an autopsy? And why would you want to know who benefits by your death? If there's any doubt, I want it cleared up. And you should too, Bolton. Well, I... I do, Mac, of course, but... Well, then just sign this paper, giving your consent. I... I... Well, very well. Give it here. There you are. Mr. Bolton, I, I don't like to butt in, but I can't find the housekeeper. Well, no she place. went to her room, Sam. She's all upset. Oh. Well, Mr. Mac, that five gallons of ice cream Mr. Bolton got for the party tomorrow, she didn't put in the deep freeze and it's all melted. I was ah, wondering... Throw it out. Do anything you want with it. Only get out of here and go back to your work. Oh, yes, sir. Who's that, Chief? That's Sam Webb, the hired hand. Hmm. Uh, what you doing here, Chief? Ain't nothing wrong, is there? Yes, Sam. It's Mrs. Bolton. She's dead. No. Wrecked the car, did she? What makes you think that? Huh? Uh, why, uh, uh, just the first thing that popped into my head, I guess. Besides, I, I thought she wasn't in no condition to drive when she came out to the barn and drove off. What? You mean she was ill? Oh, no, ma'am. She was mad. Blazing mad, if you ask me. Folks can't keep their mind on their driving when they're like that. What were you doing in the barn? I thought I told you to mend that fence at the bottom of the west pasture. Well, I, I finished up early, Mr. Bolton. So I, I thought I'd clean out the stalls and, and do some repairing. I, I was there when you come in. Sam, did Mrs. Bolton tell you what she was angry about? No, sir, but she was good and mad. Oh, it wasn't anything, Mr. Carter. Uh, Bolton was late getting back with the car, and Kay had an appointment in Elm City. She was mad because she was going to be late. I couldn't help being late. I was delayed. Uh, was there a quarrel, Mr. Bolton? Of course not. Kay was always flying off the handle, but it didn't mean anything. I sent Mac out to the car for the rest of the supplies I'd brought back while I tried to talk her out of it, but uh, I couldn't. I see. Well, thanks for giving your consent to the autopsy, Mr. Bolton. May I answer some very important questions? <laughs> Carter, Miss Bourne. Hello. Oh, gosh, what a night. I was down at the blame garage till 6 o'clock this morning. Oh, uh, did the mechanic find anything suspicious? Well, the car was smashed up pretty bad, but he swears the wreck didn't affect nothing that could have caused the accident. Well, did he check the steering gear, the brakes? And... Yeah, and the muffler, too. Nothing had been tampered hmm. with. And the autopsy showed absolutely no trace of carbon monoxide in her lungs or blood. No other poisonous gas for that matter. And mm-hmm. she wasn't drugged, either. I guess we was wrong about Bolton doing it. Maybe she did fall asleep at the wheel. No, I doubt that, Chief. Anyone who was as upset and angry as Sam said Mrs. Bolton was just wouldn't doze off. Are you still trying to make out it was more than an accident, are you? Oh, we're sure it was. Well, now, if Bolton caused that wreck without tampering with the car and without drugging her in any way, he's committed a perfect crime. A murder without a single clue. I wouldn't say that, Chief. Every unexplained fact is a clue. And there are several in this case. Such as what? Well, why was Sam so sure she'd been killed in an auto wreck? Why should her dying words have been about murder for insurance? And why was she driving with the heater turned on? Okay, if you're looking for unexplained facts, what about the ice cream? Well, what about it? Well, now, Bolton brought that back from town at 4 o'clock. Uh-huh. And when we were there at 7.30, it was all melted, according to Sam. Oh, well, that's only natural. The housekeeper forgot to put it in a deep freeze. Miss Bowen, we get them five-gallon containers of ice cream for picnics and such. We get them early in the morning. And they're still as hard as a rock when we eat supper. George, that's it. Huh? Huh? Well, what's what? That's what killed Mrs. Bolton. The weapon that vanished into thin air. Vanished? Literally and completely, without leaving a trace. What? Well, then there's no way of proving it, is there? Not unless we can get a confession. And anybody smart enough to think of a scheme like that won't be easily bluffed. Now, Lucardo, where would you get a weapon that would vanish that way? At your local creamery, just as Bolton did. Oh, Nick, you're not saying that Mrs. Bolton was murdered with five gallons of ice cream. No. If it wasn't for that ice cream, she'd be alive right now. Oh, Nick. Come on, let's drive out to the farm. Now I've got something to work on. I know, Carter. I carried that container of ice cream into the house from the car without opening it. But Bolton... Yes, McEwen, were you going to say something? Well, uh, only that when I went through the kitchen to get the other things out of the car... I noticed that the seal on the container was broken. Well, I didn't break it. Perhaps the housekeeper... Oh, no, Mr. Bolton. I asked her. She was upstairs at the time. Well, what's the ice cream got to do with it anyway, Mr. Carter? Plenty, McEwen. Those five-gallon containers are in two sections. One for the ice cream itself, and one that holds dry ice to keep it from melting. So what? 
Did you ever notice how drowsy you get in the crowded room where the air is stale? Well, sure. That's because the oxygen in the air has been used up. And replaced with carbon dioxide, which people have exhaled. That's what happens when we breathe. Come to the point, Carter. All right, I will. When I examined your car just after the wreck, Mr. Bolton, I found a few small pieces of dry ice in the heater. Dry ice is nothing but carbon dioxide in a solid form. In the heater of your wife's car, it melted. Fast. And flooded the car with carbon dioxide. And with all the windows closed, it must have been ten times as bad as the most crowded, stuffy room you ever saw. And that's why she went to sleep at the wheel. <laughs> that's fantastic. You think somebody took the dry ice out of that ice cream container and put it in the heater of the car to... To, to, to make her wreck the car and kill herself. Yeah, Mr. Bolton, that's exactly what we think. Then, then it must have been Mac. Why, that's a lie. You went through the kitchen when I left the ice cream and, and then went out to the car for the rest of the things. Uh, you must have opened the package and... Are you accusing me of murdering my own sister? It, it had to be you. Nobody else could have done it. No? Well, uh, who got her to take out that insurance policy? Who inherits this farm and everything else she owns? That doesn't mean... I don't get anything out of her death, and I don't want to. But you get played. Now, calm down, Mac. Calm down. She was all I had. And he killed her. He killed her. I did not. You did it yourself. And now you're... All right, all right. Hold it. Hold it. I know how we can find out who put that dry ice in the heater. How? Ask Sam, your hired man. Sam? What would he know about it? He was in the barn from the time you drove in with the ice cream, Mr. Bolton, until your wife left about ten minutes later. Dry ice melts fast, very fast. To be effective, it'd have to be put in sometime during that ten minutes. Sure. You're right, Mr. Carter. Sam must have seen him putting that stuff in the heater. That's why he figured Kay was killed in a wreck. Yeah, maybe he didn't think nothing of it at the time, but afterwards he realized what he saw. And then maybe he figured he could get paid for not talking. Well, he'll talk now. He'll talk or I'll break him in two. All right, no, no, McHugh. And you and Bolton will stay here with the chief. Patsy and I will go talk with Sam. And after we do, Chief, I think you'll have a new border at the county jail. Nick, you didn't really find any dry ease in the heater of that car, did you? Why, of course not, Patsy. I told you I'd have to bluff. Yeah, but if Sam did see something, it won't be a bluff any longer. Oh, yes, it will. You may have seen something, but he couldn't tell what was actually going on inside the car from back in the stalls where he was working. No, no, I guess not. Or maybe we can use Sam's testimony to frighten the killer into giving himself away. Oh, here, this must be Sam's shack. Uh-huh. He must be here. We know he's nowhere else on the farm. Yeah. Let's see if the door's locked. No, it isn't gone in. Right. <gasps> oh, Nick, look. They're on the floor. Oh, that's Sam. Nicky, he's dead, isn't he? Yeah. Shot through the head. Probably sometime last night. Look around the floor. See if you can find an empty cartridge. Right. If he was killed with an automatic, there's a chance the empty shell's on the floor somewhere. Well, if it is, I'll find it. Here. Here's something. What is it? Somebody knelt down beside the body. There's a perfect knee print and a smear of blood. You can even see the weave of the material the trousers were made of. Some sort of coarse tweed. Nick, I found it. The cartridge shell? Yes, it was under the table. Here. Uh Huh. Now we can really get down to business. Yes, this time we've got a weapon that can't vanish into thin air. An empty cartridge case. The first bit of concrete evidence the wife killer has left in a series of five murders. But Nick still faces the problem of proving his guilt. We'll see what happens in just a moment. An important announcement. Coming next week on Nick Carter, Old Dutch Flinzer's Big New Contest. Listen so you can get an early start in this easy, fascinating contest that pays off with loads of valuable prizes. And remember, we've activated seismatite in Old Dutch Cleanser. Its amazing sudsing action sweeps away dirt and stains, cuts grease on contact, cleans fast, safe, sure, leaves no gritty sediment, rinses away completely, saves you time and work, helps you keep your house at its shining best. New sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser is at your grocer's now in the same familiar package. Get two cans tomorrow. One for the kitchen, one for the bathroom. Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismotype. Now, back to The Case of the Vanishing Weapon, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. At the farmhouse, Nick and the chief are trying to find the automatic with which Sam Webb, the Bolton's hired hand, was killed. 
Mac has admitted owning such a gun, and they've gone to his room to get it. There you are, Mr. Carter. But I swear I haven't touched that gun since I came back two weeks ago. Did Bolton know where you kept it, Mac? Well, I don't know, Chief, but it wouldn't have been hard to find. I didn't even know he had a gun. Well, this is a thirty-eight. Sam was killed with a thirty-two. A thirty-two? Then, then Bolton must have used Kay's gun. What are you talking about? Kay didn't own a gun. Why, you're a liar. She had a thirty-two automatic for years, kept at her bedside table, and you know it. That's not true. You can come and look for yourself, Chief. Our room is right across the hall. But she won't find any gun there. No, don't expect to. Not now. Oh, uh, here's your gun, McEwen. Oh, thanks, Mr. Carter. But uh, Kay did have a gun. Charlie must have seen it hundreds of times. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll get at the truth. There, look for yourself. Do you see a gun in that drawer? Kay wouldn't have a gun in the house. All right, let's forget about that for a minute. Who owns a tweed suit? A tweed suit, Mr. Carter? Why? We found evidence proving that Sam's killer was wearing a suit of coarse tweed at the time of the murder. You have one? Why, why, no. Neither do I. Where... You shouldn't have said that, Bolton. I've seen you wearing a tweed suit a hundred times. But I... I did have a tweed suit, but Kay gave it away last week. It was worn out. Who'd she give it to? I, I don't know. She didn't Why, say... Why, Bolton, but... I saw that suit hanging in your closet only yesterday. I'll bet it's there right now. What? Well, well, it's gone. Naturally. Of course it is. Any fool would know enough to get rid of a piece of evidence like that. I tell you, I haven't had it for over a week. Wait a minute. You went down in the cellar carrying a bundle this morning, Bolton. That was the garbage. Mrs. Lawrence always puts the garbage in a paper bag. The bundle you had was wrapped in newspaper. It was not. It was a paper bag. And then I heard the furnace door. I always burn the garbage in the furnace. You know that. Bolton, suppose we take a look in that furnace and see what else you was burning. <laughs> There's another scrap of tweed that didn't burn. That's part of your suit, ain't it, Bolton? Yes, but I didn't put it there. Mac did it. He's raving me. Oh, sure, sure. He is, I tell you. Everything you found could have been done by him, couldn't it? He could have put that dry ice in the car heater as well as me. He could have shot Sam and put that suit in the furnace. And wore the suit to kill Sam, too, I guess. Why, you blame fool. Anybody can see that Mac couldn't get into your clothes with a shoehorn. He's twice as big as you are. And I never owned a tweed suit in my life. Anyway, the knee print by Sam's body had exactly the same weave as this tweed that was burned in the furnace. Now, wait a minute. Uh, did you find something else, Nick? I'll say I did down among the ashes. Look. That's it. That's Kay's gun. I never saw that gun before in all my life. Any fingerprints on it, Carter? Afraid not, Chief. The whole outside is burned clean. Yes, but a ballistics test will show if it's the gun that Sam was killed with. Won't it, Nick? Without a doubt. Even if it's the same gun, that doesn't prove anything. Well, here's something that does, Bolton. A perfect set of fingerprints. Prints? Well, I thought you said the gun was burned clean. The outside was, yes. But there's a fine set here on the cartridge clip. I thought they might have been overlooked. That's smart thinking, Carter. Well, how come the cartridges didn't explode in the fire, Nick? Well, the clip's empty, Patsy. Oh. But the prints are nice and clear. They're, they're not my prints. I never saw that gun. Yeah? Well, now, I'll just take that clip over to the county seat and let the fingerprint man there have a look at him. Oh, uh, if you don't mind, Chief, I'd rather take this to the fingerprint lab in the city. Huh? What's the matter with Joe Parker over the county seat? Well, he may be perfectly all right, but... Well, look, let me have my own way, will you, please? I'll stay at the hotel in Elm City tonight, drive into the city tomorrow, and have a report you can depend on before tomorrow evening. Well, okay, keep the blame clip. And you, Bolton, come on. I'm locking you up where you can't get out to commit no more murders. there. Who's in the room? Who is it? Don't move, Mr. Carter. You're a fine target under that bed lamp. McEwen, what are you doing here? I came to get something that belongs to me. That clip with the fingerprints on it. What? And those are your prints. Bolton was telling the truth. You killed Sam. Sure I did. I couldn't let him tell about seeing me put that dry ice in the heater of Kay's car, could I? And he said he had been in the barn at the time. I had to get rid of him. 
And all the evidence against Bolton. You planted it yourself. Why not? Somebody had to be the patsy. And I could see you suspected him already. Nobody knew I had that thirty-two, So I said it belonged to Kay. And who can prove that it didn't? And you planted it in the furnace for us to find, together with a tweed suit. <laughs> sure. That suit was the smartest part of the whole frame-up. Kay gave it to Sam. It was hanging right there in front of me when I shot him. But you couldn't have worn it. It was too small for you. No. But I could wrap it around my knee and then make a print in that blood stain, couldn't I? Didn't tell you I saw Bolton trying to burn it. You thought of everything, didn't you? Everything but that cartridge clip with my fingerprints on it. Where is it, Carter? Or do I put a bullet in your head? All right, you win. It's in the left-hand top dresser drawer, wrapped in a handkerchief. Yeah? Thanks for making it easy. First, we'll wipe these prints out. And then, Mr. Carter, I'm afraid I'll have to get rid of you. And I hold on, McEwen. You've destroyed the proof against you, and I let her go at that. I can't let you talk about this little visit. Look, McEwen, don't... Shut up! I said I was going to get rid of you, and I am. So... As Mac points his gun at Nick's head and pulls the trigger, he stands only a few feet away, too close to miss. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Here's a wash day tip. Keep your washer sparkling clean inside and out with wonderful new sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser. Yes, a touch of Old Dutch Cleanser cuts grease on contact, sweeps away dirt and stains almost like magic. You'll be amazed at the new sudsing action of Old Dutch Cleanser. Snowy white, leaves no gritty sediment, rinses away completely. It's been granted the good housekeeping seal. Yes, ladies, for faster, easier cleaning than you've dreamed possible, switch to new sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismotite. And next week, Old Dutch Cleanser's wonderful new contest starts. Easy to enter, easy to win. It's loads of fun with loads of valuable prizes. Hear all about this sensational new contest and how you may win next week on Nick Carter. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Vanishing Weapon. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new wonderful old Dutch cleanser. In Nick's hotel room, he faces a killer with a gun who says... I said I was going to get rid of you, and I am. So... Oh! oh you had a gun all the time under the bedclothes. Sorry, Mac. I tried to warn you. Nick? Nick, are you all right? I'm okay, Patsy. But our friend here has a bullet in his arm. Come on in. If you're all down a shorthand, Nick, the microphone picks up every you word mean he said. You this was a trap? You bet it was. See, I expected you to come for that cartridge clip. If my gun hadn't jammed... It didn't jam. I took all the bullets out of it when I examined it out at the farmhouse today. But I couldn't be sure you hadn't discovered that and reloaded it, so I had to shoot first. What's the matter in there? Who fired that gun? What's going on? Everything's under our control. Call the chief of police, will you? Sure, Mr. Carter, sure. I'll get him here in two shakes. Where's your proof, Carter? My fingerprints aren't on the cartridge clip anymore. Your confession before two witnesses is proof enough, McEwen. And as for those fingerprints, I was bluffing you. Why, you... So dirty... far as I know, there weren't any prints on that clip. How did you know Wayne McEwen killed his sister and Sam Webb? Well, I was pretty sure of it from the moment we found out how McEwen's sister was killed. Done that? Mm-hmm. Furthermore, every bit of evidence we had against Bolton came directly from McEwen. Uh, Chief, did you find out why he killed his sister? Yeah, he told us all about it at the jailhouse. Seems his bridge-building business ain't been so good these last few years, so McEwen drummed up a sideline of getting married and then killing off his wives for their insurance. Oh, then he was the one Mrs. Borden was talking about just before she died. Right, Patsy. Yeah, but how'd she ever find out about this? McEwen says she was cleaning up his room the day before she was killed, and she came across some of his private papers that he'd forgotten to put away. Uh Uh-huh. She didn't know he'd been married at all, so when she found a marriage certificate, she got curious. Oh. And what she found in the rest of the stuff gave her a pretty good idea of what had been going on. Then that night she accused him of killing the two girls, and he admitted it. When he asked her what she was going to do about it, she said she hadn't made up her mind. Well, if I'd been in her place, I'd have turned him over to the police. Oh, she wanted to, Miss Bowen, but he was her only brother, and she couldn't quite make up her mind to do it. Mm. But Mac didn't dare to take any chances, so... He killed her. Yeah, he was pretty clever about it, too. He almost got away with it. Yeah. 
But when he killed Sam, he outsmarted himself. Well, you know the old saying, Nick. Give a killer enough rope and he'll hang himself. So he will, Patsy. So he will. Every time. Well, Nick, that's the last of them. Okay, Patsy, that's all for now. You better go home and change. Remember, we're meeting Bill and his wife at 7.30 for dinner. Well, how about after dinner? I want to know how to dress. Well, Bill said something about taking in an amusement park and ending up with a boat ride on the river in the morning. Oh, moonlight. hold on. Take it easy, Carter. Hey, for heaven's sake, Patsy. Mm, amusement park, boat rides, redheads, penicillin. <laughs> okay, I get it. I don't want to end up at the bottom of the river just because the ticket seller was a beautiful redhead who posed as a man. Hey, hold on, Patsy. Let's tell about that adventure next week. We'll call it The Case of the Purloin Penicillin. <laughs> Ladies, have you discovered Delrich margarine? Delicious rich Delrich makes friends at first taste. Full flavored, it's the perfect spread for bread, rolls, toast. Try Delrich in your cooking and baking, too. Mighty good, mighty economical. Only Delrich gives you the original easy color pack, the easy modern way to color margarine. And where state laws permit, ask for Delrich in golden yellow quarters. Delrich, America's new favorite. Dell for delicious, rich for rich full flavor. Get Delrich margarine tomorrow, for Delrich makes friends at first taste. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this same time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick and Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons with original music played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser and Delrich, is happy to bring you today's Nick Carter adventure transcribed. This was done so that everyone connected with this program would be able to spend Christmas Day at home with their families. And now, new wonderful Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismatite, invites you to stand by for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's Nick Carter adventure starring Lon Clark... The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, brought to you by new, wonderful Old Dutch Cleanser. It is mid-afternoon as Sergeant Matheson and Nick Carter in a speeding police car turn into a street of cheap rooming houses. Uh, You can understand, Nick, that Warren's specialty shop can't stand losing all those expensive fur coats, even if it is a big woman's store. You sure it's the work of shoplifters? Sure. And we think Peggy Matthews, the girl we're going to see, is one of the shoplifters. Mm -hmm. Any reason to pin it on her? Well, one of the store detectives spotted her in the store this afternoon, but she got away from him. But after she left, another fur coat was gone. You just found out where she lives, huh? Yeah. We learned who she was from a beautiful set of fingerprints she left in a plastic case she'd been handling. So I got a warrant to pick her up on suspicion. How many fur coats have they lost, Matty? Oh, a dozen or more, Nick. Each of them worth over 3,000 bucks. Hey, quite a loss. Yeah. Must have been mink, huh? They were. What do you want? What? Well, who are you? This is my rooming house. I'm the landlady. We want to see Peggy Matthews. Eh, what do you want Peggy for? Take a look at this badge. <laughs> a couple of flat feet. Well, you're, you're... Okay, second floor. Turn right into the hall. Well, that's better. Come on, Nick. Right with you. I hope you fall and break your head. Thanks. She said turn right at the top of the stairs. This must be the room. Mm. I don't hear anything, Nick. Well, with this warrant, we can go right in. Hey, door isn't locked. Great Scott. Someone moved faster than we did, Maddie. She's been strangled. 
with one of her own nylon stockings. <laughs> Nick and Matty are back in the murdered girl's room after unsuccessfully searching the house for the killer. Several men from the homicide squad have just arrived and are going to work as Patsy Bowen hurries in. I came as fast as I could, Nick. Oh, you didn't tell me it was a murder. Uh, We called you, Patsy, because we thought this needed a a woman's touch. Oh? Yeah, this dead woman is Peggy Matthews, Patsy. Uh Uh-huh. She's a shoplifter who was seen acting suspiciously in the Warren Specialty Store this afternoon, just before another mink coat disappeared. Is this the coat here on the chair? No, we found that one in a clothes closet. Uh, She bought it a month ago in a small fur shop downtown. Now there's a label in the coat, and we phoned the store to check it. She paid $400 for it. $400? For this rabbit skin? Yeah. Oh, she got stuck but good. That's why I wanted you to see it, Betsy. I needed your opinion. Oh. Hey, Nick. Look, I've been thinking... Maybe we ought to bring the manager of the fur department of Warren's specialty shop down here to look at her, just to be sure this is the girl he saw, huh? Good idea, Matty. Come on, Patsy. We'll bring her back here as soon as we can, Matty. So this girl was murdered before you could talk to her, eh, Mr. Carter? That's right, Mr. Dodd. You sure you'd recognize her again? Oh, yes. This particular girl snooped around the fur department for some time. Although I didn't see her take anything. But you kept an eye on her. I'm afraid I didn't. You see, I was very busy with Miss Robard. Miss Robard? She's a fashion expert on one of the women's magazines, isn't she? That's right. Too bad this girl is dead, Mr. Carter. One of our most expensive fur coats was missing right after she left the store. Maybe she could have told us what happened to it. Well, we want to know where that coat went. We'll have to find out some other way, Mr. Dodd. The final curtain has fallen for Peggy Matthews. Well, uh, Mr. Dodd, is this the woman you saw in your department store this afternoon? Yes, Sergeant, I'm certain of it. No question at all. Uh Uh-huh. Well, okay, Mr. Dodd, and thanks for coming down. Oh, Patsy and I will run you back to the store, Mr. Dodd. We want to get a full description of the stolen coats anyway. Uh, Can we leave at once, Mr. Carter? You see, Miss Robot is waiting for me to get back. We've been in conference all afternoon, but there's still a lot left to do. Sure, sure. We'll leave in just a moment. Hey, Matty. Yeah, Nick. Did you dig up anything where we were going? Well, just one thing, Nick. The landlady broke down, uh, finally, told me that Bruno Seeley has come here to see Peggy a couple of times recently. Bruno Seeley, eh? Smart character. I'll have a talk with him shortly. Oh, uh, Mr. Dodd, would you give me your expert opinion as to the value of this fur coat? It belonged to Peggy. Hmm. She didn't shoplift that from our store, Miss Bourne. I'd roughly guess it was worth about $150. Uh-huh. Well, Nick, I guess I'm a fairly good judge of fur values. Patsy means that she told us Peggy Matthews was cheated when she paid $400 for this coat, Mr. Dodd. You just backed up her opinion. I see. Well, I don't think Miss Matthews minds being cheated anymore. Shall we go? Miss Bowen, Mr. Carter, this is Audrey Robard, the fashion expert I told you about. Hello, Miss Robard. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Robard? I, uh, I'm familiar with your work in the magazines. It's lovely. Why, thank you, Miss Bowen. Oh, Nick, just look at all these gorgeous fur coats hanging on the racks here. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Dodd, tell me, just how many coats have shoplifters taken from this store? Why, uh, I can't say exactly. Uh, I don't have the figures. Are the prices on the coats? I mean, could anyone tell they were getting the best just by looking at the price tags? No, no, indeed. Each coat is marked with a code number. Only the sales lady knows what it sells for. And you have no idea how the coats were smuggled out of here? None at all, Mr. Carter. The store detectives assigned to this department have spotted shoplifters dawdling about, followed them to the street, and stopped them. But although we found a number of stolen items, there wasn't a single fur coat. Well, I don't think you're too careful with your coats, Mr. Dodd. All the time we've been talking, there's been a lovely coat lying right there on that display table with no one near it. Oh, that's my coat, Miss Bowen. I threw it down there as I came in. And it's not as nice as it looks from here. Oh, well... Well, you've had it a good many years, Audrey. Nothing lasts forever. (laughs) How right you are. Uh, Mr. Carter, why don't you go up and see Mr. Warren, the owner of the store? He might be able to tell you things I couldn't. Yeah, good idea. Is he here? Well, it's almost closing time, but I'm sure he's here. 
He never leaves until later than this. His office is upstairs, fourth floor in the rear. Good. I'll go see him. We need every scrap of information we can get. Sit down, sit down, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I don't mind telling you, Mr. Carter, how glad I am that you're helping us. Tell me, Mr. Warren, just how many coats have been stolen? Fifteen. And the cheapest of them retail for $3,100. Oh, say, they really made a haul, didn't they? Over $50,000, Miss Bowen. Golly. Your store detectives haven't seen anything suspicious? Well, there is one rather odd thing. What's that? Lately, we seem to be attracting an unusual number of professional shoplifters. Many of them are known to our detectives. But they haven't caught them with anything? Well, just small, miscellaneous items, Miss Bowen. Never anything really valuable. There's no way of smuggling the coats out through a crooked employee, perhaps. Absolutely not, Mr. Carter. Why, we've checked that thoroughly. Yet we're completely at a loss to know how the coats get out of the store. Well, thanks, Mr. Warren. Oh, not at all, Mr. Carter, not at all. Now, please don't hesitate to call on me for any sort of help at any time. I will. And we may have news for you soon. Good. we got one clue that may lead us somewhere. In fact, we're going to see the man in question right now. Ah, this is the place, Nick. Sealy's Bargain Outlet. So that's what he called it. <laughs> Wonder how legitimate a business it really is. Well, Bruno's already done one stretch as a fence for stolen goods. If anybody's in a position to direct a shoplifter's ring, Bruno Sealy's the man. Well, Matty, come on. Let's see what he has to say. All right. Nick, all the fur coats that were stolen were the very best quality, weren't they? According to Mr. Warren, they were. Mm-hmm. But, Nick, if Peggy Matthews got chipped on the coat she bought for herself, how would she know enough to pick out a really good one? The prices weren't on the coats. Say, that's a very good thought, Patsy. If Peggy got cheated so badly when she bought her own fur coat, it's proof she didn't know good furs from bad. Hey, that's right. Oh, oh, Patsy, it takes a woman to notice a clue like that. And if I'm right, Peggy had nothing to do with stealing any of those coats. Not unless someone pointed out the good ones to her first. Yeah, Nick. Well, come on, let's go in and see if Sealy can throw some light on this. Hello. Anybody here? Hello. That's funny. Hey, Bruno. Bruno! Hey, Bruno! Maybe he's in the back room. Yeah, could be. Hey, the back room's empty, too. What's that? Sounds like somebody in pain. It's coming from inside that closet. Great Scott, it's Bruno. He's been stabbed. Listen, badly. Listen to me. Listen. Just a minute. He's trying to tell us something. I can't seem to breathe. I... Bruno, I... I'm Nick Carter. Who stabbed you? I don't know his name. Not his real name. I... Uh... Yes, Bruno. See, Marge Panette. Go see Marge Panette. Marge Burnett. In, All right, Bruno. In my pocket. Key. Post office box. Clark Street Station. Package. Nick, I better call an ambulance. That won't be necessary, Matty. He's dead. <laughs> After summoning the homicide squad to take over at Bruno's store, Matty, Nick, and Patsy have hurried to the Clark Street branch of the post office, where they have just opened Bruno's post office box. Uh, yeah, there's a, a package here, but it don't weigh anything. Well, open it up, Sergeant. Yeah, that's what Bruno wanted us to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, will you look at this? Well, what in the world is it, Sergeant? <laughs> A string of beads string from the Warren beads. Specialty Shop. And the price tag says only $15. Yeah, I don't get it. Here, yeah, let me see that wrapper, will you? Yeah, sure. This package was postmarked early this afternoon at a postal substation near the Warren store. And this necklace was stolen from that store today and mailed to Bruno. Yeah, probably from a mailbox right in the store. Why, well, of course, Nick. 
Wall into the branch post office on the fourth floor. Say, it's a smart idea. You nab something small, have an envelope all addressed, you just slip the loot inside, seal it, and mail it. Yeah, but what is all this to do with stolen fur coats? I don't know, Patsy. But we can be sure of one thing, Nick. The murders of Peggy and Bruno are tied up together somehow. And to one man, Matty. Bruno said it was a man, but we didn't know who he was. And just who is this Marge Barnett Bruno wanted us to see? She used to be a pretty good confidence woman, Patsy. Confidence woman? Yeah, yeah Patsy. Lots of these confidence women turn to shoplifting when they begin losing their nerve or their looks. Look, I can get her address from our records, Nick. And you and Patsy can go and see her, huh? Sure, Matty. I'm going back to Bruno Seeley's store. I want to finish my report. Okay, Matty. Patsy and I'll see you, Arch Barnett. We better hurry because the murderer may have the same idea. Oh, Nick, this is Marge Barnett's apartment. Here's the name below the bell. Hope she's home. Well, the police certainly keep an up-to-date file on crooks, don't they? Sergeant Matheson got this address for us in only a few minutes. Yeah, Patsy. People only knew how. Yes. Hello, Marge. I, I beg your pardon. Am I supposed to know you? I know you. You must have slipped to turn to shoplifting. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Oh, Nick Carter. Well, what do you want? Shall we talk out here in the hall where everybody can listen? Oh, come on in. Snooping coppers give me a pain. Thanks. This is Patsy Bourne, my assistant. Huh. Trying to make a cop out of her, too? You ought to be ashamed. Why, I like it. Marge, Bruno's dead. Bruno dead? He was murdered, Marge. So was Peggy Matthews. But who did it? Suppose you tell me. Oh. Goodbye, Carter. I'm not talking about nobody. Now, wait, Marge, wait. Bruno was stabbed. When we found him, he still had a few seconds to live. And the last thing he told us was to come and see you. Bruno said that, did he? He did. I wonder why. Maybe he was trying to save your life. Hey, come on, tell me, how'd you get into this anyway? Oh, I'm getting old, Carter. As you know, I've been everything from a cheap shill to the operator of a big store. From the best roper he ever saw to a plain subway dealer. You've been what? In English, Patsy. She means she fronted for con men and rose to become the operator of an important con man, con game herself. She worked from the top as the smart, pretty girl who brings in the suckers. Being a subway dealer means she was reduced to dealing cards from the bottom of the deck. Well, it sounds almost fascinating, if I could understand it. How many of these small, inexpensive items did you steal, put into a package, and mail to Bruno, Marge? See, you're wise to that, huh? I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, it was. Until fur coats and murder got mixed up in it. Where do fur coats come in? Look, Bruno paid you to steal these small articles for him. And paid you more than you could get anywhere else, didn't he? Yeah. He said he had a particular customer for a lot of that junk. All right. Just what orders did he give you? Well, I never did understand it, Carter. We were supposed to show up at Warren's specialty shop at a certain time and just wander around. Did those instructions include visiting the fur department? Why, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we had to pass through the fur department on our way to the counter where this certain kind of glass junk was sold. And you, uh... Lingered in the fur department. What woman wouldn't? She's got a point there, Nick. Yeah. And this business is getting a little clearer. Well, say help me, that's everything I know. Well, thanks, Marge. All right, Patsy, come on. We'll make another call on Hugh Warren, who owns the store. I think we can do something for him if he'll do something for us first. <laughs> I hate to bother you at your home like this, Mr. Warren. Oh, it's perfectly all right, Mr. Carter. Perfectly all right. I hope we're not interrupting your dinner, Mr. Warren. Dinner? Why, Miss Bowen, it's after nine o'clock. Oh. Well, so it is. We've been pretty busy. Well, have you learned anything? Enough so I think we're on the right track, Mr. Warren. Good, good. We'd like a key to your store and permission to go inside tonight. I want to look around a bit. Why, I think that could be arranged. But a word of warning, Mr. Carter. This store is wired for burglar alarms. Not only the outer doors, but many places inside the store. For example, the door to the cashier's office will flash an alarm if it is entered without a key. And there are other things to look out for, too. We'll be careful, Mr. Warren. 
I think you'll have no trouble if you follow my directions. Now, if you have a pencil, I'll give you a list of things to watch out for. Oh, golly, Nick. I never realized how lonesome a store like this can be after everyone's gone. Yeah. Wonder where the watchmen are. Mr. Warren said there'd be two of them here. We haven't run into either one of them yet. Well, it's positively eerie in here with just our, our two flashlights for company. I see. According to Mr. Warren's directions, we turn right here. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Hey, the lights are on in here. Oh, Nick, look at all the fur coats. Dozens of them. All second-hand, Betsy. Huh? Oh, yes, so they are. But some of them are still lovely. I know I... Well, that's funny, Nick. What's funny? Remember how I thought for a minute this afternoon that Audrey Robart's coat was a new one? Yeah, what about it? Well, this coat here is her coat. The one I saw this afternoon. You sure? Positive. I took a close look at it as we went by, and I noticed this funny jagged tear on the lining. <laughs> I'd know it anywhere. Good for you, Patsy. Hmm? Now I know I'm right. What do you mean by that? He means you have good eyesight what? and an excellent memory, Miss Bowen. It's Miss Robart. Don't move, either of you. My father taught me to use a gun when I was a girl. I see Jason Dodds with you. Showing you all those coats he has in his arm, no doubt. Keep your hands up, Carter. You too, Miss Bowen. Yes, Jason and I stole those missing coats. We knew you'd find out, so we came back tonight to clean out the place. And we're going to. You can't stop us, Carter. Jason had his own keys, and he's arranged for the watchman to be in another part of the store for a while. Too bad we came in just when we did. Yes. It's too bad for you, Carter. Jason, put down those coats and walk around behind Carter and search him. Well, look, I, I, I... Do as I say, you fool. I know everything. We heard that much. Yes, yes, we, we've got to finish it up. Keep your hands in the air, both of you. And don't reach for your purse, Miss Bowen. I know there's probably a gun in it. Looks as if you hold all the cards, Miss Robard. Jason, stand right behind Carter. Now reach over his shoulder. He probably carries his gun and his shoulder home. <laughs> Nancy, cut the lights and run for it. Back to the cashier's office. We'll have to... There's a phone there. We can call the police. Audrey, what happened? Oh, you fool, Jason. Letting him throw you like that. I, I couldn't help it. He moved so fast. When I reached oh, over his Never shoulder... mind. They're headed for the cashier's office to phone. Well, we can stop that. The switchboard's right over there. I can even find it in the dark. And then find it. If we can stop them from calling for help, we've got them cornered. <laughs> Carter? Carter, I know you're in that cashier's office. Then come and get it. Audrey, let's get out of here. Not before I take care of Carter and the girl. How? How are you going to do it? Listen, they're in the cashier's office. And that's the only door right ahead of us. Yes, but... Oh, stop sniveling. We've got Carter's gun. Miss Bowen dropped her handbag and I found her gun in it. Yes, That means yes. they're unarmed. We, we can smash the glass panel in the door of the cashier's office and get them that way. But Audrey... Grab one of those chairs and throw it through the glass. Okay, uh, I guess you're right. Here goes. Oh, there, that does it. Carter, you can come outside and get it. Or I'll come in after you. It makes no difference to me. Cautiously, Audrey Robard moves up to the broken glass in the door, reaches inside, and unlocks it. Jason Dodd hovers uncertainly behind her. Carter? Are you coming out? All right, if you won't come out, I'm coming in. Stay beside me, Jason. There aren't many places they can hide. Oh, please hurry. It's been at least ten minutes since I smashed that door. You're so darn careful. Take it easy. Even without a gun, Carter's still... Okay, pretty... you two. You... Drop the guns or we'll drop you. Cops! The police. I oh. said drop those guns. One second we start shooting. Okay. Okay, we give up. Yeah. You, Doc, kick those guns my way. All right. Uh, that's better. Nick. Hey, Nick. Are you in there? Right here, Maggie. What kept you? Yeah. What kept me? 
Listen, it's not ten minutes since the alarm came into headquarters. What alarm are you talking about? The alarm you sent in, Miss Robart. What? I made you smash the glass panel in the door to the cashier's office. When the glass broke, a burglar alarm went off automatically in police headquarters. You turned yourselves into the police. <laughs> All right, Nick. Give with the details. You say it was worked with second-hand coats, huh? That's it, Matty. Miss Robart would go out and buy a cheap second-hand fur coat worth practically nothing. Uh. Then when she came to the store to see Dot, which was practically every day, she'd leave the old coat and walk out with a new mink coat. Ah, uh, she was well known in the store, so no one ever thought of suspecting her. And when she came in with the cheap coat, she'd carry it over her arm so it wouldn't show how cheap it really was. What a racket! Yeah. And Dot would put the old coat with the used coats the store had for sale. And fix the records to account for it. And another nice, new, valuable mink was missing without a trace. And the shoplifters were just part of a setup to confuse us, honey. Huh, yeah, Matty. Dodd arranged that with Bruno. The shoplifter stole some small object and mailed it to Bruno's post office box right from inside the store in previously prepared envelopes. Just so we'd think the professional shoplifters were stealing the furs. And they killed Peggy Matthews because she got wise and wanted a cut. Dodd admitted that. He killed Bruno, too. Yeah. When we connected Bruno and Peggy, I suppose Dodd was afraid of how much Bruno might know. Mm. So we had to put him out of the way, too. So he sent Patsy and you to see Mr. Warren so you'd be out of the way while he killed him. Yeah. Well, I think we better let him lock up the store now. Oh, in just a minute, Nate. Hey, Patsy, where are you going? Into the fur department. After all, it's a woman's privilege to look at those beautiful mink coats, even if she can't have one. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick and Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's transcribed adventure was written by Norman Daniels with original music played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmorris saying, when minutes count, use new wonderful old Dutch cleanser. The Linux Show, starring Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting case, The Howling Horse, in which Nick Carter goes hunting in a forest of death and tracks down a fabulous four-legged killer. enjoyable living, for real contentment, it is necessary that we have time to relax. Time to do the things we like, as well as to do the necessary things. And these days, American homemakers everywhere are learning that one important way to enjoy leisure time is to depend on the three great Linux home brighteners. Those magic new shortcuts to beauty for woodwork, furniture, and floors. You, too, can save drudgery each day with those three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, the modern brush-on finish. Linux cream polish for fine furniture. And Linux self-polishing wax, the amazing new quick-drying wax product. Try these fine modern products designed to help you do your work in record time. You'll find that they're a really efficient way to leisure time for you. Ask your hardware, paint, or department store for the three great Linux home brighteners, the modern shortcuts to new home beauty. And now for today's exciting case from the life of Nick Carter. The lights are out in the old brownstone mansion at the corner of 5th and 4th. In the darkened laboratory, the strange whine of electricity sounds. And under the pale, purple aura of ultraviolet light, Nick Carter and Patsy play a strange jigsaw puzzle game with crime. Wait a minute, Patsy. Mm-hmm. This letter A matches the A and bequeath. Just a moment. 
Yes, an exact duplicate. Make a note of that. Right. Well, right in progress. A word here. On this slip. Mm-hmm. Exactly duplicates the here and hereby bequeathed. You got that? I've got it. Better and better. Ah. See that word will in last will and testament? Uh-huh. A precise duplicate of the written will from this thank you note. Who's that? Hiya, folks. It's the demon reporter himself in person. Why, it's Scubby. Oh, hello, Scubby. Pardon the interruption, masterminds. The housekeeper let me in. Well, what's cooking, good looking? <laughs> Nick's testing the validity of a will, Scubby. We're matching samples of the dead man's writing with the writing in the will. Oh, very interesting. Do they match? Precisely. Well, then the will is genuine, eh? On the contrary, the will's a forgery. Huh? I'll turn off the ultraviolet, Patsy. Put on right. the lights. Hey, I don't get it, Nick. If the writing in the will dovetails with other letters, doesn't that prove the same guy wrote folks? No, Scubby. The fact that words and in individual letters from old correspondence match words and letters in the will proves someone forged the will by tracing the dead man's handwriting. Very clever. Very clever indeed. It'll make a nice feature article when I finish with my story on the howling horse. It... Did you say howling horse, Scubby? Yes, beautiful. I'm on my way upstate to cover one of the craziest stories that ever hit the desk. I thought Nick might be interested. What is it, Scubby? Well, it seems there's a guy upstate named Lucas who has... B. Lucas? Three degrees in medicine, archaeology, and natural philosophy? Explored the Gobi Desert in 36? Yeah, the very same. Mm-hmm. Well, this Lucas must be pretty wealthy. He's got a big estate, about 700 acres of forest and lake. But and... what about that howling horse you mentioned? Well, there's a story that Lucas brought back a couple of horses with him from one of his explorations, and they howl. Nonsense. Oh. They also kill cattle. Ridiculous. These horses of Dr. Lucas also have murdered a man. Oh, no. Well, that's the story I'm going to check. Are you interested, Nick? In horses that murder men? Certainly am. I'll use my car. We should reach the Lucas estate by nightfall. Let's go. Sit down, Mr. Carter. Ma'am? Thank you. The other ten, too. Thanks. I'm mighty happy to have you with us, Mr. Burnham. Thank you very much, Sheriff Crane. Yes, uh, the case too tough for you to handle, eh, Sheriff? Well, uh, you better. Be too tough for anybody except Mr. Carter here. Working out of court in anyway. You better explain, Sheriff. Well, it's like this. Lucas ain't amiable, ma'am. Not by a long shot. Keeps himself locked up in that estate. Nobody can get him. Nobody sees him. He kind of acts like he's scared of something. Hiding. But he's a mighty powerful man in this county. Got influential friends. My hands are tied. I can't buck him. But you can, Mr. Carter. I hear you're a fighter that don't care a hoot where the punches land. Well, I try to live up to that reputation, Sheriff Crane. Now, tell me about Lucas's horses. Don't know a thing. He brought them back with him about six months ago. Moved them in in horse vans. Nobody's seen them. But pretty soon people start talking about them horses howling. They're sure about them howling? Yep. Then, one or two folks seen one of them running around Lucas's estate. A big black critter. Seen him at night. Mean and ornery. Mm. But pretty soon they started killing cattle. Rip them apart with their teeth. Folks sued Lucas. He just laughed. Told them they was crazy. Swore he didn't own no horses. I see. Last week, Jed Storm was killed. On the road that passes Lucas's estate. Head was near torn off. Body all ripped to pieces. I figured maybe the law better step in. I had to pull every string I could to even get into Lucas's estate. Search the place from top to bottom, house, barns, everything. Well, sir, Lucas was telling the truth. There ain't no horses there. You sure, Sheriff? Ma'am, I'm a farmer before I'm a sheriff. You can't fool a farmer on things like that. All right, Sheriff. We'll start tonight and see what we can find. Uh, just one warning, Mr. Carter. Maybe I sound kind of fantastic-like, but believe me, I ain't been stretching the truth. You go slow, and you go careful. That Lucas is me. Them horses is deadly. Thanks for the warning, Sheriff, but I've met deadly killers before. And Nick is still here, which is more than you can say for most of the killers he's met. <laughs> Directions are right. This must be the road that skirts Lucas's estate. Keep your eyes on the left. 
We ought to sight the house any minute now. It's pitch dark, Nick. Watch for lights. Oh, what's the program, Nick? You going to bust right in? Going to try. I don't know how tough Lucas really is. Maybe he's that bluffing sheriff friend. Nick, I can see lights off to the left. Yeah? Where away, Skipper? Deep in the woods there. See? Yeah. The lady's right, Nick. I see them. That must be Lucas' house, all right. Yes. There's a gravel drive turning off the road. Here goes. I'll be more than interested to meet Lucas again. Oh, you know him, Nick? Casually. I had a rather distasteful job of checking his credentials for the government some years ago. Intelligence work. Believe me, it was a nasty interview. Nick! Hey, for the love of Pete, Nick! Someone's bombarding us! Oh, stop the car, Nick! We'll be blown up! Stop anyway, there's a roadblock ahead. Oh. Hey, this doesn't look like a bluff to me. Lucas is playing for keeps. This is a private property. You are trespassing on private property. I shall give you five minutes to get out of here. Where's that voice coming from? He's using a public dress speaker out on the grounds. He's probably got the microphone this in the house. This is your last warning, whoever you are. You have five minutes to get off my ground. Apparently, we haven't much choice. One city. Was that Chinese? It was, and raises a very curious question in a fantastic case. Let's back out to the road and start finding the answer to it. All right. This is far enough. Let's get out. Okay. Well, where are we now, Nick? About half a mile past Lucas's house. We're going to cut into the woods from here, then circle around to the house. Well, I got my flashlight. Lead on, Nick. No, no, Scotty. No flashlights. We do this in the dark. Well, Patsy, you can wait in the car if you want to. Oh, who, me? Why, you don't talk as though you think I'm scared. Well, aren't you? Well, yes, but I won't admit it. All right. I'll hold your hand, beautiful. Uh, I'm not that scared. Now, listen, we've got to be as quiet as possible. Hey, do you think that we're going to meet any wild horses, Nick? No, no, Scotty. Nick. You haven't explained yet about Lucas talking in Chinese. Not sure I understand yet myself. Oh, I sure wish I'd covered the beauty contest instead of this guy. Hold everything. What? Quiet. Listen. <laughs> Hear that? Jeepers, did I? It sounds like howling. There it is again. Howling horses, I said. <laughs> nonsense, Nick Carter said. Well, is it nonsense now, Nick? A howling horse. Hey, it's coming closer. Are we just going to stand here and wait, Nick? We are not. Gunshot, man. What's happening, Nick? Someone's being chased by Scubby's howling horse. Someone is using a gun to protect himself with a lot of Careful now, whatever you do. Hold your head. Nick, yes. straight ahead in that clearing. Yeah, I, see. I can see the silhouette. Yes, chasing a man. Almost got him, too. Quick now. Too late, Nick. I know where you are. Get your flashlight out, Scubby, and flash us right ahead, quick. I want to get a look at that horse if he's still there. Right. Here you are. There. There is nothing. There is nothing at all. Nothing but a body of a man sprawled there in the grass. Oh. A body without a head. <laughs> Grimly, Nick paces the last few steps forward to examine the victim of a murder he could not prevent. Who is the dead man? How did Lucas' fantastic creatures track and kill him? Why did Lucas cry a warning in Chinese? Can Nick answer these questions in time? We'll see in just a moment. Modern science is constantly achieving miracles, constantly finding new ways, better ways, to do the things which must be done. And science has done its share of service for our American homemakers. Take, for example, the three great Linux home brighteners, which are proving such an aid to women everywhere. There's Linux self-polishing wax, for example, created by leading research chemists to give you the finest. Made from a brand new formula, Linux self-polishing wax offers new beauty, new protection, new skid resistance for every floor surface in your home. And Linux self-polishing wax contains the greatest possible amount of real carnauba wax, for that handsome, satiny finish only real wax can give. What's more, the underwriter's laboratories have proved by test that any linoleum, hardwood, or rubber tile floor is actually less slippery after Linex self-polishing wax has been applied. And, of course, Linex self-polishing wax saves time two ways, for it takes only a jiffy to apply and dries quickly. 
And then its beautiful protective surface saves you future work because it's so easy to keep clean. Choose genuine Linex self-polishing wax and know what it is to use the finest. Ask your dealer now for all three great Linex home brighteners. Give your home new beauty the easy Linex way. And now back to our story. The strange story of savage howling horses that hunt and kill men brought Nick, Patsy, and Scubby to the small upstate town of Avernum. When Nick drives out to the estate of C.B. Lucas, famous explorer who has brought the animals to America, he is warned off by Lucas, who shouts at the master detective in Chinese. When Nick, Patsy, and Scubby attempt to steal into the estate on foot, they witness the tracking down and killing of a man by one of Lucas' savage creatures. Now in the blackness of a forest clearing, they examine the dead body. Oh, what a mess this fellow is. Yes, head torn off completely. Apparently, Dr. Lucas's man-eating horse took it away with him. And did you hear the way it howled? It was like a lion or, or something. Well, that wasn't any lion or anything else that I ever heard of. You're right, Scully. Wait a minute. Well, this is odd. What, Nick? Look at the gun this fellow was carrying. Huh? It's lying beside his right hand. For the love of Pete, what is it? Happens to be a Patterson Colt. Model of 1848. 1848? You mean a hundred years old? It's about... This is one of the original Colt models, fired with percussion caps. Oh, but that doesn't make sense, Nick. Why would a man defend himself with an antique like that? Well, if you remember, Scabby, that when Lucas warned us off, he talked in Chinese, it does make sense. Well, not to me, it doesn't. We'll in a very few minutes. Come on, get up to Lucas's house. Well, aren't you going to search that body for identification or something? No, we won't find any. How do you know? Let's concentrate on being quiet, shall we? Okay. Put that flash out, Scabby. Sure. Now stay on your toes. Dr. Lucas' charming pets may be closer than you think. Nick? Yes? I, I can see the house lights from here, straight ahead. Yes. All right, quick now. Oh. Oh, I sure wish there was a moon. You're, you're not getting romantic, are you, Scubby? Heck no. I'm just scared of the dark. Wait a minute. Listen. It's a funny sound. It's like machinery or something. It's not machinery. Hurry, let's get to the house. Take this path here. Nick, that sound is awfully familiar. I just can't place it. Familiar to you, Scubby? Well, yeah. Coming over the PA, Lucas has on the ground. Over the PA? Right. Our right, quick, into the house. Those French windows at the side look open. Open? They're smashed. Like a truck went through them. So they are. Careful of broken glass. Oh, Nick, look at this room. Yeah, looks as if the truck drove through here, too. Yeah. Where is Dr. Lucas? I have a hunch that something's happened to Dr. Lucas, Patsy. Something that accounts for the funny noise you hear over the PA. Come on. Uh, I don't know like this. The train's advice is... Oh, for the love uh, Yes, I rather expected this. It, it's a body. It's brought alongside that phonograph. And it's a needle running in the last groove in the record that's making that strange sound, Patsy. I'm afraid Dr. Lucas has played this phonograph for the last time. Better take the playing arm off the record, Scotty. Yeah, all right, Nick. Now, let's have a look at this body. Oh, lots of blood. Body quite warm till very recently. Mm-hmm. The same way our friend back in the woods was killed. Head torn off. Only this time the head was left with the body. But this isn't Dr. Lucas. Nick, look at the head. He's Chinese. Glory be, you're right, Patsy. Then this explains why we heard a warning in Chinese over the PA when we first drove up to the house, right, Nick? Scubby, start that record again. This man couldn't talk English, so he had an English-speaking record made to, to warn people off the ground, Play it, right? Scubby, play it, quick. Okay. Turn off the PA first. We'll hear it direct. Right, Nick. This is private property. You are trespassing on private property. I will give you five minutes to get out of here. What'd I tell you, Nick? That's the voice we heard. This is your last warning, whoever you are. Five minutes to get off my ground. Please, turn off machine. Please, turn off machine. For the love of... A couple of hatchet men. Please, do not move. A sorted and self-highly expert in use of lethal firearms. Kindly raise arms to extreme vertical positions. Remain with backs against wall. Thank you. Oh, now listen, wise guy. Please, to remain silent. Oh. We have made long journey for most prosperous meeting, Mr. Lucas. Lucas? Well, this Quiet, is... Patsy. ...was extremely injudicious to take away Gucci Chang, Mr. Lucas. 
Rash action put miserable selves to extreme expense of body and purse for long journey. Yes. Now necessary to locate Go Chi Chang at once. He's ever that number two associate as yet unsuccessful in task. Remains for self and miserable number one associate. Hey, what in place is it? Mr. Lukas, you will please inform this person of locality of Go Chi Chang. May miserable Fang Pai remind honorable Mr. Lucas, this person highly prosperic species, lack refining benefits of civilized education, much prepared to obtain required information with cruel methods of contemptible savages. Golly, Nick. Oh, who is this Goshi Jung character you birds are after? He's the guy I think you mean. He's dead. Be quiet, Scubby. Ah, this news highly interesting. It's true, Mr. Lucas, that Goshi Chang departed to join all of our ancestors. Whatever it is. Then the uh, task of this person reduced to minimum. Only necessary to ensure demise of you and friends and then return to home. Our demise? But we... Then, uh, this is why I'm in King Fu and I'll... This is the payoff. Look out, Scubby. Here goes the phonograph. This way, Patsy, Scubby. Get moving. All right. Block bullets as easily. Okay. They recover enough any minute now to start shooting. This must be the kitchen. Straight ahead and out the back door. Do you think we can shake the Nick? We move fast enough we can. All right, I'll get the door. Through, Patsy, quick. Come on, Scubby. All right, with you. Oh. oh. Now what? Quiet and keep running. Come on. We'll stand a 50 50 chance of shaking them in the dark out here. Why didn't you tell them you weren't looking? You think they'd believe me? Hey, this looks like a garage ahead. In then, hurry. Careful. There's a car here. Don't bang into it. All right, now what, Nick? Oh, we can just hold out long enough. Sheriff Crane will rescue us. Huh? What do you mean, Patsy? Well, when you were examining the body, I called the sheriff and notified him about the two deaths. What? He said he was coming right up as soon as he could get his posse together. Oh, good work, Patsy. That's my little darling every time. That's about the worst news I've ever had. But, Nick, I... I understand, Patsy. It's too late to explain now. All right, here's what we do. Yeah, we're listening, Nick. Get into this car. Drive out of the garage like 60 and get past those two killers. Uh Okay. 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 I'll take the wheel. You two hold on now. All right. Here goes. I'm cutting straight across the lawns and fields. Let's hope the tires hold. Oh, they They don't get us now. We're safe. I think we... I think we made it. You all right back there? I guess so. Well, watch out. We're going straight through the fields to that patch of woods where we found the first victim of Goji Jung. Oh, for Pete's sake, why? I'm going to perform the nastiest piece of business I've ever been forced to do. I'm going to run a human drag line. <laughs> Scotty, this is what we do. We're going to take the body of the unfortunate fellow and drag it. Oh, holy smokes, where? Get across Lucas's land, away from the house. Quick, give me a hand with the body. Okay, Nick. Why, Nick? We set a drag line for Do Go She Jump. All right, now start moving, shall we? Okay. Nick, what's a drag line? Folks use it down south for fox hunting, Patsy. Especially when there aren't any foxes in the neighborhood. It's an artificial trail. Well, huh? I understand, but why do we have... For the we sake have... of Sheriff Crane and any men he may bring with him. Don't forget, Dosi Jung is around the house and grounds. And the killer. We've got to turn ourselves into bait to save their lives. Good old howling horse. Why didn't Lucas leave him where he found him? Nick, did Lucas discover Dosi Jung? No, Betsy. A gentleman by the name of Marco Polo discovered him. Marco Polo? Yes. I'm just the other side of that tree, Scully. All right, Nick. Dosi Jung was discovered many centuries ago. But he's unknown in the Western world. He was, that is, until Lucas brought him here. I warn you. Sooner or later, he'll pick up the scent of this trail we're making and come after us. And believe me, it'll be a tremendous shock. Oh, nothing could shock me anymore. Well, you've never seen anything like go see junk, Scubby. Golly. Got the queen. Fortunately, there's a brisk wind blowing. If he doesn't pick up this blood trail, maybe he'll pick up ours. Any... Oh, wait, wait. You hear that? Yeah, I hear it. We're in luck. We must send it. Keep moving, Scubby. Here at the top of that little hill. All right. He got closer. He's as fast as a racehorse. Yeah, and he howls like a pack of... Nick, I just got it. Good. No time to talk about it. All right. This is far enough. Put the body down, Scubby. Okay. Get your flashlight ready. Patsy. Yes, Nick. I want you to stand on my left. Here's an extra magazine for my automatic. Hold it. When I yell for it, slap it into my left hand. Okay. Oh, what a monster. Stand by. Oh, it sounds 
awful close. He should be in sight any second now. Right, Scubby, straight ahead. Right. Oh. Nick, for the Lord. It is a horse. A stallion. No, no, it's a dog. A giant dog. And a killer. Look out. Oh. You can't stop him. Oh, Nick. Magazine, Patsy, quick. Bring the giant. For Pete's sake, Nick, get that gun loaded. Right, here we are. It's all right. We've stopped him. Steady. Steady. Oh, golly, Nick. Oh, golly. It was so big, so fantastic, looming up and just got his flashlight. It's all right. It's all right. Nick. Nick, do you mean to say this? The that thing was a dog? I do. That was Goshi Jung. The fabulous, almost mythical Tibetan master. This is the first and probably the last time we'll ever see this breed. And in killing it, we've destroyed the monster that murdered Dr. C.B. Lucas. In just a few minutes, Nick will be back to give you the final details of today's story and describe the strange creature thought to be the howling horse. When your furniture was new, of course you were proud of its handsome, gleaming appearance. Since then, it may be that finger marks, dust smudges, the cloudy look of inferior polish have made your furniture look dull and unattractive. But with Linex Cream Polish to help you out, you can restore its appearance in double quick time. For Linex Cream Polish cleans as it polishes, cutting the job in half. Yes, one quick application of Linex Cream Polish removes all the cloudy dullness from your furniture, leaves it gleaming and beautiful. And because it dries hard, leaving no oily film on the surface to attract more dust, it saves you future work as well. No wonder so many thousands of modern American women are coming to depend on Linex Cream Polish, the up-to-date beauty treatment for fine furniture. Get Linex Cream Polish now. You'll find all three great Linex Home Brighteners, Linex Cream Polish, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, and Linex Clear Gloss, the longer-lasting brush-on finish, at hardware, paint, and department stores everywhere. And remember that your dealer is headquarters also for Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that brings quick new sparkle to walls and ceilings. Chemtone covers in one coat dries in one hour. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. I had heard of the Tibetan masters before, Patsy. Mm -hmm. You'll find an interesting chapter on that strange animal in a pamphlet on Chinese dogs published by the Quan Quan Company in Los Angeles in 1944. It's one of the oldest defense breeds in the world, and is so revered in Tibet that none has ever been allowed out of that country. Go see Jung means dog of Tibet. Oh. Well, aren't there any pictures, Nick? No, the Tibetans do not permit pictures to be taken, Patsy. Oh. All we have are the descriptions of various explorers from Marco Polo down. All describe the giant dog as being the size of a horse. Well, it sure was, Nick. There have been attempts to steal one of the mastiffs and bring them out of the country, but in each case, the dog has either been stolen back or killed. So Dr. Lucas managed to steal Goshi Chung. Right. And brought it to his estate and then lived in constant fear, knowing the Tibetans would never let him keep the dog. He knew that sooner or later they'd send men to kill it. And they did. And that's why he kept himself locked up? Precisely. Lucas made that recorded warning to play over his PA system whenever strangers drove up. He was undoubtedly warned by some sort of mechanical device that was set off by our entrance to the ground. He also repeated it in Chinese to warn off any Chinese gunmen who might have trailed him here. Mm, and it really was Lucas we heard. Yes. You see, Patsy... The dog apparently turned savage and broke loose from the chains with which it was confined. Lucas could not recapture it, so it roamed the estate, killing everything it met. Oh. In fact, right before our eyes, we saw it kill a man. And that was Mr. Fang's number two assistant, prowling around the grounds. The mastiff ran off with a dead man's head in his jaws, crashed into Lucas's house, and attacked Lucas himself. Then it dropped the head of the Chinese and tore off Lucas's head and rushed off with it. Exactly. That's why you and Scubby leaped to the conclusion that the head we found alongside Lucas's body actually belonged to that body. Well, when did you first begin to understand what was happening, Nick? When I saw that the first victim had been carrying an old Patterson coat. Hmm? There's only one section of the world that continues to use antique firearms, Patsy, and that's the mountain regions of China. In Tibet, you'll still find soldiers equipped with flintlock rifles and old Civil War weapons. Golly. Well... What about those killers from Tibet that came after the dog, Nick? The men who thought you were Lucas. Probably slipped off and started back for home. We'll never see them again, and there's no need to, really. They haven't been guilty of any crime. 
All the guilty parties in question have already paid in full. Well, Nick, that was certainly an unusual tale. What's next week's story going to be about? Next week, Ken, we're going to meet a strange young man who, as far as anyone knew, never touched alcohol at all, yet apparently came home intoxicated night after night. Then one evening, he was murdered. And that was the evening he carried home with him a can opener seven feet long. And the murder was revealed by a silkworm. A giant can opener and telltale silkworms. Sounds like a swell story. What's its title, Nick? The Case of the Worried Worm. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Long Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson plays Betsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester. The programs are fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Master Detective is presented at this time and over these same stations each week by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's Nick Carter adventure, the case of the haunted burial cave. I wish I hadn't come into this whole cave. I hate places like this. I always feel as if the roof were going to drop on me. My, this section of the cave is huge. Yes, I think the secret burial chamber we're looking for must be much like this. Mm. Just look at those big rocks up there hanging over us. Well, There's somebody up there. Put out the lantern. Get back against the wall. That big rock is going to crush us there. Now another intriguing transcribed adventure with Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented in cooperation with the Mutual Network by Dr. Scholl's Inopad, world-famous relief for corns, calluses, bunions, and sore toes. In a moment, the case of the haunted burial cave. But first, are you one of the four million? We hope not. Four million is the number of Americans injured by accidents in the home every year. Now, most of these injuries are caused by falls. Falls which range in seriousness from sliding on a scatter rug to diving accidentally headfirst down a flight of stairs. Now, these accidents in the home are 100% preventable. Why don't you make a safety check of your home today? Appoint yourself a committee of one to go through the house from cellar to attic and check potential sources of accidental injury. Pay particular attention to your stairways. Remember that stairs are for stepping, not storing. Remove articles that have been given semi-permanent storage on the top step. They don't belong there. Move them and find a more fitting storage spot. Teach your children to put their toys away when they finish playing. And during your inspection trip, and after it too, think safely and live safely. This message is brought to you as a public service. Now, today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, the case of the haunted burial cave. In an isolated area near the Canadian border, a small archaeological expedition is camped near the mouth of an unexplored cave. The head of the exploring party, Cole Adams, crouches alone on a narrow ledge in the huge cavern, the pale light of his lantern casting distorted shadows on the dripping wall. Who's there? Is that you, Farrell? Well, answer me! Why are you hiding in the shadows? <laughs> Oh, the view 
Listen, this plane is just magnificent. Yeah, lovely country. Mm-hmm. So, Mr. Farrell, you found Mr. Adams after he was attacked. That right? Yes, that's right. His wife was worried when he didn't come back, so I went into the cave after him. He was still unconscious. But he's all right now. Oh, yes, Miss Bowen. He's fully recovered now. Well, I'm still not certain just why Mr. Adams asked me to come up here. Well, the nearest town is 30 miles away. Mr. Adams went in and talked to the deputy sheriff there, but the man refused to take any action. Oh, but surely with such a clear case of assault with intent to kill, the authorities would be forced to investigate. Well, most of these people feel we have no right to be poking around in the old burial cave, and they'd be very happy if we decided to pack up and leave. Oh, so... When the deputy sheriff refused to take any action, Mr. Adams called Nick. Yes, and when you agreed to come up here, I was sent to meet you. It's only about an hour by plane, but it takes forever in a car. The roads are so bad. Who's backing this expedition, Mr. Farrell? Adams secured a grant from the Norwood Foundation. He and his wife were in this district last year on a vacation. Adams heard about this cave, did some superficial exploring, and decided it might be a very rich archaeological find. Why hasn't the cave been explored before now? Well, it's fairly inaccessible, and there are a lot of superstitious stories about the place. The natives are sure it's haunted by the ghosts of the old Indians who were buried there. I see. How many members in your party? Well, there's Cole Adams, his wife, and myself. And we hired a guide, an Indian named Sam Big Eagle. Hmm. At first, he claimed he could lead us directly to the hidden burial chamber, but since we hired him, he's done nothing but slow us up. Hey, that Echo Lake over there, Mr. Farrell? Yes, that's it. You can see Jeff White's cabin through the trees there. Well, who's Jeff White? Oh, he's a very nice guy. He's, he's blind. He lives there on the lake all by himself. I see. Mr. Farrell, you said your Indian guide blamed the ghosts of his dead forefathers for the attack on Cole Adams. What do you think happened? Well, I'm an archaeologist, Mr. Carter, not a detective, but I'm sure of one thing. Those big purple bruises on Cole Adams' throat weren't made by a ghost. The entrance to the cave certainly isn't very large, Mr. Adams. No, it's most deceptive. But after the first 25 yards, the entrance passage grows progressively larger. I see. We'll have a look at it in the morning. I must say, Mr. Carter, that I'm sorry you agreed to come up here. Neva. Why do you say that, Mrs. Adams? Because if you'd refused, Cole might have been willing to give up this silly exploration. I've too much at stake to be frightened off by a few ghost stories. And was it a ghost that nearly choked you to death? No, it was not. Those were very human fingers at my throat. I'm hoping Mr. Carter will soon be able to tell us who it was trying to murder me and why. Oh, no. Where are all the explorers? Oh, uh, over here, Jeff, by the cave entrance. Well, this is Jeff White, the blind man we were telling you about earlier. Oh, yes. Kevin tells me you have guests, Cole. Yes, that's right. Nick Carter and his assistant, Miss Bowen. This is Jeff White, the mayor of Echo Lake. Hello, Mr. White. Know? That title is quite unofficial, but welcome anyway. You've come to investigate the attack on Cole? Yes, that's right. I'm glad. I was afraid Cole might decide to pack up and leave. And I've been spoiled by having someone to talk with. You mean you live up here all alone, Mr. White? I do now, Miss Bowen. I hope you'll both come to see me while you're here. Oh, well, they certainly will, Jeff. I want them to see your house. It's just beautiful. That's thanks to Muriel. Well, I mustn't stay. I just want to say hello. Oh, oh but Mr. White, aren't you afraid to wander through these woods alone after dark? For me, Miss Bowen, it's always dark. And I feel perfectly safe in these woods. I know all these paths by heart. Gosh. I, I think that's remarkable. Well, he's a remarkable man, Miss Bowen. He was a brilliant chemist and was blinded in the laboratory explosion. Mm -hmm. Yes, I noticed the Phi Beta Kappa key he wears on that keychain. He received a large cash settlement for the loss of his eyes, and he and his wife came up here to live. Is she the uh, Muriel he mentioned? Yes. She ran off several months ago with a local no good. Oh. I mean, she just walked out on him? Yep. Just disappeared. Hm. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'm feeling rather tired. I <laughs> think I'll turn in. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mr. Adams, the morning you were attacked, you got up early. Then you went into that cave alone? That's right. I'd gone some distance inside when it seemed to me that I heard digging. Digging? Well, it was very remote and... It stopped as I approached. Uh -huh. And then without warning, I was seized from behind. Hmm. Now, tell me, do you think it could have been some Indian who resents this intrusion upon his sacred burial cave? It could be. Or it might have been someone using that as a cover-up, Mr. Carter. How do you mean? 
papers, you noticed I have a most attractive wife, many years younger than I am. My assistant, Kevin Farrell, has quite a reputation as a Don Juan with the ladies. Are you accusing your assistant of trying to murder you? No, I am making no accusations. I only know that someone tried to kill me, and I expect you, Mr. Carter, to find out who it was and see to it that a second attempt doesn't succeed. In just a moment, we'll return to today's adventure with Nick Carter, Master Detective. But first, you know, from early childhood, we're taught not to neglect our eyes or teeth. But when it comes to our feet, it's another story. Yet, government records prove that seven out of every ten of us are troubled by either painful corns, calluses, bunions, sore toes, or tender spots on the feet. And for one reason only, shoe friction and pressure. Now, the way to stop all that needless distress in a hurry is to promptly protect any sensitive spots on your feet or toes with soothing, cushioning Dr. Show Zinno Pads. Zinno pads give super fast relief from pain, make new or tight shoes feel easy on the feet. Stop your corns, calluses, and blisters before they can start. Remove corns and calluses, one of the fastest ways known to medical science, when used with the separate medications included in every box. No other method can make all these claims, yet Dr. Scholl's Zinno pads cost only pennies at application, so get a box right away. That's Dr. Scholl's Zinno, Z-I-N-O. Dr. Scholl's Zinno pads, sold everywhere. Now back to the case of the haunted burial cave. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. It's late morning, and Nick and Patsy, accompanied by Cole Adams and his wife, are preparing to enter the mysterious burial cave. I don't know where that Indian guide of ours is, but I guess we can manage just as well without him as with him. I haven't seen him all morning. Uh, where is Mr. Farrell? Well, he says he's going to try to catch us some fresh fish for lunch. Oh, honestly, Cole, that coat of yours still reeks of mothball. It's a good, clean smell, dear. Ish. You have your lantern, Mr. Carter? All set. And I have mine, so I think we're ready. No! What? You not go in there... No. There's your missing guy. He's been in the cave. That's why we haven't seen him. You not go in sacred cave. Oh, now look here, Sam. I'm not paying you to wander off whenever the notion takes you. Now, what were you doing in the cave? Very bad place. Bodies, dead people there. If we know that. That's why we're interested. You go in cave, you die like others. Now, listen, Sam. If this is a burial cave, people were taken here after they were dead. They didn't die in the cave. No. They die there. You die, too. I've had enough of this nonsense. Are you going to guide us into this cave or not? No. You go away. All right, then. We'll go in without you. I not let you go in there. Oh, he's going to hit you. Sam, get out of the way. Uh, you point gun at Sam. All right, go. Sam warn you. Go in cave and die. Like others. Had you gone much further into the cave than this when you were attacked, Mr. Adams? Oh, yes. I'd say about 50 yards from here. There's a sharp turn and then a, a kind of a recess. I... I wish I hadn't come. I hate places like this. I always feel that the roof is going to drop on me. Well, you can go back if you like, Neva. Help Kevin fish. Hey, wait a second. Wait a second. Hmm? Well, what's this? What is it, Nick? That's some old 38 cartridges, Patsy. Oh. Someone stood here and fired a dozen or more shots. Well, say, look here on this wall. Someone's tried to scratch a message. And you are. Uh. Murder, maybe? Oh, it's probably just somebody wanting to leave their name for posterity. Oh, it's been written fairly recently, I'd say. Well, shall we go ahead? Yeah. So, Mr. Adams, what did your Indian guide do for a living before he hired on with you? 
A little of everything. Hunting, trapping, prospecting. Prospecting for gold? Oh, no, no. The uranium fever hit this country. Oh. Everybody was out hoping to find a rich uranium pocket and get wealthy overnight. My, this section of the cave is huge. Well, I think the burial chamber must be something like this. Oh. Look at those big rocks up there. They just seem to hang. What? Somebody up above us. Put out the lanterns. Get back against the wall. That big rock. It's going to crush us. <laughs> Mrs. Adams seems to be resting quietly now. Oh, good. Well, Mr. Adams, how about it? Should we go back to the cave? Well, we've lost so much time now, Mr. Carter. I suggest we wait until morning and go in without the ladies. Oh, well, that's fine with me. You think it was Sam Big Eagle who pushed the rock down on you, Cole? Yes, Jeff, it must have been. He tried to keep us from going into the cave, and when that failed, he probably followed us and tried to crush us with that boulder. I well, came too close for comfort. If Nick hadn't pushed us all back against the wall, why... We've been hit. I'm sorry Neva's hysterics prevented our investigating further. Say, Farrell hasn't returned from his fishing trip yet, has he? No. And I don't see him out in the lake either. I have a suggestion. That since Mrs. Adams is so upset, why don't you let her stay here at my cabin? Miss Bourne could stay with her, and I'll bunk down over at your camp. Why, sure. Oh, that's very kind of you, Jeff. That's quite a collection of keys you have there, Mr. White. Oh, it's ridiculous of me, I suppose, to wear them up here... But they're keys I used to use when I was a chemist. Oh? Offices, labs, lockers, so on. And I wear them on my belt because I like to hear them jingle. They remind me of the past. And a very happy past. Well, it's certainly a very cheerful sound. Well, if we're not going back into the cave today, suppose we see if we can locate Sam Big Eagle. Right. There are several questions that Indian's got to answer. And I'll also be interested to hear what Kevin Farrell's been doing while somebody was trying to kill us. Are you accusing me of trying to kill you, Adams? I only wondered what you'd been doing all day. You don't seem to have caught many fish. I didn't have any luck. No, no, the luck was with us this time. Now, look here, I've had about enough of this. If I wanted to kill you, I wouldn't sneak around pushing rocks over onto you. Well, maybe you'd prefer to strangle me with your bare hands. I don't have to take that from you, Adams. Here, Adams, Farrell, stop it. Will you stop it? You're just child. Oh. The important thing right now is the fact that Sam Big Eagle has disappeared. Stop your quarreling and let's see what we can do about finding him. That Indian sneak thief came into our camp during the night, took my rifle, my lantern, my good coat. Where's Jeff White this morning? Probably left early for one of his hikes. Night and day are all one to Jeff. I suppose we really should have checked at Jeff's cabin to be certain the women are all right. Why shouldn't they be? Well, with Sam Big Eagle prowling around, it might have been a good idea to check. Well, I think it's more likely he's waiting for us here in the cave. Hey, look. Hmm? There's a light up ahead. You're right. What do you suppose that is? Some kind of a trick? We better go slow. in the same big chamber where we were attacked yesterday. What? It's a lantern lying on the path. Well, there's someone beside it. Hmm? Why, it's Sam Big Eagle. No. Oh. He's been strangled. In just a moment, we'll return to today's adventure with Nick Carter, Master Detective. But first... Now hear a mutual minute. A large portion of the responsibility for keeping the American public the best informed in the world belongs to radio newscasters, commentators, and analysts. On Mutual, you'll find veteran newsmen in every category who are experts in their fields and who take their responsibility to you, the listener, with utmost seriousness. Whether you prefer a fast five-minute digest of the big headlines of the moment or thoughtful, penetrating, and informed commentary, Mutual is your network for news as you like it. And when you like it. Wednesday evenings, they're full of Lewis Jr., Gabriel Heater, Frank Edwards, and Ed Pettit with full quarter hours of news, as well as Bill Henry and his famed five minute capsule. And the daytime favorite, Robert F. Hurley, heard every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening. And Hazel Markell brings the woman's point of view from the nation's capital each Tuesday and Thursday evening. These are but several of the mutual names for news. 
Hear them regularly over most of these same stations. Now back to the case of the haunted burial cave. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. The body of the murdered guide has been brought out of the cave. And Cole Adams has gone to tell his wife and Patsy. Outside the cave entrance, Nick and Farrell examine the body. How long do you think he's been dead, Mr. Carter? I'd say not more than an hour. Well, then the killer may still be in the cave. This is possible, although it's more likely he got out before we started in. That's Cole's coat Sam's wearing. I'd recognize it anywhere. Yeah. And he had Cole's rifle and the lantern with him, too. Yeah, strange about the lantern, don't you think? Oh, what do you mean? Well, seems to me that if I'd killed someone, I wouldn't go away and leave a lantern burning beside the body. Unless... Unless I wanted to call attention to the murder. Hello. Back from the cave so soon? Oh, good morning, Jeff. There's been an accident. An accident? Is someone hurt? Someone dead. We found the body when we started into the cave. An awful shock for poor Mrs. Adams. Aunt Neva wasn't with us. Cole has gone to tell her and Miss Bowen about it now. Oh. Well, I'm glad she was spared the first-hand shock. After yesterday, it would have been too much. Mr. White, you haven't asked us who was murdered. I assumed it was the Indian. Yes, that's right. He was strangled to death. That accounts for his disappearance yesterday. No, it doesn't. He came back to the camp during the night. He was killed early this morning. How can you know that? He stole Cole's coat and rifle and lantern. Oh. By the way, Mr. White, you must have left camp very early this morning. Yes, it was very early. I couldn't sleep, so I went down to the lake. I find it soothing to listen to the water. I see. Well, shall we join Adams and the women at the cabin, Mr. Carter? Yeah. I want to arrange for another expedition into that cave. But I can't understand why Sam Big Eagle should have been murdered. Maybe it was to frighten the rest of us away. I'm no sleuth, Mr. Carter, but mightn't the Indian have been killed because he knew too much? You mean perhaps he knew who'd attacked Mr. Adams earlier? Yes. But why didn't he tell us? Well, he might have been paid to keep quiet. Why, yes. And then the murderer arranged to meet him in the cave to make a payment and killed him instead. Mr. Adams, has it occurred to you that there may be other entrances to the cave? Well, it's very likely. A cave system as complex as this one would be almost certain to have another opening or other openings on the surface. But we haven't located any of them as yet. Do you want me to go into the village to get the deputy sheriff? Oh, yes, yes, if you will, Mr. Farrell. It'll take me all day. That means I can't possibly get him back here before late afternoon tomorrow. It's a pity we haven't a telephone. Well, I think we should all agree that no one is to go into that dreadful cave again until Kevin gets back with the deputy sheriff. Sorry, Mrs. Adams. I can't make such a promise. Does that mean you intend to go back into the cave, Mr. Carter? I haven't any choice. I've got to go into that cave to find an answer to this riddle. Well... When do you mean to go in? That, Mrs. Adams, must be a secret between Miss Bowen and me. Mrs. Adams seems to be asleep. So do the men. Then I will be able to slip away to the cave without anyone knowing we've gone. No, 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 Patsy. That'll defeat my purpose. Your purpose? Yeah. The killer must hear us leave. There's no point in our going into the cave. Oh. So as we go out, I'll just close this cabin door a little too loudly. There. You think that'll be heard, Nick? By the person listening for us? Yeah. And now we go to the cave? Yes, but not too quickly. Hmm? We want to allow our killer plenty of time to set his trap. <laughs> I don't think we were followed into the cave, Nick. Oh, I didn't expect to be. I'm sure the killer has a private entrance. Well, if, if there is someone waiting in here to kill us, Nick, doesn't this lantern make us an awfully good target? No, no Patsy, the lantern isn't important. Oh, it is to me. Oh, golly, I'd hate to be in here in the dark. It's bad enough even with a lantern. <coughs> oh, down, no, Patsy. I say down the, flat. The lantern. I dropped it and it went out. No. Now we can't see who's shooting at us. That's the way I wanted it. That... That sounds like Jeff White. <coughs> now you two are in the dark. 
Just as I am. That means we're evenly matched, Carter. In the cave, a blind man has the same chance you do. You better give yourself up, White. Give myself up? No, I'm going to kill you. It may take time, Carter. But I'm safely hidden behind a big rock. I can be very patient. I'm going to kill you just as surely as I killed the others. In just a moment, we'll return for the conclusion of today's adventure with Nick Carter, Master Detective. But first, now hear a mutual minute. Remember the song, Accentuate the Positive and Eliminate the Negative? That's a pretty good idea, generally speaking. It's always easy to find something to gripe about, but, well, maybe we'd find a lot more to sing about if we only started to think for a minute. About the future, for instance. The fact, well, that we have more reason to believe in our country's capacity for development and progress than ever before. America is still a young country, still expanding, still growing, physically, economically, and in the realm of new ideas and new sciences. The infants, the children, and the young people of today can look forward to a tremendous period, an exciting period, one of hope and promise. And there are cold, hard facts to prove this. We believe in those facts and the promise they hold for America's future. And the advertisers who use the time and facilities of the world's largest network believe in them, too. This message has been brought to you as a public service. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Haunted Burial Cave. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Nick and Patsy wait tensely in the total blackness of the cave while the blind killer crouches behind a big rock. I am between you and the entrance, Carter. You can't escape. And you can't hit me behind this rock. I know every crevice in this cave. As only a blind man could know it. Is this the way you trapped your wife from the other man, White? Yes. He was going to take Muriel away. So I tricked them into coming here, where I had the advantage. Then I killed them, just as I'm going to kill you. Are you? We're hidden in a recess in the wall, so we're protected too. And we can be just as patient as you can. He dropped his gun. Yeah, here, I'll strike a match. He's down. And there's his gun. But, Nick, how did you hit him in the dark? His keys gave him away, Patsy. When he moved out from behind the rock to get a better shot at us, that keychain he wore was just like the bell on a cat. Well, Jeff White certainly had me fooled. So he killed his wife and the man she planned to run away with. That's right, Mrs. Adams. Since White recovered consciousness, he's given me the whole story. He tricked him into a rendezvous in the cave, and then in the total darkness, killed them both. The other man put up a fight, didn't he, Nick? Yeah, he must have, Patsy. Those empty shells I found on the path that first day must have been from his gun. Hmm. He crouched there as we did last night and fired at White. But not even White can fire as accurately as you can at a sound, Mr. Carter. Well, then that scrawling on the cave wall near the spot where you found the shells must have been made by White's wife. Mm Mm-hmm. She started to scratch her name, M-U-R, the first part of Muriel. But she must have been killed before she could finish it. After White killed them, he took their bodies to the inner burial chamber. He must have felt sure they'd never be discovered. Yes, but then he let the story leak out that Mrs. White had deserted him for another man. Everyone felt very sorry for White, and that was the end of it. Until we showed up here, prepared to explore that cave. Yes, but you'd given White no warning you were coming, so he couldn't move the bodies. Consequently, he had to frighten you away. And that's all he meant to do at first, just scare you off. Of course, he didn't know that my husband is a stubborn sort who doesn't frighten easily. Well, I guess my calling you into the case, Mr. Carter, must have really panicked White. Had Sam Big Eagle found the bodies? Is that why White strangled him? No, Big Eagle was murdered because he was wearing the coat he'd stolen from Mr. Adams. What's my coat got to do with it? (laughs) It smelled of mothballs. Hmm? Remember, White had to depend on sounds and odors for identification. So he killed Big Eagle thinking it was Mr. Adams. That's right. 
And he gave himself away when he came into the camp afterwards. Remember, Mr. Farrell, his first reaction to news that there'd been a death was... What a shock it'll be for Mrs. Adams. Because he thought he'd killed Cole. That's right. See, when he realized that Mr. Adams couldn't be frightened off, he decided to kill him to stop further exploration. I imagine he hoped to point suspicion at the Indian guide. What a shock it must have been for him to discover that he'd killed the wrong man. Another thing which pointed to White was the lantern left burning beside the body. Your reaction, Mr. Farrell, was normal. He couldn't understand why a killer would have left the lantern burning. And White simply wasn't aware of the light. Well, Mr. Adams, now that the bodies of Mrs. White and the other man have been recovered, there's no reason you shouldn't go ahead with your explorations. This burial cave wasn't haunted by the ghosts of ancient Indians, but by a ruthless killer who feared discovery. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated, it is presented each week at the same time in cooperation with the Mutual Network by Dr. Scholl's Inopads, world-famous relief for corns, calluses, bunions, and sore toes. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Others in today's cast were Arnold Moss, Gertrude Warner, Bob Haig, John Brewster, and George Spelton. Today's script by John McGreevy. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. This is Jack O'Reilly suggesting you join us again next week for the case of the accusing blood. Another intriguing transcribed adventure with Nick Carter, Master Detective. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.